if you're buying it to get that that eat cad e100 sound that people like it's not it's not that it's just a whole different it's just a whole different mic yeah, yeah. i just got to say mike delgadio mm-hmm. he's he's the reason that i uh the first mic i ever reviewed was the uh, cad e100s still have it till this day i love that that's microphone cool. so yeah, that's cool hey yeah shout out man Sweet. thoughts on the mv7x I don't have that. that one, I, don't I, have it. I think the MV7X, the XLR output is a huge improvement over the XLR output of the MV7. However, I would, I think it was the MV7X video or my MV7 review. Go watch it because I compared it to the Shure PGA 48 or 58. I think they're using the same capsule or a, a slightly modified capsule, and you can get a very similar sound without the cool broadcast look for 50 bucks, 60 bucks, as opposed to 150. So so go watch one of those. Look in the comparisons. There's timestamps. There you go. I think it's kind of fascinating that the difference, the microphones that output a USB output as well as an XLR output. I've noticed it on a few mics now, the MV7 and also the um, ATR 2100s. The XLR signal just doesn't sound nearly as good. The digital yeah. signal just sounds so much clearer. It's like crystal clear. Mm. I think it's by design. I think they want you to use the in, in, in the integrated in. But the one thing that that I got a question about is at this point when the internal um, analog digital converter dies, will the XLR portion still continue to work? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something in the course over the course of time. Anytime I see these hybrid microphones, the 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 Samsung Q2U, it makes me wonder. Is I mean, because technically, if they split the signal off of the capsule. We'll take one over to, to be digitized. One of them just goes straight out. Technically, it would continue continue so to, to work. I've had personally a Samsung Q2U die USB still work XLR. Yeah, that's okay. good. That's good. That's the way know. it should be. That's the way it should be. Uh, real quick here, a quick one uh, to go around to all you. Uh, how many of you are relaxed about your audio quality and live streams and music? Uh, did we already answer that? A lot of us did, yeah. Uh, you can tell I was trying to find that video. I just gave up. Trying to just put the, I, I, the appropriate things you, on the screen. I don't think you answered a question yet, Alan. Or, um, um, I kind of did a few hours ago about oh, my okay. audio, um, but I'll go ahead and at least answer it since the question was up on the screen. Um, the biggest thing about me is that I realized, I looked at my metrics you know, a couple of years ago, and I realized that like something like 60, 65% of the people that were watching my videos were watching on their phones. And I looked at that and I remember saying, okay, if that's the case, I'm going to start being very aggressive with the, the processing to try to get the dynamics relatively flat and high. That way, if, if people are watching on their phones, that way they're not going to say volume up, volume down, volume up, volume down. That way they can just listen at a constant level. I use a lot of compression. I use a lot of leveling. And I'm sure that everybody uh, you know who watches this, there are people like, you know, Alan, why do you always sound so heavily compressed? Because it is. That's the way, like right now, I yeah. could instantly turn this thing off. You'd hear the background noise and everything like that. My dynamics would be all over the place. But to me, you know, I would rather it be consistent and people, you know, like right now I can back off on this microphone a little bit. It's going to change my tonal quality, but I'm still, you know, it's compressed. And, and that way it's still kind of there if I go a little bit in and out of the pattern of this thing. It's going to kind of find it and bring it up a little bit. So I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to stay strictly, you know, in front of a microphone. So, yeah. One comment on that. I was listening to, I recently was traveling for 10 days, driving in a car, listening to a new podcast I'd never heard before. And I was even driving a Tesla, which has no engine noise. So, and I was able to listen to audio at a much lower volume, which was cool. Uh, but even then, the dynamics of this podcast were way too much. I'm like, the guy would get loud and it would almost hurt my ears. But then he would, you know, he just, trail off and you'd be like i i literally missed four words it, it, mm. so yeah it's like i know people like audio to sound natural and have natural dynamics and we all love that but in terms of delivering something <clears throat> to the people that they can hear when they want to hear it it's you know unfortunately we do have to use you know quite a bit of compression 
So it is in your guys' opinion, this is really fascinating because, you know, I'm learning a lot just by listening to you guys about just like the technique of what you do from one platform to the next. Are is live streaming for video and podcasting in your opinion are they synonymous as far as like the the output levels and mixing styles, do you think? Or are they somewhat maybe different? You're muted, Bander. I would say they're different. Just, just like Chris was talking about, I will compress my podcast a bit more. I'll shoot for, mm. first off, I'm pretty consistent with my speaking level and I have a consistent distance. So I have pretty level dynamics already. And I, when I get loud, I'll back up, but I'll shoot for three to six dB of gain reduction. Right now I'm getting half a dB of gain reduction because people probably aren't going to be listening to this in their car. They're probably not going to be listening to this while they're running. A podcast, they will be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Michael, there's there's a similar thing in our world as well about how post production does change their mix choices depending upon what the delivery format is. When I'm sure you've heard a lot about people complaining about not being able to hear the audio on some of the recent releases in recent years of which there are many, many reasons for why that is. But one of the reasons is that people are doing the mix to the standard for a theatre release when it's going to be ending up on Netflix or some other streaming service. And somebody's home uh, studio set up or, or just their TV speakers, it's a very different kind of way that that mix should be done for the dialogue and the ambience and special effects sound and music than how that mix should be done when you're viewing it in a theater. Mm -hmm. That's something that I noticed a couple years back. It's just a nightmare because some mixes are 5.1, 7.1, whatever it is. Down mix to stereo for me, it's impossible to hear the dialogue if there's any action going on. So I watch pretty much everything with subtitles now. Mm. Totally. So, Mike, I have a so, question for you with with the audiobooks and stuff, do you, I mean, I know what you, you know, you have really good mic technique and you control your own dynamics. Mm -hmm. How much do you, uh, how much compression do you use and what do you aim for as a final output? Something that's more natural or something that's more tight? Well, primarily I, I aim for the audio. Generally I aim for the ACX standard. So there's, you know, there's a very specific uh, RMS that you're supposed to shoot for. Uh, between minus 18 and minus 23. So I just shoot for minus 20, whatever that is. And I try and do minimal, uh, minimal compression. It's usually only just a little tiny bit, just to, just to capture the peaks. Uh, Cause I still like to have a little bit of that, uh, a little bit, a little bit of the dynamics available. Um, but it's, uh, I, d I don't do much. I try and do one, because it's a marathon, I try and create a chain at the beginning that will just cover like 99% of it. So, you know, the the Isotope RX stuff, I'll have it try and do my mouth clicks and try and do my room noise and, uh, you know, like deep breathing with a gate. But I try not to do too much and I just try and hit. I just aim for I just aim for the ACX standard without making it because I think for audiobooks you don't want it to sound like a podcast you don't want to sound like FM radio it should sound as unfatiguing as possible and for me that includes including the dynamics rolling off the bass but having it sound like a person like we're like we're like we're talking if it's if it sounds really like fm radio where you add a lot of compression to it it gets really fatiguing over time you just can't mm -hmm. listen to it for more than an hour and sometimes you might be listening to an audiobook for five or six hours and if you're listening to the whole thing some of those audiobooks are 25 40 hours and so it has to feel as conversational for me that's the way i i try and do it that's incredible uh mike just the the you know, it's something I never really thought about, but it makes complete sense what you're saying. And and the, from the listener's experience and the goal to for yeah. like retention and, and how that works, that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly when I yeah. when I when I coach people, they're talking mm -hmm. about like, you know, they always want to sound very authoritative and they're always boosting the bass up. They're always adding bass yeah. to try and add gravitas to the voice. I'm like, 
you got to imagine somebody's listening to this audiobook in their car. And if that subwoofer <laughs> is just, if you turn up 60 hertz and that subwoofer is just hitting them in the back for hours, they're going to punch out of that book. Mm-hmm. And you don't want to have to have them turn the, turn the bass control down on everything. Just, just make it sound like you're in the car seat next to them. Just be, make it sound natural. And I found that that's been my most successful when, when engineers or, or when directors don't give me any notes on on my sound. It's usually when I when I'm doing as little as possible to it. Yeah, Sean Milo's actually said the same thing earlier when he was here. He said that um, one of the things he does is uh, he tries to concentrate on speaking natural and making it sound like he's more having a conversation and telling you a story as opposed to trying desperately to sound interesting um, yeah. and trying to make uh, you know. And I imagine that too. I, it's it's like. You, Michael, you've worked with me. You know that I am the way I am on camera, that I am just naturally an energetic and random, and I'll just go on a Absolutely. random tangent. And then if yeah. you if we eat a whole bunch of crystals, we're going to get wacky. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that that's just that's the way that we that, that, you know, we are and try to be yourself on camera. I know that my voice is really high pitched. I know it's really awkward and I know I don't help it by backing off on the microphone. But the thing is, I don't care. I like to do, you know, I, I like to just sound natural. I like to sound more the way, the way that um, that I sound, and then I'm going to do the same typical thing of compress the crap out of it, but, which but is am- making am- it not sound natural though. But but what's amazing to me, Alan, is when I listen to your voice. I mean, you have such, you know, you have a lot of diaphragm control, and I think you have a lot of strength, and you can feel that you're coming from your gut, you know, with it. And you know, a million years ago before I did sound, I was singer songwriter. I did vocal training and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, your stuff sounds amazing. And yes, Alan is absolutely right. You know, it's his, you know, he's got a very energetic and pleasant persona to be around in a workplace. And yeah, he's going to be, you know, he's, and, and it energizes you, Alan, you know, that's the great, one of the nice things about working with you is, is you, you energize, you know, the department. So I've always appreciated that. Ah, thanks, man. Banjo, uh, it was funny when uh, when Banjo came to visit me because I he he normally is like in bed by like nine o'clock and he's up early and I was up early and he was up and, and he and we were both up late when he came to visit for for a few days. And I just we were constantly doing one thing or another. And it was and and it was it was it was actually kind of funny because uh, Banjo, when I first met him in person last year, one of the things that he said is, uh, I kind of, you know, you are the same way you are, but kind of seeing you in person, I kind of changed my opinion a little bit uh, because you see when you spend all day with someone, it's kind of. Well, Alan is the exact same person that you see on the videos. There's there's zero difference. It's just 24 hours a day. (laughs) Oh, yeah. He's I can. Yes. Alan extra. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> By the way, there's a good question from ThinkBase. I guess you'll get to it um, eventually. I'm slowly clicking the okay. buttons. Uh, if if there's, I mean, there's actually a couple of questions that I've actually froze on the screen, and I'm going to come back to them because um, there's some things I want to uh, answer. I'm just trying to get. I can, I can slowly work my way down through there, <laughs> but um, and we're getting we're getting close to that. As a matter of fact, if you want to tell me where it is, real quick, I'll just put it up on the screen and you can answer it real quick. Where is it? Oh, think the, base. The think see. base one. It's a starred one. Oh, it's up at the top. Yes, it's starred because I'm going to come back to it. Oh, oh nice. okay, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that's the reason why. I'm tr- just I'm just trying to get more don't, current. Don't, don't skip anybody though. You know, you can read them all. Yeah, if there's, I'm trying to put things up there long enough to mm-hmm. fully read. Uh, Heil Finn or Super Sure Fifty Five. I have no idea. Good question. I don't know either. There's, there's a, there is a dynamic Sure 55S, and you know the the dynamic that looks like the Elvis microphone. But maybe that's what he's talking about. Yeah, never use the Heil Finn. The 55 I would do is sure for sure. Yeah, I think I which used, is I think I did a video uh, between the comparison. I think it, Mike, you did. I think yeah. It was a it was a, they were both on loan to me, so I don't have strong memories of it. But I I have a recollection that the preference it, of the people who listened to it was that the the Hal Finn um, mm. got the got the nod. Mm. I think it okay. sounds more compressed. Like I think it's uh it's got a um it's got like a more radio feel to it. So if you're looking for natural, I don't think that's it. But the Hal Finn had a I think that's sort of the Hal sound. It sounds more more compressed for lack of a better 
for lack of a better word, it's got a. It's almost like V shaped. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is the one James Hetfield uses from Metallica? That's the Sure That's the 55, sure. right? Yeah. Okay. One of these, one of these guys. Yeah. Right here. Oh, there it is. If I can hide my eyes, we'll see. No. It, oh, did it? It yeah, did yeah. it. It did it. Hey. In the short history video, oh. only that Chris <laughs> Channel, they talk about the history about that a little bit with the Unidines, and they talk about the capsules, and it was a really amazing video. If you haven't watched that, Michael, go check it out. You're going to hear a lot about the SM7B and the SM7, but you'll have a new found respect of it when you when you do. The the prop master on my show, we got a Unidine, a, an, an original 1950s something, and um, tried to make it work, but... All right, this question has come I, up a I couple of one, times. I, I bought one from the from the 50s. Um, mm-hmm. I bought one, and the first time I plugged it in, I accidentally had Phantom on, oh, and it no. killed it. Killed oh, it. Oh, no. And, 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 Mike, it had that switch, like the high, the low, medium, high, like where you could change the impedance. And yeah. It, yeah. Yep. Now, did you just cut off the quarter, the, the quarter inch and put an XLR? Or what? Uh, or was it a... I no, it had a. I bought it. There was a. It's in the other room, but I have a vague recollection that it had a special connector. Hmm. That I, and I had a. There was a cord. Torsal am, 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 amphenol. I think it was amphenol. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I and I, I went and I went on eBay and I got that cable and I plugged it in and uh, I heard. Zzz, and it's nothing. Uh, wow. I was like, you knew instantly oh. what it was. But mine, I, mine, they you were they had white labeled that microphone, so mine was actually from another brand. It was um, mm-hmm. like Stromberg or something like that. But it was mm-hmm. it was sure made them for this other mm-hmm. company. It looks exactly the same. The only thing that was different was a different color um, uh, windscreen under the grill. So mine mm-hmm. was uh, had this like red burgundy color, and I think the the shores were black. Under? Well, they actually talked about that in the video, in, in Curtis's video. The historian yeah. talked oh, yeah. about I haven't seen some, it. some, some, some. Mm. Oh, you should go watch it before we say anything more. I will. Um, just go watch it because you're you'll be like, wow. I will. He, he I will. shows video. He shows pictures, not video, but he shows pictures. He talks about things. It's an amazing, amazing on, on YouTube. He shows yeah, it's, it's Curtis Judd audio. Things? Curtis awesome. Judd audio. Just look look at it. It's like in the past couple of weeks. He interviewed the historian Ed Shore. It's awesome. I'm. I, that's. Awesome. I will I will definitely watch it. Okay, let's go ahead and answer a couple of oh, What was it? What was the what was did they did they say what they talked about with the color? Did the color Yes, mean I'm something? gonna make you watch the video. Gosh darn it. Uh all right, NT one or King B two. I've never heard of King B two, but I have an NT one and I NT1. love that thing. That's what you used last year, I think, on the Epic live stream. King oh, B two the King B two is um great, but it's enormous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's great. I mean, it's great for the price. If if the if price is a consideration, then King B two all the way. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think that the I think the NT one is probably a, a more versatile long term. Like I think isn't the doesn't the King B have a proprietary shock mount so that if you if you, does if you break it, it's you you're limited in your options. Yes. Whereas the NT one is going to be easier to put a shock mount on it. I think it's easier to. There's other things that's and it's just more. Even though it's a big mic, the NT one is still reasonably big. It's more no. diminutive compared to the the King B two. It's, it's also heavier. I mean, the King B is is, is, a, is a beast. Um, one of the things I did is I looked at the specifications when I reviewed uh, the King B two, and I looked at the difference between the the King B one and the King B two. I think, and this is just speculation, that uh, some of the, the the difference between the two of them is in parts availability. Um, I think that because of the part shortage and stuff like that, I think some of these microphones, they they could not get the exact sound to sound right for whatever reason. Um, maybe there was, a, you know, you know, like, uh, for example, Michael, you'll appreciate this. Electrosonics, you know, at the um, Mixer Mixer recently told us that they had to, because of the part shortage, redesign something so that way it still performed the same way with alternate parts that were readily available. And that's one of the things that, that Gordon told us at the that the Mixer's Mixer. And I think that a lot of microphone companies ran into that too because um, Tom Buck did a, v, uh, a video where he talked about the old school Yetis versus the new school Yetis. Mm-hmm. And he opened it up and looked at it and there were some differences. Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, and, and, and I think that part of that that we run into on a lot of these different microphone manufacturers, if they have a winning combination, they don't necessarily want to change it. So they might all of a sudden say, well, we don't have any more to, to release. And that's kind of what happened with the uh, the King B two, um, 
and at the same time, I'm sorry, with the King B. And so right now on the market, you can still get the King B or the, I'm sorry, the worker B one and the worker B two. Yeah. And, but considering that the price difference is only 10. And to me, the fact that the worker B two doesn't come with a shock mount and that it doesn't come with a windscreen built into it and all the custom, you know, the, the B themed, everything is gone. To me, it's a no brainer. Go for the one over the two. Plus, it also sounds better, in my opinion. I think that the, there, there is changes that were made. If you look, some of the differences are ever so slightly, like with regards to the diaphragm. I think it went from like 25 to 24 mill millimeters or something like that. I think there's one spec that makes it like the noise performance is 1.5 dB uh, higher on the, the Worker B2. Little bitty things like that I don't think are a huge deal breaker. But they, the, the King B1 to the King B2 is the same, in my opinion, as the changes between the Worker B1 and the Worker B2. They have the kind of the same tweak, the same changes. Like there was a component that was part of the solid state system and that they couldn't get that exactly right. That's my opinion. But so I, I agree recall, with you. Alan, that the, the, the company changed hands between that version too. It went from like yes. Fender to Turtle Beach or something like that. They, Do I have that right? Gibson, Gibson? Gibson. to Independent. <clears throat> Then Turtle acquired Beach. by Turtle Correct. Beach. Yeah. So they're Good probably night, driving down. They're probably driving down costs in manufacturing with a larger company too. So yeah. uh, that would be durability, long term dur durability, uh, would be maybe a, a question about the internals. I don't know if they're they're making them cheaper. I don't know. I don't well, know. I'm guessing they were just trying to move a lot of inventory with the King B1 because I I don't imagine they sold that well initially, but they were originally three hundred and fifty bucks. bucks yeah. Yeah. So when when they drop down to a hundred, just Pull like off the shelf. this is amazing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and it at that point when it was a hundred bucks, I would say, why would you buy the AT twenty twenty? I think this sounds right. so much better. But yeah. at a hundred, yeah. it's twice the price of the AT twenty twenty now. It's it's not even it's it's a different category of microphone really. Mm -hmm. yeah. We we have a note from the uh, custom uh, one of the customers with the King of the king b1 and they, they asked him what he thinks uh what he thinks that king b is going to need in the second version to be to be good and and this is what he said you're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules <laughs> yeah sorry yeah it's very like always a, coming uh, through Barry. with the great yeah, advice yeah. that's Barry. that's an ideal uh, wonderful <laughs> bit of uh an ad to that I wish I had that voice, man. I wish I had that voice. You do. Man, I'm not even close. <laughs> I'm not even close. No, but I, I personally feel like the amount of strain and work that I've put the NT1 through makes me just immediately want to recommend it. Like I, I've, you know, tried out the King B2 and the one, and they're they're solid microphones, but I just like I. I gotta, I gotta go NT1, you know. Well, I, have, I mean, I have a, I have an NT1 from the. Uh, I don't know when did Bandrew, Do you know the history when they started making? I have the white body the, one. The, I, think it was like I think I think we have the same same version. The, they started in the nineties. I think what? they got sued by Neumann because they had the same head basket as the U eighty seven, and then they revised it. And that was the the late nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah. It might still I mean it still oh, works. It's, it's great. I mean it's hard hard not to recommend. Who knows if they've if they've driven down their manufacturing costs? I cause because they've been through a lot of revisions internally. <laughs> it's all all uh, automated though. That's how they've done it. It's it's all they've invested so uh, heavily in input. automation. Go ahead, sorry. David. He's running a delay on the other side of the world. <laughs> I, I don't think he can hear it. One of the things I, I was going to say earlier when we were talking about price of, of different products, um, one thing that people overlook... Uh, the, uh, the, hi, the, yeah, sorry, like my one, it hasn't crashed yet, but it does jerk is. a little bit, so I'm not quite sure whenever there's a gap in conversation or not. <laughs> yeah, so I'm talking also from the future, so, you know, that time travel thing is it's a little tricky. But yeah, I remember reading the history about Rode because I was, you know, keep going. <laughs> You're running you such it, a bro. delay. <laughs> oh no! It's like a minute. Got a message Dang, in there. Dang, dude. David, you'll you'll hear us 
in a, in a moment. I was quiet waiting for you to talk. You suddenly started talking and then you started talking over me. So I stopped and it's just, there's such um, a delay yeah, going I, on. He's, he's, yeah. I was just saying, um, I was following the history of Road at one point because, um, I, He's in some like it. serious history talk, and then he sees us just laughing, <laughs> right? Oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, poor guy! Disconnect and reconnect, please, David. Let's try this. Yeah, uh, you'll you'll do that in about five minutes, of course, when you finally hear this. But hey, um, hey, it might guys, actually help I'm, you. I'm gonna it, the. Uh, it's hit the hour for me. I'm going to run. Okay. It was good. Thank great you. Great seeing you, Michael. I really great. enjoyed. Thank you, Alan, and everyone. Happy New Year, bro. Yeah. It's great seeing you on, man. Appreciate great hanging talking out with, with you, you guys. Michael. And yeah, man. And and have fun. Happy New Year, Michael. Stream. Be well. Okay. Great See meeting you. you. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick, I will, I will go ahead and say the thing that I was talking about. I think David's frozen on the screen now. No, he just jumped to life. Um, one of the things I always tell people is that when it comes down to products that – you 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 have to apply a value of different things. Like you can get the cheapest components you possibly can. You could assemble that in the cheapest possible way and then sell it cheap. But if you take those cheap components and you shipped them on a boat over to Antarctica and built them in a factory there, you would have to sell them at Norman Neumann prices if you sold them in America to turn a profit. So part of the reason I think Road is has been so successful is because they have all the automation in house. Because they are, are are in relatively speaking, they're not far away from some of the components that you would get, and not just the garbage components that are that are in China that we're talking about with like newer microphones. They're able to get the good products from 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 China and every other place that makes them, and then they put them together. And because they have the factories, they're able to very easily make very good quality product right there and then when they send it out there the cost the, the the difference in the australian dollar versus the u.s dollar is like what 60 cents to the dollar or something like that so the the cost would be a tremendous even with the with the shipping in bulk back up to america it's still that's one of the reasons why it's so in, inexpensive because road is great quality for what you what you get and so I would say definitely go NT1. That stability, the way that they constantly maintain, you know Road as a company isn't going anywhere. Um, unfortunately, Neat doesn't respond to, to messages when I send them uh, very often because I did ask them if they wanted to, to have any part of the Epic live stream. They didn't respond to me. I sent messages and said, hey, do you, you – know, and I've asked them questions, and they don't respond. So I don't know if the, if they've, if the person that – my contact over there is no longer there and my email is going to the abyss – I don't know what their story is. All I do know is that the NT1 is solid as a rock. It's not going yeah. anywhere. It's already been in a couple of revisions over the course of time, and I would say go with that. It sounds great. It's a very, very neutral-sounding microphone, and it makes a lot of people happy. It sounds great. Yeah. So. Yeah. And to, to f add on to that, when you're buying something, customer service is something that you need to take into account Road is a company that does it better than I think anybody else. Just look at their Twitter. They are responding to everybody. They are saying, oh, you didn't get this or it broke. We'll send you a new one. Yeah. They are one of the most responsive companies out. Yeah, it, Line Level Media just said, Road's customer support is next level as well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I will say a take that I had a long time ago well, not a long time ago, but when the uh, NT1 and the NT1A went on sale, like the last few months and everything, I was like, hey, watch out. Like they might put out a new version of those microphones. And I'm going to stand by it. I'm going to stand by it. I think that, mm -hmm. that might be a good take. But Yeah, we'll see. I, I think they, yeah, you, Alan pulled up the comment about the, NT1 versus the LCT440. Completely yes. different sounding microphones. They yeah, are. that's why yeah. I stay on Com it. Completely different sound if you want the neutral or the very boosted. I have noticed a lot of people picking up the 440. Yeah, that, I've seen that a lot of people talking about it too. I've constantly recommended videos of testing out the 440. Um, real quick here, I really don't have a whole lot of opinions about the Rode Video Mic Go 2. I think you mean the go-to wireless, I guess. I don't know. Or, the, so or the, do you mean video mic? 
So the yeah, the VM might be a different thing. I I've tested it, but I but he might mean the wireless. I'm not sure, but I just, I just researched. Oh, sorry. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead, Chris. You go. Oh, I just researched the Rode Wireless Go Two, and that ha the, people spoke highly of that. But For there's a competitor called is something that you need to take into account. There's a <laughs> there's a competitor called DJI Mike. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I bought that, and I just used it. And so far, I didn't try the wireless part. I just clipped one to my shirt, mm -hmm. and I was having a chat with my mom about, you know, her mom and, yeah. uh, you know, my grandparents. And she had one clipped to her, so we each had one clipped. And it sounds nice, <laughs> records 24-bit, 48 kilohertz, yeah. and records for seven hours. And, and anyway, my first try, it worked really well, the DJI. Yeah. Well, there are videos online of people using the DJI mic on the Action 3, and it eliminates wind noise very effectively, much better than than other mics do like it when people are on skateboards going down a road. So it's it's definitely got a place. It's not pro by any means. It's still very good. The one, the microphone that's built in uh, to the Pocket 2, I can tell you right now, is garbage. Uh, it just it's, it's the same kind of thing. It just modulates really weird. It doesn't sound great to me. I did a couple of tests, and you hear all the chirps and stuff from cheap modulation. Hmm. It's just not great, but the um, I think that the the um, DJI mic is totally different. Uh, David, I do notice that you're back over there. I turned you up a moment ago, and we heard talking in the background. So I'm going to try you again. Okay, it's much better. It's recovered. So, um, DJI mic is so much better than Rode 2 Wireless. Got more features. Okay, well, cool. Well, there you go. Uh, real quick, let's go back over here to the question that you were talking about earlier. Quick, uh, quick question, which people never give a definitive answer to preamp running into the interface mic line input or is bad or uh, doable DBX286 uh, DBX into my channel one of Rodecaster one first gen or Rodecaster Pro first gen? Well, yeah. you don't want to run line level into mic level because you're, you're going to be much more likely to clip. Now, as far as the DBX, you could attenuate it at the the back end, the the last step. It has a master volume, right? Yeah, the last knob on the right. Yeah, so you could attenuate it to get it more attuned to the mic input, but then you're going to be getting maybe a little bit of coloration from the focus right, but the focus right's kind of neutral. I just, it's not going to be optimal. Yeah, so I teach this in my course. I can get a plug in here. Um, yes, uh, get it. No, my my course. I um, so he, so here's the deal. You're starting with a microphone. First thing you need to do with a mic signal is crank it up with a preamp from mic level to line level. So on your DBX two eighty six, that's what you're going to do. Your mic goes into your DBX two eighty six. Oh. You put up your preamp so it's a good level. And then when you come, you can come out of the 286 at line level. And then what you do on the interface, which is the roadcaster, is you turn the preamp down pretty much all the way. If not like five, maybe 5% 5 out of 100, obviously. But so the second preamp, if you ever have to run two preamps, one into the other, the first one does the work. The second one does no work. Mm -hmm. And that way... It won't be distorted, and it'll still go in at a solid level. Solid level to record at. Chris, you can yeah. probably answer this. Isn't it also that you should be going? That you should not be using the XLR jack on the focus, right? You should be using the quarter inch in the combi jack. You should be going uh, into the center. Isn't that right? I I misspoke. He's using a Rodecaster one, which just has the XLR input. It's not combi jacks. No, the the Gen one only has XLR, and the focus right does have mic level and quarter inch line level so if it was the focus right yeah use line level but uh, i misread it i thought he had the focus right he has the gen uh, one roadcaster uh, oh, okay. okay one thing also to keep in mind is that once you convert from mic level to line level you don't want to go back you do not want to output fair. out a piece yeah. of gear that basically attenuates it back down to mic level just for you to boost it back up later that's one of the big no-nos you don't do that's one of the big ways of the, you having double preamp noise, if not more. That's that conversion you're going to go. If it's not done right, you're going to end up having all kinds of artifacts, even in analog audio. It's going to be modulated weird. It's going to have saturation issues. There's going to be all kinds of issues that sometimes will that you'll run into. And so you have to be very careful whenever you you change your levels. 
And so if there is a way for you to go out of the DBX-286S into something else, mic, uh, a mic level and line level, take the line level. If that's not an option, then maybe look at that at the approach that Chris said of, of lowering your, your preamp level all the way. So that way it's not doing any of the work, as he said. And one of the things that we run into in the, in the pro sound world is if we ended up using like what, what we were talking about earlier, the sound devices MM1, the mic, the uh, line level out of that is very hot. And so if you take that sim signal and you run it inside of a transmitter, you have to turn the transmitter way down. And even then it's a very, very hot signal, <clears throat> even when you do that. So one of the things we always do is we would add an inline uh, 10 decibel pad to try to take that down a little bit so you can turn up the gain a little bit more on the transmitter before you transmit it out. So that way it's basically attenuating the line level out of the, which is pro pro wireless plus four, a, a, pro, a pro line level out plus four dB. I think, so, I, I don't know about the wireless world where, where you are, but I believe that there are, uh, there are, there are line attenuators that will take you from line to mic level um, for like in the, in the home studio situation too, if, if, I'm not mis if I'm not mistaken. I've never used one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, By the way, and everything we're talking about is called gain staging from yes. going from thing to thing, managing Absolutely. the level, gain staging. Yeah, that's correct. Very good. Good point. Um, well, quick, Chris, I mean, that was really good information. Where, ca where can we find <laughs> more? Um, are you referring to pod? Oh, thank you. Podcastengineeringschool.com. <laughs> oh, th yeah. perfect. <laughs> When I hear you have something called semesters sessions, oh. when is the next semester start? Wow, like ten days from now, actually, it's amazing. Oh, wow, yeah. is the amazing. registration still open? Is registration hey. still open? It is. Yeah, there you go. What do you yeah. know about that? Hey. I gotta say, uh, Chris, I was watching your videos the other day, and uh, you literally made me want to buy. An RE three twenty again. I reviewed one a while ago, but I was like, "Hey, like, <laughs> I think I gotta get one again." So I did. Hey, I got it. Yeah, Sweet. and so it's, it's because of you. So thank you for making me spend that money. <laughs> but dude, hey, but like, I did get a good deal on reverb. Like, it's like two hundred bucks. Two hundred bucks for that sound. Hey, that's good. Sweet. It's a good sound for two hundred bucks. Very nice. Yeah, love it. Uh, real quick here, there's one more question that uh, is is from a long time ago. Dane, you're still here in the chat, but I wanted to at least address this. Um, I also addressed this like nine hours ago or something like that, but uh, might as well mention it again because very few people are still on. But here's the the thing about this. One um, service that True Audio offers, if you go to trueaudio.com, they're one of the sponsors. Click the link down in the, the description if you want to check it out. If you click on insurance, they now offer something called True Shield. Now, I'm going to do a video about it because I want to sign up with them. It is designed for people that are in pro sound, people that have maybe a sound package that might be $80,000, $90,000, a $200,000 package, something like that. And it's affordable insurance because Glenn True is a pro sound mixer who also is a company owner. So he said, what we really need is this. And he he pushed hard enough and, and went through the right channels to find someone that is actually great, Andrew. Um, so he went to it went to, and actually found someone, uh, a, 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 an insurance company that was willing to take it on. And so you can go to True Shield uh, and get insurance through them. And I think the minimum policy that they will write is like forty two thousand dollars. But it is, or at least that's what they told me. And I need to verify all this before I put it out in a video, as I said. But I think it was like something like twenty one dollars a month for forty two thousand dollars worth of coverage. And they don't, and they, and, and one of the things, and that's like, they also have extra things in there too, that if you uh, want to do add-ons and stuff like that, you can, but if you have, I think that they're missing out on a big opportunity with content creators. So I'm going to, I told, um, I was at, at the Mixer's Mixer, and when I heard about True Shield, I was like, wait a second, and, and Glenn was across the way, I walked right over to him, and I felt rude, uh, rude about this later, but I said, I said, Glenn, do you have a second? He said, yeah, pulled him aside, and I said, you are missing an opportunity, what are you doing? And he just like looks at me. And I said, I'm in the content creation world. People who have home studios that are doing this full time, that have thousands of dollars worth of gear, and that's their livelihood. What happens if something like that happens? Tell me more about True Shield. Because if there's a way to insure your gear for only 20 or 30 bucks a month, that is something you really should do. I mean, imagine spending 250 or $300 a year 
I mean, some of you guys are obviously making, making, you know, you could make that on one or two courses. You can make that in, in easily a month of your, of your affiliate links. I lose money every single month. So it's like, you know, with all the crap spending I do, but it's, it's like a lot of, a lot of us could easily do that. A lot of people, a lot of us could easily do that Welcome and you should. Life. Yeah. So Danny, anyway, I want to uh, at least address yeah. that. And mention that. that actually sounds amazing if the if the limits were lower for many people but dan uh, you may also be able to contact your homeowner's insurance and get a rider for a high value piece of equipment happens all the time for things like jewelry where you can get a specific rider for a specific item so if you do and go by that lct 1040 you may be able to get a rider to cover that specific piece of equipment for from all sorts of calamity and and i will tell you from looking into this if you're doing a lot of gear and it's not a corporate policy, they will request receipts, valuations. They will request a lot of information to, I, I think a receipt of a recent purchase will be sufficient, but if it's more than two or three years old, they'll have to have an appraiser come in and value what you were trying to insure. So if you have 500 mics, it can be a process. Yeah. So one thing that I, I don't know if this is, it's a little bit on subject, but I uh, was in touring bands before and everything. And one of the things that happened to us is we like would have equipment be stolen. And uh, because I had renter's insurance, like it, it didn't even matter that it wasn't in my home. They actually covered it. And I was like actually outstanding. I don't know if like this was just a great situation for me or if a lot of people have had this happen, but, um, dude, like renter's insurance saved my butt. So it was great. Hmm. I, I had a, we somehow snuck onto a show at not the whiskey. It was the, was it the Soma in San right. Diego? Okay. Yeah. And, and at that show, somebody stole my pedal board. And I've never replaced any of those pedals. It had Dang, it. Dude. It took me months to save up and buy the Electro Harmonics Memory Man Deluxe or something. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, yeah, yeah. and I loved that thing, and I still That's haven't right. replaced it. But it got stolen, <laughs> and I didn't have coverage on it. Yeah. Bummer. So please, if if True does that. Make a video and, and I, be... I'm actually going to do it. I'm going to do it. It just is going to take a little bit of time. Um, and part of the reason is because I'm not on a show right now. And I have plenty of things that I need to do videos on. I'm backed up in. Um, there's a couple of things like I mentioned that the video I have on Monday is doing a real life test of the Adobe podcast uh, AI software to see how well it works at farther distances. And it's freaky at, at what it can do. And it's a, it also is a great way to think about where the future is going. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the video, but all you have to do is just, you know, it's, it's going to be a video that's released, I think on, what is it? Uh, January 2nd or something like that. Um, so I got to shoot that video, but I've already shot the location stuff and I play, I showed Andrew and it's freaky. It's freaky how good it is. And uh, it's only in Genesis stage right now. It's a beta. And I imagine that they're going to be selling it at some point in the future once it's more polished. And I think right now they're using the algorithm to kind of tweak whatever's uploaded and they're trying to learn from it. But I definitely think that in the future, it's going to be something to keep an eye on. Um, but yeah, there's some. Um, yeah, there's there's. I, I've been on this kick recently about essentially there's no reason there's a very minimal reason why anybody can't create content and get good sound. When this comes out, it's going to be solidified because you could have an NW700 plugged directly into your computer's motherboard, run it through this, it will fix it up. Wow. It's It was wow. that crazy good. The sample that I heard outside <laughs> of Allen's, my buddy was going to record a podcast with three people in an untreated space. He's like, I have no room for mics. I don't know what to do. He just took a Zoom H5 with the stereo mics, dumped it in the center of the table. Sounded exactly as you would expect. Echoey, just garbage. He sent me the processed audio through the AI podcast thing. It sounded like an SM7B right on somebody's face. Yeah. 
It was bonkers. Wow. It is. I'm gonna. I'm looking right now. Uh, would you be okay if I showed the the video that I showed you from um, our shoot on your planet? Yeah. Well, let's see if I can find the AI process version of that. Um, I'll see if I can so find this, that. So this this thing is it inside of Adobe Audition? This AI thing you're talking about? It's not Audition. It's a separate thing. It's okay. it's called Adobe Podcast uh, Beta. But uh, I have a video coming about it very soon. Let me see Sweet. if I can. I'll see if I can find this this um, example. Where is? Oh wait a minute! I just saw the word. Oh, there it is. Let me double check that this is right. Okay. Now this is. I'm going to share share this. Oh crap! Press the wrong button. Um, you can't really hear the raw audio here, but uh, oh crap! This video mm. didn't do it before. Let me see. It's probably not going to play correctly. <clears throat> Let me try this again. I'll try it a different way. But it was freaky good because the audio up there, first of all, on on the planet that we were shooting on, Andrew, it was just getting hit really hard. And so what I what I did is I ran it through, and you could barely hear us in the background talking a little bit. So I'll do this as an example, and you will hear in this and just the beginning of this, you'll hear our voices. So turn up your audio level if you want to and listen to it. You'll hear our voices as it you know you can imagine it fighting really hard to try to pull out our audio level but it attenuated the the background wind to almost non-existent and it really did process out a lot of the stuff and our voices get a little little weird in places and robotic because of all the background noise but um anyway i'm gonna play this right now and let you hear it okay so what you do is put your hand in here um cut cut all right all right, go ahead and slap it, please. All right, try it again, please. Let's try this again. Try not to drop it. <laughs> okay. Here. All right, let's wait. Oh, my bad. <laughs> so that's where the video cut. This is the raw footage of us actually, laughing. It actually Plus did it. pretty good. And it pretty good thing right there. Yeah, it went fine. So you can see how, how we're blowing like all over the place. What we can do now is <laughs> oh, we reset the time code though. I don't care. The time code reset. You see me in frame. So anyway, you you get an idea though. It's wow. that's kind of the, a little bit of the raw behind the scenes footage of us doing the location shoot, and that's when we kind of were learning about the damage that was taken from uh, from that. So. <laughs> it was kind of cool. It's kind of cool. It's it's a little. It sounded really weird. It sounded like we were having some issues and going through puberty. It's but, pretty scuffed. <laughs> but uh, I'll see if I can find the raw footage real quick, and I will show you the difference. Right, because um, you could. You only heard a little wind once in that video, <laughs> and it was pretty that. aggressive. And and, and, what and is that's pretty much the worst case scenario. Cameras inbuilt microphone in twenty mile an hour winds, fifteen mile an hour winds, blowing right onto the mic. Wow. Yeah, Butter, that was it. Butterfingers Bandrew. Yeah. That was it. That's exactly it. Um, let's see here. Heather nailed it, of course. Yeah, Too many see, zip fizz. The, the thing is, on my planet, <laughs> when you go outside, you don't wash your hands with soap. They just have sticks of butter that you have to rub your hands in. It keeps away all the, the critters that try to kill you. So what part of Tatooine was that? <laughs> I, I, the, the part's unknown. I can't disclose that. Okay, I found the, the raw footage real quick, and we'll watch that as a comparison. Whoops, wrong thing. So this, this, uh, where is it? I found the raw footage, and we will watch it right now. Um, edited, raw footage, all this gigabytes and gigabytes of footage. All right, here we go. And this is the original. All right, go ahead and slap it, please. Uh, try it again, please. Let's try this again. Try not to drop it. Okay. Here. All right. It actually did pretty good. Yeah, pretty good 
thing right there. Yeah, it went flying. So, what we can do now is... <laughs> wow. Oh, it reset the time code, though. Okay. The time code reset. So, you can hear the difference. You just hear a constant... <laughs> like that on the microphone. It was just a non-stop pounding of the, the, the diaphragm mat. And it was able to pull out, and you heard you heard the 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 when Banjo first says something, it was very very you know like that on the the processing, but it was able to pull out something, and it sounded close. Granted, it's really creepy and crazy, but it still worked. I can't wait to learn more about that because that I, I'm wondering how they did. Like, is it just is it like the AI artwork created? Cr creating apps now where they just take a bazillion pics from Google and analyze it and then create new ones. So like are, are they, is Adobe like scanning tons of audio to, to, to map certain things? I, I was so curious. I'm not sure. I think what it is, is it's probably tuned to hear the human voice and within the certain vocal, uh, vocal frequencies. And it's kind of the same kind of way that like Adobe RX works and how we have all these algorithms like Waves has plugins and everybody basically is making plugins. Even some of the inbuilt ones inside of DaVinci Resolve are just completely mind boggling. And, uh, uh, and Audacity, freeware. I mean, it's like, this stuff is crazy. Um, and what you can do with software and DAWs now compared to like 20 years ago. And so it's, so it's, it's, I think just the next evolution of what sound processing is. And I think it's in the very infant stages right now, but it's only going to get better I mean, right now we're talking all about gear and, and, and talking about microphones and stuff like that. It could be that we're doing that the next evolution of process of, of videos on YouTube is going to be which AI sounds cleanest. And, uh, you know, do you actually need a microphone anymore? Comparing a microphone, you know, a, 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 a $3 microphone off of, off of Wish to a $1,000 microphone if you process the $3 one using AI. You know, you're going to see all these different comparisons popping up. And it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens when these softwares and when these apps really start to be good. I, I liked David's suggestion or point. I think it's going to be really interesting once the, the tools get powerful enough to allow you to say, I want it to sound like this microphone. Mm. Modeling and stuff? Yeah, kind of just modeling no matter what microphone you're starting with. I don't know if they'll be able to do that. But that would be very impressive. That would be wild. And I don't think that it's ever going to really replace us in production sound world, David, because they, I mean, you know, if that's the case, why not just scan the actors and do use AI to shoot the entire movie? Because the, th the fact of the matter is, you can watch a movie like Star Wars, and it's still you can tell it's 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 VFX. Look back at at movies from twenty years ago that did VFX, and you're like, oh wow, that looks so. I remember being impressed. I mean, some movies like Jurassic Park are still amazing. Like the original, the OG from 1992, 94, whatever it was. Those look uh, look great. Um, but then we've also gotten into the world where now we're using, we're using VFX totally different than we used to. We're now doing things like trying to VFX everything, entire scenes. And when you do that, the, the dynamics and the physics are just not right still. Just like how deep fake still makes people's faces slide slightly. Right. At, and when they do certain expressions, it looks like they've had too much Botox. You know, it's really interesting. So. Yeah, it's amazing. Sharknado is just outstanding visual effects. It's just <laughs> next level. <laughs> but you know what? There's a lot of charm that can be in those movies. And the ones that are just really goofy. The thing is with VFX is you have to be consistent. If it's inconsistent, if like they spend their entire budget to make one piece look great and the rest of it looks like crap, then that's when you're like, oh, geez, this is terrible. Hmm. But if they make the whole movie consistently look goofy, then there's a bit of charm in it. Just like how each one of our channels, we produce content and people will know that, that like what you said earlier, you, you think your, your background is boring, but people will look at you and say, but your audio sounds great and you're, you look like you're teaching in a classroom. So it seems appropriate. And just like Audio Hayes earlier was saying that he's kind of coming at things on his channel as someone that is kind of in a big city. What can you actually produce in the real world if you have people trying to kill each other the next apartment over? Right. You know, that kind of thing. You find your 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 world and you kind of go with it. When Banju had Cheryl living down below, that was when he then we had the bullet go through his floor at some point while he was off at work. Um, but 
that was that was he had to change the way he did reviews because anytime he would turn on his guitar amp for three seconds, she'd call the landlord, uh, the 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 office. So right. he had to come up with a solution that was going to remain consistent for his reviews, but still provide quality. And you, yeah, they asked about that when you were off camera a little while ago. You want to explain what you're doing over there, Banjo? With your box of doom. Oh, yeah. So it's just an isolation cabinet. There's a vintage Celestion 30 in there. That's pretty much the standard stock guitar cab speaker nowadays. I think people are getting into others. Doesn't matter. I have my guitar amplifier up here. Run that into the box of doom. And inside of that, there's a bunch of treatment and it attenuates the signal by 30 dB. So I don't run my amp too hot. So I can play guitar and have a mic in there running through the XLR out and then record that without hearing any amplifier noise. So I don't have any issues with that. So that's why I, and it wasn't cheap. It was, <laughs> it was a lot of money. Hmm. And I had to contact the guy because I wanted... Uh, I wanted to have a USB pass through so I could test USB microphones. So we had to customize that a little bit. But Sylvester, I think is I think it was Sylvester, was amazing. Box of Doom. If you're a guitarist and you can't have loud noises, right. great, great product. I had a question for you, Mike, as far as voiceover and audio books and stuff like that. Is there any talk in the voiceover world about, you know, AI voices taking over and all that? But because I would think I, I, I my guess is that your opinion about it is that it's it'll be a long time before AI takes over because there's just the human voice is just too hard to. I, I think it's it's I think for a lot of a lot of things, it's going to be a long time before the human voice takes over unless there's like syllable by syllable, some human going through and modeling like does this need to go up to, to, to teach it to act and to understand the difference between, you know, the, if you ever read like, a, um, you know, when you read a book, the way the, the line sound is not necessarily like most of the AI sounds really flat right now. There are some companies that are out there where you can actually change the inflection. You can make it go up or you can mm -hmm. go down to try and add some acting to it. I think that part has a long way to go, but I do see, I mean, certainly if you watch enough YouTube, you hear the AI voices everywhere, everywhere now. It, that race to the bottom, that lowest common denominator where they just need a voice saying something, that that's already here. I think we're going to see a lot of it for um, nonfiction, uh, a lot of industrial use, uh, a lot of things where you have a, like a, a accessibility issues. Uh, there, I know that there were some companies out there that were working on like turning tons and tons of scientific papers or, uh, you know, uh, like PhD kind of papers, just turning those away from just the, the plain old voice that you might get with Apple to be more of the synthetic voices. I know lots of voice actors are selling synthetic versions of their voices. Mm -hmm. uh, like we saw, I saw, you know, we saw James Earl Jones go by in the, in the, in the comments, I believe he did, you know, make us allow for a synthetic ver version of his voice for the star Wars franchise. Yeah, probably. So he did. For, for, he did yeah. probably for a lot of money. I'm guessing, I'm guessing, it, but I should, it, yeah, it's not, I don't think it will be. I think that there's like this middle ground of a bunch of work that, that is going to get displaced by the combination of like mid journey, chat gpt that that all of that stuff there's going to be a whole bunch of middle that gets that just gets eaten up by by software that's that's just gonna be just type it or give a prompt and it's going to do some typing that's going to get turned into text that's going to get turned into voice it's going to get turned into imagery that it's just going to be fully automated and probably for a lot of business training and stuff like that i can see that that being the case for like fiction audiobooks i don't know if it knows how to act yet that might be a few years away but the the pace at which things are changing i couldn't say like it used to be yeah it's a decade away i mean it could be like with now GPT. we're approaching that decade <laughs> yeah i mean that gpt4 if i if 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 i wasn't being gaslit then it's supposed to have like a corpus it's like a hundred times as big as the GPT corpus to, to, for its training corpus, uh, like 1.5 trillion, uh, what do they call them? Neurons or whatever, um, uh, that it's going to be, 
I, I just can't even guess. I can't even. The, the, it's, the acceleration is so fast right now. A, a few things to keep in mind also. Microphones and AI do understand things like the acoustics and they can digitize that. What they don't have is emotion. Right. That's when expressions and that's when what you do in your performance, we know we can make our voices sound different than how we inflect and how uh, and how we are emotionally. You can tell someone over the phone is smiling. You can tell if someone over the phone is mad, not just because of their tone, but you can tell just by the, their energy level and by everything. There is a lot that we can tell by the voice and we can tell things. Uh, we dial in on tones really easily. Computers, when they learn how to do that, they'll be dangerous. But I think I don't think that that's. I think that they're trying to figure out the 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 zeros and ones and how to change it. I mean, think about how much post processing we have to do to make something sound natural. Sometimes, I mean, considering how like um, in the Mix Master Challenge, Austin, she was talking about how she would go through and had she she would have to go through and paint out and individually level things and drop out, you know, manually basically construct and artistically create the sound that they want for the cartoons in a very, very, you know, in a magnified minute. And that's what she does all day. If you can imagine that, and then imagine us trying to create an artificial voice from that, when it takes that much to make us sound good for shows now. That that's probably true. But I think, I think in the short term, the, the, the business cases that I've seen for it is for things like imagine, you know, George Clooney does an espresso ad. Right. And he you, you actually get him doing the thing, but it's in English. There, there's now like with the deep fakes and with the with the uh, with the synthetic voices and everything, you can now have him perform it in any language and the lip flaps will match and the voice will match. And he still did the one take hmm. and it will still reasonably match the emotion because it's following following that emotion. I mean, that's that's absolutely productized now. Mm -hmm. like there's, there's absolutely companies doing that now. And, you know, there's a lot of things in like the translation world where you take A to B, where you take, um, you know, the actor might do the real, quote unquote, the real actor might do take one, but then when they want to translate it in, into other languages, or if they need to add anything else to it, they'll have a stand in model and then just deep fake the actor onto it, the real actor onto it. Uh, for the, like the little parts that need to change and that, you know, actors and it's my understanding, I'm not involved in it, but it's my understanding that, that there is a lot of like licensing of your, your model licensing of your voice, that there's a, that there's some prevalence of that out there already. Pops. And so, but where it goes and where it goes in, in two, three, five years, 10 years, the, 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 the pace, the acceleration of this stuff is I between Dolly two to Dolly three to mid journey to stable diffusion. What's happened in like three years is just unbelievable how much mm -hmm. that has changed. And just if, if you think about like chat bots from two years ago to what GPT three can chat GPT can do. It's just, I don't know if you've, if you haven't created your open AI account just to do, just to interact with chat GPT, it is unbelievable. It's often wrong. Like I was having it try and help me write code the other day and it was doing a terrible job at it. But the explanations that it was using along the way to help me generate code, they were spot on. Like the mm -hmm. explanations and stuff were spot on. The code was close, but not what I wanted. It's probably me not doing the right prompts for it. But it was, it's really kind of amazing what these, what these things can do. And this, you know, it's, we're in the infancy of it. I still feel like we are really, really in the infancy of mm -hmm. it with what processing power is doing with, it's just, I can't imagine what, what we'll be seeing a decade from now, what it will be like. Let me throw something back out to you. Remember back 25 years ago when, Barely. okay. Barely. Okay. Well, um, maybe, maybe you could have remembered a little <laughs> bit longer if you hadn't had that zip fizz a little while ago, <laughs> but, but, uh, but there was, if you recall, there was a time that you that that the 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 cyber nannies existed, where there was a human that searched all day long for the most grotesque things they could find on the internet to build uh, filters so that way people wouldn't see it, so that way their kids wouldn't see it, and they sold that as a service. Then what they did is they removed people from that when the technology got good enough to do it on its own. That was twenty five years ago. Now, if I say cyber nanny, you guys nod because you're like, oh, I remember that now. 
but you might not have thought about it ever until I mentioned it just now. If I if I w- walked in the other room, I mean, the kids are probably about to go to bed, uh, or at least the older ones. But if I walked in there and asked them if they know what that is, they'd look at me really weird. Cyber nanny? What is that like? An uh, like a an internet? Is it kind of like Discord, but it's like for kids, where your kind of your speech is no, it's not, and, and you'd have to explain it. But it used to be that people had to actually search for this stuff to build blocks for it. Now, AI has been trained to do that. And now what we see from like movies like The Social Dilemma, where those algorithms can also be tweaked to throttle something or to completely kill something if it's not in the interest of whoever is in charge of that algorithm. And it's scary. Yeah. So that's the reason why I say that it's it's as soon as we're able to, if the computers are able to figure out AI to the point where there's emotion, it sounds like us, it looks like us, content creators are going to be in trouble. Just like every politician, just like every actor, all of a sudden you're going to end up, someone's going to say, oh, look at this. This Did you realize that, and they're going to t- pick the, the most, they could pick you know, someone that's legendary, Betty White, for example. They're going to say, look, did you know that Betty White was in a porno back in 1940? And people are like, what? And then they see this and they're like, holy crap, mind blown. And it's not that she actually was, it's just that they were able to recreate that with AI and people are like fascinated because it's it, because they're like, and you know what? This seems kind of real. This, you know what? I believe this now. You're going to convince people then it's going to change people's opinion and someone's going to say, I can't believe Betty White would do that. And then it's going to blow up. And it's going to be the next worst thing. I mean, so, I, I mean, you're definitely seeing that with now with a lot of the young actresses where they are, where they're being involuntarily deep faked into, into those situations. It's, yeah. it's, it's bad. Or, or you even see videos online of people of, of the guy that, um, that when, um, what was that movie? The, um, uh, the Irishman. A few years ago, they deep faked and made and de-aged everybody. Then a guy went on YouTube and he was like, you know what? This doesn't, I can do better. He did it and it looked better. And then they said, we want you to work for us. And now he's doing, uh, he's basically doing deep fakes for, for a film yeah. because yeah. that was, that was something that he did better than the guys that are spending millions and millions of dollars in VFX. And this is a guy in his home studio. And so that was like mind blowing for a lot of people. Yeah. 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 So, you know. Wow. Um, Andrew, I think that as we push later and later, you're probably going to want to drop out at some point. I think we should go ahead and do your hour, your second hour of sponsorship. Okay. So, so yeah. yet again. Uh, before before you do that, I just want to say us microphone and audio YouTubers are safe from this until the AI is able to create a robot that has a speaker that plays a human voice and sounds natural in front of a microphone to offer a demonstration. So we're safe for the time being until it does go full Skynet. Because somebody said YouTubers won't be in big trouble. I agree. But we we have an additional layer of protection. Well, one thing I will say is think about how many people have had old videos come out. YouTubers that like 10 years ago, they made a racial slur. And all of a sudden they're like, cancel, that's it. Even people now that said things back 30 years ago when that footage now suddenly pops up and it was it was not acceptable back then, but it wasn't something that was going to cancel someone back then because it's like, well, it was never really a good thing, but people did it, you know, back in the 50s or the, did it back in the 40s. All it takes is someone finding old video footage now to, some, to totally cancel and end someone. So imagine when someone again decides to say look this was a video that was deleted and it was put on on youtube back in 2018 remember back in the old days and that was a video it's all of a sudden like 2030 and someone doesn't like you and they could easily say look i found this old video footage and it looks very convincing because they went back and looked at your footage in that era and they modeled after you and suddenly it looks kind of freaky scary and suddenly you're canceled and you can say all day long that's not my video i never did that And they're gonna say i don't believe you i'm looking right at it it's real (laughs) It's like it's not real i was there i was there in that era and i know that was never a thing right. or they'll they'll put you on top of like you know urban climbing of the the statue of liberty and they're like look i didn't do that and all of a sudden you're gonna have the police knocking on your door when did you do this i didn't you know <laughs> or something you know there's anything can happen um and that's the scary thing that we just have to constantly be on our toes about okay Andrew. Uh, let's go ahead and because I don't know if you remember what your request was for the second. I think uh, I think so. And yes, audio test kitchen. Thank you. Audio test kitchen. Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, okay. So 
Oh, wait a minute. That was wrong. Hold on a second. I have to remove this one because this is not the right video. That was, I was about to play the non-correct version. By the way, guys, I think I have to punch out. I was just going to say the, the same thing. I got I to gotta punch out too, but what are we going to do? What are, you, are you guys going to be okay? Yeah, you guys going to be all right? Yeah, we'll be fine. I could stick it out. I mean, I got up at 2.30 a.m. in, uh, in, in uh, New Jersey, but... And now I'm in Colorado go. at 9 p.m. But <laughs> wait, go, go sleep. Zip fizz. Okay. What about it? Oh yeah. Um, no, no. Yeah. I have another some, one. But... Have another one. Uh, do you want to at least stay around before you bail? Do you want to see what band you wanted to have? Let's do yeah. it. Okay. So Let's here is what band you requested for his entry or his intro segment for his podcast sponsored hour of the Epic live stream. This next hour of the Epic live stream is sponsored by Podcastage. Podcastage.com. If you want consumer audio reviews, go to podcastage.com. I'm Dr. Amber Brown, standing here in the parking lot at Twin Pines Mall. It's Saturday morning, October 26, 1985, 118 a.m., and this is temporal experiment number one. The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, I want to do it with some style. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is the problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? <coughs> Marty. He's in a 46 Ford. We're in a DeLorean. He'd cut through us like we're tinfoil. Ha! I'm sure that in 1985, plutonium's available at every local drugstore, but in 1955, it's a little hard to come by. <laughs> Great Scott! Well, there are plenty worse places to be than the Old West. I could have ended up in the Dark Ages. They probably would have burnt me at the stake as a heretic or something. Marty! You're going to have to do something about those clothes. You walk around town dressed like that, you're liable to get shot. Well, then tell me, future boy, who's president of the United States in 1985? The justice system works swiftly in the future now that they've abolished all lawyers. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Oh. That means that your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. Oh, anyway, that was so good. Wow. So that's what he requested. And so just to make it official, <laughs> we have to have the podcast's logo up there on the screen right now. All right. There we go. And Fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, I should have waited one additional minute before I played it because guess who just decided to show back up? <laughs> oh, Curtis! you are kidding me. <laughs> did did Curtis see it? I saw it. I okay, saw good. it. Okay, good. I, I first, think well, I think you saw I, the whole thing. I, well, I just just uh, got into the studio here and I and I saw... <laughs> I saw the white-haired crazy guy, and I was like, "What is going on?" And then I was, "Oh, okay, got it." It's it's banjo. I'm getting my money's worth. <laughs> yes, and you know because this is a charity live stream, I'm going to I'm going to be a little bit stricter about the guidelines. I think next year, I think that one was recorded at five thirty a.m. Uh, you know, a few wow. hours ago. And and that's the reason why editing together these and stuff like that and the outro segment, which I'm sure you'll also remember at the end of your hour, uh, that was a lot of fun too. Hey, listen, I thought that when I donated, you were just going to put my logo in the corner. Then you said, what do you want me to say? Oh, that's it? it there's I, I, nothing I, else you want me to do? I was saying, you know, if you, you know, what would you, I asked everybody who was going to be a sponsor for the Epic live stream. I said, hey, what would you like? What would you like to have happen? And some people were like, oh, yeah, I would like you to just say some stuff about from the heart, whatever you feel. I'm like, all right, cool. Some people would say, can you play our video? Some people would say, can you do this or this or this? I'm like, sure, no problem. And then Banjo says, what humiliation. He has, I mean, he has, he has uh, creative control. And then he, I, I, I saw him like, oh. <laughs> and I, I just, I saw the, and I was like, you know what? For charity, I don't get, you know, I'm, I'm, I used to be an actor. I'm, I'm not like, humiliated by things. I don't care. I'm, you can't, you can't, you know, have me be embarrassed by that. Mm. So to me, it's fun. It's fun in games. If I thought it was going to be humiliating to create something like that, then I wouldn't have done it. But there you go. That's great. So, <laughs> so much fun. That's awesome. So anyway, yeah. um, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you much, uh, so much, Mike. Y'all are both, uh, Yep, it's they been were. so much fun. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm really, uh, it's really been great. I wish you guys all uh, just a fantastic new year. Yeah, you as absolutely. well, Mike. Thank you, yes, guys. Thank you. Be so well. Happy new year. Be well. Be well. All right. Have fun. Enjoy the rest. Go out with a bang. Oh, before you both leave, hey, Mike. Hey. What? Where where could we find what you do? Uh, you can find me on YouTube under the name Podcastage. A booth junkie. Booth junkie. <laughs> booth junkie. Booth junkie. Come on over to Booth Junkie and watch a video that I haven't put out now in three weeks or something like that. Come on over. 
<laughs> there you go. Come on over. And Ooh, how about you, Chris? You want to do a plug also? Yes. Go to YouTube. Go to Podcastage. That's my channel. <laughs> Jeez, Jeez well, Louise. Well, you're really getting your money's worth out of it with some really yeah. good endorsement there, uh, Andrew. I did a plug earlier. I'm good. <laughs> but thank you, Alan. Thank you, Bandrew. Curtis, good to see you. Mike, great to see you, man. Good oh, he's you, going Paul. for more zip Oh, round two. Oh, great trade. Straight in. Oh, my. Grape seed extract. That's what I was hoping for. Grape seed extract. We, we, we have trained him well, Curtis. Oh my God! He's, it was empty, ready. and I just got a little tiny bit of the dust. Yeah, it tastes awful. Ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> just awful. Yeah, he, drink some more. They'll t- they'll take care of it. Oh, thank you. Now the funny thing is, is is Curtis also has one. Is it his or tequila? Curtis has. I don't have a tequila. <laughs> Not here. Wait, mm. Curtis, you have a Zip Fizz with you right now? Um, he has everything at his desk. What are you talking about? Oh, where, that's right. Where, where did I put that? Um, Beware. You're not going to be able to go to sleep, though, right? Is that what it does? Oh, no. Oh, my. He's not going to do it. I'm sure. Oh. 100 milligrams mm. of caffeine. Limit two per day, Alan. Limit two per day. Two per hour? What? Yeah. Shake well. Limit two tubes per day. What is what a if day? You put... What if you like put a bunch of little tubes into a bigger tube? How many of those bigger tubes? So two tubes. It, it doesn't big... specify tubes. So size. two tubes. Two tubes. See, the, the fact is, between ages of zero and ten, Alan, you didn't drink any Zip Fizz, so you have all those days mm. to two a day. You, you I also you I also didn't really discover it until I was almost in, almost almost forty, so I have a lot of years to catch up. There we go. Protect from heat, light, and moisture. Oh, so I guess you couldn't bake with it. That's good to know. Yeah. Mm. What happens if you expose it to heat and light? Is it like gremlins? And I was going to say, well, <laughs> don't we know feed, what happens. Don't you know feed what happens your when... zip fizz after midnight, Mike. <laughs> we know what happens when you get it wet. <laughs> oh, my God. It expands when you get it wet. So that's just like a gremlin. 100,000 times your daily B12 allowance. 100,000 times. Is that healthy? <laughs> Wait, is it, wouldn't it be 1,000 times? Because it's 100,000%? No, oh, this is 104,167 percent. Yes. Same thing here. I did, How do they fit? How much B12 is in here? I don't know. We're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> you can fit 100,000 times the USRDA of anything. Yeah. Oh, we'll find out. Did, Wow, you just did the shot. That's number wow. four? Yeah. Uh, oh, I, officially, I have a little bit left in this one. Okay. Wow. You're not yeah. talking fast enough, Alan. <laughs> I'm already <laughs> saying, it's like David before. I'm already saying things. It will catch up in the stream in time. So, remember, uh, David hasn't hasn't returned yet. He might. Uh, I'm hoping he comes back. Oh, my goodness. Right. All right, gentlemen. Connection wasn't I'm good punching enough. out before Alan's heart explodes. All right. I yes. Be here to see it. Night, Mike. Night, All Chris. Right. Happy, Bye, New Year. Happy, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. All the New best Year. to you guys. Be well. Be well. See you. See Take you. care, Mike. Thank you so much for coming. Anytime. And Chris. Chris is now. Oh, he's in the wings still. Thank you so much for coming, man. Okay. So, so Curtis, thanks so for coming I, back. Go yeah, ahead. What would I miss? Oh, a lot. When did last, you leave? Uh, five o'clock my time. So four hours ago. <laughs> oh well um what was it there was there was we've we've covered a lot of stuff i actually um i think we discuss we we discussed a lot of different things you missed um the outro of the the banjo hour of his uh the geeks rising you missed that yeah you caught the first one i did catch but, the first one yes yeah. i did yeah the outro was one of the the best things that I've ever seen, frankly. That I that I produced probably. <laughs> it's fantastic. Oh, okay, and Alan, you produced you produced the outro. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of, of all the segments that, as we've gone yeah, in yeah, and out yeah. of, yeah. of spots, yeah. that's what I basically spent yes, yesterday on and okay. the day before. Okay. So okay. that, in addition to answering and responding to over two hundred and fifty emails from people that have been curious about, uh, that have been interested in, in the. Uh, me trying to match people up. And by the way, I have done that 
so David has now returned, just so you know. Um, real quick, I might as well address the the giveaway things that we were talking about before. That that I sent out the thing that that was the video about giveaways, and believe it or not, up until I was responding to all of the emails that came through until about three a.m. and then I was like overloaded. I'm like trying to get all these videos done, and I'm like I'm never going to get to sleep, and I got to stay up forever tomorrow. So I said to myself, I'm not going to be responding to anyone that writes me some of these long. It's like they're trying to write a dissertation. And some people literally did send me long emails. And I'm like, where is your list? Where's your want? And I'm like going through. I'm like, I don't have time to read this. I'm going to have to just. Sorry. Um, I read all of them up until about 3 a.m. And that was over 250 emails. I don't have the exact count. One of the things I was hoping to do is there's two things that I would not able to get done in time. Number one is I wanted to go through all the emails because people would say, hello, I'm from Estonia. Hel uh, Estonia. Hello, I'm from Russia. Hello, I'm from Iceland. Hello, I'm from whatever. I wanted to find all the different countries and put them up as a list on the screen to say, this is how global our audiences can be. And I thought, I mean, you know, I have a much smaller channel than both you and, and uh, Curtis and, and Bandrew. And their reach is far more vast than mine will ever be. But the fact that they are able to, uh, you know, they, the fact that, that, that people were seeing this from all over the world was, was really amazing to me. So anyway, I did get these emails. And one of the things I did is I went through because I could, and, and I'll say this again, I said this like 10 hours ago, I could very easily say, okay, we're going to do a giveaway here. Start and finish. If your number was in there, we're going to give something away, or I'm going to do a giveaway this way or however. The thing is though, if I'm trying to give away, let's say a USB microphone, and someone who is a production sound mixer get where to win that. They'd be like, what in the world am I going to do with this thing? They don't do a podcast or whatever. Just like if I, if there was a college student that entered and uh, I said, okay, here is a $500 gift certificate to, you know, uh, an audio, uh, a pro audio company that sells only, you know, wireless microphones. They're going to be like, I'm in school. There's no way I can use that. You know, I wouldn't use that thing for five years. I lose it by then. So one of the things that, that, that we did is we connected, uh, you know, I got people and I looked at all the emails that came through. And if someone said, this is what my wish list is, this is what I would really like and benefit from. I looked through them and I said, okay. And sometimes I would follow up with questions. Sometimes I'd say, yeah, sorry, I can't help you. I'm not giving away a, a time code system. I'm not giving away a boom pole. I'm not giving away wireless. So sorry. And so a lot of people, I was able to just blanket say no to some people I would say, when you say this, or what exactly have you done this? Have you done this? Have you read this? Have you, you know, that's one of the reasons why during the Gotham Sound Hour that we did earlier today, Gotham Sound, we gave away six copies of Patricia Mirswa's book behind the sound card because there were six people that wrote me from school, that wrote me from, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, education that said, what would I really benefit from the most is that book. I just can't afford the, the $80 right now. So I said, you know what? Let's connect them up. And Gotham Sound was more than happy to sponsor it because they're all about education. So I thought that was a really cool thing. And there's other companies that have, have donated things too. And I did um, I did get them and, and I have a list together. And so right now, there's a couple of things we could end up doing right now. Um, what I will say is that I will say I have two names right here. Let's go ahead and go through these, I guess, the, the giveaway items. We'll go ahead and do this. I, I might as well do it now that we're inside the, uh, the 11 o'clock hour. So one of the things that we were going to be giving away is, the, is a Electrosonics $200 gift certificate. And there were some people that said, I'm going to be upgrading my wireless soon. And I would say, really, what, what brand are you going with? And, and anyone who said Electrosonics, I'd say, great, you're going to be entered into the comp competition uh, or into the, the contest or the, um, the drawing for it, I should say. So what I'm going to do is I have two names in front of me. I don't really want to share this document on the screen right now because there's a lot of there's people's you know specific information. But what I will say is, I'm going to let you guys here that are in the stream tell me a number one or two, and I have them in order right now. And we'll say one is the, the, the first name and two is the second name. So collectively, you three guys decide number one or number two. I have a coin. I'm going to allow the coin 
to decide That's for good, me. Yeah. Heads like is it. one, tails is two. Okay, okay we're going to bring Bronson back in on this. I don't know how much of that okay. you caught, but we're going to do a couple of giveaways here. I th- and, hang on. And I'm not going to re- recap what I just said. You can go back and rewatch or watch the video I did about how I'm going to be do- doing the giveaways, but we're going to pick a number, pick a number one or two. And if there is a tiebreaker, if it's down to two to two, I'll bring up uh, a, a, a random number generator. But since y'all don't know the names, y'all don't know anything, y'all know the orders or anything, pick a number one or two. I, I, I got tails, so that's two. Okay. There's one for two. Bronson Curtis? Two. two. David? He said one. Yeah. One. Look at that. And then Bronson is holding up two. Okay. That means that I don't think he's still in here. He was definitely in here before. Raymond Lowe is going to get the $200 gift certificate to Electrosonics. So he was someone that was very uh, very much participating in the stream earlier today. And so that's going to be great. Congratulations. Um, very, yeah, very good. Congrats. So um, we have what's the next thing. We have, uh, I want you to pick a number between one and six now. And pick two numbers between one and six. I'm looking right now for the next thing that we're going to be giving away. Oh, I've been, I've been working towards this my whole life. He, has a, he has a Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. I th- That's exactly what I have. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I knew it. Okay, we'll actually use this D6. Again, two uh, and David, six. David, there is no seven. He's saying <laughs> two well, and you're five. Saying five and two. It's two numbers, so I'm choosing two and five. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, you, you know, one to six and you choose seven. <laughs> of course, that's a sound person. Well, let's go past. <laughs> let's go to seven. Okay, so we have one and four. We have two and five. And two and six. Two and six. And Bronson, three. He's and laughing. Three and. We don't hear anything. You're, Pick, uh, you're, 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 you're quiet over there, Bronson. We got no we're, audio. We're not hearing you. You're not muted. It's just not up on your end. <laughs> he's doing a little troubleshooting here. Stand by, people. Okay. He's, he's going to get it sorted. I feel it. Kaori is saying two is the ultimate number. Tonight it appears to be. <laughs> okay. Nothing yet, Bronson. Still have nothing, dude. Anybody know anything about sound? Might be able to help them no, out. No, got nothing. <laughs> if only we knew somebody. <laughs> Maybe if someone in the chat knows anybody. Well, okay, we got to figure out, okay, what is his signal chain? Bronson, what's your signal chain? Oh, wait, we can't Tell hear. us, yeah. Tell us what it is. I can't read it. <laughs> in the chat. He's going to put it in the chat for us. Oh, Uh-oh. he's going to, he's going to, he's going to. Oh, he's restarting his computer. That's what that means. He's restarting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I okay. Think maybe, so maybe, maybe, like maybe before, you know, when, when my tablet crashed, I'm now using my laptop because I just remembered, oh, wait, in between this year and last year, I purchased a laptop for myself this year for my uni studies. I like completely forgotten about that. And it was a flat laptop. So I just left it charging for a while. And um, so, yeah, I was still like listening to you guys on the YouTube stream and you're talking about AI and it's like, darn it, I wish I was part of that. I was literally doing my <laughs> final exam for a course I'm taking about artificial intelligence online while I was waiting. And then you were talking about artificial intelligence. I was like, well, that was a coincidence. <laughs> Let's see if we hear him now. Can you hear me? Yes. We got you. Yes. You just had to restart the, you know, just restart the whole thing. Restart the thing. Okay. What are your two numbers? Oh, I did. I was doing three and five, but I, and I don't five. know if that means anything to anyone else. <laughs> okay. So three uh, and five. Three and five. So who? Uh, what What were the numbers that you chose, Curtis? Hold on one second. Uh, three, five. What was it? One and four. And what about what about you, David? What did you choose? Two and five, wasn't it? Two and five. Yeah, yep. was, two and yeah. five. And ba- yeah. Banjo, what did you say? Two and six. Okay, so I have twos. two for two, yeah. and then two for five. I think two for five. Two for five. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that would mean that the DDVO seven 
you kits, which include a boom arm, is going to go to TJ uh, Z and Stefan C. So you two guys are going to get. Uh, thank you very much, Deity, for agreeing to send those out. They're, they are going to get those USB kits. They both have a need for a microphone, and they are going to get one now. So, congratulations! Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now, um, those were supplied by Deity. We want to thank him very much for supplying those to give away. Uh, there is a there's a couple of things that I'm going to be giving away. Here's one of the fun things about about me. I really was interested in hearing the Worker B2. So I said. I want to get my hands on one. At the time, Neat had not had had had, had no intent. They, they were like, well, we're going to do it at some point. And they then told me that they would reach out to me as soon as they were released. I then started seeing videos about it. I'm like, I want to hear this thing. I want to hear it on my voice. I want to hear how it compares to the original. And after reaching out to them, they finally said, okay, we're ready to send them out. And then nothing showed up. And then I said, okay. So I, after a while, I got another email from a different person who said, yeah, we'd like to send you a worker B too. And I was like, oh, okay. That must be the, the, the guy who's now handling this. And then nothing arrived. And so I was like, after a little while, I was like, I guess after like a couple of months of waiting, I said, all right, fine. I'm going to go ahead and buy one myself. I bought one the day that mine arrived from Amazon. I get confirmation emails from two different people from uh from two different like a uh, a neat person and from uh their social media person saying okay it's in the mail i'm like ah oh. well i thought y'all forgot so i now i responded and said okay here's what i'm going to do i'm going to review the one that that i bought myself and what i'm going to do is i'm going to give away the other two during the epic live stream so i have two worker b2 microphones that i'm going to be giving away and we have a total of one two three Four total people that uh, could use a worker B2, that could use a um, a large diaphragm, basically a large diaphragm condenser is what they they, they said for, you know, uh, podcasting that goes along. Because they, they said they didn't really have a microphone, but they have an interface. Their microphone died or for whatever reason. Uh, there were different stories. So there is four total people that would like the worker B2. So what I want to do is let's do the same thing as before. Pick two numbers between one and four. Uh, say them out loud, please. I'm writing them. I'm typing them all down. Two and three. One and four. All right, Bronson. Two uh, and six. Wait a minute. Was that it's two? Between one and four. Oh, two and four. Two and four. And what about you, Andrew? Three and four. If you said three and one, I was going to say, geez, guys. Um, okay, so three and four. Uh, four is definitely a winner, so we're going to have a runoff now okay. uh, between one and three. So give me one number, one and three, guys. Okay. One number? One Got number, it. because we have to do a run uh, runoff. One. It's got to be three for me. One, Good. three. Three. And all close on the mic. And how about you, David? Two. Okay. So the three takes it there. That means that Jesse N and Giovanni T are going to get it, provided that you're in America, unless you want to help me uh, with international shipping costs. Uh, I believe both of you guys, though, I know one of you guys uh, told me that you were actually located in Atlanta. So that's because one of them actually was really funny. He said, I've worked with you before. Uh, that's how he started the thing out. He says, I worked with you and he names a bunch of shows. He says, uh, that he remembered the way I yell sound speeds on set. And then he said um, that he he said that uh, he was he then saw I forgot who the person was, but he saw a video online and then he said, wait a minute now, is that is that the the same guy from that I know from set? And then he, as soon as he saw that it was, he was like, oh, I'm going to jump in. So there we go. Uh, Jesse N and Giovanni T are going to get them. So I Congratulations. just none of that. So, yeah, yeah, two worker bees will be going out at some point. No one said that they were doing content creation that involves an Apple device or something like that. They never. Uh, there was nobody actually that said they were creating content on their phones and wouldn't mind a uh, microphone because Movo accidentally sent me something a little while ago, and I said, you know what, I'll give it away in the Epic live stream. So I'm going to hold on to it and see if I can, you know, give it away to someone else. Uh, also, keep in mind. I'm going to throw out... Um, well, do we want to check in the chat and see if anyone in the chat... No, because people are going to say, yes, yeah, sure, because they're going to turn around okay. and sell it. Fair enough. That's fair the reason enough. why I didn't do right. the giveaways that way. 
No one has mentioned it at all. I re- looked at over 250 emails, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play that game because someone could is gonna say, "Oh, cool, send That's it to me," policy. and then turn around. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not gonna good do policy. that. Okay. So, um, uh, let's see here. Let me go ahead and 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 pause for a moment and look at. Oh, let's see. Where is I'm going to look at a, cu- uh, a couple things in the chat to answer this question. No, he's not. Um, that would be oh. very interesting if he did. And then uh, if DD Drew came by, he he is not. He is you know doing something else. So let's go ahead and look at this. Norman, <laughs> you were going to give away uh, Banjo's U87. You up for that, Banjo? <laughs> uh, I will give it away for thirty seven hundred dollars plus shipping. <laughs> okay and um, plus tax give it, <laughs> give it away for that yeah. give it away Seems give it away fair. give it away yeah. now um i tell you what then what we'll do uh, are we raising thirty seven hundred dollars <laughs> well we're, we don't have that those kind of donations coming in um actually raymond i don't know if you saw this or not raymond you got yourself you mentioned this a little while ago i said that you were here i don't know if you were here just a moment ago but you actually got yourself a 200 hundred dollar gift certificate from electrosonics coming in so I'm going to be emailing you about that and um, putting you in connection with Electrosonic. So that way, when you go to buy your uh, the wireless that you were talking about, you're going to be able to add that uh, to to help you out there. So that's cool. He doesn't get the Neumann, Neumann craze. Uh, my voice doesn't sound great on Neumann either. I'll tell you what I'm going to do real quick. I'm going to actually um, let you guys talk for a moment while I go over to my computer and hit record and get the, get the stream recording. So that way we have the second whatever part two of this video is going to be. Yeah. Uh, cause I don't want to end up missing out good, on, good uh, some of the Epic live streams. So I'm going to let y'all loose for a bit and I will be back here in a couple minutes. Uh-oh. We got this. We got this. We got it. So, what co- uh, Andrew, uh, what do you, yes, what, what's the first thought that comes to your mind when Alan says that he, his voice doesn't sound good on a Neumann? Okay. Do you, do you buy that? Do you? It probably sounds exactly like his voice. Okay. <laughs> it, 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 that came that came across really mean. That came across a lot meaner than I thought. No, it's like when I use the Neumann, it does. I said it in my review of the U eighty seven. It doesn't do you any favors. Yeah. And I use the SM seven B because it does me a lot of favors. That's why I love this microphone. It tames the harshness in my voice yeah. and hopefully makes me sound a bit less annoying. The yeah. U87 sounds great. It makes me sound as annoying as I do in real life. Hmm. Okay, good to know. Hey, yeah. I'm, I'm curious, David, what is your philosophy on microphone choice along those lines? Like, are you looking for something that's at, like, this is what this person actually sounds like? Or are you... I think to me it's probably else. more about the environment or the conditions I'm recording under than any one person, especially as you're going to have multiple people in a scene. So why would you choose a, a mic on your boom that's just best for one person? I mean, you could perhaps if one scene is mostly about one person choose a burr mic that's more suited to them and then in the next scene or next take or something swap over to a different one but that just seems like you're introducing more trouble and variables than possibly makes sense for any like small gains in sound improvement so yeah i tend to more think about what what sounds better for the room or what sounds better for the environment is it like are we out in some like quiet wop wops where you know maybe a wider mic might still sound really nice and pick up a bit of environment versus i was shooting next to a motorway and i'm going to automatically reach for my sink and cs3e <laughs> yeah so that's probably my thought choice of how i choose mic more influence than particular actor yeah what about what about wires what about your lavalier mics well i pretty much just exclusively use cos 11 so i guess uh <laughs> um what what's the use of them? Oh, cost eleven. Um, uh, I mean, I do have like a couple of DPA um, forty sixties, and yeah, sometimes I might use that. But often, maybe that might be just more of the accessory I've got on it already is is uh, better suited for the cost Because you know, it's often just about speed and pace. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Looks like uh, Bronson, you're sporting. Is that a RE twenty tonight? Yes. 
Yeah. Very good. It makes me sound like a man, you know, so that's why I use it. <laughs> so, so I just, guess something, just for a minute. You know, yeah. But, <laughs> but uh, no, to, to add to that, I think that from like a studio, like vocalist standpoint, I think that I usually try to go for neutral microphones because it's easier for me to accent in post and just be like, Hey, like here are the, the qualities of their voice and here are the things that I can, you know, like bring up and make sound really good rather than, you know, like having a microphone that, you know, is wh whether it's like V shaped or, you know, whatever or makes them sound like a man, like right now, you know, like I, I think that that's, that's the way that I would usually go and just fix it, not fix it, but just accent in post the qualities and the strong suits of their voice. But and what about you, Curtis? Are you on the you're on the ethos? Tonight I'm on the eth the Earthworks ethos. It's just uh, it's just the one that's on my boom arm right now. Um, it depends. Like if I'm doing if I'm doing more production or location sound, I I definitely understand David's perspective on that, and I would approach it pretty much that same way. It wouldn't be so much about matching the mic to the person unless, I mean, like if, if an actor an actor shows up and they have a ton of sibilance, that might influence my choice a little bit of which lavalier microphone I use with them. But I'm going to let Post manage the, the sibilance or any other kind of unusual characteristic of their voices. But for, I think things for, for live streams, when you don't have, I mean, live streams, you don't do Post, so... I think finding a mic that fits somebody's voice is a little bit more, it makes more sense in those, in those uh, circumstances, I think, to kind of match the mic to the voice yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, probably only just under very extreme circumstances might you think about matching it or maybe like, also if you're doing a film, it's really only, you know, maybe a short film on advert, it's only about one person for the whole thing, but that's kind of a bit unusual. And also even then, still going to go for your default like logic process thinking about mic choice and it's only really in the stream scenario something about their voice stands out but but the thing though is at what point do you like make that decision to like not go down the normal way you decide upon a mic but instead tailor it to this one person like i said during the very short little chat with them while you're introducing yourself and like um leveling them up like that's probably not going to make that decision that quickly and have that much of a sample listening to them is it after you've done the first take of, of a shoot you know like then that's probably not like it's probably only after been listening to them for a little bit longer but then if you have listened to them for a whole scene are you gonna like change your mic to something else yeah it's just exactly disrupted. <laughs> yeah you better off like whatever decision you've made like stick to it unless it's like really the wrong decision if you, if you just made like a 10 percent wrong decision you're going to cause more problems trying to chase the last 10 percent than just like yeah. going with the flow yeah that makes sense to me i i have a question so so uh bandra are you um are you doing like musical mics like you're, you're swapping them out every once in a while is that what you've been doing uh, no so i started on the started on something i i didn't recognize like the, it was a handheld yeah, the Neumann KM105. Okay. It's just because I was using that, and I thought it would be funny to join while hand-holding a mic. Then I went to the SM7B, and then everybody started roasting the SM7B, oh, saying okay. how terrible it is. <laughs> hey, not this and, guy. And then I went to the LCT1040, because Michael Wynn asked about the coolest mic we have used. And as far as technology, I think this is the most interesting one I've used. Okay. And then I went back to this because, and now, now you're pulling somebody, out the ethos. somebody said they hated the high end on the ethos because it's hissy. So I'm throwing on the ethos. <laughs> I see. I see how you approach it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute for just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and swap things out and see if just, just, just because we do those kind of things. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's all change to XM eighty five hundreds. What a <laughs> so you you took a sandwich break. I did. What I kind had, of sandwich? I had a French dip sandwich. I'm like I'm like kind of man like I 
I don't know, man. Like, I can't go wrong with the French dip. Like, I don't know because I used to hate them. And, like, my mom always loved them. And they're like, you're disgusting. That's a soggy sandwich. And then now I love soggy sandwiches. So I don't know, man. But what kind of sandwich you like? Uh, just a standard ham sandwich. Hammy, yeah. G- give yeah. me a ham sandwich. So give that's me fair, a turkey dude. sandwich. Yeah, no, that's good. Oh, that's if, if now I haven't done this in a while, but man, I used to, I used to get wrecked by going down to Subway, getting a foot long mm-hmm. Italian sub, dude, having them okay. toast it. Yeah. Holy Toledo with all that meat <laughs> toasted with the the edges getting all brown and Dude. and burnt. Oh, it's one of the greatest things ever, but I don't do that anymore. Dude, yeah, the Italian sub is that's like if I if someone like made me go to Subway, I'd get that. <laughs> For sure, dude. No, like I I would say when we've had some road trips or whatever that I've like had to go to a Subway. I used to like it. I think I wore myself out on it in high school and everything. But uh dude, that's the Italian the Italian sub is the right choice all the time in that situation. But no, dude, I think that I think that that's my thing though is like I I I appreciate like a turkey club, you know, a ham sandwich or a turkey and ham. It's great. It's great. Can't go wrong with it. What about you, David? What kind of sandwich are you? Well, not what kind of sandwich are you? Because you're clearly a human, not a sandwich. I mean, I guess you could be. (laughs) Um, I have not had a sandwich in over 10 years. Really? Wow. Wow. I don't know if that's just a humble brag or it just makes me mad. I don't know. know. (laughs) Are we fighting now? Is that what's happening? And also, I'm literally never going to eat a sandwich again ever in my life. Oh. What do you eat? Like, what do you eat? Well, um... I generally eat just like once a day, and so I haven't eaten today other than basically chugging coffee um, because I only slept about four hours. Um, But when I last ate last night, I just just ate, was it lamb? Yeah, it was either lamb or beef. But yeah, I just just ate like a kilo of that. So we Do you do the (laughs) carnivore thing, the carnivore diet? Um, I have done that for a while, but not like... um, I don't care if I'm carnivore or not. I just, I just, just have to avoid carbs. I've, mm. I've got this, well, especially starchy carbs, because I've got this autoimmune disease. So I just have to be like very careful about what what I eat. So, and but yeah, so long as I do that though, I'm like perfectly healthy. So yeah. it was basically a miracle. I like figured out the solution some twelve years ago or so, and yeah, I'm pretty much normal. <laughs> now and uh yeah it's great and you know i can nice that working on set you know physically active running up and down hills chasing actors swinging long boom poles and such so yeah it's good <laughs> you know, but um before this like when i was really sick i couldn't even like walk so it was pretty Dang. like messed up yeah i didn't mess yeah. up what immune disease i've got so you know that's why i've got no desire to ever eat another sandwich again yeah. or any that's other nice. breads or potatoes or pumpkin or cumin or whatever nope yeah, understandable. Yeah. You know, like that not eating potatoes makes me so sad because I'm from Idaho. So I mean like that's my thing. Like uh, but, Well, that's uh, where I live. Well, I mean that's your Idaho. economy. That's yeah. that's <laughs> I'm like, you, hey, you, I can't abandon yeah, I'm, this. I'm, but, I'm basically yeah. an economic terrorist. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, hey, we don't accept you here, sir. <laughs> Um, I mean, like, I used to be, like, all about carbs because, like, when I was younger, I was a um, keen endurance athlete. You know, I've been, like, nationally ranked, won um, Auckland titles and done many Ironmans. So, you know, that kind of lifestyle basically, like, lived and breathed carbs. Yeah. So <laughs> it was very – it's been a change in mindset, but yeah. a worthwhile one. No, dude, that's, that's good that you found what worked for you. I mean, like – that's all anyone can ever do. I mean, my my wife definitely she's had to do that whole the battle of like the FODMAP and everything and like finding what works for her and everything, you know. So definitely, dude. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. People should like use what's best for them. And I'm no by no means saying, hey, everybody else has to be keto or paleo or carnivore or whatever. Like, you know, 
people do what what suits them and so not, not unless somebody mentions to me that they also got ankylosing spondylitis and I'll be like, hey, you should try this. And then I might push them into that diet. Sure, but yeah. you know, the odds I bump into somebody else with ankylosing spondylitis is um, like one of my friends and my birth father. I think those are the only people I've like met in real life, you know, other Damn. than like online support groups that's yeah. got the same disease. Gotcha. It also kind of sounds like a dinosaur, so it's a cool sounding disease at least. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I have sometimes jokingly called my <laughs> disease my, my pet dinosaur, you know, ankylosing spondylitis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fair. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and I mean, I almost look like a caveman too, especially when my hair was longer. It's fair. You know, caveman yeah, and true. dinosaurs did live together. <laughs> I do. I've, yeah, I did notice that the. The the hair is very different. Is it this year or was it when when did that when did you I go with the short? I just did this a few days ago. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, for the first couple of days it was so cold because I just <laughs> lost my beanie. Uh, very very cold. But um, yeah, now I've got used to it. I'm back to like, oh my goodness, it's just so hot. Like before I jumped on the stream, I was just wearing like a singlet and shorts. But uh, yeah, I, I thought maybe I should you know not not show off my my Hairy arms so much and, and um, dress up a little bit for, for the stream. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much New Zealand weather nice. at the moment. Very nice. Um, yeah. just, just like shorts and bare feet and um, and singlets. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Before, yeah, Dan, before, if, I'm sorry, before, real quick. Dan, if you yeah. are on uh, to try to, if you are willing to to try to record from your end too, my, my computer over there, I have not turned on in a long time. So it keeps wanting to do updates. And of course that means restarting. And I'm like, disable, disable, disable. And it pops the screen up. I'm like, disable, disable, disable. You got to restart in five minutes. Is that okay? And I'm like, all it takes is me walking away from that thing and it's going to restart. And it's going to totally like completely destroy the recording. So I will try to record on my end. If you don't mind trying uh, to record on your end too. Um, I don't know how long, how long the string's going to go, but in less than five minutes, YouTube is going to stop archiving this live stream. And I would like to make sure I have it. <laughs> Uh, so if anyone else wants to be uh, a backup too, and just all I'm looking for is just the screen because I'm putting the chat on the screen. So if anyone is willing to do that and record the, the audio and video, uh, I would be very, very appreciative of that. Um, so there you go. Sorry to, to, to drop that in there. All right. Uh, what were you going to say, Curtis? Well, we're, we're kind of uh, moving around with our microphones here, and I, I wanted to get a little sample with Andrew on the Earthworks ethos there. So if you want to talk to us for a bit. Hi, Curtis. I'm so happy to see you. I've really missed you, and I just don't know what I have been doing with my life without you in it. How? I long for days with you. I long for... <laughs> For evenings with you, I long. Oh my, okay, it's getting awkward. It's getting a little awkward here. It's getting um, red, bro. I, uh, so, I'm curious. I'm curious what people think about that. A very. It seems like they very much went for a broadcasty sound with that. Am I? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. I, I've had a number of people say this is the best sounding microphone on my voice. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's it's very. It's got some. A lot of low end to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does, but sounds good though. It's sounds beefy. Good. It's beefy. I was gonna say beefy actually, boy. try backing off a few inches. Let's see what yeah. happens. Okay, now I'm a few inches off of this. And... Is it on mic still? It almost sounds like you're getting at the edge of the pattern. Is it right? So it's at the corner yeah. of his mouth. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Right about there. I'll talk right into it. Okay, now I am. I don't know. Seven feet away from it. I'm really bad with distances. <laughs> So I just wanted to say, hi, Alan. How are you doing today? I hope you're doing super well. Thanks for inviting Curtis. I've missed him so much. <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds fine. It sounds fine. It sounds more natural to me there. Yeah. Just slightly backed off a little bit. That, that sounds more natural to me. I don't know if anybody else has a perspective on that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've got uh, yeah, definitely some proximity effect. I think a lot of people that are wanting that kind of sound, they can do really well with the Earthworks ethos. Definitely. I switched over to the Earthworks SV33 here, uh, since we're on it. We're, we're uh, Bandrew and I are kind of working a theme. Uh, this is a vocal mic. I think it initially meant for vocalists, like as in singers, for the uh, the group that works in the music studios. But um, 
Let's answer this question real quick. Uh, do you guys feel it's worth investing in cardioid lobs for better isolation when conducting sit-down interviews? Two, three guests. Is that overkill for video? I think cardioid labs are a bad idea because you know how you can hear even on an omni when a person like turns their head and goes on and off axis. I could only imagine on a cardioid it would be so much worse. I do which, and also if you need the lab to be hidden, which even on sit-down interviews is very, very common. I mean, that's why I get hired. Uh, if it's just going to be like exposed, why don't they just let the camera op do it? Um, yeah, for any hidden labs, the cardioids sound also a lot worse for that. You've got much more handling issues. Um, and also cardioid labs are bigger sized as well. So again, like it's more unsightly. I do actually own one or two cardioid labs, but I only use them for when I want to do like a plant rig real quick, like maybe up on the lap, up on the visor on a car. So, I mean, like lots of people, and I often still do, just use like a normal lab. That's a really like super quick, just throw it up there when you're in a rush. But yeah, I, sometimes I might like play around with the, the cardio lab being up there instead, just depending on. There's um, a couple of large labs. Well, Look you at should the of this thing. Yeah. Once you can see it. Um, where's my. That, like, we can see it. Yeah. That Put your finger next to it. Put your finger that, next to it for a second. And also, just keep in mind, like, I've got. Wait a minute. So, yeah, where's my. Yeah. Wow. So just also keep in mind. He's yeah, I've also got like relatively large hands too. I mean, I'm nowhere near as big as um, Curtis is, but, but um, you know, I'm, I'm merely six foot three. Um, so you know, like, I, I, it's I'm not like, you know, I was like, I've got super tiny hands and making that laugh look big. But yeah, that's huge because the the whole reason I got it though is because I just recently got like a Sony digital um, transmitter and I got like a very unusual connector that nobody else in the world uses. Yes. Yeah, just be normal, Sonny. <laughs> yes. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, pretty sure nobody else. So, so, you know, I was sort of, I'm going to get wires and labs for it at some point, but I thought I was just sort of browsing eBay and I just thought, oh, I'll just grab so something cheap that's for sale that is already pre wired and ready to go. I plugged in. And I'm like, oh, yeah, th th this is actually like it's a Sony um, ECM166BC is the model number. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'll just, just order that because it's, selling on ebay for some stupidly cheap price and just uh yeah and i've got something to just immediately plug it in with and test with before i rig up some better things for like a cost 11 and yeah when i got it i was like holy crap like it's as big as the connector and the connector is like the biggest ever connector i've seen like what the yeah, yeah so on the um on the smaller sized sony transmitters the uh dwt b 30 uh, or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, they actually use the Limo connection like the same as Zatscom and the SSM from Microsonics. So at least, I, at least I think that's compatible with them. But yeah, anyway, anybody There's... anybody got a bigger lab to beat this with? <laughs> well, I, I don't, but I do have a thought. I think I think where cardioid labs are most useful are for live presentations on stage. That's typically where they're going to want to use them so that they can manage feedback in a live sound reproduction system. And there is also one, Sure has a new Uniplex, which yeah. they're actually using a MEMS microphone capsule. Um, <clears throat> but it's also a cardioid, but it's much, much smaller than typical cardioid lavalier microphones. So that one's pretty interesting. I've heard it and it sounds quite good. But again, it's mainly for, for live sound reinforcement, not for- and Also, for doesn't Sure's their new like cables technology that they're, they're using in their latest um, Sure, lav models are like much better than normal in handling noise, so maybe that might also help with this new cardioid. That that it's good. Than I mean, it, I mean, it probably it, still not optimal choice for our usage, but it might be helping minimize it, some it does, of the many it, negatives. It does a good job. Whatever that sound is, if someone could mute or yes, something, please. Um, what I was going to say to that is, is it's is it is very good. It is very good. It's just. Nothing is going to be miraculous at removing it, just eliminating all of that, uh, or at least nothing currently on the market. You're going to hear some handling noise transfer through the cable if you start, you know, sliding your fingers down, something like that. Um, the one thing I was going to say, and I'm going to put this out there. I have two questions for you guys. If you talk into a regular microphone 
And it is, let's just say you switch into, it's a, it's a multi-pattern microphone. You switch it into CardioAid. And what happens if you go and talk directly into it one inch away? What does it do to your voice? Proximity, lots of bass. Now, you, ba you, you switch that now to Omni. Now, what does it do? You lose, you lose the products, Ooh, some of it at least. Yeah. Okay. So that right there is something to keep in mind regarding CardioAid versus Omnidirectional Pattern Microphones. Part of that, you know, by dialing it in a little bit, you're going to get more proximity effect you put on your chest. And that CardioAid pattern will pick up your chest more. Usually one of the things in the film industry that if we use a CardioAid pattern uh, live at all, it's going to be used as a plant mic. Now, that's not to say it's the only application for it. To Curtis's point, you know, you can use it if you're trying to, uh, cue, uh, you know, uh, try to play off of feedback. If you have floor monitors or something like that, trying to play off of that, you know, and try to get, eliminate that. But you got to keep in mind, a lot of it's designed to pick up areas only like this big. After that, it's going to start falling off pretty aggressively. That's one of the reasons why a lot of mixers that are old school will do things like um, they're going to start they're going to start um, uh, using a, a lav mic as opposed to a boom mic in a place with a noisy environment. Even though post can go back in to the ISO boom track and say, "I'm going to able to I have more." information there i can make that sound better than a, a lob but for the mix track they're going to be using the the lob um, uh, they're going to make it sound better than a lob but then they're going to be using the lob mic for the mix track because that's what people are listening to on set so just be aware that if you use a cardioid lob there's going to be a lot of a difference of sound that you're going to run into and more of a learning curve than just throwing a lob on somebody we know that lobs are made that they're that they're typically omnidirectional, but there is a detail increase as soon as you go down the barrel, just like every microphone. The detail is higher when you go down the the, the barrel. And an omnidirectional pattern is still the uh, I'm sorry, the cardioid pattern is definitely the same exact way, but you also have the same kind of effects that come into physics of picking up a cardioid type microphone, and then you have to, you know, worry about playing off axis responses and that kind of stuff a little bit. So just keep that in mind as well. <laughs> Okay, and uh, yes, we actually just crossed over the twelve-hour mark, so we're playing catch up on some of the the chat from when uh, I went over there and was trying to get the thing. Let me see if it's it's currently still recording, or at least it looks like it is. All right, hopefully so it's still going. Just a person asking about the handling noise. Just make sure you got enough slack in your lav mic and like add a bit of strain relief along. <clears throat> also, one of the things you can do, and this is something that um, a lot of people don't talking about. Uh, a, a lot of people don't talk about is that if you simply add a loop right there, that actually takes a lot off. So if I, I ha if I had this as a lob on me here and it was mounted to me and that little loop is in there, that gives a little bit of, of give that little connection there. It's one of the things that we'll, we'll sometimes add. Uh, actually, do I have it handy? It's over there. I have a uh, Rycode INV6 with a, um, an ambi. Ah, you know what? Let me just grab it. I'll show you. Do it. Okay. Now that he's gone, we can take over the stream. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I, Revolution. <laughs> oh. Oh, the dictator has returned. Yeah, don't, I, I forgot to turn off my speakers. When I went over there to try to work on the thing, I turned on the speakers so that way I could I could still listen in. So I heard the conversation. Um, hey. <laughs> we said nothing. Yeah. I, I love the whole the, the, the comment by the way of uh, Alan says he doesn't sound very good on a U87. What do you think? And you said, well, it's not for, it, it sounds like him. And it's like, <laughs> I realized that sounded wrong. <laughs> oh, well, um, let me show you this real quick. This is, uh, this is a regular Rycote Envision 6 liar. And I have attached to it an ambient XLR tip. So, oh, I got to show it to the camera right there. I've added on a shorty that I, I made in, in, into a low profile. So I can take this. Put a microphone, a low profile microphone on this, it's going to hold it just fine. But if you notice, there is a knot built into that. As a matter of fact, if I take it out, you're going to see that it's in there so much that it's, it, it, I've, I've had this wired up, I think, for like eight years. You can see that it's actually holding the shape of it. And part of that is because it's been in a knot forever. Those, uh, if you could build a little knot into some things like that, it magically changes the balance point and it changes and it, and it suddenly, uh, is a stop for some of the vibration that will happen. It will suddenly get dissipated through that. Um, so that is a, a little thing to keep in mind as well. If you add a little bit of a, of a, of a, if you start to run into a lot of noise that comes from someone transferring, you know, like, like doing this number to a cable, a lav, if you simply do this number and then you connect up the lav to someone and there's a little bitty loop, a little strain relief loop, that will actually take quite a bit out of it. It's really amazing. And so you're not familiar with that trick. Now, you know, 
Um, so let's see here. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to do that. No. Uh, Banjo. <laughs> that is funny, though. Let's see here. Trying to... And yes, I, I remember seeing the, the comment before. Oh, no, I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about Bronson as a little kitty protest happening. Oh, that's what it is. I thought you were talking about the, Just uh, adorable. the thing earlier. And we're about a minute away from uh, ending. Shh, 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 shh. He'll get mad if we don't do it. He's not purring very loud. <laughs> okay. I'm not Curtis has had enough. First visit at all, but this is like my sixth mug of coffee. How do you do this? How do you people do this? How do you, what do you inject mean, you people? How, how do you inject four hours last night? Is is how you do it? Okay, but well, I mean, you had that much. The the that's amount amazing. of caffeine, the amount of caffeine that's consumed in this group here. I don't know about Ban Bandrew, are you a large caffeine I'm consumer? I'm pretty good. Normal so I only consume zip fizzes pretty much when I'm on a stream with Alan or in a voice chat, maybe. Okay. But every morning I only have two cups. That's okay. it. Okay. All right. And I'll tell you I'll tell you this, Curtis. Naturally I'm pretty energetic. And Bandrew will tell you when he was over when he yeah. was over, he stayed with us for four days recently. And um one thing that, that I didn't, I only resorted to Zip Fizz when I was wanting, you know, just wanting to, to have one. I don't require him to keep going. I will get I, up in the morning at my first alarm. <laughs> He'll get I, up at his, at like the, 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 the three uh, hour anniversary of his first alarm going yeah. off. It was the first day, I think. Um, uh, yeah, it was I'm really funny. <laughs> I, got, I got up in the morning and, you know, I get up when the alarm goes off and I instantly walk in there and I, and I uh, you know, do a morning routine of like, Four, three to five minutes in the bathroom and then I'm out of there and I'm I get dressed and I'm out the door within a couple of minutes so I'm out there wandering around and I'm hearing his alarm go off he'll hit it and then after like 10 minutes later the alarm would go off again and I'm like is this guy ever going to get up we had said that we'd start our day at a certain time and it was like an hour to have an hour and a half hour 45 minutes later he walks out and he's like uh sorry about that <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it made me laugh though so um. ex explain a little bit give me so this is after staying up until midnight and getting up at around 4.30 or 5. Yeah. So I have alarms. They're not turned on right now. But I have 2.45, 2.53, 3 o'clock, 3.07, 3.15, 3.23, 3.30, 3.38. 3 every seven or eight minutes because I know I won't wake up. And I, I, you basically what I have to train yourself to wake up. You, you, you're training yourself right now to ignore your alarm is what you're doing. And that's the reason why you ignore it. If you trained I yourself to get up on your first myself. alarm, you would do it. I'm sorry? I just don't trust myself. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm the same. I do, like, many alarms. But also, I don't just do it on only my phone. I might do it on my watch as well, and I'll do it on one of my tablets or both my tablets. I had a situation... Some years ago, it was quite a few years ago, I'd gone down to Rotorua, a, a city a while away, for a, a TV doco shoot. And um, I think, I'm not sure how it happened, but my phone, like, I think my phone got pretty flat and traveled down. So I had my phone plugged in and it was charging, but in some way it just like, just, just didn't go off. I think maybe like... Maybe just like the charging cord got bumped loose and maybe my finger was still on the screen. So the screen stayed on and it just died. And so because because my phone was dead and back then, many years ago, I only would set an alarm on one thing. Um, it just didn't wake me up. Luckily, where I was staying, you know, I'd been put up there by the production. So then they were coming to pick me up. So they were just like banging on my door like, hey. And it was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. But like, thank goodness for that. But yeah, after that situation many years ago i've always done at least two devices my alarms are on i don't want any freak occurrence even if it's like fully charged and even if i've got it on the charger like whatever i don't want a freak occurrence where one of them dies for some reason or a firmware update comes uh, on online and push to it or something and i just like you yeah, know i'm gonna have always two devices with my alarms when i get up in the morning <clears throat> but I never run that risk ever again 
Uh, real quick here, Dan, uh, thank you very much. Dan Agnew here in chat uh, donated $50 to stack up via the uh, YouTube right there. Thank you so much for that. Anonymous donated $123. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And that pushed us over uh, $1,000 just on YouTube alone. And um, I will, let's see, looking over here, there's also J uh, Jan, John uh, Bautista, who is in, uh, there was a $20 donation. Thank you very much for that as well. So we are still, keep in mind, that this is a fundraiser. So if you want to make a donation, very much appreciated. Uh, neither me nor YouTube is getting any cut in this. It is going directly to the charity. Um, at the very beginning of the stream, over 12 hours ago, and if you're watching this on YouTube uh, after the fact, you're gonna you're watching the second video. Well, watch the beginning of the first video, and you're going to see the charity that we're supporting is stack up and what exactly we're doing here. But I think it's kind of um, I think it's at, at the point where your time is over, Banjo. So what I need to do is your hour of the epic live stream is ending. Uh, your sponsored hour of uh, podcast. So, are you ready to see the outro that you, again, uh, in your in your brilliance here, and how you decided that you wanted your your hour to end? Would you like to to watch let's, that now? Let's see. I I don't remember anymore what it was. You'll remember really fast. Once we again, we okay. want to thank Podcastage for sponsoring this previous hour of the Epic Live Stream. not as good coming up either so there you go <laughs> money hope, well spent i hope between that one and the, basically you have four spots today and yes i will send you the originals if you would like to <laughs> reuse those or whatever for oh, whatever absolutely your crazy purposes are um yeah so there you go that's that's that is the that is the reason why if you're watching this in the future and wondering why I have now restricted the way that we're doing content creation <laughs> for the spots, the reason why is because when you trust someone like Bandrew to come up with something and he st his mind starts working, then there's there's some problems there. Uh, it was funny because that audio was created from two things in the YouTube audio library. He blended it together, decided to add some distortion and um, then said, hey, I think this should be it. You should uh, basically, you know, he asked me, what costumes do you have? I'm like, for the love of God. Okay. And I told him, honestly. And then he's like, oh, cool. This is going to be fun. So there you Brilliant go. Work. Awesome. Brilliant work. Very good yeah. work. Yeah. 10 so out of was, 10. That right there was the, was the last thing that I rendered this morning. And then right after that, I uploaded it, went to sleep, and I got to bed at 6.50 a.m. only to wake up at uh, at 10.30. So that's when you say, David, you know, I, I went to bed. and I, I think I got to sleep probably by about 7.15 and that's why when you say, oh, I only had like four hours of sleep, I'm like, you got that much? Sounds great. Uh, because normally I don't rely on caffeine or anything either. I, I have a lot of fun in the live streams, uh, but I don't need it to stay going at all. And um, I believe so. that. I believe it. Yeah, I, I went to bed about 7 or 8 a.m. and then got up at noon, I think. So not, not very healthy, but I was just sort of like in a zone doing my course online. So I was just like, I want to knock this out and finish it before the end of the year. So, yeah, as I say, uh oh, when my uh, die before I know exam for the AI course and finish that, so that was good. Okay, uh, now we are going to do one other thing here that we had started before, and we're going to go ahead and finish it before, uh, before we move on any farther, and that is continue the giveaways and what we chose and how we chose to do it. We're going to, again, if you're just joining, we have already given away a couple of things. We gave away a $200 gift certificate to Electrosonics, and that went to Raymond L., who's in the chat right now. We also have, um, we gave away earlier with Gotham Sound here, six books of uh, Behind the Sound Card, Petrushka Miroslav's book. 
And that was uh, that went to Cornell D, to Michael M, to Rodrigo F, to Phoenix XL, to Mercer M H, and James R. All of them. Uh, whoa, we just lost somebody. Um, all of them were people that entered and said they would like the book. And so Gotham Sound accommodated. And originally they said they were just going to give away one. And then it's, when I said, uh, "How do we want to? How do we want to find out the winners?" They said, "Well, let's send them all one because they want he they they felt that it was very important for everybody." to get a book with that information in there since it, you know, for students and stuff, you know, $80 is kind of hard to sometimes save up. So it's, it's, it's great that they did that. Um, Also Sean Milo, who sponsored an hour because of his book, the uh, shark in the housing pool earlier. One of the things, if you are just now about to join from the UK or you are uh, across the pond, um, UK, anybody from the UK that wants to send me an email at Alan at soundspeeds.us If you are interested in getting a free copy of The Shark in the Housing Pool, he is willing to give anybody from the UK because he he has some copies and he is not he he doesn't really um, know anybody in the UK that would like him. And so if anybody in the audience would like to see it it, or read it, uh, have an audio book read to him by Sean, it's actually really a good book. I really am enjoying it. And um, it's basically a story about a mortgage. uh, He basically is a mortgage fraud con artist. And uh, this, and he does mortgage fraud. But if you click on the link down in the description where it says "shark" in the housing pool audiobook, if you go there and you buy it, and I do mean buy it, don't, not listen to it on the the Audible trial or whatever. If you do buy it and then forward that email to me at Alan at Soundspeeds.us, I will forward that to Sean, and he will give you an audiobook copy of the program, which is by the same author, and it's about how um, this uh, this this guy when he went to um, prison. He manipulated the system and what he did in there and how he kind of played the system to a certain degree. It's going to be really cool and how he manipulated a certain program. So he will see, he will give you that for free simply by buying the book. So there you go. That's a, a little thing that uh, Sean is doing for viewers of the Epic live stream this year for um, 2022. So we do have a few more things to give away. We also then gave away two worker B twos, one to Jesse N, uh, Jesse N and one to Giovanni T uh, we gave away two Deity VO7U kits, which is a USB microphone kit from Deity, and that goes to TJZ and uh, Stefan C. So uh, there is one thing that we were not able to get coordinated, and I'm going to have to go back and forth with um, uh, Mr. Sinella, Philippa, who was here earlier. Uh, we have to figure out a, a giveaway item there. We weren't able to get it done because of the time differences, and he's a very busy guy. I was having a hard time, you know, getting all the stuff we're, uh, done, but we will be doing some sort of a, of a Sinella giveaway, not on the air, but we're going to be doing it uh, after the fact. And I do have a couple of people that we're trying to work out the details for, um, mainly lo- logistics of sending them to people potentially internationally and what would that entail uh, versus some uh, someone else who it would not be as bad, but we want to make sure that a Sinella goes to a pro that's going to use it because it's not an amateur product. So there is that. Uh, we have, let me see here real quick. Uh, I know that we have, we've already given away that, 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 okay. So that means we are down to one thing. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Six, oh no, I'm going to eliminate him because he already won something. Actually, you know what? I'll leave him in the, in the list. We'll see what happens. We'll leave it to fate. Mm, no, I'll be fair. I'll be fair. I'll eliminate him because he already has won something. And yeah, we'll do that. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six people in the running for a DDS Mic 2 location kit. So this is for the people that ask for a shotgun microphone. You can use an S-Mic 2 inside of a, of a booth or inside of your own home recording, but this is specifically the location kit that includes a shock mount, wind protection options, and stuff like that. A little, um, it, it comes with the Ryko shock mount that, that is designed for location work. So since it is that kit, we wanted to give it to someone that would use it in a location, uh, location recording capacity. So we have six people here. And why don't we choose numbers between one and six, and we'll figure out who gets the location kit from uh, DD, the S mic two. So uh, we have four gentlemen in here. Name your numbers. One to six. One and four. Three. And one more, Andrew. 
Oh, we need two? Oh, you're right. You're right. Okay. Re reset. Yeah, we just need reset, the one. Reset, yeah. reset, reset back oh, to one. Okay, my bad. Okay. No, I, I, okay. I was the one that said it wrong. We have one person. Pick a number between one and six. I'm sticking with three because that's what I rolled. Three? Three. One. Uh, what is that? A five, uh, Curtis? Five. And what was it also? Bronson, you said? One. And David. I just realized I've got a dice here, so let's roll it and find out. It's a two. Okay, so we now have we now have a standoff. So I'm going to do a random number generator, and we will just do this live right now and see what it rolls. Um, because we were unable to get a good answer. So this will be the final selector. It will be. A very nice prize. Well, assuming that it matches up with one of us. Okay. So let me uh, add my screen, share a screen, and I'm going to go over here. There we go. So let's add this screen here. It says roll a D6 that you can actually go. I don't know if you all knew this or not, but you can go to, to Google and, and type that in there. So we're going to roll a D6, and it says 6. Okay, so let's see who person number 6 is. But nobody else, none of us selected that, so. No? So. Got to should I re-roll, or should that be, well, geez, you're right. It, it would have needed to be one of the ones that we selected. Otherwise, yeah. So I hey, think. Maybe just okay. uh, roll that Here's again. What we'll do. Roll Here's again. what we'll do. Here's what we'll do. Um, I will put it out there. We'll do this one more time. But this time, we're going to roll it until we get the same number twice okay so we'll, we'll reset this and we'll say okay so if like a one comes up a four comes up a two and then we roll another one then we'll know that's what it is okay that's the number so help right. me keep track of this if someone will, will take notes please here we go we're going to start over roll a d6 and we have five okay then roll it again two roll it again one Two, so it's two. Who is number two? two. Um, number two is I don't know how you say this name. L I H is the first name, and then O is the last name. So Lee O. So per, uh, so this is a kit that we I did get permission, special permission from Deity to send it internationally if we need to. So this is something that we can ship internationally if you are in another country. And you just want it so, Leo, you have yourself a Deity s Mike 2 location kit coming, and that is going to be awesome for you. It's gonna, you're going to be able to get some great sound because of it. So there you go. Congratulations. Well done. Absolutely. Awesome, awesome. So those are the giveaways that we're going to be doing. Um, and if anyone doesn't understand this process that, that I just went through, I'll explain it real quick. I collected emails. Over 250 emails came in from viewers about their wish list. I asked for a wish list of what would you, what could be beneficial to you in your setup. Some people were like, oh, I really need time code. I'm starting to get into that. Some people said, I could use a boom pole. Mine's falling apart. Some people were like, well, I could use this and this and this. So what I did is I looked at all of them. And if it was an item that was already pre-approved to give away, then I said, okay, we can help you out. Um, if it's not something that I had, I said, sorry, I'm unable to help you. If it is something that I wanted to find out a little bit more detail, if it is something that is, I'm like, okay, well, they just mentioned this. Let me find out the details of what they're actually interested in. So I would ask questions. And then like, if they said, I need another mic, a mic to podcast with this. Like, oh, do you have anything right now? Is what might, what might my response be? And if they said, no, I don't have anything I'd like to though. I would say, okay, good. I'm going to enter you for something. If they said, I have an interface, but my microphone got destroyed, so I need to get another one of those, I'd say, okay, I'd enter you for the Worker B2, for example. So those are just some of my mentality on how we did this. And um, so that gives you a little bit of insight as to what I, what I did and exactly how I did it. Now, another thing that unless you were on with us five hours, uh, I'm sorry, 10 hours ago at this time, nine hours ago, I got to do the math. You don't know this, um, but... What's kind of cool also that happened is Sean Milo for during his uh, his his hour that he was with us uh, sponsoring the uh, Shark in the Housing Pool. One of the things he did is he actually had reached out to me in advance. And as we were going back and forth, he said, you know, if you're doing giveaways, would you, I have a whole bunch of gear that I donate to people who are in need of audio gear. He supports 
audio people. And if someone says I could really use one of these, I want to start recording. Um, if they, if they do like music or something like that, he will give you some gear. Now, this is not, I'm not going to connect you up with him because I don't want you pestering him. But one of the things that he did, he, he does this occasionally and he did offer it to us. So I went through the list and I then paired it up with people that were in need of those. So we also, from Sean's gear, Sean is going to, um, I'm going to be reaching out to you, uh, th to the following people and letting you connect up with Sean so he can send Andy P a Zoom H5 that's in great condition because Andy P said that he, he has the microphones, but he needs to have some sort of a portable recorder. And then John S said he was in need of something to plug his, um, his TRS microphone into so um and he even named a zoom h1n he says that would be great if i could get a zoom h1n so uh sean is going to send john s a zoom h1n someone named the general and i got to find out the exact name there was in need of an audio interface preferably with a couple of inputs and so we connected him up there with a um a sound blaster k3 plus uh, which is a usb audio interface and streaming mixer and that's new in the box by the way uh, from the uh, from the actual server that the Discord server Ping Pong is going to get a DD V Mic D4 Mini that's new in box. Also, that uh, Sean will be sending him, and then uh, the In the Pew show, which is a church related show that need they need to have. They had uh, only the ability to, to to put two microphones in there, but they do a ch church show. Sometimes they need to record instruments and stuff. And they said, I really need a minimum of four channels, and Sean's going to send them a Zoom Pod Pod Track P4. So Sean is going to be hooking some people up there, which is just completely amazing. So big time oh, support. Generous, amazing, oh, extremely generous. And uh, so I thought that was just completely amazing. So uh, definitely want to uh, say thank you to Sean once again for doing that. So if he's listening after the fact right now, thank you, Sean. I'm sure that everybody out there in the world that is that is listening to this understands what it is of a gift, you know, being able to give someone the ability to use their voice and to record and do what they want to. Sometimes people just want a way to talk. Sometimes people want to sometimes get things off of their chest. Some people record just to, just to have the practice. And it's not the same when you just record into your phone or people want to record, you know, um, I know somebody who actually started up a, um, uh, just recording their own voice because they started getting old and wanted to tell some stories. And that way they would be able to tell, they would be able to have a hard drive of some of their stories for their family to have when they passed on. So they started doing that just recording. And there's a, a hard drive that basically says, you know, this is a bunch of audio recordings that they did. So it's everybody records different things for different reasons. And that those, the, everybody who got something today was someone that emailed me, told me what you wanted. And I basically helped help facilitate that as much as the the donations that we had for gear and the people that 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 gave us something to give away. I helped facilitate that to get those in the hands of people that would actually use it, and not just resell it. So that's a little bit of what we were doing today. Um, real quick here, let's go ahead and uh, bounce through some of the the other chat. Did anybody else? Um, I saw it looked like a couple of y'all were about to say something. Is there anything y'all were going to say? No, just impressive all the, and and very kind. All yeah. those uh yeah. There's good in the world. There is. Yeah. So, let's see here. Oh, this is some I think we've already gone through some of these. Where did it where did I stop before? Some of these we don't need to go to. Yeah, Bantry is definitely a gold star sponsor for this. Uh he almost should be a producer of it next year because he last year I think you donated a thousand dollars to the DAV and this year between all the different donations you've done, you've donated seven fifty. That's very, very generous. Thank you so much, Bantry. Huge yeah. supporter of, um, of, of charity here. Oh, here's a great question here. Who is sponsoring the mic burning hour? Um, I actually need to, uh, need to mention this. This is one of two things I was unable to accomplish before this year's Epic live stream. I do have all the footage. I outsourced it this year. Last year, if you watched um, the video, uh, there was there was someone, Ono Coffee, who was in, in the chat earlier. He said that he does bonfires all the time, and he would be willing to do it for us, record it. So um, I told him what I would need and how I would need it. He recorded everything. He got it all together. He was able to get all the footage, and then he sent it. We had some issues sending large files. One of the things that we didn't think about is how to send large files to the internet. And I got those files yesterday. Unfortunately, I was not able to get the video edited with all the spots from sponsors that that I was that I've been producing basically for about 16 hours straight leading up to this live stream. 
with the exception of making a few phone calls regarding the live stream. But that will be coming. I will release that. I'll probably see if I can get that edited tomorrow and I'll see if I can have that up as a New Year's as a New Year's um, thing for the you know annual Yule log. I might even do it tomorrow and try to release it tomorrow night so someone has it to to definitely have for the 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 you know New Year's. But I will go ahead and announce um, that the microphone did not put up much of a fight because he had it on the fire for a bit. Then he got the fire going and the microphone basically melted in a hurry. So the Yule log is not going to be an hour. It's going to be probably a minute and a half, two minutes. And the microphone, can you guess what that microphone is? Banju, uh, don't guess because I used that box when I sent, uh, I sent you something recently. Hmm. It was a plastic. Oh, the, uh, it was plastic. Had the newer NW700. Yeah, I shouldn't have given that away. Someone's paying attention. I shouldn't have given it away. <laughs> the newer NW700. Yep, yeah. exactly. So that's our Yule log. Uh, and unfortunately, I do not have that to show as part of the Epic Livestream this year because I wasn't able to get it done. Sorry about that. So it's we have a we have a comment here. Then. Please put an SM7B on the log. Nope. That's will hard, not man. do it. That's tough man. John yeah. S, you actually were one of the people that just just got through winning something, and you're going to go and start trolling Banjo. That's my job. Don't take my job. <laughs> If if you want to buy the SM7B to burn, do it. No, I don't got four hundred dollars. Yes, <laughs> in the pews right there. There you go. So uh, in the pews, you actually reached out. I know that you would be be on it at twelve thirty a.m. That's amazing. Uh, but you're going to be receiving that. Uh, what was it? The pod uh, the pod track P4 was that what it was? Yes, yes that was the, the P4. P4. So you're going to be receiving one of those. I'll connect you up uh, via email in the pews, and you're going to be getting that. So. There you go. Uh, it's okay if you slide in the, instead of edit, pal. We understood. Uh, I have two videos I have to produce before Monday. So one of them is going to be that that um, putting together the audio for the Yule Log to get that out on time. And the other thing is my release on Monday, which is going to be the the first look in the, in the kind of the early beta stage of the Adobe podcast um, beta software if you use it for production audio. Um. So there you go. Yes, uh, you didn't. John, you're not paying attention. You did win something. Hold on one second. Let me tell you what it was. I have to go back to it. Uh, John S. What did you? You won the Zoom H1N that you had requested in your email. You had named the Zoom H1N there, and you said that's something that you would actually like. And so there you go. So... And this actually, uh, in the pews, that was actually a gift from Sean Milo, who was here earlier doing, um, I think it was, his hour was either three to four. I think it was three to four. Yes. Sean was here during that time, and it's Sean who uh, has gifted that to you. So there you go. That's awesome. So I'm just kind of looking through the chat. I might as well fly through it so that way at least it's on this because I'm not recording the chat on the other computer. What was the last thing that we saw here? Um, oh yeah, the sponsored about the um, the burning mic hour. So there we go. A one another thing that people had had missed if they if they were here earlier is all the different sponsors that the the spots that we did that go over each of them. So if you missed it before, I don't need to play the numbers, but if you missed it before, each of the sponsors had a little had a section where where there was something that we said about them and every single one of the sponsors that we had had a spot that we basically go over some of the highlights of their products or their services or something like that. Definitely support the sponsors um, because they were the reason why this live stream actually has gotten up into quadruple digits before we even started. So we are looking at right now, just to look at the dashboard here, donations for online uh, it's stack up total right now is $2,790 and you haven't seen that. I haven't revealed what it is yet because I wanted to see how many sponsors we could get and we could fill up all those spots. And that includes the donations from the sponsors, which each sponsored hour cost $250. And then, um, and then there's some other donations that were in after that. As for YouTube itself, let's look and see if there's any more that have gone through any time recently. Mm, no. So, all right. Everyone's kind of 
quiet at this point. <laughs> I do have one question. If sure. Curtis doesn't mind me asking, are you uh, are you in Utah or Idaho, by chance? I'm based in Utah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was just. Um, I remember hearing that Park City. Is that right? Do I know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to tell them your address also? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, 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 please no. But don't. I was curious. Yeah. No, let me bring I, it up on Google sense. Maps yeah. and I'll show you where he lives right now. Yeah, just we'll land it live. right on there. <laughs> no, it so takes. I live oh, in uh, I live in Twin Falls, Idaho. Twin Falls. Yep. I I stop there when I um I do have family that lives up in Idaho and I uh, usually stop in Twin Falls. It's a little break on the drive up. Oh, do you have a Tesla you need to charge or something? Because we got those, dude, for sure. No, <laughs> that's about it, though. <laughs> no, yeah, no, it's it's actually grown quite a bit. Um, it's a it's a cool little place, but uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah no. Uh, do you go go up to Boise then? I'm assuming. Yeah, like exactly. that's usually the stopping point, so it mm-hmm. makes sense. But exactly, yeah. Do you, do you talk? I have to play it, even though it's past. Go ahead. It's a gorgeous. The, there's a massive just gorge there with a with a snake river running yeah. through it and it's amazing for those that have never been there it's quite i was surprised the first time i went there i went wow who would have known yeah it's one of the few here. places that uh that allows base jumping still yeah yeah it's so like people, one of three or something people jump off the bridge with parachutes Dude, and it's like it's like you jump and you pull because like it's not that big of a drop um it's pretty rare <laughs> that anyone gets hurt but it, it does happen. But uh, yeah, one of the few places though. It's it's interesting. But uh, oh, that's cool though. I remember hearing that I thought that you were from either Boise or Park City, and I couldn't remember. And I was like, oh, interesting that you know, like another audio guy is just pretty close. But yeah. Well, the thing is, if you don't know, Curtis just tags his <laughs> city on every single it's video. Great. It's so weird to me. <laughs> It's the that's, very first hashtag that comes up on his videos. That's it's like, where I get it then. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, that Underneath makes sense. his videos, it says yeah. his city. That makes sense, yeah. <laughs> it's, yes. it's such an uh, interesting thing. Oh, and by the way, I just saw another name here in the chat. I wanted to mention one thing also. Some of the things that um, that I, I, I saw, I said, okay, I'm going to see if I can reach out to people and see if I can get some of the gear that people are interested in if I did not already have sponsors and I thought I might be able to get it uh, to someone. And there were two people that asked for quick locks, quick releases. And I was able to, since Gene Martin, uh, and sound guy solutions is one of the, the sponsors of the Epic live stream. I emailed him and said, there are two people that specifically asked for quick locks. One of them is in chat right now, Linda Lawson. And the other one is Kevin S he was in here a little bit earlier, but both of them had requested quick locks. I was able to make that happen thanks to Gene over at Sound Guy Solutions. Each of you are also going to be receiving uh, quick lock, quick releases from Sound Guy Solutions. So I don't know exactly what kit he's sending you, but it should be like one of the quick locks and at least two of the tips, I think is the kit Very he's cool. going to send you. But uh, both of you will be receiving those, and I'll be connecting you up with Gene right there. I just made a note. Uh, I'm going to be going through this document later and fully figuring this thing this thing out. But both of y'all have requested quick locks, and I was able to make that happen. So now that I'm seeing your your name, Linda, in chat, it suddenly rang a bell. I'm like, oh yeah, Linda. You got to keep in mind, I'm I'm running off of basically 11 hours sleep in the past 72 hours, and we are now almost 13 hours into this stream. So bear with me just a little bit. Time to take another zip fizz. On the topic of um, quick releases, I recently got a couple of the nano shields, and man, I'm so annoyed that I didn't realize at the time that they've got the quick release built into the handle, so you have to use their brand, and you can't use somebody else's, like Ambient or whatever. It's like, ah, damn it, and there's, yeah, never mind. So uh, I guess I'm switching over to them. I have, I have been me. happy with the Rycoat. The Rycoat's been good. Um, that's what we use here. Actually, mostly on the studio. Um, but I haven't used the ambient. Is is the? What about you, Alan? You use the ambient quick release, yeah? I usually do, and part of the reason is because I bought in and had like eleven of them before all the other competitions started coming out. So, but as soon as I found the Sound Guy Solutions one, I actually did a presentation about it um, when we gave one away to class I taught like eight, ten years ago, something like that. Sound Guy Solutions uh, donated one to us to give away. Then um, there was there was um, 
there were advantages. I did a video on quick releases and you should check that out if you're interested. I go over the, the six major branches of quick releases that are normally used by film people and how they would be used. There was one of them, actually one of the six is just an, uh, a cheap Chinese knockoff of one of the major ones. Usually I use the ambient ones simply because I have a whole stock of them and I use all my own shock mounts. So like the one earlier that I have that, that I just got through showing, it's already on there. I already have a bunch of the tips. I already have a bunch of these, but I have these quick releases all over the place. I literally have, how many boom poles there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 boom poles over there. And um, one, two, three, four, five of them have the ambient quick releases. The rest of them are the ones in my uh, that are out in the in storage or something like that outside in the garage or in storage. So, uh, but yeah, the, the sound guy solutions one, um, one of the advantages you have to that is that you can, you can rotate the microphone to any angle. So as opposed to the right code and the ambience where you can go in this way or 180 this way, the Orca, you could get in different in six different axes. The, um, uh, triad orbits, heavy what you would use on a stand something like that i think it has uh only a couple axes also maybe 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 that's another six it's six i think yeah it's yeah. a six also now that i think about it along with the, the so orca. so the sound guy solution so it sounds like you put it in you put it exactly where you want it and then you flip the latch right yes okay well you 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 do that and you can actually literally pick any angle you want to and then lock it in place and let me see if I can find the video. Someplace I have a video of me demoing it as we gave it away um, during a, a thing I did. Like I was, I was teaching a class about boom microphones and I, and I gave one away. And so you can hear what I say about them. And you see a demonstration where I li literally just press the thing and then have someone try to pull it off. And you see the, the, the boom pole, which was uh, just start to, to, you know, cause it wasn't locked properly. It wasn't locked enough. It starts to pull out and the thing hasn't released, but then I just go over there and I click a little thing and it completely releases. So I'll see if I can find the video real quick. Um, and because it's, you know, Gene was extremely generous to, to you know, as soon as I reached out to it, some people I reached out to and asked if they'd like to sponsor. Some were like, oh, it's a bad time of year. Maybe reach out to us earlier next year. And I understand that because I didn't reach out until like a couple of weeks ago for many of these brands. Um, and then, but Gene was one that I I called him up. And he said, yeah, sure. I'll take one for audio um Audio department and for Sound Guy Solutions. So I'm like, awesome, great. And then when there was a couple of people looking for quick releases, he's like, yeah, sure, I'll send them. And so that shows you the generosity and dedication he has towards education and helping the audio community. Just amazing, amazing support from Gene Martin over at Audio Department and Sound Guy Solutions. Let's see here. What does it say here? Will you be doing your live show on Sunday or taking the holiday off, Curtis? We are doing the live show on Sunday. Yes. Excellent, excellent. That's commitment. Damn it. Dang, yeah. We did I take, was just thinking, we took last Sunday off. Oh, okay. I was just demonstrating that I've got one of these Chinese quick releases right here. It was, you know, as you're talking about them before, I literally have it just here on my desk. And you know, it, it works you, and you're it off does camera. There you go. Oh just uh, fine. Wait, but, show um, it. Show it real quick. Yeah, so you know, just sort of like I've actually got two of yeah. them screwed together. I should just like unscrew that, but yeah, um, yeah, and so yeah, just sort of like clips. Oh, yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, like you wouldn't really want to put it on the end of your boom pole, I guess, but they are dirt cheap, and so I'm just going to using them for my shark fins. So it's not like you're going to swap about your shark fin to instead be on your boom pole or. I mean, at least not for my setup. So it doesn't, yeah, it, it, it works good enough for holding the shark fin up. Or then if it's for something else, like you want to just hold your monitor on your card or something. So there's lots of uses of just, you know, these cheap quick releases. But yeah, get something from, um, sorry, what is our sponsor again? You know, our, our, our sponsor, if you want to be putting one on the boom bowl. Sound Guys Solutions. Yep. Sound Guys Solutions. Bronson, you can so, actually say it out loud instead of typing if you want. Or who is that? That was Bandrew typing. That's Bandrew. That's on his uh, oh. Gator on Blues. Oh, golly. That's the way it sounds. <laughs> yeah, so somebody was asking about YouTube channels. 
and I was pointing out that Podcast Engineering School has a YouTube channel. They started producing, Chris started producing, I think, four or five videos per week, and I have just loved them. They are, it's, now Curtis, I see you like shaking no, your head like, that's like, like that's a lot of, yes, so yes. the way he approached, it's very early YouTube, it's not a five, ten hour production shoot, it's, Got it. okay. here's a single topic, three minutes, done. Yeah. I Got love it. it because it's just these quick, quick videos to just get a little bit of information. And then... <laughs> <laughs> but and but even, then, uh, even even early YouTube videos, though, I remember your review of a uh, was it a backpack? I can't remember. It was yeah, a, a let's bring those bag. up every um, single uh, stream that we did with Andrew because yeah. I'm sure he loves and it. And on that, that note, one. I am gone. <laughs> 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 yeah, my first review was a messenger bag. Be, so yeah. so let let's oh. talk about that. I. <laughs> well, why was your first um, review a messenger bag? Were you once a messenger yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, n no, I wasn't. So, I wanted to improve my ability to make videos, and I didn't have a lot of disposable income, so I just started making videos about what I had access to. And my first camera, I I had it somewhere here, is a Logitech C920. So, just using what you have, making videos, and practicing. You don't need to start and have a bunch of expensive stuff. Just make the content you feel like making. And now look at you today. Yep. It's amazing. Yeah, I now still... You have 900 microphones. You and I them... still have that messenger bag. <laughs> you still have the messenger bag. <laughs> Messenger back. So you gave it a good review. That's good, man. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's real quickly let's answer a couple of questions here in chat. One of them, one of them is right here. What do you think of Lobs on uh, Lobs versus Boot Paul? I think we kind of already talked about that, though. Um, yeah. I guess we could revisit it, but basically, um, I, I'm a, a bigger fan of using Boom Poles. Than lobs because their quality is uh, a choir, uh, higher and it gives post more signal to work with. And, and the DJI boom. mics for for and you're you're a boom off too. By the way, <laughs> yeah, but I mean I understand I, it's I'm a tool you. that's useful. But go I'm, ahead. I'm totally no, I'm totally with you. I think that we, I think the kind of the consensus was that you love when you have to and you boom whenever you possibly can because it mm. usually sounds better. You have more to yeah. work with. Yeah, I'm sorry. Alan, I didn't mean to. Uh, to oh no! You. By I all means, just, doesn't. I, mean, I just, we have a lot of a lot of people here, so. Yep. So Linda, said, I'm sure that was in response to her her getting the uh, Sound Guy Solutions thing coming her way. So oh, was that a messenger bag? Yes, no. I'm about to say this is a messenger bag, and it's the world's best ever messenger bag, and that is my review of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's about like Andrew's first one. What was the thing that you did where you said, "I love this, and this is why I love it. I love it because it, it, it's it's something I love," and that's my review. And what was it that? that no, you, I. So it, it was wasn't something like that. It was really funny. It, you worded it your own way, obviously, but it was a it was a review of an SD card case or a mouse pad or something. It's like it's a, it's an SD card case. It holds SD cards. It's great. <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> or I think I it's a it's a mouse pad. <laughs> I this was this was well before I realized there was an entire community of people who are nuts about mice. The DPI, the texture of the mouse pad, how that refracts the lasers and it's crazy how in depth it gets. What's their opinions about wired versus wireless? That must have quite a few battles. Oh, I'm I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure there are plenty of battles. I steer clear of all of it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have pretty much taken a step back on any kind of online battles, whether it be iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, SM7B, RE20. I will share my opinion there, but I'm, when people start arguing and crapping on each other, shut up. It's a microphone. Use it. Record something. <laughs> it's an operating system. It's a tool. 
Wired wireless. Yeah, fight over it. <laughs> um, let's see here. Jesse, I don't know if you caught this earlier. You actually won something. Um, you won a Worker B2. Jesse actually was uh, was the person that I, that I mentioned said that uh, recognized me from in content creation from having worked with me on set. So real quick here, Jesse, you want to work with me too, and I'll be contacting you soon to get that to you. Um, you are local, so <laughs> may end up saying, hey, meet me someplace. Since I know uh, we've worked together on the same sets before, I can at least put a face with the name. Uh, can each of you tell us something that has been most rewarding as you found success in your prospective careers? I guess it was nice getting to be on like quite big sets and experiencing like how different that flow is compared to smaller size stuff. So it's good to get to that point. Uh, I, say, I uh, oh, go ahead, uh, go ahead, man. When the numbers all sum to what I expect them to, I find that extremely rewarding in Excel. Word, yeah. I'm gonna say. Well, I mean, like, I don't think it's necessarily fair to say, like, success, but I would say what I get the most reward from is just community, like a sense of community, like the fact that we're doing this and the fact that we're all talking, we have something in common. I think that's really nice. And I think that, you know, the people that comment on videos, comment on reviews, and that we can have something to talk about and you know, different parts of the world, different parts of the United States, whatever, you know, different backgrounds. Like, that's cool. That's awesome, you know. Yep, yep, yep. What about you, Curtis? I agree. I think it's, to me, it's really fulfilling when um, you can help somebody get to a point where they want to get in terms of audio production. That That, to me, is super fulfilling. When people come back and say, hey, I mean, here, John Smith in the chat is saying, uh, he watched the MKE 600, Sennheiser MKE 600 review some time ago that I put up and ended up buying one and is, uh, it sounds like quite happy with it. Um, that's great. That makes me happy. Yeah, I agree with that to give a serious answer. I mean, my answer was serious before. I love Excel and when at my day job, that is very rewarding. But as far as YouTube goes, Helping people make informed decisions and learning that they are happy with those purchases is just amazing. Knowing that they didn't waste their money. Mm -hmm. the, the community is incredible as well. Agreed. Yep. I have one of the best Discord communities, and I, th that's one thing I will fight other people about. My Discord community is the best. <laughs> it really is. It really is. How, how, much, how much time... I'm not going to fight you on that. I'm just curious how much time it takes to, to manage that, to help keep that on the up and up. So it's surprisingly, we, we have a, a good number of moderators, but it's pretty low maintenance because we we don't have a constant flood of people. If it was 500 new people a day, it would just be a nightmare. But we'll get five or 10 people max per day. And most of them don't really engage. It's maybe one out of 10 that will be pretty active. And, and most of them will just go over to the advice section for an hour or two, and then they head out. So it's pretty low traffic, so it doesn't lead to any too many issues there there are occasional issues but not too much i will spend at least an hour a day in there though and especially like on the weekends on saturday night there'll yeah. be a, a voice chat going on and stuff going in yeah there. that's something that over the years that's been going for f four years i think every saturday a minimum of three to four hours <laughs> Uh, real quick here, uh, Dan's comment right there. Soundspeed does actually have a channel, and uh, it's basically production sound focus. He hasn't uploaded in a little while on it, so the U YouTube algorithm kind of, you know, pushes it down a little bit. But it is still there. So <clears throat> if you do a search for it, I think you might even be able to. I got to remember. 
I think if you go to my channel and you click on the related uh, the the channels that I feature or whatever, I think he's on there. At least he used to be. Um, I can't remember. There was a, there was yeah, an issue I was I've running into where I was and not uploading anything recently. I've done like one video this year. There was an issue I was having a, a few years ago with a trademark, and so I may have removed it during that time so that way oh you know, yeah i remember that yeah you remember that uh i'll have to tell you about that we we, we ended up um uh going uh getting ready fired up into full litigation mode and uh after i spent quite a bit of money had the other the other party say okay 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 and back completely off and completely abandon their supposed claim on the brand and stuff so that was something that I um, won't say names or won't say anything more than that. If yeah, you know, I, I, then, if you I, know, you know. I know who the person is. I should yeah. like Google stalk them and see what they're up to these days. Oh, it's, the, it's up to the same thing. Up okay. to the same thing. Uh, it's just a, a different, a different thing. Just change names, basically. So, I told, uh, I've told very few people about that, but uh, that's that's something that that's the reason I actually have two trademarks on Soundspeeds. If anyone's curious about that. I have, uh, and the word mark, one of them is word mark tr sound speeds, and it's related to all the different services that I can do. And one of them is tra is a word mark of uh, SS. And so <laughs> uh, it was short for sound speed, so obviously. But, um, sure, it's short for that, not anything else. No. It was, Yikes. Good thing why, there's no historical importance to those. Well, I didn't think about that when I actually did it. Because, and here's the thing. It said, give us a short way to word it. it it's like the, when, when it got the trademark, it said, give us a short way to put it in there or whatever. Uh, and I forgot the wording that it did. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just shorten it to SS. And then all of a sudden I find out word mark is important. I'm like, oh, crap. So I was like, I wish I would have put it through for sound speeds. Um, but, you know, once you do it, if you change the word mark, then they'll retract it. Yeah, I mean, you have to refile it. And at the time, I didn't want to do that because I didn't want the other party to potentially take that uh, word mark at that point or uh, take the trademark at that point uh, just by simply filing it earlier. A funny historical fact about SS, my great uncle was invited to join it. Um, but uh, this was like very early on in... Um, the Nazi world, so they were not quite going so nuts with the whole anti semitism Well, they're still pretty nuts with anti-Semitism. Yeah. And I perhaps <laughs> I didn't realize he was Jewish either. But yeah, that could have been very awkward if he had like agreed and said yes and found out later, oh wait, you're a Jewish guy in the in the SS. Um because yeah, my family <laughs> is German Jewish. Wow. So that was a very awkward time for, for my um grandmothers and great grand grandparents and Grand eight ankles and stuff and <laughs> yikes wow but yeah it's, it's just just an illustration of like how ridiculous the things were like my grandmother for instance in school during social studies they actually had her stand up it's an, a great example of array in stock because she was tall blue dye it's like tall blonde blue eyed aristocracy you know von kunzburg and um, yeah, just like all the perfect traits of Arayan race, except for the fact, you know, she's half Jewish. <laughs> and they just yeah. did it school. It's only a little thing, though, right? Anyway, <laughs> not a big let's deal. not uh, yeah. get ourselves scared from YouTube <laughs> for going down discussing this topic. Oh, yeah. Actually, well, I'm going to grab something right here and I'll show you. Okay, it's kind of cool. I hope it has nothing to do with what we have been discussing. <laughs> right? <laughs> Otherwise, this yeah, stream has gone in a <laughs> very <laughs> strange direction. Feeling a little flag, awkward. I to show my sweaty flag. Awkward. Um, hey, Curtis, are you using the A20 Minis, I think? I do have one. I wouldn't say it's my primary transmitter. I'm still using the A10s. Those are my primaries. Oh, the A20. Battery life, I guess. Yeah, ah. A20 is it's like a really specialized. Oh, look at that. Oh, yeah. Very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Can you biggie yeah. eyes that? Can you biggie size that for us? Yeah. Uh, focus oh. on your your window. Oh. Make that's yeah, what you make mean. Yeah. make your window big. I was about to hit the remove button. Okay, here we go. Uh there's well, I'll just do them both. Amazing. Very cool. 
it's my old address. I mean, since it's a matter of public record, I don't live there anymore. <laughs> so I can show that address. No problem. Whoever it is, it's the new people living there going to go get harassed. <laughs> Actually, uh, hey, I, I we want a microphone. Uh, I don't think give that us is. a microphone. That's the thing that's very interesting about public records, though, is they do post all that kind of stuff. So be careful with what you put online, even with government agencies. It's one of the reasons why I'm able to kind of track down and find information on certain companies because they have to license certain things. And uh, I will go and hunt down what they're working on in certain realms when they have to get approvals for certain things. I'll be pretty vague intentionally, but um, I've seen a couple of people, you know, post online and say, hey, we have a new product coming. Anybody want to guess what it is? And I'll just kind of do a little little thing that says, I know exactly what it is. I read your manual last month or whatever. And I'll get a, a, a DM, what? You know, and they're like, how did you find out about it? I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, and then they'll be like, okay. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. That's why I haven't said anything before, but I won't enter their well, contest and stuff like that where I could potentially win something because it, I'm cheating. <laughs> what was that? Oh, via um, patent filings, you know, you can often get like a, a clue, you know, or, or people registering with the, um, uh, or whatever the body is for organizing with RF. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm very easily Googleable. Like if someone wants to find my address, it'll take like five seconds on Google. But again, I don't really care because I am in the world's most remote city. Nobody yeah. from America is going to come over and harass me. And plus, even if you are in Auckland, I'm just in a, an apartment building. So. You know, like, it's not like my address for my house. There's a billion other people here. Well, I mean, I'm in, I'm in the South here. And the, the place that I currently live, the address, it's, it's, you can't find it because it's a rent, we're renting here. And even if you showed up here, I will tell you this, the house is heavily armed. So unless you come and knock on the door with a smile on your face and you attempt to be nice, it won't end well for you. <laughs> is it heavily armed with lots of boom sticks? Well, it is that too. There's a lot of boom sticks, but um, well, Alan is the weapon. I mean, he's, yeah, he's uh, the like... ninja. He's the ninja. He he does have to register right. as a register his fists as deadly weapons, That's and a myth, before actually. before fighting anybody, he has to disclose. I should warn you, these are legally classified. Whatever That's a it myth. is. That's non-existent. Because I actually asked that when I got my first degree black belt. I said, I've heard about this. And then he's going to shook his head. One of the masters, you know, the masters I was talking to was like, no. That's, he, he's like, no. Why I oughta? Yeah. I, I have heard of like court cases going through the courts and people being treated differently if they do have like substantial martial arts background. So, but again, I don't know what your legal system is, and it depends upon the circumstances. But anyway, better, better solutions just don't get into fights anyway in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't end up well for anybody. You're going to go to jail if you yeah. win. You'll go to jail if you lose. You'll be canceled regardless. Just avoid it. Yeah, I, I learned that from watching Con Air. <laughs> How much information I don't know if you've have seen you learned that, just from to... watching the internet, from watching movies, Andrew? You realize it's not real, right? My entire existence could be... Everything I have ever said could could be tied back to to just a movie quote. I kind of get that. I I'm the same way. I think <laughs> I, I speak I speak in movie quotes way too often. Uh, wait, um, get a... the group? what's the oldest recorder you've ever used? Where is that? Oh no, me. Oh, you? Oh, I was I was like, oh, where's that just, question? Just, <laughs> um, oldest recorder I've ever used? Jeez, I don't even remember. Um, or maybe like not because you, you're a Burmop, maybe like the oldest that the mixer you've worked with is used. You know, that, that, that might be it. Were you around in the night Niagara days? Or is that going back too far? Yeah, no, I remember the very first. I can't remember what the very first this horrible B movie. What was that thing? What, what did we record on back then? Or was it maybe just after Niagara Days? It's it was like, like 20, 20 years ago. When did we, when did we shoot that? 20, two, 2000? I think it was the first movie that I did. Uh, that was... A, that was... I think that, that might be Dat era. It might have been. It might have been... It was either Dat or it was Niagara. I can't remember what the, sh the, the show budget was. I can't remember what it was. That was definitely... Yeah, we definitely had Dat budget. Then. It might we, still be like... We, we definitely like had Dat. Niagara last. Yeah. Yeah. 
How about you, Curtis? Well, not nothing that old. I, I, I guess my first recording digitally on something of substance was a Digi 003 audio interface to a Mac. Uh, <laughs> so early, early two <clears> thousands. <throat> but, but yeah, not 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 a third recorder. No, no, no. But did did you have lots of issues with with the dats? Um, did you do you remember that? No, I, 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 was, I was asking asking Alan. Oh, Alan, yeah. I'm sorry. What'd you ask? Did you have? Were I, did, you working yeah, on did, any dat? Were there always like lots of issues in set with the dat? Because you know that that's what I've like heard. I was um, wondering like, what was your first experience were. Were they were they pretty temperamental? Uh, you know, as as uh, you know, usually any gear will be temperamental if you run into extreme temperatures. You have to be careful and keep things in the shade. Um, current uh, no, solid state recorders and stuff like that onto the solid state media this day and age is a lot more reliable, uh, especially with temperature changes and stuff like that when it's tape based. There were some issues that you would have with sometimes um, tape based systems with recording, but that's pretty much anything. That's th just the nature of what would sometimes happen. Sometimes it would drag a little bit or something like that. So there were there were systems in place to try to get around that, and minimize it. But the, I don't really remember, you know, um, if the, if the mixers were fighting something. I don't remember anything that was really blatantly obvious. Like I need a moment because this is acting up, or so I don't really, really remember any of those. We shot, um, I think, the Greenskeeper. I don't remember what that was. We shot that, I think, in 2000, 2001, something like that. And I remember for at least part of it, it was like 10 degrees outside. And we had, we were shooting in this warehouse. It was freezing. We had this, like, uh, like this dragon breath heater that was just blasting everybody to try to heat the room up. And there was only one. And the whole crew was trying to, like, be like penguins in the Antarctic Circle, you know, trying to huddle around the thing. Um, but, um, I don't remember really any issues, but then, as you mentioned, I'm a boom up, so I'm on set. I don't remember if if the fights that they faced, you know, because we didn't have two way communication nearly as much back then. Um, on oh, set, yeah, it was more yeah. you'd go and talk to the mixer. Now we can just go talk back, you know, wireless talk back and stuff. And if you disconnected, and and I think on that show I was running a single XLR back to the mixer, so I could not say anything unless it was through the boom, and the mixer wasn't talking back to me. So I don't think he had he had had a talk back system that was integrated into his recorder. So. Yeah, anyway, I've seen it as a segue to show what I got a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> it's uh, well, I mean, I don't think anybody would recognize it. Maybe Alan would. Wait it's, a minute. It's um, a... Oh, yeah. yeah. It's uh, is that a Fostex? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. That's not the one that. Um... Yeah, there's about three or four models that look from this angle like yeah. almost exactly the same. So, good. Yeah. I think it's, I. It, of the ones that look like this, it's the best version of it. Okay. There was, I, I, I can't remember which model. There was a Fostex recorder. What is the format the thing records on? So this this is not recording to DAT, but yeah, true. There were maybe like two or three models that look very similar to this. They're just a yeah. bit older. But this is kind of the first generation of them according to digital. And so, yeah, they still like look pretty much the same as their like last generation dat recorders but so that yeah, is a dat kind of to digital media well yeah that that's so. what i'm trying to remember because i i actually helped uh, there was a school that reached out to me and asked if i could speak to them and this is maybe eight years ago and and so i went to the school and i saw that the the, the guy that was basically had just got through taking over the av program there he was kind of looking for a new direction in his life, and he was offered the position, and he had been involved in, uh, in audiovisual um, producing and stuff like that for a while. And he said, you know what? That might be what would be fulfilling in my life. And he decided to take this AV program at this school and wanted to pump it up. So he reached out to a bunch of local people, and I was the only guy that really responded back, asking if I'd go out there and, and, and talk sound with him. And I said, sure, you know, whoever will listen to me speak sound, I will speak to them. And I mean, that's uh, why you YouTube, not, so you get to, um, even more people listen to you. Yeah, exactly. You know, how many people go into this live stream and they say the live stream is 17 hours long and Alan was speaking for 16 and a half hours of it. That's very much the way it is. doesn't matter how many people are in this. Um, it's funny. My daughters <laughs> will tell me that they tune into my, like, I'm going to go out there tomorrow. They're going to say, yeah, every time I popped in on your stream, dad, you were, you were the one talking. And I'll be like, yeah, I have a problem with that. Um, but yeah, there was, there was, um, after I spoke to this school, they were like, yeah, we're, I really want to try to get some gear and we don't have anything. And the school doesn't have any budget because they've never had a teacher that's really cared. And they want to see what I can do before they invest anything. But how am I going to be able to do it unless they invest? So it's kind of a catch 22. 
and the school didn't pay them enough to uh, pay them enough to do anything. So I said, let me see what I can do. So I contacted the local audio community and said, do you have anything that you'd be willing to donate to a school? And so a bunch of people were like, I have a recorder. I have this, I have this, I have this. And then I, I and then I contacted him and says, Hey, can I meet up with you after school one day? I met up with him and he just, I, I started giving him all this stuff. And he was just like, I mean, he, he was kind of surprised and just did this number. And then he just kind of froze and he walks over and like bear hugs me. He's like, you don't know what this means. We're going to be able to do it. I'm like, well, that's awesome. You know, but that was one of those things where I'm sure he's putting it all to use. It's a, it's a, what is that FOSTEX there though? Oh yeah. So the answer it is the um, PD 606. 606. Yeah. So oh. um, yep. they have the one before of, of, there was a PD six, which was the first ever digital one. Um, and this just came slightly out afterwards. And they've also got like the PD206, which is basically the same thing, but two channels. I I know, two two tracks. But yeah, I think it's still got, I think, yeah, I think you've got to record down to two, but you've still got the same number of inputs. But yeah, anyway, like this, this can record all the, all the inputs. And so, yeah, I got it for 80 bucks New Zealand, which is, I don't know, $50 in American. Um, so yeah, I was just kind of like, why not? <laughs> and um, I think this is pretty much the oldest I can possibly go back while still making it semi-usable in a very stretched meaning of the word usable on a modern film set. Um, because if I go to the previous one, the, the PD6, which is almost exactly the same, it lacks though... Um, the internal hard drive that it's recording to, mm -hmm. and it's also lacking what got added to the second to last firmware update to this, which was the recording to a USB drive, although it doesn't do it simultaneously, it does it the same way the Mix Pre 10 does it. It records to the main media and then makes a copy to that. Because, yeah, and otherwise, if you went to the PD6, which is, you know, only just slightly before this one, the very first one. So this was almost the first one. And you go to PD6, um, I would have to get, like, white bowl DVDs and be writing to, to the DVD to, like, as a recording media because there will be no internal solid-state drive and no firmware update to record to USB drive. It would just be, like, just, just unimaginable, like, difficulty in using it in any kind of modern scenario. I mean, it'd be not as bad as writing to DAT tapes, but only slightly worse. So yeah, I feel like this is the oldest sort of digital recorder you could still use in practical sense. But even then, you're like really stretching the terms of like practical. Like, can you see on the back? That is not one, but two V mounts. Wow. Is that <laughs> just ever power, seen a power with a double oh. V mount? So yeah, you can imagine like just by itself, you don't want to be carrying this on your back, let alone <laughs> rigged up with that. But um, I was kind of thinking, it's still like, you know, it was for its time, you know, your top, top end recorder and cost, I think it was like 10 grand or, or something, uh, 10 grand American, you know, goodness knows how many dollars and banana dollars in New Zealand that will be. Um, and so, yeah, I th I'm thinking like if I could just do like a fringe short film that I'm just helping out with them. I'm, and so I've got a boom up that they, <laughs> so I don't need to carry it. Maybe I might bring this out just to like, you know, have some fun living in 20 years ago and experience what it could be. But yeah, it's got to be something like when I've got a berm up already, so I'm not carrying it. And it's got to be just like some like low, no budget thing for friends. So I don't like putting too much of my rep reputation on the line for it. And uh, yeah, it could be like a fun, fun historical trip to, to like see what the experience is. And maybe we could do a video out of that too, hey? Real quick, Liberty Do just donated two hundred dollars to Stack Up, which is amazing. Thank you so much, Liberty, for doing that. There's a bunch of people in there showing the love and saying, "Holy smokes, look at this! Wow, yay!" That is awesome. awesome. And then, of course, uh, yeah. it's it's funny. There's one more comment I have to show here from Doc Justice, who is uh, actually sticking it out. He he, it's so funny because uh, you know Doc Doc will know because uh, Halter Technical. He's the He's the the main guru behind uh, the brain force uh, behind uh, Halter Technical, and it's funny because uh, Halter Technical was the very first person that I reached out to and asked if they would like to sponsor 
uh, do a do a sponsored hour of the Epic live stream, and he was on board from the very beginning because he's very he he understands uh, he understands the value of what I'm trying to do here, and he was you know it's it's nice he was able to, and and that uh, Halter Technica was able to. Um, but it's funny because his comment here of <laughs> make Alan bark like a dog again. I was actually thinking about that. I was like, you know what, K Tech, poor K Tech is is right sandwiched between t- Bandry's two hours. And so it's going to be bookended in with K Tech's, you know, pro wireless or uh, pro pro boob poles and all their uh, bags and everything else, with <laughs> barking like a dog and cats and everything else. <laughs> it's like you know that's going to be it, they're going to go back and watch this stream with like what the crap did he just do? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. awesome. <laughs> uh, it's it's hilarious. I was like, you know, I'm going to talk to Doc and he's going to be like, well. It's it's all that for charity. Exactly. That's the reason why. It's you know. all for charity. Exactly right. And <laughs> and I know that you do this for these go for 13 hours so far and it's nice to have these little goofball moments to break it up. They are. And also, it was funny cuz I I was I, I sent Bantry a message last night. I said, "Holy crap, these emails are killing me because they kept flying in." And it's like people can't just send an email and ask something quick. Or, or say, this is what's on my wish list. Even though I said, just send me a couple sentences. It's like a block. And it's like, holy crap, I got to read this. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a novel. And, and so after a while, when I got to past like 3 a.m., I stopped reading them. And then some people were sending me messages this morning, late in the morning. One person sent me a message right before we started and said, I would like this. And this is block text. I'm like, dude, we're about to go live. I can't read this block when we're about to go live. Um <laughs> So it's like, I'm sorry, I, I hate to be direct like that. I'm going to have to revisit some of these things later and say, yeah, sorry. But, you know, there's a lot that goes into this. And uh, and, and short but sweet is is great. You don't have to try to convince me. Just tell me your wish list. So. <laughs> oh, Darren's here. First, at church AV system we set up had mini DV cameras and mini DV audio recorders. Cannabis DV uh, Raptor cards and a, and a uh, capture video from mini DV tapes we still have a bunch of music on mini disc yes exactly as a matter of fact i have some mini discs literally right over there uh sitting on the edge because i i was one of the early people that jumped in on them and were using them for recording quick and easy things um a very interesting format very uh, very much more versatile in some ways than cds were but the quality wasn't nearly as good it definitely sounded a well, lower bit rate i think it was 12 bits or 12 yeah it was it was not even sixteen, so I remember that if you started fading out, it would you'd you would hear it cut off real quick. Wow, <laughs> it's kind oh, of interesting. Geez. Back in the day, are you still using your cedar, David? You have no audio. Sorry, um, I don't use it very often. In fact, I'm not sure when I last used it this year because. I'm mostly using my 8v3 most of the time. Not not this thing. Oh, gee. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm mostly using my standard as 8v3. And so... That's if they don't want to pay your full rate. You're like, okay, fine. I'm going to bring out the Fostex. You don't want to pay me. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh... only have, we only have $100 in our budget for equipment. Perfect to have the uh, ideal recorder for you then. <laughs> <laughs> I think if I was going to be using that on a shoot, I want to be paid more if i'm gonna to have to wear it like i said only in very like unique situations <laughs> and also yeah i just i just i don't think there would be a situation where people would ask me to use it um but anyway i got sidetracked there yeah so i'm mostly using the 83 and i sort of resisted spending all that extra money for the plugins but then at some point it went on sale this year for them so i bought the noise reduction plugin and although it's not quite as good as the Cedar, it's like good enough that not needing to worry about the actual weight and powering of, of the Cedar DNS2, mostly the Cedar DNS2 just stays at home now. Um, so I think the last time it got used was maybe a few months ago. Somebody rented it um, for a TV studio. Uh, real quick here, we had another couple of donations come through. I'm just going to address real quick. Sorry, I hear it a pause, and I'm going to j- dive into it. That's what I do. Anonymous for $100, and then Adam Stanford. Uh, weird Benjole Lee guy donated $5. So thank you very much for those donations to Stack Up. Banjo Lele. 
I butcher words. That's what I do. I should almost register that as a domain. I butcher words. <laughs> words are so, hard today. Words are hard all the time for me. So. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, so you have Curtis Judd audio commenting, and you have Curtis Judd actually in here. So that's kind of funny. <laughs> Curtis Judd audio is the the is it Curtis Judd audio the discount version of Curtis, or is Curtis <laughs> Judd the discount Curtis Judd audio long form content basically? Yeah, it's the yeah it's the long form content, and it's also the it's the more dedicated crew. Oh no, I I love CJA. I love the live streams. <laughs> CJ, it's just like I like the, uh, I like the podcasters, but I also really, really like the Band Says podcast. That's the fun stuff. The oh, ramblings yeah. of a madman. <laughs> I tell you, that is so much fun, though. The stories that will just come out of Bandrew real quick, the stories that he'll just, in, when he finds himself talking, sometimes he'll say things, and he's like, what am I talking about? How did I even get into this? What were we talking about? And, it, and it's so funny. One of the, like one of the stories I loved the most when he just started coming out. I was laughing so hard I almost ran off the road. It was when you went to you had the one opportunity to go to Mexico for like an hour. Yeah, that story. Would you please tell that here? It's like one of so, the best things ever. So my buddy was just like, "Hey, do you want to go to Mexico?" And and I didn't have a passport. This was before that was really a thing. You could just hop over, and we went there. And when we got there, we're like, "Well, we're not going to do any of the stuff people." come to mexico for let's go to burger king like the most american thing you can do <laughs> so we go to mexico we don't get authentic mexican food we go to burger king and at this time i'm a vegetarian so already a stupid decision and i was like well crap what can i get and i was like i guess a number one that's a whopper so i i could not speak spanish for anything and my buddy ordered for me and he was like numero uno e numero uno no carne and everybody working just like it, it was like a scene out of a movie they just stopped and like looked at looked at us like no carne <laughs> numero uno no carne tu es loco <laughs> <laughs> they thought I was a crazy person because I was ordering a hamburger without the ham burger in it. And uh, yeah, I was just a, you don't think about these things when they're happening. And then afterwards, you're just like, that was a weird experience. What what did they actually deliver? I mean, did you actually get something? Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it. You had to explain it to them like four times. <laughs> and so you got a bun with a <laughs> Was with lettuce, with just lettuce. like lettuce and tomato. mayo or whatever, <laughs> and to, a, to, a single tomato and pickles, maybe. It was just like the stupidest thing. <laughs> it's one of those things they're just kind of looking at you like, "Here you go, buddy." Because of my diet, I've done the exact opposite. I've ordered hamburgers <laughs> without the burger, you know, bun part. Yeah. Well, that's different. That's that's a that's a keto thing. That's that makes sense. Yeah. But <laughs> this is just like, can I get the the least healthiest version of this without like the protein? I just want the mayo and <laughs> I, I think that, okay, let, thinking about this now, I think it makes sense because in America at the time, they were doing this whole, oh, we have veggie burgers thing. So I was thinking, oh, they probably have that there. They didn't. Yeah. And, and <laughs> to answer John and the, I'm not vegan. No. No, if you were if you, if he were a vegan, you would already know. Yeah, it would it would say vegan Drew or something. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> how can how can you tell if someone's a vegan? Don't worry, they'll tell you. <laughs> I didn't even have to say it. Yeah, I have bags of dry meat <laughs> in my in my cupboard. How do you know somebody does CrossFit? Don't yeah, worry, same they'll way. tell you. Same way, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Oh, there's a bunch of those now. There's some that, I should, that we can't say on YouTube. <laughs> how how do you know that somebody uses a Sure SM7B? Same it's, answer, I'm assuming. It's, it's clearly it the there. Frame. You'll see it. You'll see it in the frame. Oh, they're on you Twitch. You already know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And I'm uh, throwing up the the things on the screen, which is awesome. The deuce. Yep. Podcast, it's two. It was one of the things that was kind of interesting about when you were out here, Banjo. We didn't actually record a whole lot. Mm -mm. Surprisingly enough, we basically recorded the stuff that's on your planet. That's about it. Yeah. That was literally about it. That's all we really did. Um, very interesting. Mm-hmm. I need to actually uh, watch more of Curtis's, Curtis's Sunday live streams live. I, I usually you're... have stuff going on in the middle of the day with the family during that. Like but, sleep, uh, you're sleeping. That's usually yeah. when you're sleeping. Isn't no, it? that's when I. That's when my my kids have everything in the world going on. My um, my six year old is usually trying to, uh, you know, that's about the time that she's wanting to, me to chase her around the house or do something crazy, and I'm like, you know, sure, let's do it. Uh, question all this, all the audio uh, that applies to what harnesses do you guys use? Like to carry sound bags on for long days. David. I, I personally, I've sort of swung around my opinion about this over the years because I feel, you know, just like lots of these other choices, it's not necessarily a wrong or right choice. It sometimes comes down to personal preference, just like if you like a Sankin or you, or you like an MKH. 60 or whatever and likewise you know if you like a zoom f8 or a mix pre or if you like orca bags or k-tech bags um actually my current opinion on on those two is neither um i'm quite a fan of my petrol or satchel bags but anyway um so it used to be that i went for like i want a big heavy duty harness and i really wanted to um you know give me maximum support but these days for the last few years, I've been wearing, I think it's, hmm, I'm trying to remember which, which, which brand it is. But anyway, it's, it's like a, it's a very, very lightweight one. Like Orca's got, like, if you think of Orca's most lightweight one, it's like that, but from an older brand, just look, a, um, is, is it? Is it Satchel? I think it is. Anyway, um, it, it, it is just like a, like a small square of cloth and just like four strips there. And the logic as to why I switched over to like the most lightest weight one is partly because like sort of a guy's been mentoring me a bit over the years. That's actually his preference. That's why I almost thought like, yeah, maybe like even though like I've got my own strong opinions and I've got my one that I like and I'm really happy with, let's give this a try when I saw one up for sale cheap. And then I started using it, and I'm like, it's just so much better because, A, it is, although um, the, the actual weight of what you're wearing is lighter because, you know, the the, the, heart, cause the harness doesn't weigh as much. And it's so much easier and faster to, like, get in and out of that harness. So even if, like, it feels heavier and does more stress on you when you are wearing it, if you're wearing that harness for less hours of the day the net like stress you're putting on your body is much less come the end of the day. Um, if I sort of garbled that explanation out. Um, so, but again, it does sort of depend upon your situation. I mean, like, I, even though like I'm now very much leaning, I've flipped my opinion and I prefer the lightweight harness. If I had a heavier bag and so, you know, you are feeling more stress maybe I would lean back towards a more heavy duty one. Or if I knew, like, I'm going to have no chance whatsoever at any point during the day to ever put my bag down, you know, then maybe I'd lean more towards a heavy duty one. But if you're if you're doing a day where, you're, you know, you're not going 24-7, you're going to have moments where you can just pop the bag on a chair next to you and burn it, or you have downtime while you're waiting around for them to do their stuff. Um, and also if your bag, you know, is not... A 688 your bag is a 633 or a mix pre or something then definitely i think it makes more sense to lean towards the more lightweight one but yeah in the end just try out both kinds yourself and, and find out what you yourself prefer and even if you find out you end up hating one of the other kinds hey at least you now have a backup harness um i, I, don't, I know um I looked at a bunch of pads because I wanted to, I kept, I, I kept going out there and grabbing like, 
I put something uh, on if I was doing a day on a reality show or something like that, and I got tired of using the, the neck strap. So I ended up looking at the Porter Braces. I ended up deciding on a VersaFlex, the BH, whatever it is, not, not the V, whatever it is. It's the, the one that was blue, not the one that was red, the very lightweight one that breathes. That's the one I ended up getting. And um, I think I might have used it 10 times after I got it because I stopped doing reality pretty much all the time. I would only do it if it was between long shows and it's like, someone, would you please do this? Would you please do this? I'm like, no. And then like, please. I'm like, no, please. Okay, fine. So I would end up doing a reality thing and I would always end up regretting it. But that was, that's something that um, I would always resort to is that harness. Now I do know that a lot of people who are bag people, they would end up getting the one that was the stingray because it has the spine built in for back support. Go ahead. I see you. You got the porta brace, the beast. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just thought I'd run and show the one. I was trying to remember the brand, the brand of it. And so, yeah, it's it's a porta brace one. And so you can see, it's just like it's a very small little square fabric that you know you wear this, and, and it sits on on your back. And then just very thin. Well, especially the back here, it's very thin straps, a little bit thicker on that side. And um, and yeah, and then you just have like simply only two clips that you just sort of like clip down and um. Yeah, so I just find this is a very light to wear itself. And also it's very fast and easy to get out. You can just like slide it up off you like this. We only have two ones to, to unclip from. So although I do also have like a very heavy duty one, you know, that that's, you know, just, you know, big sized. Um, I found that for the last few years, this is what I use pretty much always with very rare exception. I use uh, the Orca harness, the older one, not the new one with the like the metal rod. I don't, I haven't, I haven't used that. But, it, but it's is kind it of the a... same like style, but just with without the rod. Yeah. Is this the so, one with, yeah. with the waist strap yeah, yeah. and the double clips. Yeah, so it has the waist strap and the double clips and the and the shoulder straps, and it's kind of a it's like midway between what you're using there and the newer model where they have the metal rod. Um, but I, I actually try to stay away from bags. I don't I don't want to I have a sound cart mini. I would much rather work from that if I can, if it's ever possible. I know sometimes it's obviously not possible. For most of the shoots that I've done over the last few years, the cart has been way easier to work with. Yeah. Yeah, I think for a lot of us who are not at like the top end, having sort of a bag cart makes a lot of sense because you know, um, I, um, you yeah, because because even when you are working from a car, then at times you might need to sort of just jump and be nimble, and you know, and go up some stairs or or whatever, um, to follow with the berm up. Uh, yeah, I mean, quite often it's good to be able to transition on and off very easily, and um, and also if you do often work but by yourself, you sort of switch between the two from one week to another. It's good to not have to like tear apart your whole bag and. And build into a cart and back and forth. And yeah, I'm the same. I will like try to not wear my bag as much as possible. You know, it's if, brutal. If, if, I mean, you know, a twelve hour yeah, day I mean, with that on is just crazy. I mean, I've 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 gone through a whole short film. You know, like four or five days of shooting, and I will not have worn my bag for like one second. You know, because you know, even even if I'm booming it, it as well, as I'm saying, it's you no, know, I can just put it next to me, or I can put it on a chair. It's only if there's like a long walk and talk section where they got the gimbal as well, and of course you got to be on your toes and moving around pretty quick. But um, yeah, you, you don't really need to, especially like I'll often let my um, I've pretty much always been using a hardwired boom, um, and well, unless I have to, obviously when I have a boom op. Then I go wireless with the MM1 that we were discussing in the chat earlier. Um, yeah, I'll often like, but 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 whenever I'm both booming and bagging at the same time, I'm pretty much always always um, hardwired, and so I'll often just have a little bit of extra room. So if I do need to like move a little bit on my feet, move another couple of meters away from my bag, you know, I've got that room. So you know, and you know, combined with long reach of my arms and the reach of the boom pile, you know, I can cover people anywhere in the room without needing to run around wearing my bag. Um, and I think also I am about 
to switch over. Like I only just got my new digital booms and I'm thinking I might start to even, even less often wear, wear the bag because I might even be able to do some walking talks or, you know, if it's a little short distance or something or, or like bigger spaces and just not wear the bag and be just using my, 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 my butt plug, um, boom transmitter instead. Um, so yeah, because because that's the the big upgrade I've done for the end of the year. Hey, so because um, yeah, I've just resisted using these on the end of the boom pole instead, always just passing through the MM1 because I just felt like that gave the best quality. And um, but yeah, I think maybe digital will finally be the point. I will give up. The, um, the the hardwired for the berm, even when I'm operating by myself, perhaps. Um, just, I mean, like so far, my own tests I've done, like I'm pretty happy with how it's sounding and range and everything. I have yet to, I only just really just got it, so I haven't actually used it on a shoot yet. I'm not going to like go bring it out on the first shoot. I'll just wait for like a like little small short film, low stress scenario. You know, that's the best place to like test out in real life new equipment and yeah and if, if, if a couple of those projects go smoothly i'll start using them on everything so that's uh what's new in my world but yeah it's, it's pretty unusual not not many people are using um sony wireless but um I'm, I'm living on the wild side of life and being different and maybe you'll yeah if it works it works um, <clears throat> there's a question here that I was going to, that I just got through seeing here for a second. And I, I, I thought I marked it, but there was a question that came up here. There it is. Uh, do any of you ever use a, a, a short SM7B for, uh, or, or SM57 for shoots? I know it's not likely, but I have those, uh, have those ever come up in the film industry? Probably only if as a prop, like I personally don't, but like the only likely reason you'd use it is as a prop mic. That's also, you know, hopefully if you get a chance to be recording it as well, I have sometimes also recorded a prop mic. That's insane. Um, yes, uh, real quick here. There's a, a, a private question here. Uh, Bandrew was asking, did he say butt plug? Yes. Uh, could you show <laughs> the, butt, uh, the butt plug, please? That's a, that's a film term. It's also known as a cube. Or okay. a cube style transmitter that goes, that goes on the end of a microphone, but that's trying. Yeah, to there's, there's out. just so many terms that we use that out of context, like <laughs> a boom pole. Or a shotgun it's just, it's just or... kind of casually. We're all just like, yeah, yeah. Just, but, <laughs> well, yeah, and, nobody well, was phased, no, but except and, for Bandrew, <laughs> except for Bandrew was over there going, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, did I just mishear that? Um, the yeah, closest I've like ever... four or five of these. <laughs> You have four or five <laughs> butt plugs. Yeah. Well, do, you, do you ever use them all at once? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I am a child. The, what are the, the whole thing fit in one at a time. Yeah, oh, okay. So you've never used more than one at the same time? Gotcha. <laughs> that, that's good. You know, I've, I've oh, known no, people I've that used... use like two or three sometimes, you know, when it's needed for like 12 hours straight. Redundancy, yeah. Yeah, redundancy, just in case, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, real quick here, I'm, I'm going to... you've got two poles in use, you need one for each. There you go. A, 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 you know, that's absolutely true. Yeah, we, we, where's the lie? Yeah, there is no lie. Uh, that is absolutely truth. Um, real quick, uh, to answer this question here, I've never used an SM57. I don't even use those for gunshots because I have I have um, high SPL condensers. Usually the um, AKG C4000B is what I'll use. But I do, I did use a Shure SM7B on set, and I connected that to the bottom of, of a um, Audio Limited A10. So that was something a specialty application. You can see in makeshift uh, audio booth that we set up there. I used that for the second boom because I was booming on set, and we set that up for to to do some wild, uh, some do a wild thing for a voiceover for a um, uh, a trailer that was coming up for the show. And so that was one of the cool things that, that um, I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to set up. And they were like, well, let's use, a, let's use the, the 57. I'm like, no, you know what? Or they, they said, um, you know what we should use? We should use the um, uh, MKH50. And I said, no, we have an SM7B. We should use that. 
And the mixer was like, ooh, that could be really cool. So we used that. It was really awesome. Very cool. Sounded Very good. good. So anyway, that was something I wanted to share. I'm saving that one. In uh, news gathering, they use it on podiums. But not not other than that. I don't I think it's not so much in film. Yeah, that, that's not too common in in like news press gatherings. Maybe maybe more at like yeah. I was talking about the president of the U.S. is what I was referring to. Oh, yeah. you mean the 257s? Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. <clears throat> one of them is a 57. The other one is a hollowed out 57 with a CK41 uh, ca uh, Shep's capsule in there, a CMC641. Yeah, I've, uh, I've I've heard that before. Yeah, you saw you probably saw that in the same forums that we were that we're a part of. We're a part of Pro Sound forums, and the guy. We were talking about that, and actually, the the sound guy that does that's in charge of, of running the presidential mics, he said, "Uh, okay, I'm gonna let you guys in on something that's little known," and we were like, "Really?" And that was something that that the actual tech that did that. We we get a lot of insider information, and like you know, we're coming up like today uh, with all the 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 New Year's drops of the whatever your country does to bring in the new year, David. Uh, Okay, it, you're you're still you're still in the same day as us. I was like, wait a minute, yeah, did you? I, I, why were we hearing fireworks? Because I, I forgot for a second that we were, that you're not quite that far ahead. You're you're approaching. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not quite that far into the future, but it is getting like pretty late right now. And I was meant to be at a party ten minutes ago, so and I haven't even had a shower or got dressed for that or, or traveled. It's it's like up in the North Shore as well, so I really should tap out. Like an hour ago or two, so but um, I'll I'll uh yeah I'll probably yeah I'm gonna disappear soon, maybe like now. So, All right. <laughs> thanks very much. Well, for, um, see you, David. Thank Good you so much, you, David. David. Great really hanging out, David. We're, we're, we're Great seeing you as always. Time. Um, yeah, may, maybe if if you're still doing this in a few more hours' time, um, when I'm up there, as soon as I've got a laptop, maybe I'll check it and see how you're going. Actually, it's a it's in a party with some other filmmakers that i'm going to they're going to invite to <laughs> log in from Fun. there <laughs> log in from this from the party and we'll just keep it going uh yeah, yeah. Ben, bandry is committed to stay here until the end of the stream yeah so. and, and you know that, that i'm way sorry you what other, other filmmakers <laughs> as well to jump in also even better american filmmakers because that's actually like that are some people that came over from america because i think i think the wife is originally a Kiwi, but the husband and the kids, you know, are all are like um, American. But yeah, they, they recently, just like a year or two, came back to, to New Zealand. So anyway, I shall uh, get ready and head off to there and I'll check in with what you guys are doing in a few hours' time. Enjoy your party, dude. Happy New Year. Yeah, yeah have a great yeah, party. Happy New Year to you too. Uh, when you, when, what, what, uh, is it, you must be like early, early on 31st morning, right at the moment? Yeah, about uh, yeah. 22 hours to go. It's 1.41 a.m. for me. And there's 44 cool. people watching. And we have not dropped below 38 people all day. The most ah, we had stuff. in here at any given time was 76, I believe. That's and amazing. then I did the very first promo thing for Bandrew, and I dropped from that moment, <laughs> 76, that one minute and 10 I seconds, we dropped from 76 down to like 60-something. 63 i think it was we we dropped like like I, I said the number at the time it was like 12 or 14 whatever it was we dropped in a minute over that time because people were probably like no this guy's insane i'm not going to be watching this after all so cowards i know no regret right andrew he has no cares absolute cowards <laughs> uh but anyway enjoy david david's uh <laughs> just now jumping out here so uh real quick here a question came through do your kids understand what your job is as a boom uh or don't care they understand what it is um because they'll they'll see all this equipment laying around and so they would of course being kids they would want to play with it and so i would say here come over here and be being me i'm like oh here come on let me connect this up for you let me show you how this works and i'd put head uh, headphones on them and have them run around with the microphone we have you know the the hide and seek game that i play with banjo i played that with my kids which is you know how your kids will say to you you know, dad, can we play hide and seek? Well, there's only like two places in the whole house I can, uh, I can, you know, hide from them and they know those spots. It's like, okay, is he at the top of the stairs, you know, hiding in the dark area up there at the top of the stairs in the, in the second stairwell? No. 
okay, then he must be in this bathroom then that is that has a closet. So those are the two places. They'll go to one, then they go to the other, and any place else is out in the open. They can hide all over the place. So what I started doing with them is hiding a transmitter someplace, very, very small, you know, hiding that someplace. I'd go over and put the receiver on, the, on their heads and, uh, you know, headphones and say, go find it. So now you're seeking out the, the transmitter with a microphone on it. Go find it. So that's it's really doing. cool when the headphones are actually connected. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. So if you don't understand that reference there, uh, Bronson, I did a video with Banju last year. It's uh, if you do a search on my channel, do sound speeds hide and seek, mm -hmm. or just do a search probably for for Ban uh, for Banju Scott and sound speeds or something like that. You'll come up. But I took him on a uh, played hide and seek with him in the middle of of, of woods. And oh, nice. he had no idea where I hid the transmitter. And I did, <laughs> I did, th this, this will show you how I will usually be at 100% on everything. And then I will overlook the dumbest, stupidest little thing. I was thinking, okay, I'm going to go to another, another part of the country. And I'm getting together everything I need to record. And I looked at the transmitters. And I said to myself, well, these are, I'm going to be using these as recorders. Do I need to bring the little antenna on it? And I'm looking at this. How hard is it to put a little bitty tiny wire inside of the thing? And I said to myself, no, I don't think I need those. <laughs> I travel all out there. I don't have the, the antennas when we're like, oh, yeah. One of the things that we've been talking about for over a month now is playing hide and seek. I need those things. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, I did the thing you're never supposed to do and even second guess myself. You know, because I, I had my list of things before, you know, that you make when you're you, when you're sane and when you're tired, you're like going down the list. And then that's when you decide to question your your mental Absolutely. sanity. Absolutely. You know, yep. I'm going to question my list now that it's like this early hour of the day. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, what do I really need that? Do I really need that? <laughs> well, you, it's on your list for a reason. Yeah. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> uh, don't question it. So anyway, yeah, my kids know what I do. They do. They, and they they enjoy hearing certain stories and. Uh, what's funny now is that they'll they'll have met some of the stars that they see in movies and we're like well you you met her and they're like really and then i'll show a picture of when they had visited set one day you know this is way pre-covid and they were small and i'll show a picture and they're like oh i didn't realize i had met her or that's i didn't awesome. realize that and, and and they're just like really i didn't realize that and it's, it's kind of funny that's way cool yeah so uh, let's see. Question for Curtis. Uh, I did you? Yeah, I, I looked at the, oh, so to check out the Nariva microphone mystery, I looked at the website. I have not had an opportunity to go to an installation, but it's an interesting, interesting concept. And I do hope that somebody solves that problem soon, which is conference calls in office spaces are just ear splitting. So hard to listen to. <laughs> yes. Uh, real quick, Joshua, uh, I'm a stagehand for live events and just got a job as an AV tech. So you guys are always throwing out pearls of essential wisdom. If you are not subscribed to Dave Rat, if you do live mm. events, go to uh, find Dave Rat, watch his channel. The dude has so much experience in the field, owns a company, has sells products. This dude, he'll, he'll do things like, like he'll just connect up a whole surround thing of subs that are like six feet high and he brings the camera and then you see the stability of the camera, you know, shaking and you see the people inside there, you know, shaking because of the wind of the subwoofers. And you'll see him, he'll just, he'll talk and say, oh, well, let's explain the reason why an array is different than if the forced, if forced thing speakers and he explains it and he demonstrates it with candles and stuff and how the, the air dissipates. And so you're like, I never thought about this stuff. Awesome. And it's another world yeah. than what I do. But if you're not subscribed to Dave Rat, definitely do it. He's got yeah. so much information with live sound. It's insane. Or it's like, amazing. hey, I'm going to connect seven kilometers of XLR cables to see how it affects the audio. And he does. And then, yeah. then he delivers all the information in the most laid back, beach bummy way. <laughs> it's, it. it's incredible. The mm -hmm. guy's a legend. And he's the mixer for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, yeah. is he not? Yeah. Yeah. The, but the live, the live show. Yes. The live yeah. show. Yeah. All right. So it says bought it, uh, 75 six headphones here based on Cliff uh, or Cliff Ravencliff's recommendation. I met an audio engineer who runs a mixer for a TV show. And they're awesome. I saw Mike's video. 
Awesome. It says <laughs> seven five oh sixes aren't really flat. They're they're very very mm -hmm. bright. But you know what they. Uh, who was it, Badger? Did you say? Uh, no, it was either you, one, uh, one of you two guys, either Badger or Curtis, that said that they're kind of like magnifiers. I don't is think it, I it? said that. I think I think I view them that way. Yeah, they are. They're. I like them for production sounds sometimes because they they are. Yeah, like you're like they seem to emphasize all the frequencies you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> or, Seems fair. Or, I mean, yeah. like like you're gonna really notice something that's a problem. Is that? Don't you use them, Alan? On or do you? Use I do use them on set. I do okay. use them on set because I can hear through them, and they're still closed back headphones. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I do that. You know, that's yeah. what I what that's what I personally prefer. I've tried various different headphones. I've tried IEMs. I like those. I have the the whole quick mannerism that I can quickly say where is that, and I'll have <laughs> both ears on, and then I'll suddenly kick one off because I want to hear. Yeah. You know something. Yeah. It's funny how when you're a boom operator, people will come over to your ear and they'll whisper something right here. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, I can't hear you. My ear is out 20 feet. Yeah. My ear is over there right now. You're go you're over there <laughs> trying to whisper something. I'm like, you know, what are you doing? You know, go out and whisper into the boom and then I'll hear you. But whispering <laughs> in my ear is stupid. And so that's that's I mean, I'll just kind of look at people. I'm like, who you know, over there is where my ear is. So there's actually some stickers someone made that, that sticks right here and it says, I can't hear you. That's great. And yeah, it's really awesome because yeah. it's true. When you wear something like the high noise, the remote audio HN 7506 is for a second. The 7506 driver is basically in um, high SPL, like basically like helicopter air, uh, helicopter mm -hmm. pilot headphones. Those things sandwich your head like really tight. And you hear the 7506 is very clear. And it cuts out a lot of the background noise because it's their high noise. Someone can talk in a regular volume next to you. And try to get your attention and you'll be like oh there's someone and you'll you'll hear a little something you're like what is that and it's like someone right there trying to raise their voice talking to you it's pretty trippy that's crazy yeah. so question about the pot uh that we just won uh beyond i'll be uh, it'll be a great use for recording choirs and bands we actually already have a p4 can we use both together and merge hmm sure yeah. Yeah. If yeah. You, you should be able to. If, yeah. if you have four tracks from each of them, dump them all in your DAW or your nonlinear editor, yeah. sync them all. Yeah. Yep. Sure can. Um, those are, uh, are those dedicated? I'm, I'm not familiar with the pod, pod track before. Is that actually a recorder? Yes. It yes. is. Okay. So, yeah, absolutely. Guy. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So, yeah, just put them in there, hit record. You'll probably need a memory card. For it, because I don't know if he's including uh, that. With they want to know if they can use two of them, and the answer, yeah, yeah, yeah. can. Yeah. So, question recorders. for you, because because I don't uh, record on multiple recorders. Do they need to worry about any kind of time code or anything to sync them up? Would there be any potential drift between the units? Well, Possibly, technically, not. technically, you shouldn't have to, but in reality, yes. Okay, you probably will. You'll probably have some sort of a of a thing, um, or you may. Some devices I've never never used that one will start to drift if the batteries get low, mm. uh, and they'll sometimes they'll they'll start to kind of have issues like that that will that will pop up, and you won't know it necessarily at first. Uh, one of the big things, just like what we all do when we synchronize our videos, give it a couple of claps. Yeah, for sure. I usually do three claps. And then I do an overly dramatic deep breath and I hold my breath. And that's my indicator that that's, you know, when I listen back to the sound, I'm like, the deep breath is my indicator. Not because I, I, I mean, because if I'm listening and I don't do that, I'm like, wait a minute, is this me going quiet where well, I can take a sample? And then I start to take it and I'm like, oh crap, I'm breathing now. Or I'm like, what's going on? And then I start clicking. I'm, I'm like, where's the part? So I always take a very dramatic breath in <gasps> like that. So that way I hear it. And I'm like, okay, I know now is my, my part that I can take and steal that from. So yeah, I always clap and sing the song "Car Wash," and this is my <laughs> intro for real. <laughs> Just gets you in the mood. Yeah, but I'm like, hey, working. At the... <laughs> I I want time. to hear uh, uh, Curtis's opinion on the the topic here regarding the ethos and the SV33 because I haven't used the 33. What do you think of the two microphones? Is there because don't they use the same capsule? What? How different are they? Well, they're 
Um, they're, they're they're not exactly the same. They do sound a little bit different. Um, if I do a like a sample of my voice on both of them and play it to multiple people, most people actually pick the ethos for my voice mm. personally. Um, I think that it also keep in mind that the SV33 was originally designed for vocals, vocal recording. Um, is it the cleanest in terms of self noise? I think with that issue came, or that question came up. I don't know. I never did a like a any sort of tests or measurements of that, but it didn't seem problematic to me. Um, I think I feel like um, I feel like we're doing a lot of belly button gazing as far as self noise is concerned lately. Um, I mean, we generally not 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 just this group here, but I think people are. Yes, there are pro there are some microphones that have problematic self noise characteristics. No no question about it. It's usually on the lower end, less expensive end. But um, I mean, even like a there's a Shep. Doesn't the Shep Super C Mit is something like eighteen dB A weighted or something? I don't know. It's like it's not. <laughs> I don't see it as a big problem necessarily. I think I think people are getting a little too obsessive about that in some cases. The thing maybe, to keep in, yeah, maybe you're right. Know. And and part of it here is keep keep this in mind too. In the analog world, and I was talking to Petrushka, who's now in chat uh, about this like 12 hours ago. Um, there was a time when you only had in analog recording only about maybe 30 to 40 dB of signal to noise ratio. When your noise levels are higher and they're more matched, that's when you will get increases in decibel levels quite, you know, it doubles like 3 dB, for example, uh, or, or 6 dB, depending on, on the math and how you're doing it. And if you have, if you start adding in multiple sound sources like that, you will start to run into noise floors as noise floors rise exponentially when the noise levels are higher to begin with. When they are very low, when your noise level is like negative 70 dB, if you add in two mics and you're at negative, you know, 67 dB, oh my gosh, what's the deal? Who cares? DAWs this day and age, one of, this is one of the reasons why I did a video not long ago, said you're nitpicking the wrong noise. Because so many people will say, well, the EIN of this is negative 128 and this one is 127, this one's better. And I'm like, no, that's there's more to it than that. And the thing is, though, in modern day digital workflow, it is so easy to dial out the noise of a recorder. And not only that, if your issue on a condenser microphone is your noise floor, you've already won the game because <laughs> you have a condenser microphone that already has a very low noise floor. Then you have your recorder that has a very low noise floor. If you're hearing the, the microphone or you're hearing the self noise of your preamps and you don't have them gained way up because you're trying to whisper at them from across the room, you've won. The The environmental noise around you is going to kill you 99.9% .9 of the time, if not higher. Yes. Because, and you got to eliminate that. That's the noise you worry about. That's the noise that's not consistent. You know, 150 ohm uh, self noise from a uh, 150 ohm resistor is not your issue. That can be easily dialed out in post. What you need to worry about is the stuff that you cannot control. The stuff that is like from the real world, the environmental noises, the air conditioning units that turn on the person like, like, like Ricky earlier, uh, the, the guy that was like screaming, you know, profanity at the person in the next room over. That's the kind of noise that's going to affect your recording much more than a noise floor in your preamps. So. A amen. Yes. There yeah. you go. That That's, that's something uh, I've been going on this journey about overexpending overspending on gear but also just these realizations that i've been focusing on stuff that may not be as important as i thought it was <laughs> that's why i made the video does preamp noise really matter and i have a note the next thing i want to start exploring is does self noise really matter because i have complained oh this is 20 dba is that really a problem for most people when does it become a problem? I want to find the highest noise mic I c and then a super low noise and see how they actually compare. And is it really audible for general purpose use? I understand how? for like super <clears throat> high-end professional stuff, mm -hmm. films, 
for VO, whatever, they may have standards that require it. But okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to answer that real quick for you. What's your favorite microphone? What's the noise level of it? What's the what's the uh, what's the sensitivity of it? Uh, SM7B minus 59 dB is the amount of gain it requires. And if you calculate that from the specifications, you're going to find that it's about equivalent to negative 19 dB. That's relatively high as far as standards are concerned on a very non-sensitive microphone with something like a 1.1 millivolt output of, mm -hmm. uh, of voltage. And something like that where it is so quiet and then you have to have clean preamps to boost it up, yet everyone uses them and not everybody uses them with FET heads or, or, or FET lifters and cloud heads, as uh, Julian Krause says. Yeah. You, you don't have to use those in most modern things because you can easily process it out. So there's your answer right there. One of the, the, the loudest self-noise micro, mi self microphones, the SM7B, is very popular, and yet people don't have issues with it. Yeah. But but I want to I want to absolutely actually test yes. it out. Yeah. Yes, absolutely do that. So and I would love to see that video. I expect a comment. You did this wrong. <laughs> well it's, it's funny because even when it's so funny because I'll 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 Banjo will do a video, I'll do a comment and say, Yeah, his testing is valid. And then he'll say, You're I'm gonna get pushback because you're no, coming I'm like no 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 I I this wasn't said to me recently I said I was I think I'm going to get additional pushback based on what you mentioned or or yeah based on what you said in the comment not because of but this but okay. on the topic of what you said like oh it's this isn't a good test because you're using 150 ohm resistors this isn't legitimate i imagine some people were going to come at me because of that i did i was said it is a good test no no i under you did i, didn't I say understand it wasn't you good. did i said it was a good test i understand you did i understand you did but i'm expecting pushback because i used 150 ohm resistors and didn't have them wide open i see well it lowers uh, the uh, yeah you have to you have to simulate the load though how do you do if... that other if you are measuring ei in you do that's when you're going to have optimal signal to noise right, right, ratio right. is when the preamps all the way open one of the big reasons i always champion having interfaces and recorders with a high amount of gain is because if you have uh if let's just say you need you require let's use the sm7b 59 db of gain which are you going to if if all else is equal let's say the two the ein of uh of two different devices is negative 129. One of them has 76 dB of gain and the other one has 60 dB of gain and you set that for negative uh, you set that for 59 dB of gain which is going to give you lower preamp noise. See, I would say they should be the same. Technically with the same EIN. Except, except that when you have 60 dB of gain and you lower the EIN which is negative 129 right here, you lower it down to negative to add one dB less of max than maximum gain, your noise is going to be like here, a little bit lower, versus having your EIN measured here, and then you're suddenly dropping it down 17 dB. That's going to drop not not it's not going to be 17 dB lower. It's going to maybe be three dB lower, four dB lower, something smaller, but still because because it's 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 one of those things that you're if you only have 20 dB of gain, that's a lot of noise. You add 30 dB of gain, it start, it's logarithmic. So it's going to start to peak off. So that's why it's going to be less at maximum level because, you know, it is logarithmic. But it will be lower on the one with the higher amount of gain. Very little bit, but it is going to be there. So That's something else I want to test. That's yep, a, do that. That's do that. I think I did that in one of my videos recently. I think I did. I can't it remember anymore. It would be hard to find two interfaces that have the same EIN, but drastically different gains. I'll have to look into that. I'll just go steal the data from Julian. <laughs> he has the tables. I'll just steal the data there. Well, yeah, he's already... I mean, seriously, he has a list. Go yeah, to the list he's, and he's say done it. EINs are the same. Which one? Yeah. Oh, this has this amount of gain. This one has this amount of gain. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's why, that's why he presents that information. So you have it. Yeah, 
Exactly. So grab those two. You also have a Sound Devices Mix Pre 6 that you've never opened or never used, right? I, I, it's in a drawer. <laughs> and I think I've used it once. Yeah. It probably is a doorstop or something to hold open your, <laughs> your, your mic when he does the storage when locker. He does the box throw he needs something that can keep the door open so if he yeah, does get yeah. the box out the door Makes sense, yeah. it's kinda... well I mean also the carpet because the door is just digging into the carpet that keeps the door open because it's a poorly manufactured place that I live you mentioned that in the uh, 4th of July live stream that we did mm. someone asked you do you have you ever shot a video with the door closed and you said no the place is, that I live is it's so poorly constructed that the door doesn't close yeah. I remember we all laughed about that. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm uh, Alan. Mm. I can't do anymore. I I got up really early and I'm falling asleep. And I have them. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody. Bandrew, I'm sorry to bail on you again like this. I'm, I'm just ticked off because I was thinking about failing, but hey, now I can't. You guys can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, now I hey, can't. It's great hey, to meet you. Hey, you too, man. Yeah. Alan. Yes. Keep, thank you so much for putting this together. This is, uh, I think, a really meaningful thing, not only for the, the sound community, but also for the, the charity for Ups. Yeah, it's it's a it's lot. Great. It's 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 a lot of fun. It's a it's a good thing that we're able to do here with all the fundraising. It's um, it's great to also uh, you know see everybody and to be able to hang out at the end of the year and you know the sound community is one of those things that um, I think we're it's it's kind of cool how we all watch and all kind of interact with each other and yet we actually probably see each other more often than many other communities online and. Um, uh, Bronson, Google gobble, Google gobble, one of us. So this is your first epic live stream, but you know, hey, you're gonna be back hopefully again. Hey, yeah, so, I'll come back. We Absolutely. accept her, one of us. Google gobble, <laughs> Google gobble. And I didn't realize that uh, you had COVID. I do. I have a case of the cove, the vid. Or the... Yeah, I saw, is I this saw the a... second? Yeah, because you the second one. Yeah. What, was it this year? Second time this year? No, um, I had it back in 2020, um, end of 2020, I think. Mm. And then, yeah, got it. Um, like last, I guess it would have been like, I'm, I'm at the tail end of it though. It's like five days or something like that. So, yeah, I remember in 2020, you sounded brutal, bro. Dude, the, the video that I have coming out next, the end of it, I just sound like trash. <laughs> <laughs> It's over the course of like a five minute video, you go from studying normal to suddenly, yes, I'm going to sound like ET. I really it's, do. <laughs> that's where we're, someone's like, are we watching like, him slowly happened? collapse over the course the, of this video? The worst part is, is I forgot a part at the very beginning. So I like cut it. <laughs> so it's going to be like night and day where you're very alert and energetic with your voice sounding good to all of a sudden. <laughs> Why is there a corpse presenting now? This is bizarre. Wait a minute. Weird is art. There an AI in there. Is this an AI thing he's trying to see if we notice or not? <laughs> it's, so, it's so bad. Oh my gosh. It's you know so what bad. you could do? It, it, if you wanted to mask it a little bit at the beginning. No, just do like the text to text to speech thing. I always find that so funny if it's just normal oh and then just gosh. the most obvious overdub with crappy <laughs> VO. Yes. I told I told you the way I do things is I just ADR it. So yeah. I do the, yeah. I'm like, oh, crap. My mic's in the same place it was record. And I hit record and then I do it again. I process the audio the same way I did before. And then I just slip it in there. So if you watch and speaking and all of a sudden my mouth completely starts to go and you're like, and, and all of a sudden it'll come back in sync. People are like, <laughs> like what happened? It became That's an old, awesome. you know, one of those old Chinese movies from the 1960s where the mouths never match the, the old Bruce Lee movies. That's awesome. Um, where the mouths never match the, the whatever. All right, gents, friends, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Curtis. Curtis. Really Thanks, appreciate Curtis. it. Always showing up here. You originally told me you weren't going to come in, and I'm glad you were able to, man. I'm so yeah. happy As I always. Did. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk and to you happy later. Happy New Year, Curtis. Happy, happy New, New Year, Year Curtis. Bye. All righty. So when it comes to 
fixing a line, I always enjoy making it as obvious as possible. I don't always use the text to speech, but if it's, hey, welcome back. This microphone was four hundred dollars. Yep. <laughs> Today, I love doing it just like that obvious because it makes me laugh. That's yeah. Awesome. You know, I still think one of the best intros you ever did to a video is when you walked in backwards and said "Greetings, Earthlings" completely backwards. So, I I think my first video this year needs to be that again because some people didn't realize that's what it was. They were just like, what is wrong with him? Because I didn't do the most obvious thing. You drop something to make it clear what is happening. I didn't do that. So I need to redo yeah. that. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. That is, but it's funny because I, I think I, I heard the sound and it sounded like it was reversed. And, yeah. and because it was, you know how the sound, like you'll hear background noise, it sounds different. There's uh, something weird to it. And... I remember watching it. I'm like, why is he walking so weird? Well, it's because yeah. you're walking backwards, trying not to knock things over. Walking backwards, trying to make it look like I was walking forward. Yeah. And so <laughs> if awesome. people never get the arms right because as no. you walk forward, you always, you alternate with your arms and legs. But then whenever someone walks backwards, they, their arm goes over their leg. So mm -hmm. it's something that people never get right. And if you do it, if you do it, trying to do it right and you're consciously thinking about it, then you'll always end up screwing it up. So it's it's hilarious. Uh, the UK is waking up. I'm amazed you're still going. Well, of course, John. This is the epic live stream, <laughs> and and I I don't Only know how to do fourteen hours. Any, uh, yes, actually, we are. So since the UK is waking up, I'm going to say one thing real quick. Sean Milo, who sponsored an hour like yesterday evening for you, if you are in the UK, and you send me an email at Alan at soundspeeds.us, I will send it to Sean and he will send you a free copy of his audiobook that he recorded, which is about 10 hours long. And it's called The Shark in the Housing Pool. It's a really cool story and it's literally sitting right there in my third tab. And I can't wait to actually start listening to it again. It is a it is a story about uh about a guy that uses mortgage fraud. He's uh he's a mortgage fraud con artist artist. And every single thing this guy touches, it's like, okay, you're about to get busted. You're about to get busted. You're about to, and it doesn't. And it gets deeper. And it's an awesome story. And if you are in the UK, it doesn't work for the rest of the EU because he has copies that are like coded to the way that it works, you know, in their system in the UK. It's a it's a freebie to the UK people because he he is is offering it to anybody that's listening is interested then you can definitely send me an email to Alan at soundspeeds.us and we will give and he will give you a free copy of his audiobook. Now, for people in America, if you're interested in buying a copy of The Shark in the Housing Pool, if you don't do the free trial, you know, through Audible to get to, to get to listen to it, if you buy it with one click and you forward that to me, that way the email address is on there, you forward me the receipt, I will send that to Sean so it's, he can see the email address. And he will give you a copy of his audiobook, the program. Same, same guy, but he's on the inside of G. I mean, it's not hard to imagine. You know, you know a con artist is going to get caught eventually. You know, the book has to go somewhere. You know where it's going to end. He's not doing a book about how he got away with murder and then all of a sudden, you know, you're like you never got caught. Well, obviously, um, but it's about what happened on the inside. And it's it's. Uh, he was telling me about it earlier. And I'm like, ooh, I can't wait to do that one to to hear that one when I'm done. I talked earlier about 12 hours ago about listening to audiobooks in your car or maybe as you're doing things around the house. Personally, I have stopped listening to the news. I just live in uh, the oblivious world of of my own Same. and yeah. I don't I don't stress out anymore about it. I used to get myself nope. so fired up in the morning driving to work. I'm like these idiots out there that are running the world. Why are they in charge? And yeah, I get so frustrated. And then I'd go to work and I'm like fired up and, you know, wanting to just, you know, destroy something. And then sometimes I'd be overly direct or something, you know, and I just, you don't need to do that. It's unhealthy. So I said, I'm going to listen to an audio book and take a week off. A month and a half later, I was like, oh, I'm like four books into the series. I'm like, I don't miss it. And now I listen to, you know, a YouTuber's videos. I'll listen to audio books. I'll listen to whatever I want to in the morning. And it's so much more pleasant. Yeah. And there's many times I'll get to work and I'm like, you know what? I have time. I'm going to sit in the car and finish the chapter. And that's awesome. And this book is one that if you're interested in hearing those stories, kind of like catch me if you can, where it's like, oh, what's going to happen next? This is a story that's equally as good. And the stuff that, that, that he caught, you're, you're literally saying, oh, you're about to get caught. You're about to get caught. And then he, and then he figures out a, just a, 
a way that it doesn't, that he doesn't. And then all of a sudden you're like, wow. And then wow again, and then wow again. So if you're in the UK, real quick summary, if you're in the UK, shark of the housing poll, send me an email. And if you're in the UK, we'll, uh, I'll have, uh, I'll have Sean, uh, forwarded your email and then he will send you a, uh, a voucher to get a free copy of the shark of the housing pool. If you're in the United States and you buy it with one click, send that uh, receipt to me. I will forward it to him. He will use your email address and send you a voucher for the program. Another audiobook, So you get two for the price of one. Awesome. So there you go. Morning Europe. Let's see. Apparently, a lot of Chinese uh, TV shows are dubbed because the actors speak different li- dialects, so it's easier to hear everyone that's dubbed. Yes and no. Like it depends on when it was. Uh, Bruce Lee's movie, like Return of the Dragon, the the what is it called, the Mandalorian Productions, the uh, Raymond Chow's uh, company, Golden Harvest. A lot of the early movies that they were doing in the '60s and '70s, they had horrible sound recorded on set, so. It was it was so bad because the camera noise was really bad and the noise was really high. So they had to completely dub the movies because it was so bad. So that was back then. Now it's different. You know, the world of digital really changed some stuff. Time to get some UK audio YouTubers to join now. You know, I did reach out to uh, one that I know, but he's on vacation and um, he wouldn't he would not come aboard. I left the stream open and the video and audio got out of sync. Anyone else noticing this? YouTube isn't obviously. Uh, refreshed. Same happened to me while I was doing live stream. When someone beats how YouTube manages this performance of living syncs. Yeah, you know, I, I imagine that with all the different streams coming in, think about how many people are doing live streams at any given time and playing videos. It's, you know, this is a um, interesting. I mean, it, 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 think about how amazing this really is. It's true. That's very true. Yeah. You know, count your blessings here. We couldn't for do this free. a few years ago. We couldn't do this a few years ago. Oh, for free. Feel yeah. free. <laughs> Treat yourself. <laughs> so. Good night, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, night, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeff is an actor here in Atlanta, or at least I've worked with him on a couple of projects here. And uh, it's 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 cool because we'll we'll talk, you know, on set. And uh, he actually mentioned it earlier. He he asked me. Uh, he would say, what do you need from me? And I'm like, and, and I have to diplomatically because I'm talking to an actor, I cannot just say, well, I need you to do this. So I would have to, you, one of the things you have to do is you have to play with words. You have to lead someone to the resolution for themselves so they understand what it is. It's like when you talk to your kids and your kids, I don't want to brush my teeth. I don't want to brush my teeth. And you're like, why not? Well, to go brush your teeth. I don't want to. I don't want to. But you like eating steak, right? Yeah. You do like steak, right? Yeah. Well, then how are you going to eat steak if you don't have any teeth? I don't know. Well, how do you protect your teeth? Got to wash them. Okay, so you're going to wash them? Yeah, I should wash them. I should. You're, yeah, I, I'm going to go wash, brush my teeth right now. Okay. You lead them to the answer. Yeah. And I don't want to say actors or children, but some of them are. <laughs> Um, <laughs> no. but, Jeez, you know, other people, getting other, other spicy people, up in here. Other people do the same thing. You know, you can talk yeah. to other people and you can lead them to the answer. It's actually a management style where if you, instead of being a manager where you dictate what you want the people that, that work under you to do, you ask them questions that will make them think of the answer or think of the best solution based on two or three answers that they're, that they're pondering. You can lead them to the right uh, answer. That way you're not telling them, but you're giving them things to think about because they understand the entire situation. So, that makes, yeah. Um, I think with uh, some of the spaghetti westerns, they, I don't know if they had the same issue just with the noise on set or if it was different languages, because I, I think some people were speaking Italian and others were speaking English. To answer this question real quick, no. I'm going to be editing the Yule log, the animal Yule log that I was not able to get out because I had so much work to do trying to prep the stream and get everything organized. I will be editing that to get that out there for New Year's Day, which is Sunday. And then I will have my normal, regular Monday release on the following day. So will I get to sleep? No, this is going to, I'm going to sleep whenever this thing ends and I will wake up and then I will, uh, get up and be with my family because basically for the past two days, you know, today I I basically been doing the epic live stream all day yesterday. I didn't anticipate it, but I was basically, you know, working on 
all the stuff for this live stream and answering questions and stuff got up early yesterday and was talking to people after going to bed late. So no, I won't have a chance to take any time off really until probably, you know, after I get the video out on Monday, then I might be able to finally play catch up and rest. What is that dangling down? It's the built-in cable for the ah. yellow tech. I'm using a di I'm using the sound speed special to run into the X8. Gotcha, gotcha. I still have a few of those. I think what, what lengths? I think I have eight footers and ten footers. I think I have. I'll buy three them and all. Two. Will you really? I'll buy two of each. Yeah. Okay, that will leave one. I'll uh, I'll I'll let you know afterwards. You okay? Cool. How long was last year's? 17 was hours and... Oh, jeez. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to beat that. I was you thinking want... you were going to say 14 and a half hours. I was like, okay, we can do that. <laughs> we got it. Yeah, no, we la can do last that. Year, last year, uh, that's one of the things we said is how long did the previous year went? I think the previous year went 14 hours, 35 minutes, and <sighs> some odd seconds. I don't remember. Um, I actually have freeze frames from it that I just got through putting in the... Um, Announcement video. I'll bring those up on screen here in a second. I just want to point out that I'm being manipulated by chat. I am being brainwashed by chat. It worked. It made me yawn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't appreciate the mind control. Please stop it. Oh, there's no mind control here. There's Nothing no mind control here. here. No, there's no mind control. Let's see. What did I call it? The Wouldn't it be amazing if we were on Twitch and we just put on a full season of a TV show that's copyrighted and all of that and just get away with it? Dude. Yeah. That would be tight, right? Be we could go for we could go we could for another 17 hours. Like yeah, if we had just a show playing, we could just comment on it. That'd be yeah. great. Man. No, we don't even have to comment on it. Just eat some food, dude. <laughs> just watch it. <laughs> just watch it and eat some food. Here's what we have. We have, uh, this is from, this is the total running time at the top. This is the Epic live stream for the very first one. And it ended, see that, 14 hours, 35 minutes, and 50 seconds. And that's in StreamYard. StreamYard counts it in the upper left-hand corner. Right now it says we're live 14 hours, 20, 20 minutes, and 23, 4, 5 seconds, 43 people watching live. So that was la that was the very first year, 2020. This is the... Uh, David was there with me until the very, very end. I brought up the donation so we could see how much money we made through YouTube. And that's the picture that he and I did. 17 hours, 11 minutes, and 52 seconds in the upper left-hand corner. David did stay with me the entire, uh, hey. like, last, like, six hours, I think, last year. And he would been oh, popping God. in all day otherwise. So there you go. There's a couple of the things. Uh, originally, one of the things I said was if the donation stopped coming in after midnight, we were going to call the stream. I said, I want to see at least um, $100 donated per hour or we'd call the stream. Uh, as of right now, we haven't done that because we've had a lot of guests. In the past, it's just been me and David hanging out. And basically, David was just listening to me blab and talk as I do. And uh, so it would, it would be one of those things where kind of started telling, telling uh, people to donate. And then they would say, oh, I, I said that last year... I need to see donations or we're going to call it and then someone would donate a dollar. I'm like, that doesn't count. <laughs> dollar doesn't keep it going. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we have John Gardner, in, you know, donated 20 pounds a few minutes ago. Thank you very much, John. Uh, John. Thank you, John. Amazing. Amazing. We have a, a question here. And right. I am, I'm going to read this one because I love this. And I'll tell you why I love this. Do any of you guys post on the various mic slash audio gear subreddits? For instance, there is a conspiracy theory that Bandrew is the mod of the podcasting subreddit. The reason I love this, there's a conspiracy theory about me. <laughs> Dude, what? <laughs> My yes, dream has come true. awesome. No, I don't have time to go on Reddit. I work a full-time job. I run three YouTube channels. I run a Discord server. And I try to live my life a little bit. I don't have yeah. time. Yeah, I don't like get on anything other than YouTube. Like, you don't have socials. Not really. No, not really. Yeah, like, I I have like an Instagram, but I like rarely get on it. 
that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But I have a Discord now, but yeah, that's it. Oh my God. <clears throat> I need to add you as a buddy. Do it. Okay, I gotta find well, it. I'll find it. The link to my Discord is in every single one of my videos at the bottom. So use it, click it. on on it. it. You can find me. I'm Sound Speeds on Discord. Uh, Sound Speeds in some number. I don't know what it is, some random thing. Uh, do you have any quality of life items that you recommend? Uh, oh, gosh. This is a great topic. I love this. Okay. <clears throat> I have been focusing so heavily on quality of life. I don't know if you mean strictly for audio. I'm going to assume you don't mean just for audio. No specification. Yeah, I would say not. Get a notebook. Get a pen. Use physical medium to write stuff down write down your to-do list write down what you have planned for the day write down how your day was writing something down is amazing second get a physical book when you wake up in the morning don't check your phone don't check your email don't jump on the computer within the first hour don't look at your device it's really hard instead go get a cup of coffee sit down on your couch and read your book Escape for 20 minutes. You don't got to do 50 chapters. Those are two things for you. I'll let everybody else go. Uh, for me, I would say one of the biggest things, I mean, aside, I mean, like you could just be like, oh, eat healthy. But like one of the things that not to uh, hate on Zip Fizz, Zip Fizz is great. But one of the things that genuinely I really think that every person should drink is matcha tea it's like incredible mm. for your body it's really healthy and it wakes you up like just as much as a coffee <clears throat> and you get a lot of nutrients from it makes you feel so much better throughout the day i've That's never it. had matcha tea i'll have to give that a go there's i'll i'll, I'll send you a, like a good one i'll send you a good okay one. Yeah. okay one second one second Andrew just left. So we, that means we must do this again. Yes. <laughs> I just like the Michael Myers mask. It makes me happy. <clears throat> it's always really neat to see what he has in the background there. Yeah. No, that's great. <laughs> we're just checking out your stuff back there. <laughs> what were you looking at specifically? It's out, it was out of focus. Oh. I have yeah. no idea. You have trained your camera well to you leave the room and it doesn't focus on the background. Speaking of Michael Myers, though, did you like the last Halloween? Uh, you know, I wasn't sure if he was going to die tonight or not. <laughs> Jeez, Evil Louise. Dies tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that's brutal. The the first one was really good. The I loved first it. first comeback was great. 2018 Halloween, like fantastic. I love yeah. it. I know a lot of people are like, oh, the first one was like fine. The Halloween kills was was like great. And I'm like, wait, w hold the, what? No, dude. Like, no. Then Halloween ends. I thought it just gradually got worse, but it's my it's my take on it. Hang on. This is my shopping list. I got it to write down matcha tea. Oh, Look what yeah, I wrote dude. down. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down Michael Myers. <laughs> so when I go of to the course. grocery tomorrow. Yeah, you're going to be saying, oh, where, where, what, aisles is, what aisle is Michael Myers on? They're like, <laughs> They're like I heard it's really healthy for me. <laughs> <laughs> Getting was... murdered is healthy for me. There was um, a show I did a few years ago, and... I was reading um, some peanuts with sea salt on them, and, and I was doing this, and of course, it was just a big wide shot, and I was pointing the microphone at this, at basically people walking around, so I wasn't really booming anything, so I wasn't really paying a whole lot of attention. They yelled out, you know, roll sound. I heard this, the mixture in my ear, and instead of me yelling out sound speeds, I yelled out, sea salt! And I was like, crap, <laughs> you know? And then, of course, I see all the faces towards me, I'm like, and, and I just kind of smiled, and I, I was like, I was like, and they were just yeah, like, oh, I'm he meant to do that. Cool, that's funny. <laughs> I just kind of looked at him and nodded. You know, that's like, awesome. that's what I meant to say. <laughs> we were doing, that's I great. did a scene for a show a few years ago. And uh, there was a, it was a swingers party. 
So like the camera starts off steady cam and it starts on this girl and then this girl and then this girl, this girl, of course, is they're going to do in the movie. They're going to be like, you know, all oh, we will not exploit women. We will not exploit women. Then what do they do? They put women in skimpy outfits and they put them on camera and they exploit them. Uh, that's the film industry. Yay. So uh, right. we happen to have this. We happen to have this scene that they were that they were doing that for. And um, since it was a swingers party, I yelled out sound swings. <laughs> so, but an Dude, interesting story awesome. I did at the movie Senior Year last year, which is on Netflix. Oh, I saw. We, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Well, well, how did it sound? It sounded great. It sounded Good. Fantastic. I was about to. Yeah. I was going to kick you from the stream if you said it sounded <laughs> like crap. Um, but no, that was a, that was a a, a a thing that was kind of cool. Um, when they, you know, you saw the high school sequences, a whole bunch of kids all over the place. I yelled out sound speeds a whole bunch of times, and a girl. She comes over to me and 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 um, she says, "Can I ask you a question?" And I'm like, "Yeah, this you know one of the, the, the high schoolers." I said, "Yeah," and she says, "Why do you keep yelling Zaxby's?" <laughs> Zaxby's. And I'm like, "Zaxby's? What are you talking about?" And she's like, "Every they, as soon as they say you know that we're about to roll, you yell Zaxby's." And I thought it was really weird. No one seems to be bothered by it. I'm like, "It's not Zaxby's. It sound speeds." And she's like, "Oh." What does that mean? And she didn't because it makes no sense to her. She was rationalizing it as what yeah, you know, processing and decoding that... it into something wrong. <laughs> so I said, go on YouTube and do a search for the origin of the real origin of MOS. And she was like, Oh, okay. So <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh man. Zaxby's. <laughs> Other quality a... of life? Oh, go ahead, oh, sorry. No, I was just saying you did a a lot, did you do a lot of Walking Dead? Like, so? um, I did. Do you did you watch it? I watched um, one through four. Okay, well, I was there for the second half of season seven and eight. Oh, I did. Okay. I, I did. I did about half of episode one hundred and five, which is the episode um, in the very beginning when Jim got bit, and then they basically just talk around him and they put him on the side of a tree. I was there for all that. Nice. Um, I did a bunch of this. Sequ- uh, the the episode five. That was an episode where the boom operator had bitten, gotten bit by a copperhead or a cotton mouth, one of the two, venom the snake and put him in the hospital. Jeez. And the the and basically, it's funny. It, 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 the funny aspect is that is that he told us later, he he was the boom operator. This is a skilled boom operator with decades of experience, and he could have taken a twenty foot pole and sent that snake into another county, but he decides to grab like a little eighteen inch long stick and try to pick it up to move what? it. What? Yeah. And it bit him. <laughs> And, it, and he ended up in the hospital for a week, so they needed uh, someone to cover. And so that was me. And then I did, I was a boom operator, I think, four of 11 season two, because okay. he had a problem with staying power. And uh, people just would not stay because it was brutal out there in the farm in the open sun. Okay. And um, I was number four, filling a gap in between two guys he had booked. One guy, he says, I have another guy coming in. Can you bridge the gap? Can you take it? Uh, can you, you know fill in a couple of days i said sure so i was out there on the farm did some of that nice and then I, I did like a couple of scenes a couple of day playing things i think in season it was in the hospital when they were in the hospital what was it season four something like that and i don't think they'd gotten to terminus yeah, yet I'm sure okay yeah but don't dead open on, inside yeah don't dead open inside so that's what we always oh, jokingly cool, would say yeah. but yeah i, I um so I, I was there basically from the second half of season seven through season eight. I was there to the end of season eight. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Not an easy show. Oh, I bet. I bet it would be like one of the harder shows to do sound for or do anything for. Yeah. Yeah. It's not interesting. You have zombies, you know, and people staying inside to avoid them. So yeah, you have yeah. to go outside and you have to be around them and you have to go out there in 100 degrees summer weather yeah. and tall grass because no one is going to be mowing their lawn in a zombie apocalypse. That's so they always say, don't let don't cut your grass. If you know, don't cut grass, call this number. And so you would have grass that would be up to your waist and then you would be out there amongst it. And of course, bugs love it. Yeah. And they're not about to go out there and spray for, you know, put down cover over anthills. They're not about to fill in gaps and holes. So if you have people walking out there, you're going to step in a hole. You're going to step in whatever une- uneven ground because it's got to look, you know, rustic and it's got to look really, um, you know, gritty. Well, it's it's not easy. They'll they'll suddenly say we're going to 
shoot in the woods over there. And you're now suddenly doing a walk and talk with people walking up and down uh, an incline like this. And they're, the actors are struggling and they're walking forward. And we're walking yeah, backwards, you know. That's true. Yeah, that's very uh, true. Yeah. So there's there's a lot too, you know. The shows are not that show is not easy, but you know you yeah. definitely have stories from working on it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, Banjo, talk about your quick release kit. No, it's he's not asking me to. When he when I was talking about quality of life things, he's memeing on me because I won't shut up about the quick release I use because I talked about it in a short. Mm-hmm. in my favorite stuff of the year and gift guide. It's probably the reason why, why it came to mind. Oh, well, he likes that. Is it uh, Gator Frameworks or whatever? That's or? the one. Yes, That's sir. I use, yeah. I like it. Yeah. 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 Yes, we are, Ping Pong. I don't know why, but we are. Ping Pong. I don't know if you know this or not. but He was watching uh, Avatar too. He doesn't. He doesn't know. Uh, you... One a DD V mic D4, so that's going to be something I'll be I'll be reaching out to you and putting you in contact. Sean Milo, the guy that sponsored our, uh, I think uh, three o'clock to four o'clock hour, so of the epic live stream, he gave away a, uh, some gear. He says I have some gear I'm not using, and I connected him up with people that sent me emails. That's the reason why um, why I'm telling you that. Because uh, it was it was it's Sean and uh, yeah you're you weren't here, but uh, Sean is actually I'll be connecting you up so that way he can send that to you so you can use that because I know that was, that was the thing that you said you wanted. Zaxby's. <laughs> Excellent. I'll keep your stream on during my forty minute drive home. What in the world? You're out late. When you down make your sure audio yeah. on OBS, why does it get so much quieter? It won't even let me choose which track I want to use on my interface in OBS solution. Okay. So this when you down mix, it attenuates the the mixed audio by six dB. That's because if correct me if I'm wrong, I think if you had two identical signals left and right, then you down mix them to mono the signal would be, would it be three or six dB louder? It is six. It would be six dB louder. So in order to avoid down mixing two identical signals that were panned left and right to center and your audio going to plus six dB, it attenuates the mono signal by six decibels. So you would just need to add a gain filter to bring it up six dB. There you go. I think you talked about that in one of your videos a little while yeah, ago. Yeah, that, that was a fun uh, journey to go down. I tweeted about it a lot when I first realized that everything was distorting at negative 6 dB once I did the down mix to mono and trying to rationalize it and figure out why it was. Do you have any tips for shooting more active scenes? I've been recording a tabletop soccer game called... <sighs> why do people make me say words? Sub... Buteo. I think Tiddly Winks with soccer rules. They'll they'll run around the table, so lobs are tough. Well, is there a light in the middle of the table illuminating the table right in the middle? Because it's going to make booming tough. Um, that's the big thing that always runs through my mind is how people always overhead light a table. So trying to swing across the table is always difficult for us because if you swing, you're going to go high, and then you're going to try to hit you're going to hit the light. So you have to go around it, which means you're off axis. If you are below that, then you see this big, you know, sweeping shadow going across the table. So it just, you know, it's one of those things where I can't just say, oh, well, this is how you do it because every situation is different. Um, if there's an, a, a scene or a, a, a circumstance you can ask about, you know, a lot of the times you do have to people, they run around the tables, make do better love choice placement. And that's really your best bet. Yeah. You know, having lobs as a backup. I, I teach a class on lavaliers, on lavalier miking, and I call it uh, the invisible safety net. And that is one thing that you really do need to to use and know when to use it, because lobs are something that you that you need to understand how to use them and when to use them, because they are very important. And they are tools that you will, you will sometimes need to use. 
that said the table is itself is fixed so they'll be within one foot of a four by five table that's a big swing area yeah so not easy uh we'll score <clears throat> is that I'll, your alarm alarm to that, wake up that's it that's it yeah no i gotta i gotta get though guys i appreciate the invitation I'm sure. So Wait, did now. did we beat last the first one? Because it was fourteen yeah, thirty six. Yeah, okay. So we beat it. Yeah. Okay. No, I made sure I at least stayed that long. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is that what you were doing? Is watching the clock? You're like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Bronson, it was great chat and great stream, yeah. and thanks for being here, man. Yeah. Great seeing you, dude. <clears throat> great awesome actually event, meeting you, dude. Yeah. Nice meeting you, and it's cool that it's yeah you're donating everything. That's fantastic, man. So yeah, check but, those uh, we'll donations. Talk to you guys soon. Yeah. Absolutely, dude. Thanks for coming right. in and playing and staying for so many hours. I don't know how long yeah. you've been here, but it's uh, been a while. Yeah. <laughs> you've been one of the longer lasting ones. You, you yeah. certainly have. You, I think you beat me here. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I might have, yeah. yeah. But all right. We right. just had a donation. Patricia have a good Mirspa. night and uh, happy new year. Hey, happy too. new year, dude. See ya. Night. So, Patricia, who was our guest for the first three hours of the Epic Live stream. Uh, and the author of Behind the Sound Cart. Thank you so much for your donation to Stack Up. That is amazing. So uh, keep in mind, this is a live stream event that is a fundraiser. Neither me nor YouTube get a cut of this. Every bit of your donation will go directly to Stack Up. And uh, this this is something that we are trying to do to help them uh, help them raise money. It is a fundraiser. They are a 501c3 organization, so if you do make a deduction, then it very likely and very possibly will be a tax deduction for you. Obviously, at, you know, you're supposed to always do disclaimers of ask your tax consultant or whatever before you take any of my, you know, suggestions or whatever. But if you do charitable donations every year, chances are you know what it would be if you donated to another 501c3. Um, we donate every single year and uh, to different charities. So I know it does help us. But uh, we always do over donate. We always go over the threshold. So, anyway, it's one of those things. That, in my opinion, if you are blessed, you pass on those blessings. So that's at least my our, our philosophy. So anyway, uh, plant mics in the table or lights above it. You can't plant mic on a put plant mics on a table if it's a four by five and people you know because if if it's too if people are standing around a table they're going to be standing against the table. And you're going to have a mic way up underneath you. And so it's going to be really awkward. And if it's low enough, then all you're going to be getting is like, it's going to be too distant. So you can't really plant mics on a table. Yeah. Or you're going to have somebody that leans right up against it. And all of a sudden it's going to go, you know, like that. And that's all oh, you're going to yeah. hear. So you can't do that either. It doesn't sound like a cat rubbing up against a microphone. Don't ask me how I know. I'm aiming, yeah. aiming for something fixed ideally. I don't think a boom would work as I bonk them. Yeah, well... Again, I would have to see the circumstance. Uh, Next one's funny. Fair enough. I'll revisit laws for this application. And then, okay, I planted I planted lava in a table before, and the talent unknowingly slammed a book onto the table, and my soul came out of my body. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. That's a nightmare. Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you <clears throat> what, are the, what are the loudest, most... There are times that we will throw our headphones. Most of the time, people will throw them as soon as something gets a little bit loud. But I tell you, there has never been a reaction that I've ever had to, you know, Brandy the singer and actress. Mm -hmm. Well, Brandy has a set of pipes. She can sing. Yeah. She can push a lot of air. And she's, a, she's amazing how she can do that. Well, I did a scene with her. Where And it was the first scene that she had kissed anybody in for years, is what she told us later. And we had no idea that out of the blue, after she did this, this, kissing, this kissing scene, as soon as the director said cut, she screamed at the top of her lungs. And my microphone was literally right over top of her. <sighs> and we all, me and the entire sound department, like you said, you're... you're soul comes out of your body it we literally flew back my headphones stayed right there in the air and i and they literally flew <laughs> off of me and went straight down and hit the ground and i was all of a sudden had had my ifb on my my belt that was being 
that was uh, uh, basically going down to my headphones on the floor. And I was like, holy crap. My, my ears were ringing. My head was just pounding instantly. The sound mixer who never got out of the chair, he sprung out of that chair and he f- was fired up and he ran, he ran right to, right to set. And then when he got there, he like, you saw him take a deep breath and then he goes over and, 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 you know, it's funny because my ears were slightly ringing at the time. And he says, don't scream into our microphones when they're that close. And he was, he was just like, don't. And she's like, oh, I didn't realize. He's like, don't. Well, wh- why did she scream? Because yeah. she was just exciting, excited. Oh, it, was the okay. first, it was the first kissing she, she, and she had done. And she was, she was actually told us that she, the previous time she had done it, she was doing like three movies at the same time. And over the course of like a week or two, she had done three different kissing scenes with three different guys in three different shows. Mm. And then she said okay. that was the last time it had happened and it happened years ago. And she's like, this is so weird. I don't remember. I, I haven't done one in such a long time. It's so weird to do. And it's kind of this like weird thing. And it's kind of a nervous excitement type thing. It's like, oh, man. And then when she oh, did it, gotcha. she was just kind of, you know, silly, silly sc- scream. But I tell you, we all literally, boom. Okay. I mean, Patricia's out here in chat, so I'm sure she's got some story about someone that that screamed in probably her ears, and it lights you up. It will certainly light you up. Yeah, at least it was a positive scream, because I, I could just imagine how how much confidence it would kill in the guy if it was just a kiss, <laughs> and then she screams <laughs> like she's Not being kind murdered of or something. That's Not good. that kind of a scream. No, it's more of a... It was more of a, ah! a wee. Yeah, more of a wee. It was more of a kind of a, it, it was so funny because she was so cute about it. And if it was me <laughs> watching on mute, I'm sure it would have been hilarious and it would have yeah. been so adorable. But in, in, instead, I all I remember is hearing for the split second before my head responded and I did whiplash motion and the headphones <laughs> literally stayed in the air and went straight down to the ground. I remember hearing, you know, the sound of a diaphragm when it gets hit really hard with a loud sound, how it makes that almost flapping type sound where it just, you hear it. That is what the microphone diaphragm was doing. It was brutal. So it was like, yeah. Uh, Let's (laughs) Oh, what is this? Yeah, we've been in the, have these emotions get hot, especially the global invitation. Okay. Uh, Brandy is semi responsible uh, for the Kardashians. Well, hopefully she gets residuals for it then. If she wasn't famous, her brother would uh, have met Kim to make that tape. Her Brandy's brother Brandy's brother is have... Ray J. Oh. Ray J met Kim Kardashian because Brandy is famous. Ray J and Kim made a tape. I see. That tape got leaked. Kim Kardashian got famous. That's that's what he's saying. I see. The Kardashian family was also in that O.J. Simpson thing that was Cuba Gooding Jr. Oh, uh, yeah. Because the, the, the Kardashians were friends of O.J.'s well, family or the, something. Their Car- the Kardashian was one of the defense de- attorneys for O.J. Yeah. Uh, do you learn all the scripts uh, so you know who is supposed to be talking next? I do. There's different ways of doing it where some people will just look at it and, and look for key words. They're going to say the last word in this sentence is this as soon as they hear it. That's what they'll do, and they'll go through it, and they'll say, okay, that's what it is, that's what it is. Some people will just read it real quick, and they'll say, okay, I think I got it pretty well. Some people will um, will uh, learn just the last, like, sentence. I will usually learn the script, and not only that, I have an acting background from, like, a performing arts school, and, and I did some acting, you know, after after um, school. But one of the things I'll tell you is I, I look at the script, and I say to myself, who is likely to respond to each line? So I look at that, and I say, this actor said this line. Who is the person that would respond to that or 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 say something in next? And and then they'll say, they said this, and this other person is angry. That's why they responded next. This other person was trying to calm them down, so then they're the next talk, talker. So that way I know the motivation of the people, in my mind at least, and then once I see the scene play out, then I'll know how to do it. Part of the reason I do that as opposed to just learning the lines on the sides is because if you do that, you will know – Sometimes if an actor misses a line or they flip a couple of lines or something like that, you're not thinking, thinking, oh, I'm going to cue off of this person to the next person. You say they haven't necessarily said that other line, but it looks like they're about to say something. There's a technique I call, I call using the force where you have to real quickly watch someone's body language and you, ha- you know how the human 
body works. You know how people normally will lead with their head before they go someplace. They'll start to they'll lead with their head, they'll turn with their shoulders, then they start going that direction. You know how if someone does that at the same time as they're moving their foot, as they start to turn and twist their toe out that direction, the toe directs you to where they're going. You know they're about to make a turn. So if, you, if you've never seen something in someone's ad-libbing, you can follow them with a boom if you know how to, what I call, use the force, where you watch their body language like a hawk and you study their motions and you see where their nose and toes lead. And so um, I, 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 I'm not going to show it here, but what I will say is uh, some of the closer friends, I think I did it as a special thing in my Discord server. I posted a video not long ago where I, I showed a couple of examples of me using the force that I did I, I had in a recent class I taught. And it basically is where you have to read someone real quickly and figure out where they're going to go. I had uh, in the demonstration, I also had someone from, from there. I said, I said to the actress, I said, just ad lib, go wherever you want, be quiet, be whispering. Then scream, th go anywhere you want to, do whatever you want, look down, look up, bend down under a table, do whatever you want. I don't care what it is. And then I said to another person there, I want you to just do this number, pretend that you're holding a camera, and you go wherever you want to, which means that you have someone that's walking somewhere looking this direction, and a camera could suddenly spin around and look back on you. So you and, and so, so I said, let's do this as an exercise. I'll show you what I'm doing and what, what I'm, what, how, to, how to do this technique. And I showed it in the, in the, the class response, you know, uh, and so then I, showed, I taught that technique. But that's something I call using the force. I'll, I'll probably do a video about it at some point um, because it's something about really, really quickly reading body language and figuring out what people are about to do and see how they do things. Um, if I, it, it's also part of the, the skill sets that um, I teach when I, I teach boom operator classes. So there you go. Uh, there are usually things on the table. You can hide mics behind, like napkin holders and sugar tins, but if you can't get close enough, uh, they're just ambient noise. It's pretty close. Yes, and he did say it's a four-by-five table, and people are standing around it. And if people are looking down at the table, that's one of the things you have to be careful of, is cameras might go down there and tag something on the table. And if they do, they might see your microphone. So plant microphones inside of something, you know, if they're looking at a table with a tabletop soccer-type game on there, I can't imagine someone putting a napkin holder in the middle of it. So, uh, nor would I really want to put a microphone on something if people are actively playing a game. So, there you go. Remind me, Alan, uh, do you have a video on phase considerations for mic placement? Yes, uh, three to one rule. Uh, I think I, I call it, um, hold on one second. What do I call that thing? Three. Three, two. Microphone phasing, three to one rule. I I will post, I will take this video. <laughs> one of the other god awful um, thumbnails I do, but it makes me laugh. So one as well. All right, so I'm gonna put this down in the description. I have a list of videos that I have um, that I have listed here. Uh, mic phasing, three, two, one rule so that link is being saved under this video right now so it is yet another resource that you have available by looking in the description below no one produced a limiter for headphones like ever there's a business idea why you're quiet andrew you, uh, because that would stop the issue of Brandy screaming and deafening you. Oh. Yeah, so a headphone limiter to stop stuff like that. I mean, you could, I guess, but anytime you add something like that, I mean, I mean, I guess they could. I mean, I guess it wouldn't really hurt anything. But then it adds a layer of suddenly you'd have to have processing in a headphone amplifier. I don't know about that. It could add delay, latency. You know, I don't know. Banjo, how's your cable management for your rack modules? Or are they like many of us, as long as you don't see the cables, they're not messy? Uh, what cables? I have no cables back there. There's nothing to see. There's just a nest of hell. It's not very good. It's not good at all. 
D do you ever run into interference? I actually did. I actually ran into interference because I have my power conditioner here, which has power cables coming out of it. And I had my cable from the yellow tech running behind into the X8, which is right below it. It was running by one of the power cables. And I was just, oh, oh no. And I had to reposition everything, all the cables to get rid of it. So yeah, I'll run into issues with that occasionally. Um, one of the things I know that we'll run into when people have a system at their house uh, or their home studio, one of the big things that will cause interference is if people draw, uh, go back and forth between mic and line level. So once you amplify a microphone to line level, you don't drop it back down to mic level. We talked about this a couple hours ago. But that's one of the things that people will say, oh, well, in order to go out from this this thing, it goes out mic level. i got to go out mic level. No, get something else. You don't want to end up doing that. Once you boost something to mic or to line level, if you attenuate it again and then reamplify it, you're adding more amplifier noise. You're adding more basically processing to it. And every time you you basically flip back and forth, you're adding noise. You're adding all kinds of, of processing elements to it. So you don't want to do that. You want to avoid having to reprocess your audio. Once it goes line level, it doesn't go back. You can take, you know, keep, think about the um, voltage that comes out of a microphone. It's very low. Millivoltage is what it is. Very, very little. It's usually no more than like usually like 25 millivolts, something like that. Some microphones will go higher than that, but most of the time they don't. They're very, very low. And then those have to be amplified. You have to amplify that voltage. That's what these, that's what a lot of preamplifiers basically do is because it amplifies voltage. So once it's amplified to an appropriate voltage for it to be managed, that is not going to be as sensitive to interference issues in a cable. So that's one of the reasons why when you boost it even louder going out of an amplifier to a speaker, you don't need to, nor should you at that point, use a shielded cable when you're running out to your speakers. Power output is too high. No interference that's going to come from your power line and stuff like that should be affecting it at that point if you if you run over it. It might if you run it over an unshielded cable and the power is too much and too high and you just don't you don't manage your cables properly. But as a rule, you don't normally run into those kinds of issues. So once you amplify something, you don't go back down. You process it at that level. Okay, on a live on live consoles, you have limiters all the time. Even on Zoom F eight N, you have a limiter on each channel. Uh, they don't cause a delay. Uh, talking about transparent. Well, you're talking about on on individual channels. A lot of like recorders. My sound devices Mix Pre six here has has a limiter um, built onto each channel. Most recorders do. You can choose to not use them if you want to. It's like a safety net, though. So, even the PodTrack P four has limiters. <laughs> The big question to ask is whether or not it's analog or digital. There is a difference. and um, Digital here. Yeah. Zoom usually does digitals. So the reason why you would rather have an analog limiter is because if you think about anytime there's a conversion of analog to digital, it, you have to have the signal be converted by the, by, by the ADC basically. And when that happens, if you take a signal that is too hot, uh, too hot of an analog signal, you convert it to digital and then you limit it. Well, you've already processed that sound when it was over, uh, when it was too hot. So you can clip off a digital signal all you want to, but it's already processed. It's already turned to di digital. There's already going to be information loss. Whether then if you limit it analog and then it's converted, it's going to have a better chance of actually successfully um, going through without you having those those clipping artifacts and distortions. So that's the difference. What is this one? What is the most common cause of e RFI EMI for an average home setting? Low quality power cable, surge protectors, house wiring, electronics too close, lights. Well, it's it's funny you should ask this. Remember, Bandrew came out to visit me recently, and one of the things I put in his hand is the is an EMI and RFI meter, and we drove around a little bit, and I showed. And I showed. I think I think we played with it in the in the house. We went around to different areas, didn't we? 
Or was it someone else? No, not in the it house. Been, but I know that it, we we drove under power lines. Yeah, we drove under power lines and it just <clears throat> clipped. Yeah, it goes crazy. Uh, to answer your question real quickly, unless you'd want to take this one. Uh, I've really only run into it in two situations. The main one being running a cable over a power cable, an audio cable over a power cable. Secondly, is when a USB cable is completely unshielded and it picks up radio stations. That's the original CAD U1. That's, that's a very unique situation. I haven't experienced that on any other microphones, but the, the entire cable was essentially functioning as an antenna. Yes. That's not something that will happen commonly. <clears throat> right. Here's something to keep in mind. <clears throat> All metal is an antenna, but it's different degrees of effectiveness. And it's what you plug it into. So, I mean, not uh, technically not every metal, but you know what I'm saying here. So if you have a piece of metal that's measured to a certain wavelength, it will pick up that wavelength, the frequency that hits it. If that happens to be, if your cable length happens to be in line with a wavelength that's going to be audible when you run run it over an unshielded cable, you might pick up certain frequencies of radio stations, for example. A lot of people confuse the difference between RFI and EMI, radio frequency interference, electromagnetic uh, interference. Um, and then there's also uh, electromotive force that people will, will you use a, an EMF meter, you know, the Ghostbusters, for example. So... The thing to keep in mind is EMI is any device basically that emits naturally some sort of interference. So something that just inherently spills and leaks interference from it versus RFI, which transmits something that is interfering. So if you have yourself a, a, you know, some sort of a device that has a tr the ability to transmit or emit some sort of power where it's trying to be picked up someplace and you have interference from that, that is RFI. If you have a recorder, a computer monitor or something like that, that it just by a byproduct of it working, there's emissions of interference, that is EMI. So that's the main difference that you'll, that you'll run into. For my average home setting, you will run into spill. You will sometimes run into cross power lines that will run through and they will pick up radio stations you'll sometimes run over your audio cables your video cables those old type uh f uh coax cables that we used to run into the back of our tvs or vcrs uh, or cable boxes those were big high areas of inter of interference too because most likely those would end up getting you know underneath a chair a leg or something like that it would end up getting uh, the shielding would get broke. It would turn into a, play, a point of interference. And then you'd run those cheap little Radio Shack RF, RCA cables over it. And you'd hear radio stations on your, uh, your VHS home recordings. So it's not so much you, you, uh, with, with modern day devices, something that people don't normally think about is their HDMI. Well, guess what? That's digital. You run into digital optical cable, coax digital, things like that. Digital signals are traveling places and you will run into less interference because of that. The reason why is because once you convert an analog signal, analog signals are capable of being affected by EMI and RFI. Once it is converted to zeros and ones, it is being sent at a constant level across the line and as long as it arrives it can have a bunch of interference in it on the other end that's fine it's zeros and ones the computer doesn't care that's decoding it on the other end it doesn't care as long as it receives it so it doesn't matter if it's greatly attained uh you know not a, uh, it's not there anymore as a great level this is the reason why digital wireless as long as you have one bar you are still getting a full signal in digital wireless because it is either on or it's off it doesn't matter if you have 30 bars on your wireless, or you have one bar in your wireless, if you have one bar, you're getting a full signal level just like you are if you have 30. In analog, as you start to lose your level, it starts to go like this. It starts to sound more staticky, like it does if you mistune your FM uh, dial on your car. So once you convert something to digital, like a lot of devices now, you don't run into that. So you want to try to convert as quickly as possible 
from analog to digital in a very clean way after using clean preamps to actually get your audio amplified to a decent level. Once you do that, it's going to be a lot easier. There you go. Just to chime in really quick, mm -hmm. the SM7B has a humbucking coil. That's because these would be right next to old CRT monitors, which emitted a bunch of EMI, which would cause a bunch of hum in them in a microphone. So the humbucking coil stops that. And part and, of the, re and go ahead. I may be able to do this. There's a little part on my computer with the, at least with the SM57, I don't know about this microphone. I can point the mic directly at it and pick something up. Could you hear that? Was that yeah. coming through? It almost sounds like a fan. That's pretty aggressive. Wait, hang on. Oh yeah, that is the fan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's the, the SM57, if I point it there, there's actually EMI that gets picked up. So this does a good job at rejecting. That's going to be the next test you're going to have to do. Yeah, <laughs> probably. It, I probably should. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, that's going to be the next test that people are going to be pushing you for. You constantly, you know, add a more test, add more tests. It's really funny how I'll talk with Bandrew and, he's, and he'll say, I just got an interesting comment that came through on one of my seven year old videos or something like that. And people are just like, you know, your, your reviews, you don't hardly do any tests. You should do this yeah. and this and this. And he's like, for God's sake, you're looking at a seven year old video last yeah. night when I finally, well, this morning, when I finally got to sleep, I looked at my phone and there was a comment of, gosh, why are you using flashes? It's so irritating. I'm like, I stopped doing that after mm. like six months or three months or whatever it was on my channel. I, I remember I was, I was, you telling me about that. You used to do a white swipe or something. Yeah, a white or a flash. flash. And you got complaints because people would watch at night. Yeah. And it was like keeping them awake. Yeah, you'll do this number and you're going to watch in, in darkness. And all of a sudden it's like people are like, you know, they said, I can't watch your videos. I'm like, oh, well, that's a good point. And then yeah. I had a guy help me rebrand. And one of the things he said is don't use white. Use something like blue. That way it's not so jarring. I'm like, oh, okay. So I did, and I had no more complaints. And then over the course of time, I started to completely drop the transitions altogether. I've slowly changed a couple of things, and now I don't use really um, uh, CyberLink PowerDirector anymore. I'm basically using DaVinci Resolve for just about everything. This is, um, a, and I put out a tweet not long ago, but nobody, apparently nobody saw it. It was because, because YouTube... I'm not YouTube. Twitter basically just deleted it after I hit send. It was one that, you know, sometimes you buy, you have a license to something, but then you buy an, a piece of, uh, you buy a piece of hardware and it comes with a license. It'll say, oh, as a free added thing, you get this license to this, uh, this device. And I said, if anyone is, is, has received a free license that you're not using for DaVinci Resolve Studio, I would love it. If you aren't using it and there's it's serving zero purpose, could I have it? You know, would you mind gifting it? Or, you know, tell me. Uh, tell me what you would want for it or something like that. And I then looked for that because I was like, I wonder if anybody resp responded to me. Nobody had posted anything to it. So if you are in that category, if there's anybody out there that is it that is that's like, oh, well, I already have a studio, a DaVinci Resolve Studio license, and I just got through buying the the keyboard controller and it included a free license. If you're not using that free license, could I have it? You know, if, if it's one of those things you're not using, would you mind? Shoot me an email at alan at soundspeeds.us if you uh, don't mind sending it my way because I'm constantly running into a feature and it says, ah, I'm going to put a watermark over it because that's a feature for studio. I'm like, crap, you know, there's another one because I'm constantly pushing gear to, I'm constantly trying to do another graphics thing. Limiters on headphones or everything, blah, 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 uh, like police and other public service radios. Yeah, I can imagine so, actually. I was suggesting you're concerned about limiters on headphones. You work with your ears. I guess uh, you would have something to, that would um, would save them. Uh, limiters company with uh, audio limiters, headphone limiters. Oh, cool. Regarding mouth sounds, do you guys subscribe to the room temperature water idea, or do you think the temperature really doesn't matter? I have not tested that theory. I just drink cold water because cold water is delicious. 
You know, it's actually slows down your metabolism, though. I'm okay with that. Okay. Usually they say that in the morning, first thing in the morning, if you if you uh, drink, drink something with hot water or do you drink a cup of hot water, it's like one of the best things in the world for you. I know Bronson earlier said uh, matcha, hot matcha tea, mm -hmm. but you know what? The, the hot water is actually really, really effective at that. And of course, Soundspeed says, uh, you know, he is still here. He left the stream. Are you at your party and you're sitting here just, you know, listening? If you're at a party, dude, go enjoy your party. <laughs> Why are you still listening to the stream? I, I, like, wonder, I wonder if he's throwing this stream up on the TV at the party. Because <laughs> he said it's hey, a bunch of filmmakers. Yeah. But, you know, this is this lunatic is doing the live stream 15 hours and 8 minutes and 24 seconds in. No rush going digital wireless. So digital hybrid is still the common industry standard. And digital hybrid is really an analog transmission. 100% correct. Digital hybrid is basically analog. They call it digital hybrid simply because it does come panding. And that kind of involves digitizing it, uh, you know, digitizing at some level. And in, in, that's why they call it digital hybrid. It's not really true. It, it basically does an analog transmission. Exactly. It does. It, it's not really there's not really a whole lot digital to it. So there you go. Yeah, it's a more like fan noise. Uh, good to see you guys are all still going. <laughs> of course we are. And you left. Uh, podcast is it was fan noise picking up you my just like the sm57 there you go i'm a little bit behind the set seven seven years old videos uh gee my earliest videos were so embarrassing heck my latest dozen video videos are still embarrassing you know what's funny um one of my favorite videos that i've told david this you know sound speed is he was talking about something and he asks his girlfriend uh to 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 you know, help him with something. And she's there, she does something. And then he goes on to explain whatever it is. And she literally sits down next to him and does this number. And she's just playing on her phone right there. He's like on the, on one side, she's on the other side and they're just sitting there side by side. He's like very into talking about everything. And then she's just sitting there so checked out on her phone and they're sharing this screen together. I'm like, that is a couple right there. She's like, all right, I'm here to help him. And I'm going to do something else because I'm not needed at this time. And he's just like, you know, in the zone doing his thing. I'm like, that is so, so awesome. That's, I laugh. That's a good thing, though. If you were to look back at your seven-year-old videos and think, wow, I was perfect back then and you didn't have anything to be embarrassed about, that would mean you didn't progress at all. So it's good that you're embarrassed about stuff you published seven years ago. You kind of have to embrace it, though. You released it at some point. It's part of your history. There's a lot of American history that is quite embarrassing. The thing yeah. about it, though, is you have to know it's there and that you have grown past it and you realize what you have learned from it. Just like in history of everything else. That's the reason why you're able to, when you get into a relationship and you're in your 40s or 30s or whatever, it's better than it was than when you were in high school. Your priorities are different. You have different understandings of things and you take things to a different level. It's the same kind of thing as everything else. Your experience level and your commitment to work is different than it is in different other stages in your life. So every single thing is a learning experience and you can try to ignore and try to downplay the value of something. But things that you want to forget are things that you shouldn't forget because you are learning something from them. And even if that one thing is, I really don't want to remember it. There's a reason why. It's because it was really bad and you have to put that uh, you have to do you have to do something else or want to learn something from it man i hate in movies when they go from a dark shot to a bright wide shot it happened like six times in the last 15 movies i've seen in theaters that is in theaters that is tried asking bmt for a license uh, because you're not big time. You, I'm not, you know, you know me and no one, y'all know who I am. There's 28 of you out there that might know who I am. You might've just been, you've seen other people and the algorithm says, Oh, what do you know? This is live stream going on with a bunch of pod, uh, with a bunch of podcasters and reviewers and stuff like that. And that's how some people came in here tonight and they're like, Oh, this was just recommended to me. Well, YouTube, uh, algorithm helped connect up some people tonight. Very far from big, very far from big. The one, the closest thing I ever get is if I walk into a room full of sound people, uh, pro sound people, like the, the mixers mix that we do annually, 
other people, like other pros that I've worked with, they know me and they'll come up and greet me. That's more of just knowing your people, though. That's not any more famous than going to a family reunion and people say, oh, yeah, this is such and such's daughter. This is such and such's son. You know, it's the same kind of thing. People know you because they know you. You're in their community. It's not so much being famous. And there's, you know, none of us are famous. I still haven't been recognized a single time. You have to leave your house to be recognized, Andrew. I leave my house a lot. Just at reasonable hours, like 7 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Do it very early. Mike Delgadio told me a story a few years ago. You said he was walking it. He was like doing a job someplace. He was walking down the street and someone recognized him. And he was just like, oh, wow. I don't know if he's been recognized anymore. I wonder if Curtis has ever been recognized because uh, he's been doing this for over 10 years now. Yeah. It'd be interesting. You know, that would be a question that somebody should please ask next time. And then, of course, uh, Marshmallow Test. There you go. I, I have my... Uh... <laughs> I have my shopping list, and I just added marshmallows because that I forgot about that. So if I do a podcast this week, which I might not, if I do, oh, here's what I could do, just to chillax. I've, I don't, I'm sure I've had it, but I don't remember hot cocoa with milk. I always do have done hot cocoa with water. So I want to try that. And then I could do the mouth clicky marshmallow test. Yeah. Close yeah that seems like a lot of work, though. <laughs> you know what, though? Just Could you imagine the very first podcast of the year where you're saying, we're just going to chill out here. I'm going to, you know, you, you have your, your four sponsored slot, uh, videos that I'll send you if you want to mm. want to air those or something like that. If you want to, to, they're yours, so you can do whatever you want to with them. Um, and then also you can say, and I'm going to try different things to see if it reduces the cluck noises in your mouth. For, to, to make it really bad, I'll make sure to drink a bunch of dairy with chocolate in it. Yeah. One of the things, uh, do you ever, have you ever heard of, uh, I don't know what the term is, but in my, in my uh, school, they used to refer to it as lizard tongue, where we would like drink a whole bunch of really thick uh, orange juice and then eat something like those cherry sours make your saliva so thick that you were able to like, you know, do, do the drip where it comes out like eight inches and you suck it back up into your mouth. We used to do that. Ooh. It's so funny. It was hilarious, man. Repulsive. God bless the eighties. They were such an awesome time. Uh, I'm the world's most sociable person. I love you, David. You're awesome. Oh, I know what you're about to say. Helen's reaction to my sound. Sound makes me bad. Yeah. You knew exactly where I was going with it. Uh, she's left the home left a year ago after a decade together. Oh, well, I'm sorry, dude. I'm not laughing at that. I was, la I was uh, laughing at the fact that, uh, it's just one of those damn things that happens, man. Oh, well, the best, uh, long time overdue. Sorry, dude. Uh, definitely both film industry madness and the lockdowns too. Yeah, uh, contributed to the final straw and the breakdown of uh, our relationship. Something to everybody in the film industry to remember. Yep. This is not an, an easy industry on relationships. You're away at long hours. You're away from your, uh, your family. If you have a relationship with your kids or significant other, that's magical. Cherish that. Um, you have to have a partner that understands. Uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife. You, they really do have to understand and they have to just, uh, you know, it's kind of like someone that leaves and uh, goes away overseas to the military. You can't then say, can you just come home this weekend? You can't do that if you're stationed abroad. You can't just work in vacations into it. Say, can't you just take a week off? Can't do that. You know, when you're deployed, you can't just suddenly decide that you're going to take certain liberties that are that are real world things in the other out in the rest of the world um you have to understand that when someone is working 16 to 18 hour days every single day and they come home if they come home and they collapse on the couch on saturday and they're they're sleeping in the chair and stuff like that that's because their bodies are able to finally rest and try to play catch up you have to understand that that they're going to collapse sometime like that they are going to want to sleep for long periods of times so on the weekends and recover because it is not easy. People have to understand that. People are like, you know, all you ever do is you come home and you sleep. All you ever do when you when you come home is uh, you just want to whatever. You have to have someone that really understands. Because this is a, a lifestyle. It's very difficult. Be mindful of the stresses. A typical nature of film industries can affect you in your life. Yep. 
IMAX movies need special lens rigs. Does the audio get any special treatments? No. IMAX cameras are usually pretty noisy. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the reality of the format. So can't really do a whole lot about it. You can try to cue microphones away from it if, if it's really noisy. Um, if there is, a, if you're inside of a small, you know, little compact room, you're going to hear it amplify because it's going to be reflecting off every room in there. Add in multiple IMAX cameras, which sometimes happens. Large format cameras, geez, it gets it gets kind of loud. All you have to do is just remember that it is a constant sound and post has a better chance of getting that out than anything else anyway dipping out now there are many drinks of alcoholic poison uh that uh that have to be drunk tonight well go to it i'll see you know you say you're leaving i'll see you again in five minutes that curtis jug will recognize somewhat uh often thanks to his freaky height well i'll see uh when he leaves you well when he leaves utah i hear you draw it over there what you drawing i'm blo blacking out I, I miswrote something. Uh-oh. Redacted. Mm -mm. We will never know what it says. It's a misspelled matcha tea. Oh. Curtis may be more recommended to normal people with his main channel, whereas people like Alan are way more industry focused. Basically, what I tell people is I'm a niche, I'm a niche, I'm a niche, I'm a niche. So, and then the fact that I don't even play right with the algorithm means it's not going to recommend my stuff. So, if you happen to come across it, it's most likely because you saw about it and somebody posted a video about it in Pro Forum. I've commented on something uh, on another person's channel and they're like, oh, well, that seems to make sense. And then they'll come and, and see what I had to say. Was Michael Ex Myers what you Exactly, yeah. It was? Michael oh. Myers was redacted. Oh, no. Uh, let's see here. Curtis has, I believe, mentioned that he started the secondary channel because people on his main channel were complaining about his podcast being too techy. Really? Well, he does. If you remember, it's he's, he's learn lights and sound. Mm -hmm. So he... He has concentrated more on audio. He enjoys the audio part of it more now. But you got to keep in mind, he did do a lot of camera and a lot of lighting stuff originally. He's doing more yeah. in audio now. And so I can imagine if you went to those channels looking for camera stuff, and then he starts talking about audio extensively and starts doing a podcast about the techie aspects of maybe audio, I can imagine people probably mm -hmm. saying, why do we have to hear about sound? You know, so I can I can see that. Made it home safely to his desk. Excellent. Glad you did. Glad you made it home. Uh, well, everyone's so supportive of him getting home. And then sound speed, of course, is back. Like I said, it'll be back in five minutes. You have doing 100-hour weeks. can be very brutal. And then you have another week off of doing nothing, swinging be between uh, two extremes. Exactly right. Anyway, so I'm just kidding me. That's what I'm doing listening to a podcast. <laughs> Oh, this is when you join the stream again with your live and say, hey, look, everybody, come on and join. Definitely Alan's words on the industry. Second, Alan's words on the industry. Take care of your relationships and yourself is incredibly important. It is. I have not seen it. I have no recommendation. I have no uh, opinions about it. I I'm, have not seen it either. I have not heard anything about the advanced audio technology that you're referring to. If it's mo-capture, mo cap motion capture they're using headsets that basically have cameras and, uh, to record the face and there's a microphone right next to it it's nothing new if it's uh if it's like the mocap that we did on on uh, uh, avengers infinity war then they had multiple what oh multiple cameras and, and stuff around the room and i could literally boom from everywhere it would be a person holding a virtual camera and i would be staying between them and the actors and it was no problem because i wasn't visible because they were they were basically framing up with a virtual camera in physical space and framing up the digital image that is going to ultimately be corrected in post to whatever they want it to be anyway, because it's all CGI. Is this what you were laughing about? I was laughing because he's still here. <laughs> After being approached, why are you listening to a podcast? Because I must type in more things. Curtis is very much a videographer guy who loves audio. 
Oh, I wish I could join a gift industry, but I don't think my puny $100 phone could handle it. Well, you never know until you try. Avatar 2 was a blockbuster or whatever, uh, but it, whatever, you know, it was too long. From what I've learned, they used DPA 4060s and 4097s during the motion capture. Uh, not sure about the post. And <laughs> no doubt some, some sound, some wizardry. Those microphones are probably going to give probably the best results. I think they showed the head rings on Avatar and they were using DPA mics on the rig. There you go. Thanks. Last two movies I saw in theaters, Avalon Bab Babylon uh, could have cut four hours between the two and lost nothing. You know, I saw Stranger Things, see, the season four, and now they released the first, what was it, the first seven episodes, and then they released two, like two weeks later. Those last two, one episode was like an hour and 30 minutes, hour and 45, and the other one was like two hours and 45 minutes. To me, both of them together should have been no more than two and a half hours. They could have cut out a lot because the pacing was really slow. I literally had to do what I, I constantly find myself having to do on slow paced content. When I watched Breaking Bad, I had to watch it at the fastest possible playback speed because it was so slow. And I'm like, geez, guys, speed up. And then I would put it into like 2x or whatever. Finally, it was going to manageable speed. I'm glad for the audio information on YouTube. There is too little on YouTube. Sure, man. Sitting in the seat for nearly four hours. Oh, you poor thing. How long have I been sitting here? 15 hours, 24 minutes, and 11 seconds. That's a lie. You stood up and went to the other, to the computer. That's correct. When I hit record on it, I did. And you want to hear something interesting. Um, my wife, she she's always so good to me when I'm doing these the epic live streams. She knows how much this means to me. So she brought in at the very beginning of the stream because I got up this morning and I instantly am like, oh, I got to wash this shirt. I might as well throw my other clothes in there too. And so I go upstairs to throw stuff in the in the laundry. And she's like, you want to go grab yourself a couple of sausage biscuits? I'm like, I can't leave. I have so much stuff to do. You know, I got behind. And so I instantly start to like say, and she's like, well, you ought to at least go and grab yourself something, something to eat. I'm like, no, I have to jump on the computer. I got to get this thing going. And she's like, you realize it doesn't start for an hour and a half, right? I'm like, yeah, I know that's, that's going to come really fast. And so I start doing this. She goes and gets me a couple sausage biscuits and it's from Dunkin' Donuts. And she puts, puts it on a plate over here with, um, with two things that are wrapped up that I think are also donuts. There's a donut and then there's two things that I think are also donuts. I look at it and I say, I don't want donuts right now when we first started the stream because I don't like to eat on stream unless I can kind of block it or something like that. I don't want to sit here and just chow down. Um, so you've seen like in the past hour or two like that, I was, I was t tossing a pretzel into my mouth, but part of that's because I haven't really eaten anything. But um, it's funny because during one of the, the, the commercial, the, the, the breaks, I went real quickly to grab something to drink. And when I went through there, she says, did you enjoy your sausage biscuits? I'm like, huh? And she says, that's what was in those two bags. There were two sausage biscuits. I'm like, oh, really? And she's like, yeah. And so I was like, I thought those were more donuts. And she's like, I wouldn't bring you three donuts in the middle of this. I'm like, oh, there's real food there. Cool. Well, the funny thing is, she, uh, she says, you want me to heat them up for you? Or she says, go heat them up. I'm like, oh, I don't have that, that kind of time. I have to be back there like a split second. And she's like, want me to do it? I'm like, uh sure so she throws them in the air fryer comes back in and puts them down i see her when she comes in and i completely forget that they're there for like another four hours and so when i got up there to start up the computer i looked down i'm like oh this is the one she brought in in the like 15 minutes after the stream started and those have been there like almost 12 hours just sitting next to me and i'm like oh i might as well grab a couple of bites here while i'm doing this thing so she put them in the air fryer and those things were hard as a rock by the time i got to them because they had been sitting out all day I felt so bad, but um, there there are other other things over here. This is my favorite uh, ginger beer. It's uh, any Australians will know this one. Maybe I don't know. It's like people always say Foster's Australia for beer, and then you talk to an Australian, they're like, "Oh, that's crap." We drink uh, Budweiser, <laughs> and there's my favorite epic live stream drink, which is tonic water, and of course you have to add your zip fizz to it. So that's what we do. I need to call it. <laughs> what you going to call? Bounce. I need to bounce and oh, go to sleep. Oh, my goodness. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, 
Banju, thank you so much for joining. You have more staying power than anyone else tonight. That's amazing. I know how you normally are almost about to wake up at this time. This yeah, is I'm, I'm typically after. asleep four hours ago, five hours ago. <laughs> yeah, we're halfway in your sleep right now. Yeah. So um, very much appreciate you coming in here. Very much appreciate your donations that you made and the support that you have done with the podcastage and with the uh, Geeks Rising sponsorships of ours here. And you've donated your time and that knowledge and time and, and your personality and stuff are very invaluable to us all. And then you made an additional donation on top of that. Without a doubt, the most generous person that usually and routinely comes in the live stream and, uh, you know, in general. So thank you very much for all of everything. Your time is obviously very important. And, uh, you know, the, the charities do a lot with the money. So, Well, thank you for having me. And thank you for setting this up. And ping pong, leave me alone. <laughs> Uh oh, what did he say? <laughs> Call me Boomer Drew. Yeah, <laughs> sitting at the set. Boomer Drew looked a little bit different. He looks like he hadn't, uh, hadn't, yeah. uh, you know, shaved in a while. Grew his hair out long. Hadn't shaved. Hadn't shaved. Oh, Alrighty. Well, well thank you again for setting everything up. This is amazing. Keep up the great work. I look forward to waking up and seeing how long you went. And look forward to waking up and seeing that I'm still going. Yeah. And being like. If if all right, I'll make you and a deal. seeing David coming back on in fifteen minutes, <laughs> yeah, David will be back on with another comment here in in the next three minutes. You know he will. Yeah. So, all righty. Absolutely. Well, well thank I will you so talk much, to you tomorrow. Have a great night. Thank you everybody for watching, and thank you for all your donations to the charity. Incredible. Absolutely Incredible. is. I'm looking at them right now. There's been no donations coming through for a while. Thank you so much, Banjo. You take care. Get some Alrighty. rest. Talk to y'all later. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, geez. The screen just filled up with me. I forgot it does that. It is. I, I don't think, uh, with exception of the breaks that we've had, I don't think it's been on my face more than just a couple minutes. We've had nonstop guests this epic live stream. It's been epic. There's been a lot of involvement, a lot of people coming in. And it's funny, a lot of people did not confirm with me until earlier, like, yesterday like this time i had sent emails out to people and a lot of people like oh no i'm traveling can't make it oh no i can't do it because of this i can't do it because of this and then all of a sudden i start seeing um la yesterday like 24 hours ago i'm like you know what i forgot this is your long live stream i can come on afterwards because originally i was like are you kidding me there's like no one going to be in this thing it's going to be me and like three other people and then all of a sudden I started getting all these last minute, oh, you know what? I can after all, I can after all, I can after all. I'm like, great. So now we have the, the, the usual suspects coming in here. So what I'm going to say is I, I said that uh, we were, if we didn't get at least a hundred dollars in donations per hour, we're going to call it. So right now it is, uh, it just crossed over from where well, the stream is right now. It is 1530. The clock starts now. If by 1630, we don't have $100 in donations, I will call the stream. So we'll see what happens here. Uh, let's go back through these comments here. I may, may call it early if the chat stops. We only have 20, well, 31 people now. I think Europe's starting to wake up. Yeah, Europe is definitely waking up right now. So we're going to start to see comments coming in very soon. Uh, let's see here. Better start to change your diaper uh, soon, Alan. And then Bundaberg. Yeah, hopefully it's recognized and it's not just an American brand that pretends to be uh, an Australian brand. Okay, thanks so much, Andrew. Blown away all the time, effort you put in the stream. Thanks for playing musical mics. Bye, Epic. Do you need me? If you want to come on, Petrushka, by all means. <laughs> apologies for keeping you up no you know what this is the epic live stream uh we stay on and we'll i think i think i'll obviously i'll run out of steam eventually and that's when i start to get brain dead and that's when uh you will hear me say very random things people that have been in my, my live streams before notice that my eyes will close and i'll just continue to talk that's because amazingly i have the ability to talk in my sleep i've told this story before i might as well tell it again now it was a story from a few years ago, uh, well, a few, a few years ago, I was a teenager and I went to summer camp 
And uh, I went to one of the summer camp at Camp Glisten in Dahlonega, Georgia. And one of the things that they have is a summit camp where you basically are getting once you leave the camp, the, the main civilization with all the, the cabins and stuff, and they trek you over the mountains, over the, the, the hills and mountains that they have. And then you end up in there's two different areas of it. At least it used to be back in the in the 80s and 90s. There was <clears throat> Creekside and there was Marsh Edge. There were two different areas with a big, huge field between them. Creekside was obviously on the side next to the creek, and Marsh Edge was at the edge of the marsh on the other side. Big, huge gap between there. They also had these elevated platforms that they put big canvas tents that were that were constantly mounted there. And in this, uh, we would always put our sleeping bags on top of that, and they, it, you, you could go every, wherever you wanted to. And this one time, this one year, me and two other guys were in the same, in the same um, tent. First night, nothing happened. The second night, I wake up at like, you know, whatever ungodly hour of the day. We didn't have clocks back then. Or not clocks. We had clocks. Did not have cell phones back then, so I had no idea at a summer camp what time it was. It was in the middle of the night. One of the guys in my tent was freaking out. He's like, what? Are you just And we were, we, me and the other guy were like, what is this guy's deal? Well, a camp counselor comes flying in saying, what's going on? What's going on? And he's like, he's like, these guys are talking. They won't shut up. All I'm trying to do is sleep, and I'm telling them to shut up, and they're not listening. And we're like, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. I've been asleep. And then the other guy was like, I'm asleep. What are you talking about? Come to find. And they said, wait a minute. Do you talk in your sleep? He's like, yeah, I do. Do you? And it's like, yeah. Apparently in my sleep, I can talk and make sense. He couldn't. So he would say something. I would respond to him. And he would answer something else random. And we ended up having this conversation and it drove the other guy crazy because he was like, shut up. And then we would involve that in the conversation or say something. So. That's one of the, the fun stories. Another example of me just talking in my sleep was um, an ex-girlfriend, her computer was acting up and she was in college and she needed it to do schoolwork. And for whatever reason, the thing was just screwed up all over the place. It wasn't loading in some of her programs. And I'm like, ah, and I got to go to sleep. I can't just be up forever. And she's like, I know, but I really have projects to do. Can you talk me through any of it? Sure. So I have the phone and I do what you're not supposed to do. If you stay vertical, you can stay focused. I was like, yeah, sure. I'm just going to lay down and I'll, I'll talk to you. And, she, and I was like on the phone and then I start closing my eyes. I'm like, okay, I'll stay focused on this. And I'm just continuing to tech, tech her. I wake up and I look, at, I, I look around. And I'm like, oh, the phone's here. This is a landline phone, not a cell phone back in those days. And I'm like, oh, my phone is actually, um, you know, sitting, it's, it's, it's off the hook. And so, I, and, and, and you know how back in those days, someone would disconnect, it would then go to a busy signal. And then after that, it just went quiet. So I was like, oh, it's, it's quiet on the other end. She's obviously hung up and I didn't know this. I probably annoyed her by going to sleep and she had no, and she uh, wasn't talking to her anymore. And I was just so tired. I slept through it. So I say, Anne, and she says, yeah, it's almost done. I'm like, she's there. Well, and she's like, yeah, and I really appreciate you. It's been all night. I can't believe you've been here with me all night working on this. I'm like, yeah, of course. I mean, you need it for school, right? And she's like, I really do. Thank you so much. I'm like, sure. I was a computer technician back then. So to me, the, the whole idea of me staying up all night and teching her computer and fixing it in my sleep was something hilarious. And I love that. That's a, that's a great story I love to tell. Uh, I can't believe this is still going. Hello from Europe. Well, every single year we continue to go. We just go and go and go. No sync. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Oh, I means I'm out of sync. Sorry, I have no control. Uh, hit refresh. I was about to troll, but I'm not going to troll. Uh, also, I did hear about the deity and I'm very excited about it. Very good. That's uh, uh, thanks to Sean Milo. Well, let me say this real quick. Um, since there are people in the UK as the UK is waking up, if you are listening in the UK and you have yourself uh, the, and you listen to audiobooks, Sean Milo, who sponsored an hour of the Epic Live stream earlier to spread the word about his uh, an audiobook that he voiced, he's done about 20 of them. One of them is The Shark in the Housing Pool. It is a story about a, uh, a mortgage fraud con artist who – and it's it's a it's a ten hour audiobook, and the thing is fascinating. Well, one of the things that he has is UK copies that he can gift to people, and so he has said that anybody in the UK would like those copies. Send me an email at Alan at soundspeeds.us, and it has to be the UK because the 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 way that the system works is it codes differently if you're United States, if you're the UK, if you're the Euro Europe or whatever else. But if you're in the UK, 
Send me an email at alan at soundspeeds.us. I will forward you to Sean and he will use your email address. So whatever it is, let me know the email address you use and he will give you a code so that you can download the book and you can hear it. It's actually fascinating. It's a really cool story. I'm only two hours in. It's literally my third tab right there that I'm looking at. And when I'm back, when, when I'm no longer doing the live stream tomorrow, I have one video I have to get out for Sunday and I have another video to do on mon for Monday. Once I'm done with that, believe me, I'm going to actually finish that book in the next couple of days after. So, um, so he does have that. So if you are in the UK, send me an email if you want it. Now, if you're in the United States and you go to look up, there's a link down in the description, the shark in the housing pool. If you click the link and you go there and if you buy it, don't, you know, and you don't do the trial via, you know, the free trial as part of Audible, if you actually buy it. Send me, uh, forward that to me, alan at soundspeeds.us. And what I will do is I will take that email address. It's going to be on there. I will send that to Sean. And Sean will send you a, a coupon code for another audiobook that he did with the same exact guy who, obviously, this is a, the, the shark in the housing pool is about a con man who gets caught. That's the way it always ends. They always end up getting caught because you don't end up having someone that's brilliantly, you know, uh, that's, that's breaking a whole bunch of laws and then decides to write a book saying how they've never gotten caught. Eventually you get caught. That's when they write the, their memoirs in jail, right? Or when they get out. And that's the way he basically did it. But he wrote a second book about what he did on the inside. That's called The Program. It's a really cool story and I can't wait to actually dive into it. So if you buy The Shark in the Housing Pool and you, uh, you forward me the information, he will, I'll forward it to Sean and Sean will send you a free copy for the first 20 people that do so. Uh, to the program, and you'll get a chance to get two audiobooks for the price of one, which is amazing. Heather says, Ben Burgers, her favorite too. As a matter of fact, I just threw one away that as I finished it, but my wife gave me another one. She 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 brought it a little while ago, and then she brought me another one. Congrats on winning the prize, ping pong. Uh, no clocks back then. How old are you? Yeah. No clocks. Cell phone. Alan, what's your long, what was your longest working hours? I did a show ca uh, called The Game Season 4. I think I did it in fall of 2010. The director was a night owl. It was his, he was the, my, he was the showrunner. He was the director. He was the writer. He loved the show and everything about it. He had fun with the ad libs and the actors, and he just constantly was trying to have fun out there. He also liked working late hours and he had no problem doing so. So he would just say, well, let's keep going. So he was the showrunner. There was no UPM there to pull the plug. So we would almost every single day go 16 to 18 hours. There were some days right before I started the show that went as long as 21. It was, I was, I was finishing up another show. We finished on, on a Friday and then Monday I started on, on the game, but there were many days that we would just go longer and longer and longer. And we're just, and you would have crew members that would literally be standing up leaning, you know, against somebody, you, you know, I would lean against uh, a guy and, and he would be leaning back with his shoulder and we were leaning against each other, keeping ourselves vertical. And then they would finally call rap and then give us a minimal turnaround and we'd come back in and do the whole thing again. And that was also a show that ran things kind of dangerous, in my opinion, because we would be on top of a ladder. I'd, I'd end up, there'd be a crazy situation because the, the DP would always front light and I would have to be on top of a ladder. And when you are cold outside in 25, 30 degree weather, and then suddenly you go inside of a warm soundstage and you get on a ladder where it's even hotter in the days before LED fixtures, when it was really warm up there, you instantly start going, oh, this is nice. Sitting on top of a 12-step ladder is, first of all, not what you need to be doing. It's not safe. Second of all, it's not safe to do that when you're drowsy and tired. Third of all, it's not safe to do when you're drowsy, tired, trying to focus with a boom pole out in front of you. So that's ridiculous. But that was probably, those are the longest hours I did. Routinely, it was a 16 to 18 hour day every day, Monday through Friday. That was ridiculous, and I will well, we'll never do a show like that again. Uh, you've been slowly drifting more and more out of sync since the stream started. It's on YouTube's end. Yeah. Doesn't surprise me. Usually there's a staying power thing and it has, and, and YouTube does have issues uh, with sync over the course of long streams. It does happen. Sorry to say. Uh, heads up. The book is actually a very good listen. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Why do you bring 
politics to the sound community. Support USA veterans who are willing to... Well, you really want to start going there? I don't want to get into uh, an argument or whatever else. Here's what I will tell you, and I'm going to leave it at that. Every single country has people that will defend that country. Those soldiers, as individuals, just like anybody who works for a company. If I work for a company, I am their employee. I'm still going to do work for them and take that seriously. It doesn't matter what country you are. If you give yourself to your to your government uh, to protect your country for whatever reason, depending on whatever it happens to be, whatever country you happen to be, we will all have differences in in thoughts and process and 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 our thoughts and you know philosophies. Obviously, you have a, a an opinion here on something, and you want to you know you have an opinion against the 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 charity that we're sponsoring here that we're supporting. And here's what I will say back. Every single one of our veterans that has dedicated their time to protect the country, no matter what country that is across the world, do they deserve to be punished because they were some, – some countries require you to do military service. Some, some countries, like if you go and do that and your country requires you to do that and you support your country, is it right for the country to turn their back on you? And, and, and if you have PTSD and issues, if you get injured, is it right for them to just say, well, okay. Or is it good to have a charity that kind of supports you and helps you regain your mental, your, your, get, get through your PTSD? If you're suicidal or something like that, that's what Stack Up does. That's why I'm backing them. They are trying to help people. You may have a problem with a company or a corporation, just like you might have a problem with, with a company. You know, Let's just say that you don't like Facebook. You don't like Twitter. You don't like any of the social media platforms. If that's the case, then you can have issues with those, and that's fine. But the employees that work for them, are those people evil? You could say they're part of the problem, true statement, but they still have to work someplace. So there you go. That's where I'm going to leave it right there. If you really want to pick a fight or something like that, take it someplace else. I will simply block you. I'm not going to deal with it. That's what I'll say. People deserve respect. You may have a problem with the company or uh, the government. Individuals are different. Hate on an individual individually, but don't mass, uh, you know, bring that craziness out here to me. I will straight. I don't block people on this channel very often, but I will if you're trying to pick a fight on something like this, because I definitely support people, and I basically am a lover of all people. Doesn't matter if you and I have the same philosophies on something, as long as you are a good person, as long as you are trying to just do what's right in the world and something like that. Sometimes people get hurt. You got to keep in mind a lot of people that go into military service are teenagers. They're they're 18 years old. They're starting off their lives. And some people will get injured or they'll get PTSD or something like that at a very young age. You know, right now, if you, if you had me at, at, in my, in my forties talking to myself when I was 18, I would, there's a lot of stuff I would try to teach myself. And I can also tell you, I would not be listening. I'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great to know. Okay. And then it would probably go in one ear and out the other. We learn. So anyway, that's where I'm going to leave that. Um, I'm going to add once again to the stream. Patricia Gamirswa, how's it going? Hey, going well. Alan, you look great. <laughs> I haven't seen your beard growing in 14 hours, I, I will say. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's funny. Um, Patricia was here at the beginning of the stream, and it looks like she'll be here near the end, too. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, a change of day for you. Uh, 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 it's, still, it's still me here blabbing away on YouTube. And after four hours, I'm sorry, after eight hours, Facebook... Uh, basically ended the stream i i have a little uh check a uh, little exclamation mark up there that says there's a problem streaming to facebook and then i went to facebook and it basically cut off, cut it off it pulled the plug right after eight hours i'm like you know <laughs> facebook why aren't you doing what upm should do i want the u i want the upm to take a note from facebook so. yeah yeah no i see it didn't use long weeks as a source of pride. So true. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's something that we did when we were young, and it was a a boast that we could survive that. But when you get older, that's not a way to live. People people tell war stories. I mean, that's that's one of the saddest you know things about it is it is. is and and it's crazy too. Because we typically will will accept like uh, working twelve hours as a regular day, 
And then when we end up working a longer day, we're like, oh, well, that happens. And we work a short day. We're like, wow, I get to go home and see my family. I, I did a show that originally told us when we booked it, it was scheduled for 14 hour days. And we're just like, okay, at least we know. And yeah. uh, we didn't know this until the week before we started. And then every single day, they would like you, they would start, you know, we would say the sharks are circling. That was the producers and UPMs out there at about, you know, nine and a half hours in. They're like, let's call this at 10. Let's get out of here in 10. I can't, we can't. And we, if we started to get close to 12, they would be like, you know, we should be yeah, ended now. Nice. It was. And, and then when it, when this, this shows you how we're used to taking abuse because we get our paychecks and we're like, man, where's the money? Look at these hours, man. We're only looking at 48 hours for the week. Are you kidding me? And we were complaining about that 10 hour days, like just about almost 10 hour days every single day. And that's because you, you're, you, you get used to that abuse. You get used to seeing it take, uh, you know, turn into money that comes down. And then when you get your paychecks and it's drastically lower than it is on the last show. And you say, the reason why is because the lower hours, you don't think about the value of having those extra hours with your family or to keep yourself healthier or something like that. You just think of, oh man, I should be abused right now and get the money for it. So it's hard because when you're in the union and I mean the IA in yeah. America, you know, all the crafts are in there together and there are some crafts who um, count on that overtime to make up their paycheck. They're yeah. either working at a lower rate or whatever. They've come to know that, that that's the time they need. And it's, I, I understand those uh, production people or, you know, art department people, but that prep the, that they're doing, those hours are not the same as production onset hours. And they're not happening all night long. Nobody is shopping for furniture or accessories at 4 a.m. and eating lasagna. So there isn't any way to, to uh, equalize that. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that uh, it's so hard to to fight for reasonable hours in the film business. But it happens in Europe less so because now there are so many companies that originate in America or the streamers, you know, come here and say, well, we do this in America and that's the way we're doing it. Yeah. And uh, and it's just bringing everyone down. And it's it's a tough life. There are physiological things that happen to humans and um it just uh it requires a bit of confidence and a bit of uh trusting each other to kind of not underbid and and lower things down you know to a point where it's it's bad for everyone yeah and it's it is really sad um that we've kind of fallen into this, the bad habits of the abuse. I mean, in many ways, it's gotten better. In many ways, it's not. You know, the world of digital, as we were talking about, you know, 12 hours ago, um, there is a lot that has changed in the industry just since we went from analog to, uh, from analog to digital recording. And when we went sure. from, uh, for example, film to video, there's been a Absolutely. lot of changes. And I mean, and it's, it's funny because uh, you, you talk to people that were that are only only been doing this for five years mm. and they're telling you that they remember the days when there was a guy it was really funny on this last show that i just got through doing uh i was talking to one of the the first acs over there and uh one of the uh, one of the second acs comes by there and he says yeah back in the day when and she says oh, hold on a second when you say back in the day when are you talking about he says like 2017 she goes <laughs> Back in the day in 2017. And he's like, Yeah. I mean, that was just, it's hilarious. It, it's it like, is. It's... But at the same time, you kind of, I mean, you know, you kind of get it. I mean, I, if you, if, if I said back in the day to you and I'm talking about, you know, 2000, you know, one, you're like, Okay. I mean, at that point, you were halfway vested, you know, in your, in your <laughs> union work at the point. And so you're it's just like, Oh, that's so cute. You know, because after you've been doing this for four decades, you know, it's like uh, you you can tell a lot more stories. But it's funny because me and many of the people that built the Atlanta market, you know, when the, the incentives came here, we yeah. will get on set. And, and then it's funny because we talked, you know, on this last show, there was like two or three of us that were that were hanging around on set one day. And we're just talking and we're like, geez, you know, look at the young, the, the young, the next generation that's coming up. 
And then it's funny because one of the guys named Andy, a stunt, um, uh, the stunt coordinator, he looks at me and says, Alan, you know those old crusty people that we used to always look at and and hear stories from on set? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, those are us now. I'm like, oh, crap. I know. You're, you're right. <laughs> you know, it's like. It's like it suddenly hit me. I was like, you know, we're telling these these stories and we're like, oh, geez, you know, it used to you remember when it used to do this. We always told our kids we're not going to say, you know, back in my day. But then we end up doing right. that. It's true. I remember one of uh, the first couple of years I was in the business, there was a grip and he'd say, how old are you? And I'd say like 27. I got socks older than you. Yeah. And I, I didn't know what that meant. It's like, does he really have socks older than me? Does it is that like a compliment that? I'm here, you know, or that I shouldn't be here. Like, I didn't know how to take it. And I said, what a strange thing to say. And I've said it to some people in the last few years, you know, the, the students I'm teaching or, you know, I get an intern as I got sang. And I do, I probably have. And then and then you. you hear yourself and you're like, Oh, I just said the thing. Right of passage, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's kind of cool to be able to say it's funny. You know, here's the scary thing. There are people that are legal adults of drinking age on our sets yes. that were born in a year that starts with a two. Yeah. Yeah. That is I, mind I blowing know. to me. That is uh, mind blowing to me. And, and, you know, it's funny cause I'll have a really rough day on set. I'll come home and I'll be like limping because, you know, after, after you're on your feet on concrete all day, you get in your car and you drive home an hour, you get out and your, your body starts to, you know, the adrenaline is draining and that's when your body is like, you get out of the car and you're like, oh, geez. And you're like struggling. You're like, oh, and, you know, you're, you you walk in and sometimes I'm like slightly hunched over because I've been in my car yeah, for so can't long. can't quite get straight yet. Yeah. You kind of have to uh, tell your body, you know, this is an important thing. Got to do it. I'll walk in the door and my daughters will start laughing at me. And they're like, gosh, dad, you're getting old. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to hear it. Walking fetus. <laughs> and that's just what I'll respond to them. I'll just look at them and I'll, I'll, and you know, right but it's funny. Down. It's funny when my, when my 17 year old is like, geez, I'm getting old. I'm like, you are not getting old. Shut up. You know, I don't want to hear this. <laughs> you know, you're not getting old. Um, but you know, one of the things that I, 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 I tell people and, and as we're talking on set about getting old and you know, the, the, the rite of passages that you can go through is that I tell people, you know, I'll say, I'll say, look, you got to keep in mind, it was only a few generations ago where humans didn't live much past their thirties. And my body learned that when I hit 50, it's like, whoa, 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 wait a second. Your age now starts with a four. You should be dead by now. And I'm going to remind you of this every day of your life going forward. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you for that. You know, it's like your, 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 your body really does. It's, it, it fights you back sometimes. Well, and, and I, we age quicker in the film business. That's yeah. the thing nobody wants to talk about. Um, there, there, there's a lot of positives and I've been privy to interesting, what have turned out to be world events or, or people at certain points in their careers or just places you have access to, Yeah. but there's a toll, you know? Um, and it's not, it isn't just physical. A lot of people think that what we do is physical and don't understand all the mental activity that goes into it. Um, so I thought I would share and give your voice a couple minutes. Um, I got an email between uh, when I came on yesterday and this morning from uh, an instructor that I had done, um, Mark and I had done a uh, a class with and there were some takeaways from the students things that they were surprised to hear about the sound department so if it's not a good time to do that well that's means, fine. i thought i yeah yeah you good with that yeah okay so here's the student takeaways um from a sound design class uh in the fall that you should do two days of prep for every day of shooting apparently no one had ever heard that before but mm. It was a thing I learned early on. That the sound department can creatively contribute to a film. Yes. As much as the, the desire for photography, for example, and they're cruci a crucial part of planning and pre-production as well, as well. That came as a shock. Yeah, it, it doesn't thought, surprise me. You just show up 
and uh, you just plug in things and it's linear and point there's the no thought process. Yes. Yeah, just point the microphone. <laughs> hold, uh, Just hold it over your head, put it over the actors, and it's going to be great. Yeah, which is telling me that these skills aren't being taught. And if they're not being taught in a class of sound design, they're sure as hell not being taught to directors, producers. Okay, so back to something positive, which were these takeaways. Um, something I took away from the Zoom on Thursday was that booming and onset sound requires a lot of creativity and collaboration. That mm -hmm. was something that someone in a sound design class was surprised and hadn't learned from the university. Which well, it's, a, it's amazing I, to me. That seems like it, it seems like it would be common sense. You're part of the sound department. It's a team. We're not individuals out there because if we were individuals out there, we'd be competing, but we're not, we're trying to, the only competition we have is to get the better tracks than the, than, than the previous day is, is right. that's, that's really what it is. The previous scene, we're going to make everything better. And that's the, but, that's the push that we have. That's, that's, that's so weird that that's, a, I mean, it seems like such an easy thing. Yes, of course. But that is a good takeaway to have, have picked up. It, it is. is my, my fear is that, and what I'm seeing in a lot mm. of universities around all the countries I've been teaching at is that sound design really is a post class. It's called sound design. They they usually aren't being taught by people with any kind of production experience, but they know all about plugins and they're, they're putting a lot of money into, you know, their post rooms, um, which is nice because it's, it's certainly made a, an open niche for Mark Yolano and I to come and talk and, and we get to see the world. But, um, you know, it's it's a little daunting to think that we're the two out there who are actually interfacing with students and, and they don't seem to understand what kind of production resources there are. So, you know, I have mentioned your site as well as a couple other places that, you know, they can go for solid information, but it's a slow push. And I don't imagine it happening in, in my lifetime. And you know what? And that's one of the things I really appreciated when um, – and I think I told you this uh, when when I when I saw the book and I saw that, you know, reliable sources of information was in the back of it and it did mention sound speeds. I was like, oh, that's great. And then I think I told you this. There was a guy that I worked with. He had reached out to me and said, I really appreciate everything you're doing. And it's one of those things where you see people's names, you follow them. You don't know who they are, but they know who you are. And that mm -hmm. means something to them. And they feel like, oh my, oh my gosh, I'm meeting someone that I've read a book of or something like that. You feel like just a normal person, but then they, but because what you did meant so much to them, they feel, and uh, they feel you're important to them and they will feel that. Well, he was, he ended up being a stand in on the show that, that, um, uh, on a movie that I did last fall. And he recognized me was, and didn't say anything for a while. And then finally he, he, he said, Alan, uh, you don't know me, but I sent you an email and, and, and I'm like, really? And I, and he refreshed my memory. I'm like, I do remember that email. And then he, and I said, remind me of what your name is. Cause I'm terrible with names. He told me, he started talking and us and, I, and he was talking about wanting to be in sound. And I said, awesome. Uh, so he's still doing stand and work, trying to basically get himself on set so he can watch and observe what happens uh, mm -hmm. since he's still trying to work to get his, his way in the door. And then I mentioned your book and he smiled and said, and said, yes, as a matter of fact, he was wearing a jacket at the time. He kind of does this number and he, he, cause he was a stand on stand. Yeah. He kind of does this number. He kind of turns, opens up his jacket. And it was inside <laughs> of his pocket there. And then he turns back <laughs> forward. Cause he was talking while talking to me while looking forward and doing this number. And then he just, while he's on camera, he kind of does this number and opens up his jacket and reveals that his book was there. And then he asked me if I would sign my name over where, where, where sound speeds is listed. Now, and, and so I was like, that I don't know if I can Sweet. do. I can't, I can't sign someone's someone else's book. So I think I wrote to you and I said, "Would you find it acceptable if I put my if if I did that?" That's, but then by then, I'm sure, I, I said I, yes. You but, did, but it was okay. it was one of those things where it was by the time you were busy, you were probably teaching or doing you know a show. By the time you got back to me, the day was already over, and I didn't want to, um, you know, I'm, I'm no. you know, it's one of those things, like you said, sweet. 
but it's very sweet. The first time somebody said, "Will you autograph my book?" I'm, it, it came out of left field. Yeah, honestly, and I, you know, I, I always am humble because I'm always um, just so so grateful to hear that it's helping people. I, yeah. I really wrote it for that reason. No one should have to go into such debt for film school and not learn what you want to. <sighs> At the end of it, I uh, it was criminal. Jeez. And I see that in universities so often. It does. Which is why they keep asking us back, which is nice. But at the same time, um, I now I think that's why book number four is going to be for directors. Because we have oh, to stop please, the madness. Please, I'm writing the I would, book. I would almost say stop right now with the boom book and get that one out first. Holy it's crap. Close. That's, that's it's a good close. one. Oh, it's man. Close. Boom book do. is going to be good. Oh, I'd have no doubt. That's amazing, though. Make really a book for directors to say you, where you need to learn. I'll tell you, it's this is this is something I can't you'll get a trip. stand it anymore, and I'm old enough that I can say something. <laughs> yes, and, and and you know, it's like, look, you, you know what? Fine, fire me. You know, uh, it's like what I tell people on set. You know, when I see something that is unsafe, better believe me, I'm going to step in a door. I'm going to step in front of someone, and I've gone head to head with directors, and I've gone head to head. You know, because I'm right there on the on a set. And uh, quite often I'm a steward on the shows that I'm on. And if I'm standing there, like there was a, a time when I was on a show and it was a show and there was, there was it was a, a scene that took place in 1971 and they were using a vintage door with vintage glass. And the scene basically had the camera positioned. Yeah. They, they lined it up with the door right here and then they opened it up. And what happens is the door opens at the top of the scene and it opens all the way. He goes in real quickly, grabs something, and his wife kind of in, in and catches him as he's coming in there. She's just tearing, you know, upset at him, yelling at him. He picks the thing up and she's just turning with him as the as he leaves. And so he goes right up by that door and the camera ends with her looking right uh, right at him and slamming the door. So if you can imagine, like, camera's yeah, here, I'm, I'm door opens, you. he goes in and then turns around and comes right back out. And so it was a real quick shot. It was only like six seconds long, very, very fast. He's ignoring her. She's lighting him up. She slams yeah. the door. And then they say, okay, or they, they say, let's keep going, keep going, reset. And I look up and there's a crack on, across the glass from where mm. they slammed the door. They slammed yeah. the door and there was a, there was a crack at the top of, 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 of the glass. And I look at that and I'm like, it's at the very, very top. And, and then I look at it closer and I see that the entire glass pane has shifted down about that much. And Ooh. so as soon as I saw that, I was, I said, nope. I said, because, yeah. you know, you have an operator that is literally right there. You have actors on both sides of the door. You have me booming through and doing and, and, you know, tracking with it. This is instantly unsafe. And so I said, I said, no, 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 we should stop. And um, the, the, the first city was, you know, you hear the director is like, yeah, yeah, keep it going. Keep it going. Do it again. Reset. Reset. And the first city yeah. like, yeah, let's reset. Reset this. I'm like, oh, no, no. Hold on a second. We have a safety concern. We should stop. And he's like, he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, look at the door. He's like, uh, What? You know, we're, we're going to go again. We're going to go in. He was completely oblivious. I, 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 re yeah. I retract the pole and I literally stand and uh, stand with my foot in the door and, and, and block it. And I, and I say, no, we need to stop. And, you know, the camera operator is just like, you know, big eyes, like, you know, he's not going to get, in, get involved. You have the key grip who's literally standing behind me looking at it also with big eyes, like, you know, not saying anything. And the first AD is like, Alan, back, you know, back up. I'm like, no, we need to address this. And then the, the director is like, you know, we need action, action. What's going on? What's the holdup? He gets mad, comes flying in on set. And, and, and yeah. that's, when, that's when I stopped and looked both of them. And I said, gentlemen, we have a safety issue. Look at this glass. I said, there's a you have a liability here. So there's a safety concern that affects me and the crew. And that's the, those are the words I tell people to say. There mm -hmm. is a safety concern that affects me and the crew. You don't just make it about you. You make it about everybody because it is a safety concern yeah. on set involves us all. And you say you have a liability here. You point that out. If they ignore a safety concern that has been brought up to them from an employee, that is a, that is a potential issue regarding insurance coverage yep. and potential, you know, a liability Any regarding criminal you know, action in the future. Exactly. Absolutely. And you that, say that during the deposition it looks bad. And, and so they cannot ignore it. At that point, when I pointed at that glass, the director instantly, you see him going from fired up to, oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, cut, cut. Because they're oblivious. They're on a monitor offset. The so first oblivious. AD is going by what the director is trying to keep them happy. And they, and they, it, huh, I don't see anything unsafe. What are you talking about? They're not paying attention to that. They're focused on, you know, let's keep this thing going. And so you have to stop them. 
You have to do it because especially as you start to do these long hours, 12, 13, yeah. 14 hour days, things get crazy. People stop focusing and they stop thinking right. Your brain's not functioning correctly. You're getting double time or or even sometimes higher than that on some contracts, uh, uh, you know, or at least not really so much anymore, but you used to get over double time. And that's when you were at your absolute worst mentally. And you are so inefficient and you're being reckless and whatever. And that's when people paid. are going to get hurt. When you're tired, you're fatigued, you've been pushed so long mentally and physically, you're breaking down. And yet that's when you're going to start doing stupid things. So we really do. If you see something, you need to stop and say something, because guess what? If they fire me because I pointed out a safety concern, I'm going to own part of the studio. Because that's the God's honest truth of it. If you point out a legit safety concern, it's one thing if you say, Crafty is backed up over here. They're 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 backed up and they're offloading their macaroni and cheese and their their exhaust is going right into the crafty tent and I'm starting to get lightheaded. I, I need to call my union. I need to call the safety hotline. That's ridiculous. You know, that's not a legit safety concern. You need to call the safety line over if they're backing up and their car is just there temporarily and it's idling. It's totally a different thing than when you are in a situation where they're not doing proper gun safety, you know, or, or, the, or something that is legitimately unsafe, totally different. Sure. If there's a legit safety the concern. Hard part is, and I was gonna say, yeah. The hard part is that everyone is in that diminished capacity, you know, while you should be most aware. You know? Yeah. So. Uh, real quick here. Um, how many producers think uh, we just show up, collect money and hand in sound roll. Maybe they should take a class too. And that's, that's, well, exactly in line with what you what you were saying about uh, writing a book for them. That is brilliant. I love it. It says, I'll buy that book when it published since uh, 2015. I've been interesting in film directing. Brilliant. You already have a sale Best right there. Best thing you can do if you're interested in film directing, go work on other people's films. Exactly. As a crew person, not as an assistant to the director, not in, as some above the line. Be there, you know, in the moment by moment on the set, watching decisions that are made or not. And you'll have a perspective that that most directors don't, and it will serve you well. If you IMDb some directors, and this is something we were talking about 12 hours ago, a lot yeah. of the people that come into the world of digital, since there's so much opportunity, is sometimes they're giving people opportunities that are uh, directors are inexperienced. There's some of the top tier people, producers, writers, directors, they've not done stuff more than a couple of years. They think in right. their minds, they know they they know how to run a show and they don't. And that's Absolutely. one of the things that, that is not really necessarily our place to tell them, but we really, really wish we could. And, and you know, bid on that job accordingly. Ask yeah. the right questions. Check out, you know, what kind of experience. Um, there are a couple grips that uh, I work with, very experienced, um, lovely people, and they wanted to do a short. They had written something and they were doing it on the weekend. They got a list talent mm -hmm. in front of the camera and behind the camera. I'm happy to go work, yeah. you know, with them as director producer because they know they were far they more capable of putting together a realistic schedule, feeding people, doing what was necessary, bringing on the right amount of people per department. It Not was killing one of the, the nice days. Shows. Yeah, that's great. A uh, question for you here. Um, obviously, any work with firearms and pyro or pyrotechnics is dangerous. But have you and Patricia ever experienced any situations on set that are seemingly seemingly uh, seemingly innocuous but are actually very dangerous? Yes. Yes. All too often. Yes. Well, way too often. And if you and I have, uh, there should be a poll done. Yes. Have we seen people uh, horribly injured? Yes. Yep. Have we seen people? Uh, unconscious and have a producer say, let's hurry and put them in the back of my Mercedes to drive them to the hospital when they have a spinal potential spinal injury. Yes. I haven't seen that. And luckily, it took, And it took a key grip and, and other crew people <clears throat> say, you don't move anybody with spinal injury, you know, yeah. call an ambulance. Have I seen people die? Yes. I have too. Um, and it's and almost die. And um, you yep. don't ever get over that. No. And, and, and you'll have the entire crew go through different stages. Some people will be uh, sad. Some people will be upset. So I got very angry when, I, when that happened. And I was, I, I, you, you want to see me really short. You want to see me, you know, 
saying everything you're not supposed to say to people, uh, basically on set, just having no problem saying something, you know, will intentionally make them not like what you were saying. And just, and you say it with just cold eyes. That's at that point where, where, when I saw that happen, when I saw someone, someone, uh, fall. And even though there was nothing that we did everything right, a stunt just went wrong. It was a stunt that went wrong and someone died. And, uh, and I was bitter and angry. That was my response to it. And I did not expect that. When I looked back at it, I said, whoa, that wasn't healthy. And I talked to a couple of people and they said, people grieve in different ways. Yeah. Is what they said. And they said, your, yours obviously was, was to have extreme anger uh, towards it. But at the same time, I was try- I felt, I felt I was keeping myself together. Apparently I wasn't as well as I thought I was. I was a lot more cold. I was a lot more, you know, just staring someone down and that kind of thing but people grieve in different ways and um yeah it's and it's for not... different amounts of time yeah you know um that's that's a very hard thing to deal with. and unfortunately a lot of filmmaking you know does involve doing things Potentially. going places things that and and the hours and the fact that on monday we'll start the day at 7 a.m which means we'll get up at four and then on friday we're getting up at 4 p.m to go to work by 7 p.m to work overnight only to get home at 9 a.m on saturday in order to turn around and get to set on monday with a forced call at 7 a.m you know it's like we run run into that kind of that kind of stuff and unfortunately it's been normalized way too much it's almost the expectation of a lot of people too much yeah. yeah but um it's hard on a set because uh, you're just bringing your personal experiences and obviously when alan and i have decades behind us we've experienced more things earlier in in our life it can be very hard when those dangerous elements are on shows where overall the experience level is so much less and so yeah. um, I think uh, a couple things that, that you need, anybody listening needs to know, if you're on a shoot with firearms um, in America um, or, or American-based productions, the first AD is the senior safety officer. So there's responsibility there. There should be an armorer. Those things, you know, shouldn't just be handed out by anyone. If you're on the set, which boom operators always are, you yeah. have the right to ask to see the chamber and look down the barrel. Anybody on a set who's near that firearm has the right to ask for that. And don't feel embarrassed or don't feel too shy about that because gonna, it's potentially your life. I also want to in- interject one more thing in there, too. Absolutely. If a show is doing anything with firearms, demand a rehearsal. Absolutely. There are sometimes shows that that say, "Yeah, we we all know what we're doing, right? Let's just let uh, you know. Let's just go. Let's do it. We've checked the gun. We know it's safe. No, 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 no. no. We should at least, if nothing else, do it. Uh, do a rehearsal by the marks. That way, Prop we all gun. have. We have to have an understanding of what goes on, where things go, because it's it could be one of those things where they point the gun right to the side of the camera. And the gun has been cleared. The gun is a rubber gun or whatever else. But still, at the same time, we still need to verify and go through uh, go through the routine. Part of things, even if it seems ridiculous, there is a procedure you follow. And if something involves something that it, there is in any a- that there's any aspect or there's any part part of it that is dangerous, then you need to you need to be aware of that and and respect it. And that's one thing that. Um, Trying to to get that through some people's heads is they're like, well, if if the gun's been checked out, then why do we need to do it? Well, the reason why is because there is still dangerous aspects of handling things and the way things happen. I did, um, you know, obviously, I, I, I you, people have heard me say I did two seasons <laughs> of Walking Dead. Well, during the season that I was there, season eight, we went from doing big, huge, massive uh, sh- scenes where we were shooting uh, 300, uh, 300 blanks uh, uh uh basically a day with these big huge massive shootouts we went from stuff like that to vfxing everything overnight because of a concern that came up in the and the producers were very respond uh, respective to it and they said that's not going to happen we're not going to even allow that to happen we're going to handle things and do things a safe way 
they did not want to see something happen. Uh, and so as soon as there was one thing of this isn't an issue, but it could be like when you're shooting, when you're shooting these and you see bullets flying out of guns, those things are hot. Yeah. And when you're booming and one lands right here, yeah. something like that, that starts burning, burning. When you sit there, you're like doing this number and that begins what happens to your leading arm. It's going to dip. It's going to break your concentration. And that's the kind of thing that as cameras were moving around, they were getting hit. Sometimes someone would shoot a gun next to them, even though they were head, we're in this, but the, the ejection was going or something like that into someone, or it was being shot 40 feet and then hitting someone. And then when they kind of realized they were like, uh, no, there was yeah. a couple of, there was a couple of things that happened. They said, Nope, we're not going to do that. Um, there was a couple of things I'm not going to go into obviously in a public, in a public form. I can talk to you about it personally sometime, but, um, the, the producer said, Nope, not going to happen. We're nice. going to, and, and they did not, they did not want to, to have that be unsafe. That was the same season, by the way, that we had some, uh, a stunt guy fall to his fall to his death. So yep. if you heard I about, had, um, a few years ago in 2017, yeah. yeah, yeah. Years ago, I was doing some pickups for a movie and, uh, it was Charlie Bronson. And you'd think he understands firearms. And I was there for the rehearsal, booming it, you know, because I was taking a rehearsal with him. And he saw me. And when we went for the take, he threw a hot Uzi at me and it burned my leg, you know. And I had that burn, this <laughs> permanent scar, um, as well as hurting. And, um, you know, what goes through somebody's head when they're looking at you and throw a weapon at you, Um you know, I, I had a, a DP who was having a hissy fit about um, a production issue that had turned up that morning before shooting. And, uh, and he threw a dangerous weapon just out in a, in a little tantrum, but it just missed my head. And you know. <clears throat> that's, that's, that's one of those that you, you, you very focused and you're very calm about it but you still go and say producers this is not going to happen yeah you need to get this person wrangled in yeah because you know it can't well, just start throwing around weapons you can't start doing this stuff well it was early in my career and i was just so stunned and angry i walked off the set and i thought i went through my thing and decided um just to keep going but you know, voice my concerns in a quieter way. And um, as it turned out, this person's behavior didn't change and it was a quick rise and fall. And now that person is uninsurable and um, had to leave the business. Yeah. So after hurting more people. Yeah. And finally that, that came to a very, that's the effect. thing is behaviors don't change like that. Um, it's, it's, it's something that you have to wrangle things in. Um, I do want to say one other thing. There are some weapons that require ammunition in order to charge, you know, to fire. And um, so anytime you're dealing with guns, you know, you're asking the effects people, what kind of loads? Are they full? Are they quarter? Are they blanks? Even blanks have force. Yes. So you take that in under um, you know, advisement, but you also, you're protecting your ears. You're protecting yourself. There are things to do besides booming. There are radio mics, there's Lexan, there's adjusting your position. There's locking off a boom pole. There's calling it MOS. There's doing a wild track later. You have options in the sound department, but sometimes you're on period war movies and they bring in some artillery and to be shooting. Um, you have to be really just be aware, ask all those questions. If it smokes, uh, you know, if you have other special effects that might be dangerous, fire, uh, smoke, fumes, vapors, you want to ask what's in it, you know, what kind of compound, what, who's got the right respirator for me, because you're going to be in those uh, sets that are usually enclosed. They want to, you know, not air them out the way that the safety regulations tell you. So make sure you're trading off, or it still has other. wet paint, or and it has like, or or, it'll or it's have been wet fumigated. Paint on it. Yes, yeah, yeah. or and, and they're like, they're... and you're like, you you don't smell those, and we're about to put fire in here. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I had an effects. <laughs> I did this show years ago. Um, effects 
uh, department, none of them had 10 complete fingers, which was, has anybody talked about red flags? I kid you not. I kid you not. We were doing this show. I'm and laughing I looked because on, it's, I started, it's crazy. The I started craziness. noticing. Yeah. Nobody had 10 fingers. I'm like, okay, that's a problem. Plus we're <laughs> we've been doing this, this for 30 years as a team. Yeah. We've been working together for 30 years. Get me off this set, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there were problems. It was, um, it was actually a recreation of the first World Trade Center bombing. Nobody remembers the first one, but um, we were the in one this... in nineteen ninety one or something. Was it years? I could. Oh. Uh, that no, sounds that was the about. Second... Yeah, you know, somewhere between ninety and ninety three. Yeah, I think because we were shooting it and grabbing people's stories out of the newspaper and they were just calling the producers were calling these people up. Will you sell us your your life story? And we were shooting in a documentary like mode. They were burning tires, you know, with gasoline in these enclosed, you know. Bakery in uh, in a town that. um was built so long ago that they were going to demolish it. But before that, we got it for a good price. Um, and it had, uh, you know, lead-based paint peeling and all kinds of horrible things. Um, so when you have, and you should always have all the protection you need, like the right kind of respirator. And if they won't provide it, get your own. Or, um, you know, uh, goggles and other things. You st Anytime you're putting something uh on yourself, you're limiting your vision, you're limiting your mobility. That was back during the day of cable. So it really became a dangerous situation. So yeah. think, think, ask a lot of questions, understand exactly, you know, to the best of anybody's ability, what's going to happen. What is that cigarette smoke that's in that bar scene or, you know, other things? Make sure you know where the exit is. Make sure yeah. you know two exits. Absolutely. Because one will get jammed up, always um, be aware and, of your surroundings. And they'll block one off real quick because it's going to be in a shot. And then you got to make sure that they are aware that they have to unblock another one if there's multiples. Uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia says, I guess it's uh, 1993. So that was I'm when the first bombing was. Shot so. at 91, um, 92, 92. Do you, uh, is there more on the list of takeaways? There, you know, there is. Let me see. Back to something. Uh, those in the sound department are just as important as any other role oh. on a film set. Treat them yeah, with respect role. and acknowledge mm -hmm. that. Yep. How, uh, my biggest takeaway was hearing Mark and Petrushka talk about the importance of having a good relationship between the sound department and the rest of the artists making mm -hmm. the film. The rest of the artists. Because I told yep. them, boom operators are performance artists. And I yep. say it in my upcoming book, um, and people go, Oh, I never thought of myself that way. I'm just, you know, the guy with the boom or, you know, whatever. You're a performance artist. Very you few are. people are working when the camera rolls. Operator, first AC, dolly grip, actors, you know, and you. And it's um, an added level of um, performance, you know, to be on every single take. It makes a difference. And it does. Um, there, there really isn't any room for error and quick, you have to understand that real quick, question. Uh, yeah. real quick question here. Um, as you know, I've been going for quite a while here. I have to do two things real quick. I have to check and make yes. sure that the second half of the stream is being recorded. And also I was going to see if I could run to the restroom real quick here. Uh, if you're going through a list here, I'm going to just, uh, I'm going to bring down the, it, this and I'll bring, bring up my speaker and I'll be listening. But if you don't mind, I'm going to check on those two things. I'll be right back if you don't mind. Absolutely. If you're um, not there, it'll just stop, right? Or do, do I? <laughs> I'm going to maximize you on the screen and let you you run the show for a second. I'm going to be listening, and I'll be right back with you in a couple minutes, okay? And you're going to run your videos. <laughs> or not. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not running videos. You're not running videos. No, I thought I, it was I, the top. I, oh, oh, no, sorry, no, no. I, missed I finished that. No, no, no. Not okay. that. that. That ended um, – about you're gonna, 12 hours you're gonna, you're gonna zip away for a few minutes and i'm, I'm gonna, gonna go and check monologue. the recording i have i have a check uh, i after 12 hours youtube stops recording so i okay. started a recording to make to try to catch the second part of the stream that happens after 12 ah, okay. hours I got i'm gonna it, check sorry. that and then i'm gonna run to the restroom real quick and i'll be right back and it's literally yeah, right just, over there i would go through your list because i'm gonna have a speaker up i'm gonna yeah, be listening I'm gonna, 
I, so, I am going to go over the list. Okay. Please, please, right. please. I'm listening. All right. Off you go. Hi, everybody. Okay. Let's see. Uh, an example of the importance of having a good relationship between the sound department and the rest of the artists making the film is when Mark and Petrushka talked about making sure they ah uh, the uh, head of the department of the sound department is included in the location scout in order to build trust and a better relationship with everyone else. That is something that Mark Yolano talks about. Yes, there are. If someone's running a location scout, um, in my opinion, correctly, then uh, it's not just looking at a location. It's understanding how it's going to be used, what time of day it's going to be used, where the action will take place or a range of where the action will be and where everybody can stage where not just where the generator is but where the grips are setting up you know their staging where's craft services um and it's one thing i really love about quentin tarantino's location scouts is that everyone goes on them you know heads of department and it all gets talked out and and he knows i mean i should uh, not assume that but most directors don't know what they want to do how much they're going to use, where they're never going to see. And they kind of wait to get on a set with everybody. And then, you know, I don't know, divine inspiration. I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but they haven't done that kind of prep. Those are very expensive production dollars. So pre-production, your cheapest production dollars. And directors who have done their research so they know why they want to look you know, that way, because it's it's an ocean and the sun comes up that way or for whatever reason, it will pretty much tell you that you're not going to be looking behind. But again, um, a director who can explain this area is always going to be safe, makes it so much simpler. And I have been on those shows, you know, especially Clinton's show, um, where a production can save up to. 50 minutes of time because as soon as, you know, my truck arrives, I know where it's going. And if I have to shuttle, I know where my gear needs to, to end up. I don't have to wait for the director to show up, talk about it with the DP. And then, you know, everybody at once is going to get their trucks. It makes it uh, so much more efficient for the transportation department, for everybody else, just as departments come they start everybody getting into position. We don't have to talk about it unless there's been a change. Okay, another point. Uh, no one part of a crew is more important than the other. Sound is not more important than the visuals and vice versa. Everyone is working as a unit to turn in a finished product. Seems so obvious. It obviously, us saying it made an impression on them as something that was novel. So again, it's, it's explaining and kind of giving us some insight into how uh, production uh, positions are being described in universities, which is why I'm not seeing anything changing uh, fast enough in our lifetime. And then uh, the biggest takeaway for me was gaining a deeper understanding of how all roles on a film set influence one another particularly how the sound department affects and interacts with practically every department in some way. It was also fascinating to hear experience stars on set how the department interacts with them. Things that don't get said. Um, sound people are filmmakers. Don't just talk to them about tools. Uh, in parentheses, red cameras are loud, put a pencil in the fan. <laughs> <laughs> apparently has such a good tip. And uh, I feel very comfortable since, since that uh, first AC gave me that tip. I came away feeling so much more excited to make films and be on sets. The sense of collaboration in working in film feels more tangible than ever. So, um, to have things go smoothly and efficiently on set, you have to accept the highly collaborative nature of the job, regardless if it's, if, if it's with directors, boom operators, actors, lighting, or wardrobe. Yep, 
There you go. I didn't realize sound mixers would read through the script and be heavily involved in the pre-production process. It makes sense I never really thought about. You know, one of the interesting things that I thought was very, very interesting, uh, I'm going to tell you this. I just said the same mm. thing. It's redundant. I'm the redundancy president of redundancy. Um, <laughs> this was a very interesting um, years ago. I was on a show and they just decided not to, for whatever reason, give the sound department sides. And we're like, wait a minute, why? And they're like, what do you need him? What, they said, what do you need him for? Sorry, it's so stupid. The first, the first day on the show, they said, what do you need him for? I'm like, what do you mean? What do we need him for? And they're like, what do you, what do you think for? our job is? And, and so I said, uh, I have to put the microphone over the, over the people that speak. How do I know who to put a microphone on if I don't know who speaks? How does the mixer know when to bring up a level if they don't know what the words are in who's going to be speaking when? How do, I, I said, we don't know anything. I, uh, and, and they said, well, can't you just hit record and bring them all up? I'm like, I'm like, it doesn't work. No, I was like, it doesn't work that way. It's just the same kind of stuff. And you'll get, you'll get snarky, snark, uh, snarky remarks out of me when, when I hear stupidity, just like when, um, you know, I, I've had DPs that will say, say to me, aren't they loved? And I'm like, well, are you, sh are, you know, I'm yeah. like, they are. And they're like, well, can't you just use the labs? I'm like, I don't know. Can't you just shoot coverage with a GoPro? I was like, you know, this is what we're dealing with here. You know, I, I was like, I was like, there's a difference. A GoPro has yeah. its purpose, but a lav has its purpose, but it's not in the coverage. You know, that's not Mark, when you use a lav. Right. Mark has an, a nice way of saying it because he can be so diplomatic with a knife in someone's back. It's really on a set. It's an amazing thing to see. But uh, there was a DP who said something to that effect. And he said, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And maybe we could have lunch together today because I have some ideas for lens choices for that scene that's coming up. You know, and he just goes on and on. And it's it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'll tell you, there was a very interesting thing okay. that uh, there was a very interesting uh, thing that I faced a while back. Hello, Mark. You know, he, he was here hours ago. Um, true. Yeah, I will, but you got to give me a minute. So I'm going to do this and this. Um, okay, go ahead, Aaron, uh, Alan. Let me um, try and make it public here at our house. I had I had a DP. I worked on a show about ten years ago with a DP who I uh, who this is an interesting situation. He was he's you know in his late thirties, very good, old school you know habits and old school lighting and st stuff like that that was just really amazing. And I was standing on set next to him and he was looking through the camera and he kept looking at things and he was doing this number at the monitor. And then he says, Alan, and I'm like, yes. And I'm standing right next to him looking at the monitor as he's doing his work. And he says, do you ever look at the monitor? I'm like, I mean, yes. Why? And he says, what would make this better? And I'm like, you know, you're the DP dude. You have a, you have a plan here. And he said, and he said, let me, let me tell you something here. He said, my first show as a DP, he said, I, he says, I went out there and lit what I thought was good. And the boom operator walked out, his mouth dropped. He spun a circle looking at all the lights. And I saw that and I said, what's the, what's the deal? And he said, let me show you something. And he raised his hand and I saw his hand shadow scatter across all the walls. And um, he said, that boom operator, he said that was his first show as a DP. He didn't have the experience he really needed, but he says that boom operator, because uh, he said, what can I do to fix it? And that boom operator said, what you could do is add some diffusion. And it had never occurred to him to ask for it, but the key grip was like, sure, we'll do this and this and this. And so after that, he said, every time there was a private rehearsal, I brought the boom operator in next to me because he had been doing this for 20 years and he knew more about it than I did. So it's funny because he said, when when after they would do a rehearsal, he would say to me, I want to do this and this and this. Is that is that gonna is that gonna work? And the boom operator would literally say yes, because he started to catch on real quickly. And that's one of those fascinating things he said. So I learned real quickly boom operators are someone that understands lighting too. And I can sometimes ask a, a boom operator what they what what could make things better. And they they have the experience to actually tell me and they're not as scared about mentioning it. And I'm like, Yeah. 
And so I, I thought about it and I was like, you know, it makes a lot of sense, but I was still a little like, this is still a DP. This, I don't want, uh, you know, I was like, he seems like a nice guy. I don't think he's trying to trick me here. And so he's, and so um, I just kind of think about it for a second and said, all right. And I, and I kind of glanced around to make sure no one was hearing. And I said, all right, if it were me, it, we were doing a Kevin Klein movie. I said, um, Kevin's a little bit higher and his eye line is, 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 you know, if you boomed up about six inches and you threw one of these lights over here as a throw across the back wall, kind of a, a spill of blue light over that, it would, it would give a more commanding presence to, to what he's doing. And he, he kind of looks at it and he says, looks at the monitor. He says, I like it. And then he instantly says, hey, uh, you know, he says, let's raise the camera up about six inches. And he does, he orders that light. And afterwards he's like, wow, I love it. That's exactly what it needed. And I was like, wow, that was, that was one of those things where, where I was like, he asked, and because he's a nice guy, if he was, if he was a jerk, I would not have, have said anything. Cause I'd be scared that I was being baited. But since he was a nice guy, he was always so nice and so informative and so good. And he was just literally like, he was like, well, let me tell you, boom, a first boom operator I, I ever worked with helped me. And he says, I've, I've learned that there are certain boom operators that really understand lighting just as well as I do. And just by me interjecting that to him, he's like, I like it. Now, that was the only time he ever did that. But that was one of those things where he asked for it. I told him and it ended up being kind of a magical moment. And then we did another movie after that where, and there was, this is the interesting thing. He came back to Atlanta and when he was there for that second, um, for that second show, they were trying to, to crew it up. And he said, have you ever shot in Atlanta before? And he said, yeah, I've been here a couple of times. He says, uh, do you know any sound departments? And he says, yes, I do. And he looked at the crew list and he said, call this mixer. And we got hired by the recommendation of the DP. So that was actually a really cool thing because they had no idea who to call. And so they asked the DP, and based on a DP recommendation, we got the job. We got that show. So that was kind of a cool success story. And your sound is gone. Okay. Uh, real quick here, while they're while they're troubleshooting that, we have two uh, sound wizards there trying to fix the sound on uh, on their end. Dan, yes, thank you so much for recording that. Um, I'll tell you this: I hit re I hit re hit hit record on my sound here, and I'm recording on that. Uh, but I have my sound panels here. I have the the um, the same material here, but I have it over here, so I can't can see. It? Now I hear it. Um, hear I can't it? see the computer over there. And apparently right after I looked at it, it was literally frozen up there in the upper left-hand corner. And I remembered it and came over here and typed it. 12 hours, 8 minutes, and 3 seconds in the upper left-hand corner. Meaning that it was only like 15 minutes after I started recording that the screen froze over there. The okay, noise level Alan? is extremely high. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? I can. It's very noisy. Okay. Uh, it's yeah, we're switching over to sound things so that we can both speak at the same time. So we'll okay. Start. I don't need to. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to out. just know while you were telling us your story about your DP, I was adjusting our diffusion lighting during the during the conversation so that we would have a little more a little more exposure. So just sort of in keeping with with the uh, with the, the context of the story. It's sad we got ring lights uh, in a swag package, and neither one of us has ours near. That's not true. I have one. Well, why aren't you using it? <laughs> so um, is the quality okay? Because it's, I think the reason it works better is if we're plugged in to the way I had it. I, I could put a different mic into that so it doesn't have to be the lab. I mean, yeah. It's it's that. very noisy and you sound far away. Just, just we can't hear you. Are. We can't hear you. We good but, now? Uh, you do. Yes, that one sounds much better. You can hear us? This that one good. sounds so much better. Yeah, that's just that sounds so much on. better. It sounded like there was a waterfall going before. So yeah, yeah. that's so much better. I, I think that's why it didn't work the first time when we tried it earlier in the year. Well, we've gone from Mac in in in, how, in computer mic to a DPA, so that would certainly that would be the difference. That would be that would you know what, so we're doing a commercial DPA, for DPA. I can tell you that. What's the DPA plugged into? Uh, it's into a Focusrite, uh, 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 
uh, using the for the computer. So you're using the micro dot to the XLR. Yeah, there you go. Micro dot to XLR. What is that? The DAD. Yeah. What do they call it? The DAD. Uh, whatever. The XLR version of the adapter to yes. go from micro dot to XLR. Yes, micro dot to XLR, and then XLR to, to 48 volt. This yeah. is this is the um, um, uh, what you call it. Um, uh, EMP, it's the EMP piece from. Uh... So back to lighting and DPs. Huh? Okay. Anyway, you got me, right? Yeah. Right. It does. Now, why am I getting? Why am I getting uh, foggy here? I don't... You know, it's just our lighting. Don't don't stop. Just talk. <laughs> You're waiting for your golden words. Uh, golden tell the, words. Tell, tell the effects person to back off on the haze a little bit. I think what we have here is a failure to communicate. Hang on one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> uh, it says we can hear you now. That it I, instantly says. You know, I ex what does Mark say? Lights? That perfection is the enemy of, enemy of the good. It should be good enough. <laughs> well, this is, you got to keep in mind also, this is streaming. It's the dynamic range is all over the place. We're <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Welcome to my world, Alan. That you know what? It's an amazing world. I've never worked with Mark, but I'm getting a chance to to see a little bit of his uh his his perfection that he he you know his excellence that he demands. Uh, it's not easy working with him. I'll, I'll give you that. I I'm get no special treatment. I'm uh, and, and you know what? You know what? Uh, when we're at work, we're in a different zone. So, so it's true. yeah. That's true. So going back to the very beginning of this recent conversation, when we were talking about back in the day stories, my back in the day stories involve Ray Milland and Ava Gardner and DPs who wore suits on the set and yes. uh, stories of script clerks because they originally came out of the pool, the secretarial pool. I mean, the stories with the people I worked with go oh, back, wow. back, back. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's amazing. I keep saying, Mark, we should write our memoirs before Alzheimer's kicks in. So you remember the grandmother in the Waltons, Ellen? I never, I don't know that, no. You know the Waltons is a TV series? Yes. Okay. She was the, the grandmother. grandmother. Yes. Well, oh, okay. she was actually one of the pioneering script supervisors at Hal Roach through the 30s and 40s and was predominantly the script supervisor for most of the Laurel and Hardy films. And in 49, they decided to cast her as kind of a, a joke in a part. And she ended up having another 50 year career as an actress, but she had an she had created um, the, and innovated the whole way that script supervisors line their scripts, you know, the ziggly lines and all the straight lines and all that. She was the, the creator of that and was a mentor to many, many up and coming script supervisors when she moved into her acting career which lasted, you know, she was still shoot. She was still doing Walton grandma when we got her in the nineties. Yeah. Okay. Now on. one sec. Let me <laughs> tell you're a boom operator, Patricia. <laughs> she keeps looking back to check her. She's checking her access. <laughs> you know, you fix it now or you fix it later. Take, you know, it pays your money. Takes we'll your just time. fix it in post. All right. Not for nothing. When my New York come out. For a while. Right. So a little bit of handling noise. It was quieter in Patricia's hands. Everybody's a critic. All right. <laughs> Why is it so fogged down? No, it's your eyes. Just let it go. Oh. Right. <laughs> it's is actually you know what I was it is. A cameraman for five years. You okay. Know? <laughs> then then you know you know what it is. Is is I can I can tell you right now what it is. Is, is it looks like you're getting uh, pinged a little bit. There's there uh. a light that's directly hitting the lens. Bring your hand over. Bring your hand over uh, to the side. Yeah. You're right. It's, it's this thing. Yeah, this should be here instead. There. No. The ring it's See, gonna be all about lighting. There. Okay. See, you're right. That's exactly we were flaring the lens with the uh with the uh with the uh OB. Okay, back to all these questions. Uh <laughs> thank you for thanking us, line level media. <laughs> and what you care about any gear if an emergency would occur. Do you mean a, a, a life-threatening emergency? Is that the question? Run, leave, deal with it later. If you're holding it, 
just run with it if you can't drop it and run absolutely where's that, where's that question uh i'm down uh Vardano cloudy news at 10 27 a.m i'm down yeah i'm down to 10 27 do we miss oh anything? no i think we were there Shit. because we, we were talking uh, about pyrotechnics with line level oh okay that was and then we're down to, i we see care about any gear okay yeah uh line level media when you said that i was like i'm looking at it and it just says the walton's homecoming we watch it every year when it comes uh out here in idaho oh so. yeah the specials we did the specials john boy gets married and thanksgiving Christmas, thanksgiving, thanksgiving yeah all of those yeah that's interesting that's that's it's it's really interesting the kind of shows that we'll we'll find ourselves on some of the, some of the times like um you'll be talking to other people and suddenly you're like, oh, yeah, I did that show. I did that show. I did that show. And then you realize that a lot of the shows that are on TV are, were done by the people you're standing there talking to. Yep. And that's one of the funny I, things is. Our house guest is Richard Lightstone. Yep. And Richard is famous for many films and is a past president of CAS. But Richard did the original Terminator. Mm -hmm. So we were, just, we were just talking this morning. And I said, wait a minute. Because we're talking about returning to Italy. I said, you recorded I'll Be Back, didn't you? <laughs> you know, Arnold's I'll Be Back. The very so the OG, yeah. It. Yeah, so. That's awesome. 1984. Yeah. Yep. And I remember oh. I remember that. That's such a good movie, too. It still holds up yeah. so well in so many ways. And the, I think the, sto the story, if I remember correctly, I believe Terminator was um, James Cameron... And Gail, Gail Ann Hurd, I think he sold her the script for like $1, was it? To, uh, for, for some reason, I think he sold her the rights or sold her the, the script or something. I, I, I got to remember, I got to look it up now. I'm probably, you know, where I'm, I'm almost 17 hours into the stream. So I'm sure my brain is starting to, to not remember some things. But I think I remember something about that. Like he, he sold, he wrote it and he sold her the script for like a dollar. And they kind of they 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 produced it basically together. But I think he sold it to her for some reason. I have to go back and fact check that now, or maybe somebody well, in the in the in the out there watching. There's 26 people watching. Um, it's probably true. Um, you look terrific for 17 hours of doing this. By the way, you know I don't know what you know your makeup team is doing, but you're you're you're, you're quite you're quite the you know dashing at this point. Uh, you know, little Humphrey Bogart going on in there. Um, well, I haven't gone very far today, okay. so that's probably part of it. So, so yeah. Jim, we, we knew Jim peripherally at Roger Corman's, you know, uh, lumberyard uh, studio back in the day when it was New World before the corporate lawyers bought it from Roger. And we were the last generation of people that go, got there. And Jim and Gail, I think, uh, m partnered there professionally. And but in that era, they were still, you know, they were still scratching their way up the wall. I, I did a job with with Gail Ann Hurd as a boom operator. In 1980, I don't know, two or one, it was a movie of the week. We shot it in, um, um, where was it? It was in Atlanta. And Gail was the production manager. It was called Georgia Peaches. And it was Tanya Tucker at 18 years oh, old. Wow. She was 18 years old. She's just now had a career revival, you know, in her, in her late 50s. But she was, eight, she, you know. Um, and, and Glenn Campbell would come cause that's who, who her, her boyfriend was at the time would come and visit the set, you know, and I was, I was there cohabiting with the mixer who I went, who's, who's somebody I know for many, many years, who was my first sort of link, uh, diving into the, you know, entry level, um, TV side of things back in those days. And, uh, <laughs> Well, there's stories I won't get into here online about that, but uh, but Gail goes back to there. You know now, uh, you know the, the 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 zombie show and all the rest of that. Gail's um, a force a force of nature. She's, she's quite a brilliant person. Yeah, um, no doubt. So, anyway, we have a question here from Line Level Media. If on day one a director shows you they don't really care about sound, I have you ever seen them come back around? or been able to convince them to care more during the length of the production. So have you addressed this question yet? Have you guys talked about this? No, not yet. Can, uh, can I address this? A Absolutely. Bit Absolutely. Well, a lot depends on the angle of inclusion that got you into the project, I think, in the first place. What is 
the journey you had to be there? Um, are you brought in at the very last minute with no prep and no engagement and, you know, figure it out on the day showing up? Or have you been included in the least expensive and yet most important part of the production's um, uh, journey, which is pr uh, prep, pre-production? Um, I, I don't think directors are not getting trained about sound in the journey that gets them into the director's seat. And they're under total assault. So there's kind of two communities of directors, those that are established and have validated careers and have authority over their own projects to some degree, if not total degree. And then the other, then, then everybody else, the guys who have, who are surrounded by committees of people who hired them because, you know, even though, you know, who had, you know, shows with 18 producers, you know, 16 of which are the writers actually are getting a producer credit. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure on directors and state of total panic and terror. Um, and so <laughs> sound became, be can, because it's not part of what's being taught in universities, in, I mean, film programs are the, the creative writing programs of the 1950s, uh, you know, today. They're, every university has some kind of a film program as, as, a, as a banner draw for the business of education, which it is. And so sound is often not included in their curriculum because they don't have the DNA in the curriculum. And it's one of the invisible arts. So from my point of view, I've always come at it as my, I self-identify. My metaphor is that we're musicians in the orchestra, that we're intensely passionate about our particular instrument. Um, but we come to play with other musicians to, you know, play the score, which is a script through a conductor, which is the director. And so I never come as a, you know, um, as a non-inclusive, non-creative uh, uh, solution. I come as a creative contributor and mm -hmm. not to compete, but to contribute. And so I've always taken that posture in my mind and in my attitude towards the project. And um, it's, it's kind of an, irres it can be an irresistible posture to have. So I don't talk to the director about this doesn't work. You can't no, that's fucked and so on. I talk about, you know, um, where, you know, my mission is to, is to connect the character to the audience through the instrument that I bring in collaboration with all the other instruments. And so I want to be in the circle of trust as early as possible in pre-production. Yes. That means location scouts. It means being in meetings, being having a fluid conversation with the production manager about budget issues and all the rest of that. It's kind of rare these days. Production managers are often, you know, a, a name that's not actually doing what historically production managers did. It's basically a line producing position very often with somebody who may not even go to the set. I mean, we did a project recently, I won't name names, where the production manager never was on the set. We didn't meet this person until six or seven weeks because I said to the producer, you know, we've never met the production manager for this movie mm. we're on, you know. It's a, um, and so a lot of that gets designated down to what's called a production supervisor, a non-DGA position. Yeah. Um, and so the import of our position as a full-bloated, essential creative contributor to creating telling the story, which is what everyone on a set is, is, is charged with and doing it in the, in the, with the intent of the director is the idea that um, we are a full third of the three disciplines it takes to create the soundscape. We're the first line of defense and the first yes. line of creative and creative inclusion. And so if a director is not seeing us in that light, some of that falls on our shoulders. It doesn't mean you have to be uh, bitter, adversarial, or uh, um, you know, co condescending about it. Um, you're there to help, and you're you're a guest in the house of the director, if you will, um, as you would be in an orchestra if they're you know with the conductor. It's not a democracy, but you're a full-blooded, essential contributor. You're capturing performance. You're capturing environment. You're capturing the journey, um, and with your technical tools. But that doesn't mean that because they're technical that they're less. Everyone on that movie set is a technician, yes. especially the actors. There's no one more technical than actors on a movie set. You know, day one is the last scene of the movie. Day 17 is the first, is the, is, is the big denouement. And we're wrapping, you know, on, on day two. We, we got this location finally, and it's the first shot in the first scene of the film. Yeah. An actor has to calibrate the arc, the story arc, the character arc of their, their, 
contribution that they're creating as a character mm -hmm. so that those fit into the chronology of the film when it's put together. Yeah. That's technical. That's profoundly it technical. It is. And, and so is everyone else. So it, it's, a it's a technical medium, but it's doing something that humans have been doing for 50,000 years, telling stories, if the, whether it's around a, you know, a fire or it's over, you know, over social media. It's still telling stories. It's a fundamental component of our social uh, DNA. Our, our, I think it's even biological primarily. It's the way we pass culture down, you know, language, mm -hmm. music. These are all of the society to each other and to uh, emerging generations beyond us. So all of that, all of that soapbox that I'm on about that, that evangelizing is about taking the position internally as a contributor, as a creative, and manifesting that in the way you communicate with the director and the others involved. Don't have your head up your ass. Don't be, you know, you're not wearing a flag. Look at me. How I'm, I'm a genius artist. None of that. But speak to the project. Channel the ego to serving the project. Yeah. Philosophy about getting into the mind of the director as a recognized contributor. It doesn't mean you're going to be best friends and go to dinner and have, you know, have a lifelong friendship. It's a mistake a lot of people make in their in their durable careers. People often mistake their successful and ongoing professional relationship with directors and producers as friendships. It's a big mistake because there will be a moment. And I promise if that's what you think. Four or five projects in, you're, 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 you're sure you're secure. I, man, I got this. This is a tight relationship with something that you think is essential and is financial is not going to go your way and might even end that relationship because a special status when you don't. Stay focused on the project. You know, what is it we're doing now? And never assume that what you have experienced in the past with a director or with a cast or with any group is an absolute guidepost to what's going to happen now. Try to avoid coming to the set with ideology and a presumption of approach and be in the present and, and have your antenna up for what's happening in front of you now. How are you, you know, engaging, you know, engaging in that, in that, in the present is my best advice. Um, you know, the, the argument about going on location scouts, you know, we, we don't take sound mixers on location scouts. It's like, you know, it's a false saving. It's an enormously false saving. But if you, if you force the issue as an ego issue, you're, you're, you've already lost the conversation. But if you bring the issue as a protective, as a service, why do I need to be on location? Yes, it's important to know where the generator is going to be, where we're staging, what are the logistics of access to a, to a difficult location and so on. What are the other departments, you know, doing? That's essential stuff. But it's mm -hmm. also essential the soft skills. What's the dynamic going on between the director and the DP and the first AD, the magic triangle that's running the set? Who's got the power here? Where are the ideas emanating from? And also, what are the ideas that are sort of emerging in that pre-production stage that may manifest as how we're going to do it or how ideas that may have pieces that may be? You, if, if you're excluded from that kind of exchange, you know, you're at a massive disadvantage. You know, the, grip, the grip's there, the gaffer's there, the DP, you know, they're all part of this. Uh, emerging approach discussion that is now man is migrating from theoretical into the practical and you're as much a part of that process as any other key in the, in the, in the leadership of the set, you know, from all the departments, maybe more so in a certain way, because you have to dance between the raindrops of competing elements. And, and we're always going to be confronted with competing elements. And the mistake most of us make early in our careers is looking at competing elements as territorial competition between departments or personalities. That's, that's a huge mistake. The elements, yeah. we should collaborate with our fellow departments on solving those competing elements. Let's us together figure out how to solve this. Because if your department is quote unquote winning in some minute combat zone over territory who's suffering the project's suffering the mm -hmm. storytelling is suffering you know you'll go home at night you'll eat dinner you'll kiss your wife and hug your kids and go to sleep and come back the next day 
or maybe not because maybe they've left because they haven't seen you for the last six months. It depends on which way it's swinging. But yeah. the, 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 the fundamental is you're contributing to the project is your main concept, your ego concept. And that's a privilege in, a, in an important way. The very worst movies are just as hard to make as the very best movies. So, mm -hmm. so if you can separate how sometimes you feel about, harder, some, and sometimes harder, yeah. if you can separate how you feel about this project and its and its and its leadership um, from how you feel about your work, and identify them, they are certainly intertwined, but they're two separate things. You can overcome the disappointment of poor leadership, or 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 frightened or disorganized and your contribution and, and integrating with the psychology of the show. There are ways yeah. to do that. So anyway, um, I hope that answers your question about oh, the director. I, I, I think it, kinda, it, it, it was amazing. I'll, answer. I'll put my baseball bat down. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally fine. Um, it's, it's funny. You, uh, you, you mentioned cost, you know, we don't take uh, the sound department uh, on text scouts, you know, uh, I think you mentioned cost. Well, one of the funny things is, that I I actually had a UPM tell us tell me that uh, you, you know I was like I was like you know I I, I need to be involved with this because they were like okay well we're gonna go ahead and uh, rehearse this scene uh, at the end of the day for t first thing tomorrow um, we don't need sound for that and I'm like mm, I should at least go along and and see this rehearsal and they're like no you don't need to see it and I'm like why not and they're like is like just go ahead. I mean, it's, it's, you, you don't need to worry about that. And I'm like, and I'm like, I should be there. And they're like, no, we should get you off the clock. And I kind of looked at him and I said, let's not pretend that the sound department is the expensive departments here. You know, let's not pretend that. Uh, because, and I was like, look, I need to know what's happening so that we can best prepare too. And there's been times when I've, when in, it's been a long time ago where I've listened to that and I've not, I've said, okay, it doesn't feel right, but okay, fine. I come in the next day and all of a sudden I find out the world's the, the whole room's burning up because something stupid happened. They made a decision and I didn't yeah. know that something was going to happen. And they've all decided that it was going to be pre-rigged overnight to have downward facing lights over. And I'm like, Oh yeah. no. And they're like, well, where were you yesterday? And not only that, not only know. that it was free call. Not only that you got there at call and the other departments have been there either on the clock as free pre-call or not on the yep. clock. And there anyway, camera showing up an hour and a half before call off the clock, you know, which is completely, you know, um, it's That's unprofessional, irritating. but it happens frequently because they don't want to be late and they want to roll five minutes after call everyone, they, else, yeah. you know, and you're there and it's like, wait a minute. So yes, that's a very aggressive problem, and it happens more and more because the lack of experience in the leadership at management level, at production management level. Um, but you can take a posture of, of, of deep and, and, and firm concern, you know, as you get to a place where you're not super worried that if I – you don't want to worry about burning a bridge. Don't burn the bridge. But you, you can you, – you can be very explicit about the kinds of examples. The same issue with the utility person as a, as a, as a battle zone over staffing. Staffing is a but, is a red button issue for all management. They'll spend seven thousand dollars a day plus a you know a two thousand dollar fee for the for the Muscolite operator for to do that one shot at night. But they're they're They'll not going to spend five days. Any, yeah, and, and, and right, and but they won't. They won't, you know, have st proper staffing in your department, even though there's 12 people in camera right now for the three cameras and et cetera. And they're using one camera. And they're using one camera. And, oh. you know, uh, so so we can judge all that. We can see all that. And we also should have in the back of our mind the universe that the production people are dealing with right now, too. A lot of management has multiple tiers of oversight. What's justifiable? You know, for example... The whole issue of how we supply uh, as a simple expendables, you know, you're going to do a show. It's going to be a location show. You can save them 40 percent on on a, on a proper buy in advance and, and on shipping and all the rest of that. Um, even though you, it's not going through your hands, you're not making a penny out of this. You're making a recommendation. And they said, oh, well, I didn't budget for that much. Well, did you have a conversation with the department about, you know, no. And what do you mean? So listen. And so the, the seasoned ones say to you, listen, I have to hide this. I'm going to do this every two weeks. So now they're going to pay three times as much 
yeah. for what you could have saved them thousands and thousands of dollars. It stopped being about money and started being about politics outside of your realm between the showrunners and the people they serve and who yeah. those people serve above them because they don't know production. Yeah. They're, you know, they don't know production and they don't know, not only do they don't know production, they don't know what we do. And our I, post colleagues do or don't know what we do. We have to be that voice in a in a concerned but non-adversarial way. And, you know, you have to pick your battles, but you also have yeah. to know when when to use strategic resistance and when to use when to when to, you know, network with the heart attack and, and network around behind, you know, the obstacle. Um, and it's a it's a constantly moving target. You yeah. Know? It's it's maybe our most important skill is reading the river of who we're with, how they're operating, what's driving their bus, um, and that they begin to see you as an asset, as proof. They could throw anything at you, you know, and you're going to come up as a, as the island of serenity in a sea of chaos, and that that becomes an incredibly powerful career advancement yeah. recognition. Okay, I do this, he's on or she's on, and I'm covered. I know that whatever shakes, how stupid it may get or whatever, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna deliver, you know, and not make and 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 have my team. So now you become part of the team concept that is used by production managers and defense mechanism for the chaos of film production, the dysfunctional reality of film production, yes. the lack of knowledge by directors in film production. So when you become that asset, you then you start to get the credibility to have that, that conversation one-on-one -on -one as equals saying, listen, I know where it's at, but here's, here's a savings for you. If you want, if you want to, if you want to go in that direction or when not to say that and say, you know, all right, it's not my deal. I'm, 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 I'm here for a particular purpose and I'm going to maintain my posture as a creative contributor. And you can or cannot perceive that as the reality from my end of the street. That's up to you, but yeah. I'm coming from that place. I'm here to tell stories and make movies. I'm a filmmaker and, and you know, it's, it's really that's interesting. Asset, that's why I'm here. You bought me off my yeah. resume, you know? So yeah. It's a, so you, you, you hired me, obviously, to be someone who you trust for sound. Trust me for sound, please. That's, it, it seems like a, a, a no-brainer. One of, the, funny, uh, one of the, the, the funny things is, is that I, I've been on shows before, and, I, and I've, I've looked at other people on the set and said, I said, considering how disorganized we are, this is like, how did this thing ever get greenlit? Is this thing ever going to get made? How are we going to make anything out of this? It literally... It, it's it's dumbfounding to me sometimes how I'm like, how, how is this, how are we ever going to finish it and get a show out of this? Cause it's crazy. You see how, how it's, it's nuts. Now, one thing you went, you said a little while ago that I think is funny. Um, I, uh, you said there's like basically three different tiers and we're, we're the first line of defense for trying to preserve the audio tracks. Or the one, first contributing decision yes. maker. I, I would well, say creative decision maker. Yeah. But one, same one, thing, but. One thing I will I will usually refer to it as is um, when I'm talking to people about the whole way that things go together is we're all contributors to a cake. In the sound department, what we're doing is trying to get the very best possible ingredients. Because you can say, okay, you can't you can say, ah, oh, crap. Let's just fine. Let's get Walmart. Let's just you know if if all we can get is if that Walmart's the best we can get. It's going to be a lot more difficult for you to make something that's that's going to be worthy of being served at the Ritz Carlton if you're dealing with Walmart ingredients. It's going to be a lot more, and it's going to be it's going to cost a lot more money to ch and and time trying to make that uh, disguised as something worthy. Versus if you just simply you say, okay, well, let's just instead of going to Walmart, let's go around the corner, and then you have to take a lot less steps. You know, if you go to the fresh market or you go to uh, Whole Foods and you get good ingredients to begin with, and then you, and then it's it, then it actually kind of almost makes itself when you follow a recipe, and that's very much the way that we are in the sound department. We are people that that we have done enough of these shows. We understand that it is, as a rule, very systematic in the way that it operates. You see a scene most of the time, not always. Most of the time. You can look at it and say it's going to be fairly simple. 
It just makes sense when you listen to it. And all it takes is listening to the director talk to the DP right after with the first AD right there. And you'll know how they're going to do things and how they're going to cover it. You'll know that if there's going to be any weird things after you've done a few days on the show, you're going to learn real quickly how the flow works, what angles they're, they're liking, if they're doing any weird artistic things showing a lot of headroom or weird angles or, you know, uh, you know, high key lighting for no real, you know, apparently re reason. You're going to figure things out on the show. Part of that's paying attention. And that's part of, of the experience of piecing things together after doing this for a long time. And a lot of people don't think about the sound department as being one that, like you said, can contribute. But one of the best ways we can contribute is by staying ahead of the game. And a lot of the times people just think of the sound department as a department that magically works. I put my headphones on sounds there. And one of the, the things you mentioned a little while ago, it establishes a really bad precedent when other departments come in, like you said, an hour before because they want to be prepared when the DP walks in at call time and says, hey, I want this ready now. I want to do this. And production says, no, we're not going to give you pre-calls. And then suddenly production's like, oh, guess what? We don't need to ever give them pre-calls because they're going to come in early anyway. It, it establishes a bad precedent. It's actually illegal. It's, it technically it's a breach is, of contract. Yes. It's in breach of contract. There's a bunch of issues that go on and it's illegal, you know, because they're off the clock. They're yes. not, they're not, you know, even if it's a, you know, non-union union, it's irrelevant. But the, but the reality is, is that it's a defense mechanism that's evolved over time that's subordinated, subordinated by the fearful uh, sense of competition that DPs tend to have. They're in a vulnerable position. They don't, you know, they, they're, they're like actors. They, they can have very active and then very unactive careers. Um, and so they want to be ready cushion for inexperienced directors it's all thrown on the shoulders of the dp to make the day make the call time make the you know and so it's it's one of the more common cheats that that happen um at the disadvantage of others in 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 the team and so people tend to adapt to it it's also a regional issue you know in new oh. york the trucks don't open till call time or it mm -hmm. used to be that way anyway and uh, and because they hang together as a below the line you know community but it it's not the case in in many other regional areas because people are yeah. hungry to not lose work or be targeted as troublemakers or any of those kinds of politics you also are dealing with a different kind of of underneath politic of the production and producing staff during production are on a different off budget section of the budget than the post production people are and so yes. There will be decisions that are made that it's not my problem. I go if I'm in under budget, I get a bonus. It's a very common, you know, relationship between the line producer and production managers to the production. Shift and, the cost you know, someplace else. And and this cost is going to go. This goes to post production, not my problem. Um, it's off my budget. You know, it's it's ugly. Um, happens a lot. Um, but there are other there are producers who are really passionate about filmmaking who do see it in a holistic way do try to create a community process um you know not naively but just as enlightened self-interest that they will get this idea of all right we're in we're on this you know journey this tour of duty and we have this mission and all of us are important uh, you know nobody's here as a charity case you know it's, everybody's here to bear a very specific set of responsibilities um how your part of that is understood by those who you're working with is up to you. you you said we are often invisible they put on the headphones and it works we've been excellent at being invisible as a defense and survival mechanism as a collaborative co community um, and on that note real quick it takes prep, it takes experience, it takes knowledge, know-how to make it look that way. Yeah. It, it, that, that doesn't magically happen. A, a magician gets up there and they do a little sleight of hand thing that no one sees. It took them a long time to get that little right. movement down and they practice it a long time. We do the same kind of thing. It looks very easy and they're just like, how do they make something appear out of their hands, out of mid-air? Mid well, the reason why is because they work really hard on it. Like musicians and athletes, you get fluency in your in your in your discipline. So yes, yes Patricia has a comment. I, I just want to say, along with um, everything else you're talking about, working before your call time is liability and insurance. Insurance, and exactly. If you are exactly. on the clock, and you have an accident, the tailgate slippery, or somebody didn't control it right, and you took a bad fall and have an injury. If you're, you're not there the working before your call time. You are not going to be covered by their insurance and it's Correct. going to be on you. And that's an incredibly 
important and potentially life um, deciding factor. So don't do that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, that's a very critical thing. I've, I've taught that many times. Um, one, one thing also that I usually, uh, I usually tell people is, is find out who the steward is on your show, make sure that they are, they're constantly aware and communicate with them. I usually, I kind of fell into being a, a steward on a couple of, uh, of, on a, on a show recently, well, a few years ago, because, um, because there was no steward on the show and I kept seeing oversights. And I inquired, I said, who is our steward? And they said, we don't have one. I'm like, well, you're about to. Because being a boom operator, being on set, you see everything, you hear everything, you observe. That's what we do all day long as we pay attention. We're very dialed in on pretty much everybody everywhere that we possibly can. We hear directors, yep. we hear the, the the producers, we hear the interactions. And it's really funny when the camera people will come by and they're like, where'd you hear that? You know, you, I'll be I'll be standing next to them or something like that. And they're like, geez, how I, are we supposed to be breaking for lunch in like 15 minutes? I'm like, no, they're going to take a penalty. How do you know that? And, and they're like, we didn't hear that part. And I was like, well, the, the producers were just talking to the director and saying, we're probably going to have to. If we don't roll by, a, a, you know, quarter till, we're going to end up taking a penalty. And they said, oh, and how far are we? Oh, 10 minutes away. So, yeah, we're probably going to end up taking a penalty then. And then all of a sudden they end up calling it. They'll say, all right, uh, we're going to we're going to go ahead and take one, guys. And they'll come up like five minutes later. But that's our, that's what we do is that's what we do is we pay attention and people. And it's funny because like you said, we're invisible. And there's so many times I will be literally a, a fly, a fly on the wall, just, you know, quietly sitting there listening and observing. And then people will just have a conversation and not realize that I'm there because they're not thinking about me being there. Just like how it's really hilarious. What will sometimes happen when, producers and the director need to talk and they're going to sit here. Let's come over here. Uh, get, get away from everybody. We, we have to have a private conversation and they will go and stand right in front of the boom caddy. And you're like, guys, you are quite literally this far away from my boom microphone whispering. You're right there on mic. You don't realize that you have pulled people aside and you're standing right there in front of the thing because they're oblivious to sound. So yeah. It's, it's craft. It's a crisis in craft above the line. I don't say this as a as a cranky old rat bastard. I say this as somebody who is un, un, unapologetically passionate about making movies and telling stories and film and music and all of the arts. But I, I, I look at it and I go, you know, there was a time, for example, let's look at the production manager. There was a time we Patricia and I came in just as sort of the tail end of the old system. In our younger days, in our twenties, we got we got fortunate in getting you know uh, 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 hugged and brought into the Roger Corman thing, you know, which is the legitimate post was the legitimate postgraduate school for directors and other people who were breaking in in the Los Angeles you know um, uh, Hollywood universe, and um, and he would teach. We'd sit at dailies at night, and he Roger would you know I mean he was a phenomenal influence in terms of many you know Ron Howard and. Coppola and Jack Nichols, many people were, you know, blessed to have that sort of Roger mentoring thing that went down. But in those days, if you would get on a show, the production manager who might be three cigars away from his last heart attack is on the set at call and hangs till about 10 o'clock in the morning to see what's going on, the mm -hmm. departments, the issues, what's what's turning up, what's true, what's not true, where there are issues, not to have not to find blame, but to solve things. Then they go back to the office, deal with the front end, deal with the studio, deal with the agents, deal with, you know, all of the mechanisms, the accountants and whatever. And they would they would run the shop back at back, back at the front end until, you know, they'd come back to the set around 334 in the afternoon and yep. hang till wrap. What's yep. going to be true about tomorrow that we know now? They yes. were there, you know. They'd seen the pre-call, you know. They'd seen the 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 uh, the uh, early early call sheet, the uh, um, um, Prelim, uh, the prelim, prelim, the preliminary call sheet, and so they're there to do, you know check in with the keys and say, you know, is there anything here that we're missing? Did something turn up after this went to press? And da 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 da. Um, and then they go, you know, and then they go back to the office and stay there till midnight because they never slept. And they'd be back at the set at 6 a.m. again, 7 a.m. And they do that every day. They yes. didn't delegate it. They didn't send some intermediary. They were there. There was a chair for the production manager who yes. now is essentially a second title for the line producer. Um, and there was this 
you know, mechanism of logistics that everyone understood. Actors, if they were under a seven-year contract, knew all of the technology that they had to interact with. Not just how to find their la the lens, find the light, hit their marks, know their lines, but to find the microphone and understand a microphone was a conduit for communicating to their audience, not an imposition on their privacy and their personhood. Right. So that's not being taught. You know, we, we can, you know, be more measured in, in our own community expression of our position in the posture. There's been some real progress, uh, particularly at the Academy recently, in, term, in terms of in Motion Picture Academy, in terms of mm -hmm. presence of the production sound team in relation to the other sound disciplines, the sound editing and sound and sound mix, re-recording mixing. Um, and, but we need to maintain a kind of a high profile as, as, as advocates and ambassadors, show by show, in terms of where we are with that and reaching out and collaborating with those post teams, getting ink on the specialness of the relationship between a production team and the director in, in the trades and, uh, you know, engaging in workshops with, you know, with SAG and with DGA on, on, you know, microphone usage for actors so that they have a comprehension that this is another skill they need to know the way they know lenses and lighting and on directors to know where the sound department on the set is another palette of creativity for them, not, some you know uh inoculation we're not the proctologists you know the proctologists they want to have they, nobody wants to know their proctologists but if they have a serious problem they're really glad they exist but yeah. it's not really the best social position to have in a creative hierarchy you want to be maybe the oboist or the percussionist or for you know uh, you know first first chair viola uh next to the dp who's first that kind of engagement um it's, it's a problem, you know, the front end credits have every other key except the sound department key. We're working at that, you know, as a community. One of the things social media has begun to do for us as a community like this is that we are finding ourselves connecting internationally with peers right. and, and, and developing um, social mechanisms to properly and proportionally, not more, not less, but proportionally put us in the mind of the people we, we collaborate with, that we in their projects. Um, and we have to be less invisible in that line of work, but not necessarily. See, on the set is already you're in a pressure cooker. And so you can develop that as an individual and create a different experience for that director and that production about what their relationship with the sound theme is on set than maybe what they've had. But um, this is a bigger this is a bigger journey than just individual shows. This is our position. In the 1980s, something interesting happened. The DPs and the and the picture editors were all very much like us in those days in terms of their position in the in the social or the professional hierarchy of the producer director community. They were below the line, and but they all started. At, there was a migration by the major um, uh, talent agencies to develop a below the line department, and you started seeing private representation for D DPs and editors that has successfully migrated them in the mindset of the rest of the professional community to essentially being, if not above the line, on the line. They're not technically above the line, but they have that now. You know that that golden halo glow of you yes. know the essentials we have um some migration there but we're also unfortunately and particularly in the american way have this um kind of uh compartmentalization <clears throat> of the production and post-production uh, uh phases and it's important that we take the posture complete posture as a full full-blown part of the sound design. You notice there are no awards for sound design at the at Motion Picture Academy at the Oscars. It's a popular term. It's, a, it's become a basically a commercial attribution for the sound editors. Um, and they're alone in the room, the longest, without windows, with lots of cigarette smoke and no clocks in, in intimate, you know, arm, armpit smelling uh, relationship with their, with, with the directors and they go to lunch and they have dinner and have that kind of, but the bottom line is, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing a very, very prominent person in post, Randy Tom, that the sound design is a full blown and full throated collaboration between the three disciplines. It doesn't happen without us. It doesn't happen without sound editing. It doesn't happen with re -record, without re-recording team. All of us together design the sound and in collaboration. But so 
another piece that we can do in production is to make sure from the get-go we're reaching out to the post team as collaborators. You know, they may not be on when you're on. You may be, in a, you know, in a, very often they haven't been hired yet during production or they get on during, but they may be ideas of who it will be. There may be a point where they do come on, or, you know, um, the, the picture editor may be a link for you to reach out to them. And in lieu of their not being on, you can reach out and develop the relationship with the picture editor. You know, hey, today something, this happened on the set today. I think we're going to be okay, but, you know, we might want to send this out for testing with Isotope or whatever. Um, or, you know, uh, as much as, you know, uh, our good colleague, uh, Todd Maitland and I and other people, we selections for tonalities with particular actors. If an actor's creating a voice for their character, I did a film, Cowboys and Aliens, with uh, Harrison Ford. He he created a character voice that he was, you know, about for that, throughout the whole thing. It's not his regular voice. Um, and he was very, you know, it's in the lower register. It's a subtle thing, but it's an important thing. You know, on uh, on the, uh, the Spielberg remake of West Side Story, Todd was doing that he was auditioning all these different actors with different microphones six and eight microphones in pre-production to maximize the creative possibility of communicating their character to the audience and these are all artistic events that are below the radar of most of the experience and particularly of our production even our dps who might you know i don't know if you monitor the roger deacon's uh blog uh, um, uh no. podcasts Check it out. They did a lovely interview with Stuart Wilson, um, who's a dear friend and is, you know, he, he won an Oscar for 1917 uh, last year or the year before. Um, just a wonderful, total, total professional, you know, wonderful human being. Um, and Roger, who's had 17 nominations in his of photography on the planet. It was a lovely, lovely session. It's, it's extended and it's a real deep dive. But Roger was clearly not aware of the very essential discipline at its deep dive level, even though he'd been adjacent to it for the, you know, the whole of his professional life. And so what we do and what we go through and how we prepare and how we approach and solve things is kind of a mystery to even those who we've been side by side with for the whole of our professional lives. And don't be surprised by that or angered by it, but be understanding of it. And be an advocate, you know, I, I, I self-identify for this. You know, Petrushka and I go out and do workshops internationally, Shanghai, Beijing, across Europe, you know, in university level to film film uh, graduate students who are who are funneling into the into the business as as practitioners um, and talk about this idea, both to directors and producers coming who are emerging in their careers and for sound practice you know sound pr practitioners this idea of of a holistic approach coming as filmmakers being perceived as filmmakers and yeah. understanding the actual hierarchical relationship that serve projects better not about territory but about contribution about what is a better methodology you know we have lots of issues we should be in a workflow meeting on frequency coordination in the beginning yes of the show. oh that's a very big thing it's a nightmarish area oh, we've we had several efforts but there's no pre you know everyone's bringing shit onto the set with you know most of the departments have no idea what they have what band it's in how powerful it is it's an unlicensed area not the, they're not necessarily legal but they're using equipment that is specifically in unlicensed areas because of the marketing you know the chaos of the mm -hmm. the legalities and they don't know and they bring it on and you know some of the roundhouses illegally boost that stuff which is the direct opposite of the way you know broadway all those theaters have complete adjacency to each other and mm -hmm. those shows have anywhere between 40 transmitters going on at any given time and how do they all survive that well they have an informal get connection between the different sound departments of those theaters yes they to, do to transmit at the lowest possible level for success in their venues and to be in collaboration over frequency coordination with their adjacent colleagues on other on other projects because sooner mm -hmm. or later they're all going to be working together on some show together or near some yes. each other and they found a way because they're you know they found a way we need to do that too the studios have basically signed off on any kind of authority over the studio because they look at the, the stages as purely rental facilities it's not our problem 
used to be when they had sound departments. Now they don't. So these are other areas where you can protect a production, not be a hero per se, but say, listen, we, you know, DMX and, and Teradec and everybody, you know, everybody, can we at least have a workflow conversation in pre-production so that we're not discovering obstacles on the day at the most expensive time of a production, which is when we're shooting, mm -hmm. you know, on a big movie, on a hundred to $200 million movie, Alan, it's about, it's almost $3,000 a minute yes. of shooting time every day. And you know, 30% of that is walking back to the village to watch takes play back. So, yeah. Um, and it's not the cost of your utility person or the fourth hand in the, in, in the, in the department. So yeah. when we're talking about saving money that way, you know, frequency coordination can be a big obstacle. There are directors, many, who can't operate without a monitor. Yes. It stops, shoot, it stops the shooting. Script supervisors can't operate without a monitor. You know, there's, yeah. there's 80 years of, of directing and script supervising that had no monitors. And they mm -hmm. made some pretty goddamn good movies in those days. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, we're, we're in this moment, you know, where skills are, you know, skills are at risk um, and, and how people come to the table to have have green lights for their projects. You know, there are films that have been made. I mean, you know, it's a Tower of Babel in my in my being, you know, there's there's a film that has a similar title to it that's out there right now, which, you know, one wonders about, you know, all this chaos that happens on the set. Um, we We have to. We have to find comfortable, comfortably and confidently our place in the process and not come from fear. You know, truth to power, but not as an adversary. Truth to power as an advocate. Yes. If we can do that, your career has a chance of going forward because directors and producers begin, like I say, to look at you as an asset. One thing that you said a little while ago that I wanted to share, share, share another insight is you were talking about People coming to set, disappearing for a little bit, coming back. One thing that COVID changed is studios were changing policies on who was allowed on set and who wasn't. And that was scary because people were not allowed. Producers were not allowed on set sometimes, or they were only allowed on set. And the communication fell apart a lot. And sometimes even now still, producers are not allowed on set. And that's a really scary thing. And, 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 and it's like when you have people that, that, you know, the head can't talk to the, to the heart, the heart can't talk to the arm, you start, you know, everything, the body can't function. And it's, it's quite scary. What's, what's happened on some of these shows during those times. Cause you would, you would have departments like COVID running the show and they have never been on set before. And it was that the shows were so scared with the COVID compliance to try to just, they were scared of interjecting anything or telling the COVID department or, or the COVID department could basically run the show. They could say, we can't do that. We have to do it this way. And yeah. the producers would allow them who never have any experience in filmmaking, no experience, anything drive everything because of a health, a health thing because of the return to work agreement. And that's, I understand public health. I understand, but at the same time, it's scary when it's like no other business is going to suddenly say, yeah, let's have, thi uh, have, have this health thing completely dictate and change the way everything operates and who can go where and who can, who could basically manage and how they can manage and how you have the interaction with people that need to work together and the collaboration that you're talking about. It's yeah, I, I think you're right, Alan. In fact, you, you, you remind me of another piece that happened because of COVID the, you know, the giant gap, the vacuum of non -con non no content being produced for that, that big stretch. And then suddenly everybody's diving back in, in the acceptable risk model of, of, of working, you know, in a COVID environment. Um, there was such a demand and still continues demand for content production that the staffing at the production level didn't exist. So suddenly you were seeing across the board, people out of their depth being promoted into positions of, of financial and creative responsibility that were, you know, charged with decisions that were well beyond their experience level. And, and, you know, you know, what happens when you do that, you know, do you want somebody, you know, doing your brain surgery or flying your, your airplane who's on their first flight or their first, you know, you know, they're just out of the, you know, medical school. No, you want, you yeah. want, you want that guy who's, you know, 
three cigars away from his last heart attack, who's done this his whole life and is going to make a good it's decision. All they know. Yeah. It's all they know. And so, um, so we're just, but we, we do have some really cool things about what we do that I think help us in this. We have a kind of inadvertent autonomy because there's such a preponderance of non, non engagement with the sound department by the other production parts persons. We're free to make all kinds of creative decisions all day long, um, as, as advocates and as interpreters of intent even if we not, might not have actually had a direct engagement on the subject of intent with the director or others. I mean, I try to make sure that I am in that in some form that is understandable, you know, for me and for the other parties. But yes, this, this is a asset to us that we can dance between the raindrops and, and, and use, you know, use your, your psychology, your filmmaking skills, um, the, the, the best, the best advice for survival is to be a perpetual student, you know, stay, stay engaged in learning everything there is to learn about your discipline, your practice as a practitioner, as a musician, if you will, or as a baker, as you will, you know, for that cake that you're talking about, you, you stay, um, fully, uh, you know, never sense, have a sense of mastery or I know all of this. That's a mistake, you know? It means you're not listening to what's happening right in front of you. We've all done a close-up, you know? But you can do a waist-up single with a 50. You can do a waist-up single with a 100 millimeter lens. You can do a waist-up single with a 25. The shot scale is the same for all three, but each, each of those three is saying something different. We also have that kind of, you know, subtlety in our application of our tools. And if you kind of stay in that realm, it's a little bit vague for those that we're partnering with, but they start to get a little insight, a little light on the journey of what we're doing. It's not just fighting lighting and fighting this and fighting that. It's not just about, you know, every story isn't about difficult locations and uncooperative crew members from other departments. That's sort of the stereotypical conversation. If we can migrate the conversation to the creative pieces that we're doing, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, working back and forth on the paradigm of subjective versus objective experience of the voice of this character. Are we inside their head? Or are we, and are we moving back and forth as the story point tells us? It's sort of the equivalent of depth of field. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, are we, uh, you know, DPs will do, you know, we'll do things where we are starting with a character of the shallow, shallow depth of field. And as we progress through the story and the, the protagonist becomes more aware and enlightened as he's he or she is transformed by the events in the story. The depth of field grows and becomes, you know, deeper, deep, you know, things like that. We are in those subtleties with a discipline that gets in under the radar. Sound is emotional. It's psychological. It affects us. Even if we don't have, most people don't have a vocabulary um, to recognize what their experience affecting them. That's our that's our palette. That's our meat and metier. There's there's interesting that you say that because um one of the one of the things that uh, I did a movie a few years ago and the the sound mixer that hired me we had a little uh, we had a, a a meeting on the phone and we talked and he said that he was at the production meeting and the director was saying this is a period movie that it takes place it starts in the 40s and moves kind of into the 60s and the director said we really should use vintage microphones for this. So what do they use back then? You should use that. And, uh, and it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I kind of laughed and I said, what are we shooting on? And he said, we're shooting on the Alexa. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, so I was like, all right, all right, all right, all right. You know what? I said, here's what we should do. I said, we should, if they're, I said, uh, I said, what they're doing. He says two Alexas. And they're going to most likely use one most of the time. I said, great. That's what I wanted to hear because if we're going to do it and, and here's, he's like, he, he wants to kind of do things with the look old school and he wants it to sound old school because they said the, the director is method is the, is the word they said. The director is method. I was like, really? Okay. So I said, go back. I said, here's what I would, I would, I would say to you, what I would suggest since he was asking my thoughts on this is I said, what if we did the sound old school, you rely on the boom. You don't rely on the wires as much. You play more the perspective as opposed to if there's a wide shot, play the lobs. So it always has that. If it's going to be one camera all the time, let's do it old school. If there, if it's a wide shot, ISO the, the lobs if you want to, but play the boom. So we have that perspective. 
And let's just, let's do the sound old school, but still do all the modern workflow stuff that Post would expect. And he says, yeah, that sounds really good to me. I'll pitch it. And the director was like, I like that. And it worked yeah. great. It works. That's great exactly, because- exactly what I'm talking about. You're now no. in a creative conversation in context <clears throat> of the director's intent. He flagged you on, I want this to be of a specific thing. And yeah. you ran with that. That's really exactly the example. That's a wonderful example. It's a class. It doesn't mean that that style of sound is the style of sound. It's a style of sound. Um, you know, you, you know, you've got, you know, that versus uh, Robert Altman and everything in between, but it's the right style of sound. And now that you've learned from the director, what he is trying to do with his piece. And so, uh, and, and you got through now you're in his circle yeah. of trust. I bet that yeah. affected the relationship with the director for the rest of the project. Well, it was, it was really interesting because since he was very method, it was one of those conversations that once we kind of, and we kind of said, we understand the style you're going for. Cause, cause one of the big things I'm always, I always tell people is, is don't just interject your opinion and say, you know what? I understand now where you're going, where you're going with this. Very and good. if you say that you use those words, it's going to be mean that they're pulling you in at that point, as opposed to what are they really, are they, if you say, you say, you know what? I, I appreciate you talking to me. I understand where you're going with this now. So that, that can, that, that helps us both. And that way you're including yourselves with that kind of inclusionary language. You're saying, this is about us. This is about, and that's the kind of the, the thing that I'll, I usually tell people involvement. That's, that's one of those kinds of things that um, I've had, you know, producers that know that, that the interactions I will have with directors will save money. And so when I've done like two or three projects with them and I've talked to, and suddenly we get a, a director that's like, no, we can't do that. We're not going to worry about that. Let's not worry. Let's not do that. Suddenly. The producer, whoa, 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 hold on a second. L- listen to him for a second. What did he just say? I've had producers that have heard me talk before to other directors and they say, well, oh, listen to him. And then they'll say, actually, there's some sense in that. Let's, 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 let's talk about this. And then they, they, we might find a, a common ground or there might be uh, an opportunity where they say, you know what, they, we can maybe incorporate in some of that. And then they obviously will end up by the end, pretty much doing what it was that suggested. And that's fine. I'm not looking at getting the credit. I'm not looking at trying to get credit for giving an idea because I understand that there's a lot of, there's participation that happens. You can pitch ideas. It's got to be worked. And then if it works out as part of the vision and the the idea, because I wasn't part of the prep, you know, the two days of prep per two for one shooting day. I wasn't part of that. I don't understand the big picture sometimes that they're, that they're going for here. What I can do is pitch suggestions, suggestions, and rely on our sound expertise and our experience. It's the reason why they hired us to begin with. And if That's we right. understand, if we understand and have that co- collaborative, you know, personality, and we understand each other, it's going to end up so much better. Yeah. You know, we want to help. We want to contribute. We want, we want to realize your intent in a way that it, it, that's how it hits the audience. You know, what you're trying to, and we're part of that creative palette, you know, so use us that way. Let us, let us play our instrument for you that way. You know, that's, that's kind of the message. I think that, that we, you know, we're filmmakers first and sound people next. Yeah. And I think as long as we can sort of come at the angle as filmmakers, what, you know, Jim Cameron said something interesting on the set of, of Titanic. And I, I use this in my workshops. Um, and it's a really good thing to understand as sound people, because we some, sometimes, approach this with siege mentality, which is not healthy. And that is, don't give me what I ask for. Give me what I want. Yeah. And it sounds a little crazy, you know, in terms of, you know, all right, that's, that's, uh, you know, thin ice and quicksand. What do you mean? <laughs> no, it's, it's, I'm counting on you to, co- to uh, con- understand the context in the actual, not our theoretical, but now we're in this, we're doing it. And it's, it's a process I need you to be smart enough and fluent enough in your instrument to interpret what I mean in this without me having to be always explicit and, and devote my energy to re, you know, explaining to you, can you be that alert to the work that we're doing, you know, so that, you know, you know what, you know, so it's not like I left my mind reading glasses at home this morning. It's like, if you're here and we're doing this and you see all the shit that's happened to bring it to this moment, 
you're part of that process. If you're not paying attention to that, you're not on my team. You haven't, you haven't, you know, done what I've asked you most importantly to do. Give me what I want. Know what I want, even if I haven't articulated it. And you know it's, what? There's, there's a lot of sense that's in that too. If you were to yeah. run, for example, a dance show and you said, I'm going to, and, and you decide that you're going to hire someone and they're inexperienced and you say, uh, do a couple of pirouettes and, and, you know, dance across the stage and then dance back. Cool. And then you, you, you rely on that person and, and then you kind of micromanage the process. Even, you, you know, that's going to be totally different than if you say, oh, we have Mikhail Baryshnikov here. And then you say, do a couple of pirouettes, dance across set and dance back. And you let him do his thing. You're going to end up really, really impressed with that. And part of that is understanding where they don't legitimately mean do a couple of pirouettes. He that's that's language that's used to kind of because yep. it's someone that doesn't understand our work. They bring us aboard because we're experts in what we do, because we are we are uh, artists that that deal with our craft. And yep. this is a creative process and it's also technical. And part of that is bridging the creative parts of of everything with the technical parts to make it all work. And that's one of the, th the ways that we are really, you know, magical in what we can do. And people really underestimate sound, but then it is over half of the experience of watching a show. If you have yourself, um, uh, if someone punches something and it doesn't make a bone smacking crack when you, when you, you know, people don't go home humming an establishing shot. They're like, no. you know, they feel empowered by the, the theme song. They're going to hear a crack in someone's voice, and that's the thing that's going to push them over the edge emotionally. That's the thing that, you know, it's going to be the way the music builds with the look. You hit mute on something, and it takes so much out of it. That's one of the reasons why when you, I said this to Patricia earlier, when you go to a movie, they say silence is golden, silence your cell phone. They don't say don't obscure the view of the person in front of you. There is a, uh, you still go to see a movie, and we understand that terminology, but there is also a lot that can be said for, uh, the experience that we actually get out of it when we uh, are watching a movie and we are involved in that, there is a that's story right. that's being told that's carried by the dialogue. And Magic. if you were to, if you're doing something, if you're watching a movie at home, you can very easily be knitting and listening to the story. And at the end of it, you're going to know everything that happened versus you're watching the movie. Someone calls you, you hit mute on the show and you're still trying to watch while you're listening and, and talking on the phone. And you realize that you missed so much. You're going to have to, as soon as you get off the phone, say, I'm going to rewind back because I don't know what happened. That's right. It's information. And you have to go back. Yes. You missed that part. Communication you know, is key. I totally agree with you, Alan. And I, I think, you know, the, the thing we're talking about is not that far a stretch if it's in the context of, you know, uh, let's say high-end actors, you know, a DiCaprio or De Niro or a, a Pacino or, or Brad Pitt or whatever. They're not going to want to be micromanaged by the director. They're not going to want to be given notes on, you know, on the specifics. They want the broad intent character as, as a collaborator. So um, we're kind of taking the same posture in our arena um, with, without, you know, with, with, without the ego side of it, you know, uh, uh, in an overt way. But we're saying, you know, Quentin's a good example for this in a, in a very important way. He he early on was mentored by somebody who who advised him to focus on his core responsibility as a director, which is you know directing the actors and and entertaining the audience. And he uh, he does not use Video Village. It's it's verboten on his sets. He sits at the dolly in close quarters to the actors in the room. He, you know, he, there's, there's no video playback. So he saves 30% of his shooting day that way. He looks up at the cameraman, the operator and, and, you know, old school. Did we get it? Yeah, it's great. Good. We've got that. Cause I love the performance. Same with the sound, same with everybody. Let's do another, you know, we'll have a little sister protective. And it's this idea that he spends his energy hiring people who he trusts to interpret his intent he fully re relies on that repertoire company, both behind and in front of the camera, so that he can do his main job, which is direct the movie. Yes. Instead of micromanage the movie, and he takes a leadership position without the without the uh, the conceit that I need to know everything and everybody's job more than my own job. 
Um, mm -hmm. And he respects that because it frees him up to do the thing that he does, which is write and direct, you know, magnificently. And and it's it's like he doesn't shoot extravagant. You know, we don't go over budget or over schedule or any of that because he's come. You know, there's a shot list in the in the morning. Is it is it you know? And and it goes to the keys. Is it is it uh, set in stone? No, we might discover something interesting in the process. But that's part of the art. A, we are we are on we're on the same team. We're on the same ball team. You know, we've got a strategy. We're going to you know we've when we've done the scout it, seven weeks later, we come back. We have a 70, 80 percent you know comprehension of what we're probably going to do to approach that material on that on that day. Um, you know, you know what I'm saying is like communication from the director is um, probably one of the biggest issues right now when younger actors come to, you know, to the seat. And so we, we need to get that trust thing going on. And you just described an excellent, you know, that's such a good example of, okay, the director is going old school. It doesn't mean you need to record on, on 35 millimeter optical, but it does mean that you want to approach the stylistically in context to his intent. And that's yes. a perfect example. You, he came to you with the idea. You came back to him with a solution for that idea. Yeah. It wasn't what he thought. It wasn't just the mere. And even he if didn't know is, what he wanted. He didn't know well, what he, he wanted. And he was vocalizing it the way he could think right. of it and rationalize it. And, and you could go beyond. We did on, on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. We're in a period show, you know, a very specific period. We had an entire palette of period microphones functional available for different things. And we did, there were occasions where we used that in context along with contemporary microphones or present day as an effect, as a possibility, as another way to maybe get something. You know, we were on Fisher Booms for scenes that were both supposed, you know, I mean, we use them anyway, but, you know, it's a, it's a returning art form that, you know, uh, that, that has been gone for a long time, but it allows. Uh, for certain kinds of things, mm. you know, and it happened to be very Pirandello like, you know, movie within a movie within a movie. It was his day for night, you know, his passion, his passion play about the love of making movies. And and several directors fortunately get to that. And and it was not like, OK, I going to he didn't he didn't waste his energy getting into how we got to that outcome. He jumped. He made the leap past that trusted us for achieving the outcome by saying what the outcome was. This is how I want it to be experienced. Can you do that? And I don't care how you do that, but do that so that, yeah. you know, I mean, there are a couple exceptions. He shoots in film, you know, he doesn't shoot digitally. Um, he doesn't do a uh, CGI. He doesn't do ADR. He doesn't do things that, you know, and they're not about the sound or the, they're, they are about his sensibility about what works for him as, as an artist creatively. But he does it based on that. Now, somebody here says, I know how to eat my biscuits with bacon. Uh, you know, Liberty Dude, you're, you're out there somewhere. Uh, are there many chefs in the, are there too many chefs in the kitchen? <laughs> oh, it's, he's got some very funny. This is, uh, you um, where Alan forgot to eat his breakfast. Oh, I see. Oh, I, I, I had forgotten. I didn't yes, have any breakfast, was, so I forgot to eat I was, too. <laughs> I didn't eat any breakfast either. I hadn't eaten since like yesterday at like dinner time. We had Taco Bell and I just, I, I left there because that was just a real quick thing we could do. And I ran in here and started working. I went okay. to bed at like just before 7 a.m. and then got up today at 1030 and started this. And now we're 18 hours into the stream almost. And so uh -huh. it's like, it's just been going nonstop. And I, for, I, I, I was like, I can't stop. You know, this morning when I got up, I'm like, I got to do all this. I got to get ready. And, and my wife was trying to get me to, to, to stop and eat. And I was like, I can't. And so food was sitting over there for a long time, for hours. And then I thought it was because it was covered up. I thought it was donuts because it, it was in a Dunkin' Donuts thing. It ends up being that she got me sausage biscuits. When I realized this, she, I, I was like, you know, I don't have time to heat it up because she says you want to heat it up. And I said, I don't have time to. She says, you want me to drop it in the air fryer for you? She then oh, okay. brought it to me, put it down next to me, and I forgot about it for another six hours. So I it was it. I was love my air fryer, by the way. I love my oh, air fryer. It's they're okay. wonderful. They're love them to death. I just got one. Um, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Diesel 10 for the donation, as well as Julian Kreis, Kraus, both um, actually out there uh, watching. I think Diesel just left, but Julian is still here. He's come into recently. Um, there is a question here that uh, I've been sitting on for a little bit here. Mark, uh, when shooting on actual film that involves in uh, that in, uh, informs lens choices, lighting choices, even makeup choices, apart from camera noise, does shooting on film ever inform your work as a production sound 
mixer? Sure, every element is going to is going to be a piece of of, of information for me. Um, oh, we have somebody joining us. Here. We ha- we ha- we have a uh, David. David actually was with us hours ago. Hi, David. And he, yeah, yeah. He... I just thought, I'm just quickly unmuting myself, and I'm just around the corner. So I just thought I'd say hello for like a minute, and I'll show you us hitting midnight and New Year's Eve from the future here in New Zealand. And I'm just I'm said... probably like we're only like less we're less than two minutes away. Okay. So I think I might just we're mute really myself because otherwise, we're, as soon as I step outside of the party, it's going to be way too loud. But I'm just, I'm just going to mute it and you can just sort of see us do the countdown to midnight. It's about to happen very soon. So hold I'm just going to walk out of the chaos now. Hey, what? Hold it oh, yeah. oh. See if it flips. Sorry. Uh. My, oh, it's not what I mean, flipping. Sorry about that. My head is just going. Maybe oh, if I no. put we're auto, time traveling now. auto okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Good to see you, David. So, so <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I I always love watching interviews. Like the knowledge you share is like every sentence. Like I really like any interview with you. It's really great. I love it. By the way, <laughs> if you want to like try to sort of come back and watch this up. Anyway, so oh oh. <laughs> I just thought I'd give you a small glimpse into the future. We're now living in 2023. <laughs> um, we'll catch up soon. Yeah, I'm in like Italy. We're next. Huh? We're next. We're next, David. We're in Italy, so we'll catch up soon. And then, and then. Oh, Italy. Italy. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How's 2023? Is it a better year? Um, wants to know. <laughs> well, it could be a whisk, a whisk, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, 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 only only a few seconds into it, so give me a bit a bit larger sample size to, to form an opinion on it. And, 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 have we and, and have maybe, humans destroyed the entire days? world yet? Have humans <laughs> destroyed yeah. the world just yet, or are we still working? No, on no, it? it's still here. And you know, it's not like the Y two K bug was just delayed by twenty three years. So you know, we, we, we were not having that. The electricity is still working here. So yep, yep. Everything, everything is so far so good. We count our blessings. That's every, yeah, everyone I just, is I just went over to like the, yeah, <laughs> I just went over to some uh, friends' place for New Year's. I was a filmmakers and I'm from America. So yeah, I've really been hang, hanging around Americans a lot today, both on the live stream and in the party. Anyway, I, I don't I don't mean to like completely monopolize it. So I I, I might just uh, yeah. um, uh, mute amazing, myself. Man. So I, I don't have to. It's. It's amazing, dude. It's hilarious that we have gone 18 hours with this stream and we started it yesterday. And I know we are we're 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 here so long we get to see you bring in the new year. Cause I think the first year yeah, I think we, no. we 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 went pretty long too, but we we didn't go all the way up to New Year's. Uh well, I think the first today. year. Yeah, we did today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I love it. I just love I, I've it. I've been it's part great. of both of I've I've been part of both of your last two streams, and I do remember each year I would stay to the end of your stream, and I was still able to go out to town and be there before midnight and before the fireworks and stuff. Um, although I think last year, I think the stream ended, so it was so late. I think it was only like an hour or two before the fireworks finished. Um, but, um, something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, you, you know, you've successfully had your longest ever this year, and you've gone into the new year, and at least some yep. part of the world. Yeah, this last part of the world. Year, <laughs> last, so congratulations. Year, a new achievement year, unlocked. David, um, last year, David, I don't know if you remember this picture. We took this at the very, very end of it, and it shows oh! in the upper left hand corner. That was that was 17 hours and 11 minutes and 52 seconds into the stream last year. That was the picture you and I took. So. Yeah, so that was mean. I think last year we were only like an hour or so before midnight. I remember 
we finished the stream and I kind of like rushed downtown because when I lived downtown, so I just sort of walked out the door and I was there just before the fireworks went off. It, it was a bit close timing. Um, yeah. But yeah. That's hilarious. Anyway, That's like awesome. I said. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, was amazing. I, 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 I thought it might be a good little moment to share and just jump in and, and, and share the festivities for, from a new year. Because <laughs> otherwise, you know, if you want to share in your local festivities, you have to keep on streaming for like, what, another 12 hours, another another 16 hours? I, I, I mean, I, like, I, 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 I believe that. in you, Alan. You, you can do it. You can keep on streaming for another 16 hours and make sure you get to midnight in your time as well. But you know if not, at least you've got to experience midnight in New Zealand. When my wife wakes up with a six-year-old here in a few minutes, she's going to walk in here, give me a look, and I'm going to know I'm in trouble <laughs> because this is the day that leads, leads, leads in. So um, it's it's funny because I hope, uh, for the love of God, please, Dan, if you're out there, please tell me you're still recording uh, because I want to make sure we have this, and I don't trust my computer at this point, which hopefully is still recording over there. But I tell you. Uh, oh, yeah, so you, there, your computer is still recording, but you're just not sure. I hope. It froze about 15 minutes after I started it about six hours ago. And um, so I just hope that it's still recording uh, now. And I hope between me and Dan, oh. hopefully we have it. So just just a looking around, I just realized there's something here. If you can see it, like that is extremely American. <laughs> <laughs> like all these red cups. It is not what we see in New Zealand. It is very unusual. But yeah, we're in an Amer American household at the moment. So they got red cups. <laughs> Love it. The silo cups. I have something for you, Alan. What's that? Oh, it's about time. It's about time. It almost looks like the ones that 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 there were were hockey pucks over here. That's almost These exactly the way. It looks. Very good. We'll have to definitely take that in there. So, what does this say? See, uh, now we're demonstrating our most important our most important resource: a sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> it's the most important piece. It really is. It is. I love it. Thank anyway, you for including me in this I'm, conversation. I appreciate it very much. I'll, I'm going to drop out for a bit, but okay. you know, come when the sun comes up, you know, it's 6 a.m. when it's dawn and I'm done for the night. I would just like check in and see if you're still streaming. Just see, to see if you're still like going for the midnight you New Year's Eve in America as well. I believe in you, Alan. You can do it. Keep streaming. Uh, sure. TK, it's funny. TK is just now waking up. He was a guest like 15 hours ago. So it's, yeah. he's like, you're still going? <laughs> yes, we're still going here, TK. Yeah, like, I don't know what was, was wondering if you're still streaming or not, or if I could still do no years, but yeah, go. Cool. Um, anyway, I'm gonna, like, looking for punishment this. at this point. <laughs> Take care, David. Thank you so much, man. Thanks, David. That was funny. That's so cool to have New Year's. Bye. <laughs> Oh, it's priceless, man. That's hilarious. He called us to share the moment. Yeah, um, you, you've started quite a tradition here, Alan. It's, uh, I tell you, it's, a, it's amazing. You're bringing people from the other side of the world. We, uh, you know what? If 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 I didn't have a family, I might try to see if I could do a live stream and bring in the new year, all 24 hours of it. See if I could find someone in every different time zone willing to stream it. That would be a really amazing thing. Cool. Um, yeah, well, real it'll quick, get noisy here tonight. I can promise you that. Oh, no doubt. I'm sure, I'm sure it's going to be noisy everywhere. Um, real quick here, back to this question here, when shooting on actual film, the, um, yeah. the often informs lens choices, uh, lighting choices, even makeup choices, apart from camera noise, does shooting on film ever inform your work as a production and sound mixer? Yeah, I think every element informs, you know, I mean, I, I'm just from, you know, off, off the, you know, shooting from the hip here, I, I would say that it's, it, it's, it, what are the elements in a particular project? You know, are we shooting film? What is the context of shooting film? Is it, is it, you know, theoretical or is there something specific in the aesthetic of that? And if there is, there's, there's something that I can link to so that, so that I'm approaching it holistically to, to, to match that. Is it a stylistic thing in terms of how, how I'm mixing this, how I'm, I'm, I'm you know, approaching the, the, the nature of the sound? Someone asked me, like, you know, we, we've been doing these workshops internationally. We just finished a whole series. Uh, we, you know, London, uh, Paris, and Rome in the last six weeks, doing uh, uh, many workshops in, in all three in all three cities. And um, someone asked me, you know, do you have a style of mixing for production sound? And, and I had to think hard about that because I was, you know, I know what I do. 
And I know that I adapt to the project. I don't necessarily have a singularity or an ideology or I do this only one way. But if I had a thread through it and I finally realized that I do have this thing in my head that is I psychologically, it, it was it was subconscious, but I it, it, it emerged. <laughs> but I psychologically consider or think in terms of me being in the scene with the actors and mm -hmm. reacting to the sound as another person in the scene and yeah. mixing to that sensibility, even depending, it could be different for different styles. I might be in a traditional classic sound perspective style. I might be in a Robert Altman, you know, for the information improv and no pers you know, perspective be damned and, ev and then everything in between, but either way and everything in between, it's that is the thread is that I, I imagine psychologically that I'm a acting participant in the scene with the other actors and hearing the way they sound as if I was in the room with them for me as an actor, yes. uh, as a character, as a character. I, I, that may be kind of vague. I couldn't put that on a, on a meter or measure it. No, but it, it's an aesthetic that I, I think does work for me. Um, in terms of figuring out what is it that I'm doing that that is connecting, because I get that comment a lot, you know, and it's like, okay, that's nice for your ego and all the rest of that, but okay, screw that. What, <laughs> what is it? You know, what is the, what is it that you're, you know, that makes sense to you sound wise? And and I think that's it is the idea that I I, I want the scene to be alive in my head. And that's and, and that's actually a key thing. I'll, I'll I'll I mentioned this a few hours ago. In the stream, when someone asked if we, as boom operators, if we learn the lines, the, learn the dialogue, and and I said that there's various different ways of doing it. I said I actually came from an acting background. I acted wow. years ago, so when I look at the script, I don't just say, okay, there's this line. I'm gonna remember the last like couple of you know prepositions or whatever, the last few words of each line. What I'll do is I'll look at this, and when I finish a line, I'll say, who is likely and motivated to respond or to say the next thing. And then I'll yeah. say what, and then that helps me understand the characters. And that means also I'm perhaps getting an understanding of the characters and how they're going to potentially jump each other, how some, someone might uh, interact with someone. And then when I, when I see the way the actors do it and during rehearsal, I can put my mind together with the way that they did it. And it helps That's me right. understand and cue yeah. the lines so much yes. better. That to That's me, that to me puts me more into it where I, I, I you know, it's funny because I'll watch a movie and I'm like, you know, I remember this. I remember this. I remember this. Oh, they just dropped a line. That was the, they cut out a line. The, the line about the whatever. And then I'll say, oh, they just dropped another line. Oh, they just cut a scene. And, you know, I'm watching it in my mind, saying in my mind, they just, uh, you know, there's a lot missing here. Or there's, they just got through cutting that line. Why did they cut that one thing short? Because I remember it all. And I remember the motivations that I tied in mm -hmm. because of everything in, in me it helped to help me understand the goal. That helps you to figure out not only just, you know, the scene itself, but it also helps you to really figure out where the scene is going, how they're planning on covering it, you know, creatively and how we can be, best be uh, be there for the production itself, because it is a collaboration. Totally. I, I It's funny. I have a parallel experience it, because I come out of music. I'm a second generation percussionist. My father was prominent. And I that was my first intensity uh, discipline was, you know, uh, four or five years of, you know, I was a four or five hour a day practice you know, reading, reading was the key. But the thing is, in um, when I'm in a mix on the set, and I'm mixing, it might be one microphone, it might be 15, you know, the fluency of what and where and when the nuance of a minor head turn that does or doesn't, you know, all of those things, I'm in flow. And I can hear it once. And I might not be able to tell you the words, even though I, I know what they are, I might not be able to tell you the words, but I have built into my brain, the beats. So yes. I hear the words as music, as it were. And so if I had to stop and think and all the rest in the mix that's, ha that's happening, you know, I, I would be too late because I'm out of, I'm, I'm now, it's like thinking in another language happens when you stop translating in your head, your language that you're actually moving. And so it's, it's like that. And so for me, I am similar to you. I know all the, I could, I could remix a scene I can see it on a screen and remix the scene with my fingers. There's like muscle memory, yeah. um, but I might not be able to tell you the words, but I know the music of the scene of the beats or the music of the dialogue. It's a weird thing. We, we have become specialized in that, in that integration. And it's the same idea of being in, 
inside the scene, in flow with the actors, inter anticipating intuitively what might emerge in how they're doing this performance. A, a minor change by one actor might change the reaction of the other actor, both in time oh, and intensity. It absolutely does. Whatever. And if you're really in this, you will somehow know what that's going to be. 90, you know, the force will be with you 90% of the time. It's, and it's not an intellectual pro pro proposition. It's more like a musician's improvisational proposition. You know, they, musicians communicate musically and, you know, without a lot of words, but they're an intimate communication. I think we're that way with the performance happening. Our performance is tied to the performance happening in front of the camera. So I, I, you said it better well, than me, but I, I just really, it's, it's a magical thing. I, it's one of the things I love about it. It's one of the things that we understand emotion. We feel emotion and the little bitty bits and, yes. and, and things that change in emotion. And That's that right. drives us all. So when I'm on set, one of the reasons why what people say all, all the time, why don't you mix now? Because I'm right there in the action. I like being there. I like being part. And the actors will feel it too. At yeah. the end of a show, so many actors will say, you know, we did this together. We were all there together. You know, there's a, a camera operator. There was the sound, the boom operator. There was all of us together because, you know, and, 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 and Patricia will tell you that, that, you know, there'll be a tight little set. We're all trying to all share the same space and the camera will just feel that the shot needs to move this way a little bit. The actor will suddenly not be able to exit out the way they are. So they're going to go a slightly different way. I will feel that I will see, see that we will all collaborative adjust yeah. together and it's just showing how we all share the same thing we're all aware of each other we're st just just like how some actors will be bothered by if, if people are in their eye line it's not something they're normally bothered they're not bothered with camera they're not usually bothered with sound people in their eye line because they know that we're all there together feeling the same thing and kind right. of figuring it all out together and feeling it all together it's so, like a jazz trio in 1956 with a single mic placement, you know, performing an improv, improvisational jazz thing and take one and it's for the ages. You know, you, you, you're, you're just, again, it's in your influency. You're, 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 you're not influencing. You're in a state of fluency. Yeah. Um, and so the flow is self-evident and it's not intellectual it's it's really not it's the it's that musicianship of the boom operator and the camera operator and the dolly grip in synchronous performance with the actors in the front of in front of the camera you're all performing together and that's one of the least visible aspects is that you know i, I always say every shot's handmade um but it's handmade by all the participants that are in that performance yeah. not everybody on a film set in the crew and the participants are live performers. Mm -hmm. And Petrushka says it best. She says, you know, when we're doing it on the set, it's live theater. People are watching it later as a movie, but when it's right. happening in real time, uh, exactly. it's theater. You're, you're, you're in a, you know, full on and real time performance. And that's all the, the magic company. we try to catch. And all the company is there as part of the feeling. All of us are there working together to try right. to, 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 to do the, the production. Exactly right. And, um, and that's, that's, there's, there's a lot that can be said for that. It's, um, there was one thing I was, I was going to say a moment ago and then just slipped right in my mind when I heard you say that, I was like, I got to interject that too. But it's, it's the, to, to me, it's really some of the most amazing experiences I've had on set is when there's, we didn't have time or we did or something changed and it totally drove the scene in a different direction. The actors felt it. The camera operator felt that it had to change. I reacted accordingly and had to change too. And we all changed together mm -hmm. simultaneously where suddenly a camera pushed in a wall. That was my spot. I jump over to the other side. But when I did that, it put me in the way of where the actor was going to leave. So they modified their thing, which turned the camera around. And suddenly everything has totally changed. But the director walks in and says, I don't know what happened, but that was amazing. It's because we all felt it together. And that's, and that's 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 the way a lot of it is. And and mentioning the the theater aspect of it, absolutely, you know, that's yeah. a really good way to word it as well. Because it's true, you know. I mean, these are this is sort of some of the invisible reality of this life. You know, it is a life. It's a lifestyle. You know, this is not uh, you know this is not something you learn in a few weeks and then you got it. This is a a lifetime uh, endeavor of, of of engaging to get to that level. To get that level of intuitive response is the 10,000 hours or whatever it is that they talk about is uh, achieving fluency in a thing. You, and they you can't get, teach in film school. Yeah. You, yeah. You're, you're just, um, 
you know, it's kind of, it's the kind of thing that's least understood by, you know, the people, we, our frustrations often have to do with the, the, um, the invisibility, even if you're watching what we do, you have no clue what we're doing. <laughs> You know, you see these machines, you see these obstacles, there's a stick. You know, I love that you mentioned the boom operator for you as opposed to the assumption or stereotype of the vertical hierarchy of the mixer, the boom operator, the utility. It's a jazz trio. They're all, you know, yes, the mixer has to deal with the front end and the politics and the bullshit and all the rest of that. But it's a full on Ver, you know, horizontal hierarchy of collaboration that, that takes place. And each of us have different personality traits that affect what works, you know, in terms of our natures best. I, I concur, you know, I come out of documentary in the earlier years of my career and we still make our own together. Patricia and I, she produces, I direct. Um, and what we, you know, in that context, your, um, you know, kind of you, you, the the idea that it, there's this vertical hierarchy is is not true. It's just not the the immediacy of the boom work is incredibly special. It's rewarding. It's highly esoteric in the skill set necessary, and it's a you know enormously can be if you're of the right nature rewarding it you know uh, a profession. Mm -hmm. You know, at the, at the better levels, it's well compensated, you know, in terms of, you know, can create a, a decent, you know, upper middle class income flow if, if you know, <clears throat> if, if you're if you can, if, you know, there's if the gods allow, if the gods allow you know, yeah. there's decent Absolutely. famine in that. But, yeah. you know, again, that's another lesson how to survive in a freelance life, you know, and if you look back over the decades, you suddenly realize, well, I've always been working. What was that about? You know, when was I, you know, and, and so. You know, you're not in charge of that, but it, other than by your manner and your demeanor and, the, and who you come across. But I, I love that you identify that with the dignity that it really deserves, that the boom operator is a full on equal partner. And I'll tell you, you know, unofficially right now, we're we're making the case that they are to be recognized creatively by the general industry population and that's at the academy as well we want boom operators to be recognized the way others in the sound community contribute to the telling of the story and we're working on that so i think i think you know um the dignity of work in general has been under assault for decades in our culture mm -hmm. you know the people actually do stuff you know that that stuff that we do that you know when we show up on a set none of it exists yet and when we walk away that night, we've created things out of thin air that do exist now in a concrete form that didn't when we got there in the morning. The people who actually, it's like carpenters and, and, and masons and, uh, you know, uh, sculpt, you know, the people who physically do a thing to transform nothing into something are um, unappreciated in the culture right now by design. And, you know, not to get into the politics of that. But I think we're seeing a change happening as people intuitively begin to realize, you know, if I don't do this thing, the whole thing stops. Mm -hmm. You know, if you stop on the set in that moment, it stops. If the cameraman turns off the camera, it stops. If, if you know, um, if the actor, we make stuff and we do it with craft and we do it with art and we need to self-identify the confidence that we should feel over that um, Petrushka and I have been very aggressive over the years with people who come and work with us. It's particularly, you know, trainees and, and apprentices that we, we, we always try and have some teaching process going on when we're, when we're working on a project. Excellent. And we, our first rule is never run on the set. There's no reason to get hurt and there's no reason to have to, you know, be potentially in an injury or injury receiving mode. But the second thing we say teach is don't apologize don't say you're sorry for something that you did not, you're not responsible for. Be concerned, be contributory, be even, you know, uh, uh, mm. but don't say, I'm sorry that this is not working. Yeah. Don't say that. Say, we have great, we have ideas for solutions. She says there are no problems, only opportunities for creative <laughs> resolution. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's a game, but it's an important one. Semantic. And the use of language for communicating an intimate team process is um, not to be underestimated in its significance. You There's know? um, I mean, it's we, we each have different perspectives on things, but if we fail to be able to communicate successfully to people we're collaborating with, that's the first set of tools that that needs to get fixed. 
It was um, a few years ago. Uh, I remember hearing uh, a story from uh, I was ta- I was training in Aikido, and uh, my sensei there he told us a story of the Shihan Bo, who was the guy in charge. Uh, he was the the head of the the particular martial art that we were studying, and he saw a seminar with him where someone asks him, "Could you show us this technique?" And he would say, "I'll try," and and you know a couple of the people were like. <laughs> What are you talking about? You'll try. You're like, you know, and, and he said, this is art. You know, he says, this is art. That's what we do with it. With art is we will, we will attempt it. And then it was like the most amazing thing you'd ever seen. And then he said, could you please do it again? He said, sure, I'll try. And he did it again. And it was even better than the first. And it was like, these guys were like freaking out because it was amazing. And it's the same kind of thing as like, um, we were talking about the, the boom operator. And I'm really glad to say that you're, you're trying to legitimize, um, a little bit more and 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 to to recognize boom operators i've been very pretty you know active about anytime someone says this Good. sound mixer is has is up for the academy award of this so this sound mixer is whatever i always say who is their team you'll see me post online and say who is your mm-hmm. boom op who is their team who is their utility because you have the dp and then you have the 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 camera operators who have soc after their name so one of the things that i have an intention of maybe as i approach retirement or maybe after a couple of years, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Um, I was talking to Don Supel about this before he died, and I've talked to other people too about having some sort of a recognition like that for boom operators. If you recall, years ago, you and I were talking when I think you were the CAS president at the time, and I said, I said, why is there a path that we could work for, you know, to to get boom operators to an active membership? And I remember you said you've tried desperately. Don't think I don't think you haven't. But it just isn't likely going to happen. And you then told me that mixers, the sound production sound mixers, weren't originally part of CAS as well. It was something that you kind of had to early, early on. Yeah, they, early they on, it had to change. It had it had to change in time. But you know, um, it's interesting. We're, you, we're doing this at the academy right now. You know, yeah. I, I I can't get into minutia and details. Absolutely. But we there's we we've had a significant rule change that will allow for the possibility of membership for our boom operators. We, we're working on that. Um, and it, it's a, it's a, a part of a larger pr- uh, program of the production sound mixers be, being more um, proportionate in their advocacy for self-recognition and for mm-hmm. recognition within the branch and with the larger community of filmmakers. It's a, it's a platform place that will affect other places. And I think CAS needs to migrate to acceptance for active participation as, as members for the boom operators, yeah. because there are mix, there are many mixers in post who are in CAS who are not the lead re-re's. Yes. Who are the re-re's, you know, part of the re-re team. They may be the ADR mixer, the music, you know, they're, they're mixers. And so the title of their work has influence on their accessibility as, mm-hmm. as actives. Um, and I think because the title boom operator, it's tied to, uh, to, to, you know, to labor contractual issues. So it's not as simple as what happened in the U- U- UK as far as migrating the terms to first assistant sound and second assistant sound, which was a, uh, uh, an effective plan to raise their respectability in terms mm-hmm. of compensation and credits and all the rest of that to be at least in reasonable parity to the camera assistants. Um, it's a more complex, complicated thing here because we're tied to uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements that are very classified, I mean, are very classification based. So, but your idea, I think, is is a good one. I, and I think that we should be lobbying more um, effectively with organizations like CAS for the boom operators to be viable. They may not be statuette recipients. That, that yes. will be a different thing. But that's true in the other departments to a certain extent also, you know. So, um, but the point that we are both making is the recognition for the contribution that creative contribution that these, these, these individuals are making performance performance artists artists are making. That's right, Patricia performance artists that, that are, you know, at this point, they need the department heads to be part of that recognition and not be, you know, scurrilous about, you know, um, but you're dealing with a very, um, you know, things like this are conservative and, uh, you know, there are strong opinions about it. Um, it's very clear to me. And I've mm-hmm. always been a vocal advocate for us making sure that we don't somehow create this artificial hierarchy of, you know, I'm, I'm 
Uh, you know, I'm uh, the maestro. I'm the yeah. guy behind the black curtain. You know, the the wizard of ooze. So um, it's <laughs> sorry. Well, I just, well, uh, I just wrote that. That's new. I, that, I, was all, know, that was actually pretty I, amazing. The, uh, uh, that was spontaneous. And, and yes, other, some, you know, of the best things, the some of the best things. Some of the is one of mine. You know, let's. Uh, you know, that's kind of a different. Thing. Here's, so anyway. It, here's here's, here's some an interesting again. point. You got to knock that down. Stop it. Stop it. Okay. Uh, one of the interesting points uh, also that I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to here is uh, you were talking about boom operators and their involvement and stuff like that. Senator Mike Michaels in an interview a few years ago, one of the things he said is he said if the micro if the boom microphone isn't in the right place, what can I do except record it? And that was that was really kind of telling. He understands that the boom operator, and he even said, if you only have money to hire one person in the department and pay them a decent wage, make that the boom operator, they're the person with the microphone. People do not understand that there is an art that goes into that. Boom operators are mixtures too, because yes. but we only have the one microphone that we have to figure out how to bring it in and out with 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 uh, volume of of you know expression we have to know when to push in because of the intimacy of a scene we know how to go when when to back up we need to know how that microphone needs to be positioned away from noise sources we have to understand the balance of two people who are speaking dynamically differently um, there's a lot that can, that can be said for that and and you mentioned also a little while ago about uh, people on set. I did, one of the first videos I did on this channel was called The Big Four, where I talked about the interactions between the camera operator, the first AC, the dolly grip, and the boom operator, the people that are part of the set every single time. Well, the first ACs that's are quite, the, the first AC is usually offset now, watched on the monitor nearby. Sometimes the the camera operator is doing is remote, you know, on a remote head. So some of that's being taken taken out of it. But that is still, those are still, in my opinion, the big four. The last thing I'll say real real quickly is we were talking about the art forms and uh, the collaboration, how we all work together. The way I usually like to refer to people uh, as, as it's like Alvin Ailey dance is we all start together. We go off and do our own things and maybe a couple of us will align again and then we'll fall back out and a couple of another person comes in and you all at different times you work in collaboration with people, but we're all part of a beautiful thing together and then we all start and finish together. And that's very much like like the way it is. Yep, that's right. And it's amazing when you watch it, you're like, how does this thing work? It's because that's what they do, just like we do what we do. Yep. So we need to be confident in that uh, dignity of that. And yep. sometimes fear overcomes our ability to be confident in that. You know, we are afraid of being too uh, overt, too obvious, too noisy, too, too present, um, you know. And so finding the right balance is part of the, is the soft skill set that is essential to be in partnership with your technical skill set. Yep. Um, it's, it's also, it's the psychological instrument. Um, but underneath has to be that self-esteem, has to be that recognition of what you're doing is an essential contribution. It's a creative one and it's very special. And that, you know, um, you don't need someone else to validate for you that reality. If you're not validating it for yourself, you're not emoting, you're not projecting or, or beaming that concept out of your identity, out of your personality. And we are amazingly intuitive as humans. We get all kinds of information and communicate all kinds of ways that are not, you know, here's an example. Patricia and I did a movie of the week, a remake of, of um, uh, the Hitchcock film, um, Shadow of a Doubt. Um, uh, this was about 25 years ago anyway. And on that show, the lead actor was named Mark. The first AD was named Mark. The camera operator was named Mark. I was named Mark. The, uh, the, uh, the, the lead man from the art department was named Mark. And the, and the gaffer, we had like, you know, all these key players who are on set personalities. Now, the word Mark, the name Mark, is one syllable. Yeah. Right? There's also the slate. And then there's marker, you yeah. know, the slate, you know, and hit your marks, you know, did, you know, hit your marks for the act. And yet within a day and a half, two days, it was really startling because that was kind of a unique thing. Everyone knew who meant who by what, in what way, in an instant of a moment, not to which one do you mean or 
that went away. It was really interesting, you know, and some of it you would say, okay, it's obvious that this person's doing this and that, per but some of it could have been three or four of those individuals in, in terms of, you know, Hey Mark, could you, and it was, uh, you know, to me, it was a real revelation of that we receive that we may not be conscious of that was just int intuitive. And I, I was like, Okay, this is like music. Can somebody explain music to me as a as a biological event? I don't think so. I mean, well, it's a miracle. How do you? And I'm not saying that from a religiously, you know, or spiritual no, standpoint. It's it's a very unique means of communication in humans exclusively. Well, it's because there's emotion. sending and receiving. You know, it's, for it's, creating. It's, it's, it's emotional. It's art. It's technical. It's all sure. the different things together. How do you program a computer to understand it? That's the thing. We're trying to do that with AI and stuff like that, but. It, but and I was saying I was saying a few hours ago I was saying the moment that computers understand emotion, when to apply it, how to adjust to it, that's when we're really in danger. That's when there's really well, something scary. I think that you're right, but the danger point is that the simulation, if the simulation becomes so successful that we as humans can't tell the difference between simulation and actual emotion, that's yeah. really the danger point because yeah. we will assume. The way we do with our pets, we will assume, you know, uh, uh, human characteristics to things that have another engine operating underneath. And yeah. that's you're right. It's a danger point. But it's it's more about, you know, you know how, you know, how, you know, when that, you know, Dave, Dave, <laughs> Dave, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I'm talking about 2001, the, mm -hmm. the, the you know, uh, Stanley Kubrick was talking to us, you know, 50 years ago about, you know, the same issue. And um, now it's upon us. Um, and we'll see, you know, I don't know. I feel, I feel odd going through a self checkout line at the, at the store. You know, I feel odd about some of the, you know, automation that we're having, you know, as opposed to the, the human, the human contact thing. I don't want to be on a, a automated robot conversation on the phone. Does it make me a Luddite? No, I, I like the human connection of everyday life, you know? And, yeah. um, so in storytelling, we have kind of a sanctuary for the, for the near term anyway. You know, most of us in movie world are, you know, we probably wouldn't survive normally in the real world. You know, we're all a little five degrees off center, but that's because we have the artistic temperament. We, we, we're sensitive, you know, and we process and we think independently. We may not always communicate that way, but it's, it's, it's a special community, you know, the art yeah. community and, and the filmmaking community within the art community is a special community. I know some people look at it. It's just a gig. I could never, I don't have that. I don't have that gene. I, I, it's not just a gig. It's, it's a lifestyle and, and with its pros and cons and, and uh, you know, Barbara Walters passed away yesterday. You've probably heard that, but, but somebody was speaking who she had mentored and said, you know, the, her best advice from Barbara Walters was try and never to lose the connection of balance between your personal life and your work life. She was saying that from the point of three divorces and a lot of, you know, sacrifice in, in her own life. And I think that's a really, you know, an important thing. Petrushka's and my last documentary is called I Love What I Do. And it is a real it's deep, personal. a personal document. That was, it's a deep dive into that issue of, you know, the, the choices of following your passion and still, you know, surviving the rest of your life existence with your, you know, your, your spouse, your kids, your life, your health, all mm -hmm. the rest of that, you know, because we tend to be dismissive of those core things at the expense of, you know, with the idea that we are, you know, there's no limit to our commitment to our passion, passion thing, but the passion thing is fed by that other side. And, and we're so easily seduced into ignoring that other side, uh, yeah. that, that, you know, you know, 50, you know, you go through a career and you look back and you go, was I there for the school play? Was I there for, you know, for the, for the, uh, for the physical checkup that I should have had that would have told me that I need, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think, I think we're, you know, I think we're on the verge. One thing about social media is with all of its dysfunction and its enormous dysfunction, um, it does have this upside of, of bringing, um, people together of common, of common, like, you know, common experience. Yeah you know, and which is what you're doing here. And I'm really glad you are. Um, I'm going to step away. Um, and, and that's go have that breakfast. I didn't have. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's fine. Don't be like I was 18 hours ago on that note. I'll tell you this. Uh, you're talking about family connections and, and talking about your, you know, uh, interactions and stuff with family. 
I should probably call it at this point too. Uh, donations have stopped a long time ago, and um, and we we have twenty five people that are still watching. But I'll tell you this: uh, you're talking about family, and I should probably go to bed so that way I'm not sleeping until dinner time tomorrow. Uh, okay. After after I collapse, I probably won't wake up until noon, and that's fine. That's to be expected. You know, that's only like you know five hours away from right now. But I'm naturally energetic. I'll be up. But anyway. I, I want to thank you guys for staying in. It was a gem when you came back in, Patricia, and then Mark, when you walked over. Thanks for the invitation. I mean, it was amazing. To participate. It it's really amazing. Was, you know, and I enjoy talking with you, Alan. You know, absolutely, we to, Mark. We don't have to be online to do it either. You know. So. No, absolutely not. And uh, if you ever, if y'all ever come back to Atlanta, I'd love to just well, you know. Well, we've been there know. several times. Likewise, if you ever come and you know come you know visit. where come visit. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows what's going to always happen? We have a new year upon us only in a few hours. Okay. So that's right. And you and a, I have a commitment for this year. We do. We sure do. And uh, and it's one that now that this event is past us, I'll be able to actually focus a little bit with my yeah. with my brain that's and and sweet. don't yeah. don't kill yourself um, <laughs> by your own doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's hopefully going to be one of those things that uh, once once. Like I said, one, now that we're past this, this has been the big focus that I've had like past two or three weeks. Yeah. So, and actually more more so than that, I've been kind of in prep for this for almost two months because it takes a long time to, to get everything done. It's a one-man band. This is a whole show. And the coordination of people watch and stay on all day, you'll see how tight it is going from one person to another to another and all the different things and the different parts. Yeah. And that's basically, that's that's me assembling this over the course of time and, and you know, prep. Like you said, it, it, it takes a while. So how did you uh, do the donations? I mean, before you say goodbye, where did it end up? Uh, let's see here real quick. Uh, the donations on stack up, including a lot of the vendors that donated, I tell you the donations from viewers this year has not been nearly as high as it has been in the past donations, uh, at stack ups website is 2790 right now. And the last donation came through at nine fifty four uh, yesterday. And then uh, the donations through YouTube are sitting right around uh, 1.4K someplace. So between the two of them, we're looking at, what is that? Uh, 1,400 plus 2,700. We're looking at just over 4,000, uh, about 4,100. So we're, we're doing, we're, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not at all what I would say, uh, you know, a loss. Yeah, I think we de definitely did raise a lot of money and i think we did did also have some great conversations the conversation constantly uh -huh. changed throughout the time there's a lot of of different waves of it and how things just transition sure. and part of that's you know reading the reading where the conversation's going and and who comes in and out and everything um you popped in hours ago when we were in the middle of a podcast conversation i think you you were like i yeah. see this has kind of evolved into a different area of sound but yet then you were there when, when it was wrapping out and people were bailing. So we came back in and now we've been here an additional two or three hours and the conversation got back into our world <laughs> and it's amazing. So um, real quick here, a couple last yeah. last chat things and then we're going to call it. Uh, Matthew, welcome to 2023. If you don't, uh, don't live in Perth. Uh, Heather, you're still here in 2023 too. How's the new year feeling? And then uh, Liberty Dude. And then... Thanks, everybody who wished us Happy New Year. Same back at you. And um, let's make it a really good year. Oh, yes. Absolutely here. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming in and joining during this epic live stream, third edition for the year 2022. Um, it's been... A long night. It's been a long day, and it has been, in my opinion, very epic. So, thanks for everybody being a part of it. There's probably somebody out there who's been just as crazy as me that's been here the entire day, if not most of it. And I thank you all for for coming and give us the time. People always say the most valuable thing you can give is of yourself and your and your time. And y'all were all here, and y'all were watching for hours and hours on end, and involving and in chat. And it's been very difficult for me to keep up with the chat sometimes. But it's been very interactive, and there's been a lot of information. I think that uh, that there's a lot of people that have learned a lot of things today. So, uh, very much appreciate everybody for being here and being part of this. And uh, we'll do this again next year. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Let's not Go. get ahead of ourselves here. But uh, but uh, very much appreciate everybody for coming in here. Is there a last note that you'd like to say or anything, Patricia? 
No, just everybody take care of yourself. Uh, play the long game. Alan, you did a great job. And you're always inspiring. And um, okay, see everybody later in the year. Later in the year. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in.